Hi guys, if you value my work and want to help me keep going, consider making a donation. Every donation small or large is important. Links in description. Chapter 11. Training Ground 7. Naruto wanted to seal more natural energy into the seal on his body, but he first needed to sort out something with the bijou inside of him. The prison was something else, but Naruto didn't mind it too much. He simply walked over to the bars that held the QB and tapped in seeing that its eyes were closed. Are you going to ignore me? It depends on what you want to say to me. Naruto sighed. You're still a little pissed off that the ghost of the Yandame Hokage returned and strengthened the seal after I nearly released all of your power he hadn't been out of control but he had been close to releasing all the power and turning into the Kyubi. It had been on purpose because he wanted to see how much of the Kyubi's power he could release without the key. He wanted to see if he forcefully drew the chakra, would it break? But the ghost of the Yandame had appeared and strengthened the seal. It wasn't so much as a ghost but the chakra the man sealed within the seal that held the Kyubi for in case the seal was breaking. It was the same for his mother. But Naruto wasn't in a hurry to meet her. He could activate her chakra without meeting the requirement needed for it to activate automatically on command. I was close to leaving this damned place. Naruto shook his head. I was still very much under control of my body the blonde said. That said, I had prepared needed measures to ensure that you didn't go anywhere if you managed to wrestle control over my body. What do you want? I wonder why are you desperate to be free from me? Why does my death make you afraid? Naruto waited for a moment but the Kyubi didn't say anything. Minato separated your ing and yang chakra. He sealed half of your chakra within him and the other in him. But when he died, your other half wasn't released. He used the dead demon consuming seal, but that doesn't make a difference in the sense that using that seal only gives direction to where his soul goes. Minato used that seal to separate your chakra, not to seal you. The seal that sealed you in me is the same that sealed you in him. I have concluded that Minato has your other half in the belly of the Shinigami. I'm assuming that unless the seal is released, you will never leave me, even when I go to the afterlife, you will go with me, as your other half went to the other side with Minato. It is a bit of a tricky situation. Where father is doesn't determine anything. I am certain that if I freed his soul from where he is, you'll probably visit the other plane with him. Are you afraid that you'll be connected with me for all eternity if you don't separate from me while I am still alive? No other seal can do this I assume this is because of the special characters of the 8 trigrams sealing method. Kurama stared at Naruto for a long minute before finally responding. To you people life and death means nothing, isn't it? Should someone who lives for all eternity say something like that? I am a bijou the Kyubi said with indifference. You are a mere human and yet death doesn't scare you. No, you Uzumaki death is like a state of traveling to another world for you. You have the masks in to peer into the afterlife, where no other human can see. If your mother's body had been preserved, she may have already been summoned from the other world to this one. You're not going to answer my question, are you? Naruto said. It doesn't matter. When I die, I don't want you to follow me. However, whether you are free or sealed into another Jinchuriki really depends on your attitude. We will talk about this some other time it appears that I have a guest. Sakura was nervous walking towards Naruto she hasn't spoken to him in three long years. He was a kid last time, but now he looked like a man, his hair was longer, face manlier. He had the eyes of an experienced shinobi. Then again, Naruto's eyes had at times looked like that of an adult. Perhaps the difference was that now he had the body to back it up. Although nervous, Sakura managed a small smile when she stopped next to him. Hey she said awkwardly. Naruto smiled, amused by her awkwardness. Have I become that much of handsome person that even you, who only has eyes for Sasuke feel nervous when standing before me, Sakura? He asked lightly. Sakura glared for a moment. Don't get ahead of yourself, Naruto. When she stopped talking, she realized the awkwardness had vanished her body was no longer tense. He said those words on purpose. But even though he said it just to erase the tension, it wasn't exactly false. She smiled, well, I'm sure you'll win a lot of girls. Not fan girls Naruto said with a shake of his head. I saw you around I don't want to live with that. Sakura didn't glare at Naruto. 
she had the decency to look embarrassed at her past behavior. She hadn't exactly been a kunoichi back then, had she? She was just a knave girl who was playing shinobi. That was the past, I am different now. I would assume so Naruto said. She had been training under Tsunade even before he left for his training trip, so it was to be expected that she changes. There was silence as Sakura gathered her thoughts. It is good to see you again, Naruto she said. You didn't respond to my message she managed to say. Ah, the apology. Naruto didn't have anything against people who were earnest in their apologies. Life was a fickle thing that could end at any time. No human was perfect no human could do everything right. Sometimes people do things on purpose simply because they could. Such people needed to be crushed for their foolishness. They were stupid and blind. But still refused to see the light. Perhaps it was the same for Kanoha's people. What did it gain him by holding a grudge against one foolish girl? Nothing. Unless he was a sadist who would enjoy seeing her suffer while trying to earn his forgiveness, then Naruto would go on that path. But he didn't enjoy such things. Besides, the girl hadn't been so bad. Compared to what he was given by many people, she was nothing. Perhaps irrelevant. He hadn't minded much of what she said. He could see her shouting, but he could not recall what she was saying. I wanted to look into your eyes before I say anything Naruto said holding out his right hand. Apology accepted, Sakura. But I do hope you have grown from that girl. Sakura stared at his hand before taking it. Of course, I have grown. You are not the only one who has seen changes, you know. I have also become strong. I really don't want to test that out Naruto said looking at the punch she had created with her fist. Tsunade taught you everything she knows, it seems. Sakura nodded. I had to learn. I realized I wasn't much of a kunoichi when we were still a team. I wasn't much of a help when we came across different situations. But now when Sasuke comes back and Team 7 forms again, things will be different. Really? How naive was she? Did she really think that things would turn back to the way they were? Did she really think that they would all laugh and eat together as they did before Sasuke decided to turn against them? Ridiculous. Nothing was ever going to be the same. Naruto didn't even have the desire to be in Team 7 again. He would not join. That aside, he wasn't going to be here for far too long. He had many things to do with his life. Preparations though. Preparations were needed. Later that day. Friends. Perhaps this group could be put in that category but they were not that close. Not too close to be called best friends. In your life, you had people you hanged out with, people you knew. But they were not necessarily close friends who could enter his den and share a meal with him. The Sandame Hokage had been perhaps his best friend. There were a lot of things the old man did not say even though he did tell him many things. For the third, it was just so that he could live without pressure. If things had been good, Hiruzen would have probably not told him anything. A possibility. It was cruel but not the reality. And Naruto was glad it was only just a possibility. He was sitting in a restaurant, the people he attended class with in the academy were around him. Not this only, but those who managed to become shinobi after graduating from their exams. He had gone to enter the Chunin exams with this group. They were good people the only group of people to have treated him well. Ignorant of the reality, yes, but many people still hated him even though they didn't know anything. Naruto didn't have alcohol before him. He usually drank when he was in a bar. Besides, this was a group of people who had finally gathered together after some years. Sakura would not say everyone because Sasuke wasn't present but most people would agree that the Uchiha had never been part of the group. Of course, she would never openly admit that. Why does it look like I am the only one who is still a genin around here? Naruto asked, looking around the group. It doesn't look that way you are the only one who is still a genin. Chuji said while stuffing down food his throat. How he could find time to speak and eat at the same time was beyond comprehension. Naruto turned towards Ino. Ridiculous, he said pointing at the Yamanaka blonde. Ino glared at him. What is that supposed to mean, Naruto? She demanded. 
No offense, but it is just ridiculous even you of all people is ranked higher than me. What kind of a world are we living in? He asked, looking around the group. I am offended. Eno exclaimed. I will admit that I wasn't any better when you were still around but I have changed. I am no longer the same girl I was back then. If forehead could change, then so could I. You are offending me too, Eno. Sakura said glaring at her childhood friend. If you still want to see who is better between you and me, we can still go to a training ground and I will take on. When Eno didn't say anything, it was apparent who was stronger between the two. Then again, Eno's style of fighting wasn't suitable for brawling. There was a bit of delicacy about it. Perhaps if it was someone like Chuji, then one could understand. It still doesn't make sense. I say rankings are pointless from now on. Kiba snorted. Says the genin he said. Admittedly, it felt like a win for Kiba knowing that he was a chunin and Naruto was just a genin. It didn't matter who was stronger, the fact was he was of higher rank and if there was a mission, seniority was given to him who was of higher rank, not the genin. He had lost to Naruto in the chunin exams, perhaps a bit pathetically, but this was his victory and he wasn't going to allow anyone to blemish it. Shikamaru sighed. He was certain that Naruto really didn't care about this. Probably just brought the subject to be in control of what they talked about. This made his headache just thinking about it. The blonde had always been a step above everyone. It was troublesome, hence Shikamaru stayed away. But he knew. He had heard the talk since he usually visited the Hokage's office Naruto was probably stronger all of them. But he wasn't going to say that, was he? So, Naruto, I heard you fought Sasuke Kuen, is it true? Did he beat you again? Ino asked a bit excitedly. Sasuke who? Naruto asked with a smile. Ino glared at him, but his smile only widened a bit. I don't remember. You'll have to jog up my memory a bit. If you help me, maybe I will remember. Ino folded her hands across her sizable burst. It was a chest that made Sakura envious. She had grown other parts, but that side just would not frustrating reality. What? When someone drinks it too much, screws loosen a bit in the head and they talk freely. Order some sake, we drink a bit, even you have to drink, then we'll see what drops out of my mouth. Maybe I will even mumble a few naughty things I did when I was training. You know, Jiraiya is a known perverted, wouldn't you want to hear some of the embarrassing things, I caught him doing? The following day, Forest of Death. Naruto stood up from the ground, sage mode activated. The weight of the chakra caused the ground below him to shatter. The chakra was visible around his body. It was colorless, but clearly visible even to the naked eyes. He didn't do anything but deactivated the mode and sat down. A minute later, Niji appeared from the forest. Why are you watching me, Niji? Naruto asked in calm tone. Hinata didn't send you, did she? It was already a problem that she had to watch me because of her damn curiosity, but I don't need your eyes watching me. It wasn't my intention but when I saw you sitting here alone, I grew curious. Niji said. Maybe his body language didn't show it but he had been unnerved by what the Byakugan saw when Naruto stood up. The blonde was drawing chakra from nature but that wasn't what had shocked him he had been shocked by just how much chakra the blonde was able to draw out. Even when he was younger, Naruto already had more chakra than a jonin. Kakashi has admitted that Naruto had more chakra than him. And yet, the blonde was still able to draw this much chakra. This had to be wrong, right? It had to be against the laws of everything for someone to possess as much chakra as the blonde has. When you no longer need the Byakugan to see someone's chakra, then something was very wrong. Niji had seen many shinobi but he had never seen anyone who had so much chakra that it distorts that atmosphere around him. It was just ridiculous and he couldn't put a measure to it. But he knew there was no one who came close to Naruto when it came to chakra, and we still didn't include the power of the Kyubi. Naruto shook his head. What brought you here? Tsunade-sama sent me to you Niji said. I'm not going to comment on the seals that I saw. They were just markings around Naruto's entire body. It was strange, not like anything he had seen before. It would be best if you don't comment or even say anything about it Naruto said. 
but it isn't the first time you see, isn't it? Niji shook his head. So you are the son of the Yandame Hokage it was a statement, not a question. Naruto tilted his head to the side. He didn't think it would be something that this person would know since it was still a secret. It was probably never going to be told people and Naruto didn't care enough for people to know. He didn't want to live under the shadow of his father. He didn't want to be forgotten and people see Minato's son. Then again, would these people of the Hidden Leaf willfully accept? But if they did not, would it bother him? Of course not, their views stopped being relevant some time ago. Yes Naruto said with a nod. Who told you? I wasn't told about it Niji said. That was true and even when he asked he was told that it was a village secret. He just had to think through things on his own. I just came to the conclusion about it when I was being told about your home village, Yuzushio. Tsunade-sama wanted us to know the important details before we headed there to hold talks with the village leaders. Naruto nodded. How did you take my ancestral home? He asked curiously. Niji was silent for a few moments he didn't see much. They didn't let them see anything that made them curious or want to see more. What was apparent was that the village had more Uzumaki than they were willing to show them. Overall, it had looked like a normal village, but it was not. The people seemed happy nevertheless and the air felt different. They were not happy to see the Byakugan and the Sharingan. They immediately knew the purpose. They are smart people. But there was no need to worry because they have Byakugan proof wards all over the village. Naruto laughed at the frustrations of the Hyuga which were clearly evident in his tone. You're dealing with few Injutsu masters who have been allies of Kanoha since its founding. Of course they would know how to handle themselves in your all-seeing eyes. It was still something that had never happened before. We are proud of the Byakugan's ability to see through solid objects but in that village, that rule doesn't apply, you only see as far as they want you to see. Niji said with a shake of his head. I'm certain they probably had someone with the Byakugan to proof check their work to ensure there were no weak sports in their wards. Naruto smiled. I won't add anything on that it is something only you can understand he said with a shake of his head. How are things in the Hyuga clan? Fine the clan head told me everything my father's sacrifice. I do accept my role in the clan. But even so, since I am still the brightest the clan has to offer, they allow me to view things only those from the main family would normally view Niji said. There are still some objections nevertheless. That is when you deal with people. Not everyone will agree to everything. Naruto said. Some people will refuse to see reason and facts even if it smacks them in their face. As long as it doesn't fit how they view things, they will reject it. You are skilled, but those who reject your elevation only do so because you are from the branch family. Niji nodded. But I cannot say because at the end of the day, because I am from the branch family, I am fated for nothing. Kanoha is preparing for war the clans have already sat down. I was informed that if we do end up going to war, I will be leading the Hyuga forces. So we have been training together. Naruto smiled. That is something worth celebrating. But nothing much changes for you, does it? Niji asked calmly. The Hyuga clan avoided you by all means. I suspect the clan heads knew of your parenthood from the beginning but instead of doing anything they chose to ignore you to protect themselves. Niji, you were not very wrong when you spoke about fate Naruto said. There are certain things that you cannot avoid. As a Jinchuriki, you are fated to be hated, loathed because of the bijou you hold within you. However, you were wrong to say that you cannot change things. Your circumstances have changed. But nothing much has changed with yours. Niji said. Naruto shrugged with indifference. It is a matter of attitude. If you want your story to change, it will change. You don't choose which family you are born into, but you choose how you live your life, even with the constraints that bind you. I am a Jinchuriki, but I can still live happily. You can say Jinchuriki are fated to live miserably and die alone, but that can be changed. Attitude means everything. Niji stared at Naruto. Why do I get the sense that you are just not willing to change things? It is attitude, I told you. I am just not willing to suck up to anyone to get them to like me. We cannot all be heroes. If I choose to become an umbu, do you think this village will ever recognize me? 
Umbu fight to protect their village in the shadows. They are never known to the people. Nobody praises them. If I go that path, they will just glare at them as the useless shinobi who doesn't do anything. I refuse to live according to the wishes of someone. I chose my own path regardless of what people say Naruto said. That is attitude, Niji. It seems to me that you have chosen a miserable path of existence, Niji said. Are you prepared for it? You don't make a decision to become a shinobi if you are not going to stand the killing, Niji. Unless you simply join to play a shinobi Naruto said in a stern tone. I am prepared to face my journey and the glares that come with it. But it will be nothing new. I'm sure your cousin can testify to that. She has a whole experience of watching me. Niji could never work around the issue but he wasn't going to comment on it. It had been something that young Hinata certainly not something that she would do now. He would know he was her guardian after all. What kind of person chooses a path that only brings misery? You are not even the kind to work in Umbu not because of your personality. I think you would fit there, but because of you power. You are someone who would be utilized in the front line. Naruto would not disagree with that. He was training hard because he understood the role he would have to play. But if he was going to fight in the front lines, it would certainly not be for Kanoha but for his own reasons. That can happen. People looking at you will be unavoidable. At the end of the day, it won't matter what you desire because as a shinobi, you'll still have to follow the instructions of the Hokage. As all shinobi do Naruto said with a tired sigh. You are talking to me, and you said the Godain was looking for me, isn't she waiting? For you Hyuga, diligence is important, isn't it? Niji didn't seem to mind much about the issue but he wasn't worried because he knew that there hadn't been an explicit order to return immediately. He didn't know why he had to find Naruto or why she was gathering the others from the little group of genins in their generation. We should go he ended up saying. Hokage Office When Naruto arrived at the office, he was surprised to see the others waiting with the Godame Hokage. The blonde was busy with her work while the group stood by themselves, waiting. When they arrived, the eyes turned towards them. I didn't know you two got along. Sakura said seeing Niji and Naruto walk in while chatting casually. Naruto shrugged in response. We just talked there and there he said. Your indifference is mind-blowing Ino said with a roll of her eyes. She realized, even last time, he seemed to speak with indifference. Perhaps it was something new he had picked up during his training with a self-proclaimed super pervert of a respected shinobi in the hidden leaf. Naruto smiled at Ino. Thank you for the praise I always strive to blow people's mind. It was rather difficult to tell whether he was being sarcastic in his response because there hadn't been any hint of it. I wasn't praising you. The blonde Yamanaka said. Naruto blinked with mock surprise. Really? You are mocking me, aren't you? Ino said with a glare. When Naruto only smiled, she huffed before turning away from the Jinchuriki. She knew by now that she wasn't going to win anything with someone who seemed to have a response for anything you throw. Naruto stood next to Kiba and spoke to the Inazuka. I'm jealous of the ladies in your teams. Hinata has filled up Ino has filled up Tenten has filled he spoke in a whisper. But Sakura. Kiba turned around to face the pinkette and looked at her chest. He nodded to Naruto. I get you he said. Did you know that the Godame was flat-chested when growing up? Naruto said once more. Those, he said pointing at Tsunade's chest, might not even be real. Before Kiba could respond, a dose of killing intent washed over the two, causing the Inazuka to stiffen sharply under the might of the Godame Hokage. Naruto merely smiled at the blonde. Tsunade-sama he said respectfully. What did you say to him? She demanded. I saw what you were pointing at. Nothing Naruto said with a pleasant smile. This is a pleasant group you have gathered. Tsunade sighed. She was certain that he had been pointing at her chest and the way Kiba had looked at Sakura before was the same. She shook her head. He really was a student of Jiraiya. Then again, it could all be just a play. Even Jiraiya didn't seem to know how Naruto would do things. Even that smile of his was just flat. As you already know we have changed things in the academy and your jonin senseis have been taking your training seriously. I want to see your progress. 
Tomorrow, we are going to have a match. It will be a sparring competition in which I will see how far you have progressed in your training. Naruto looked interested in this. I hope it isn't teams against teams, Bachan. Hokage-sama Sakura corrected Naruto in a stern tone. At this point, Tsunade didn't seem to care how Naruto addressed her. It is she said. Did you have a better idea? You want to see how they are able to coordinate and play along as a team right? Team 7 hasn't been training and all that. It would also be boring for me if it is in that form. It would be best if you make it all the teams against me Naruto said with a smile. I think that would be worth the challenge. I am the one who went out on a three-year training trip and still is a genin. I'm sure these guys don't want to be bested by a mere genin. You're overly overconfident, Kiba said with a grin. But I don't hate it at this time he said. Team 8 will take you on at any time. Tsunade stared at Naruto for a moment before smirking. Jiraiya praises your skills his skills are kage level and he says at full power, you are better than him as a sanin going against a team of chunins is unfair. Even Kakashi if he is fighting seriously would still win. Prepare yourselves tomorrow. Training ground 8, 10 a.m. sharp. Don't be late she gave her order. The rest of you can leave Naruto, stay behind. What about me, Tsunade-sama? You will be acting as backup in all matches you will be offering your medical expertise. Medical? Shikamaru asked. Why does it sound like it is going to be too much of a work? Of course there will be work. Tsunade said in a stern tone. A war could break out any time, you must be ready. Your group needs to act as an example, because in your generation, you are the best Kanoha has. Tomorrow, you will be fighting to the best of your abilities. A match will end when I say it is over. Kanoha has the best medical means in the elemental nations, you need not worry about dying. Dying? They looked at the Godame with surprise. Your senseis always tell you that when you fight them, you must come with the intent to eliminate. If you cannot attack Naruto with everything you have, you will get hurt. Tsunade said. Prepare yourselves. If I see that you haven't made improvements since you became Chunin's, there will be consequences to you and your senseis. Slowly but surely, the group departed from the office leaving just Naruto and Tsunade. The former sat down on the chair in front of the Godame's desk. He stared at the Senju for a long minute before shaking his head she was also staring at him. Is there anything that I have been reported to have done? Why would you ask that? You won't know what Jiraiya framed me for doing Naruto said with a shrug of his shoulders. I want to talk to you about Temari Tsunade said in a measured tone. She studied Naruto trying to see if she could get any reaction from him but she didn't get anything. He just looked back at her without even twitching. The delightful Sabaku he hadn't seen her since that day he left her in the river country. Perhaps a bit unkind of him but he would always have the memories. The days in Sunagakir had been truly pleasant because of her presence because she had been there and indulged him. When she came here, you asked her about me he said. What did she ask you? Nothing she was curious but she didn't ask much. I also know there are things she didn't tell me when I asked her about what you did in Suna the Godame said in a firm tone. I just want to know, what do you think about her? I could understand with Jiraiya, but I don't really think you want to get that deeper with my personal life Naruto responded calmly. Why are you asking? Are you not going to answer my question? I will have to see her again to actually know. But admittedly, my time with her had been delightful. I don't hate her he really didn't want to use the word, like, in this situation because he could sense that there was something in the making. He didn't want to get involved in it. Not when he was just being pushed by someone. Tsunade smiled. I'm glad, she said. Did you think that you could not hate someone when you were younger? I didn't see anything because I wasn't around, but I do get the picture of how things must have been. I can't claim to really understand it but I can see it must have been miserable. It really was miserable Naruto said with a small nod of his head. But what do you live for if you cannot hope? I did hope for a better tomorrow. I did hope for many things, because when things are not going well in your life, all you can do is hope, Tsunade-sama. Hope is what drives you it gives you the confidence to push forward. For a couple of moments, there was silence. I want you to know that I really do care for you, Naruto. 
I want you to be happy with your life and the decisions you make. You were robbed of the childhood you could have had because you became a Jinchuriki, I want to give you an option to choose how you live to make yourself happy. If you want to go back to Team 7 again, I will make it happen, if you don't want it and want to operate separately I can still make it happen. The Godame spoke in a warm tone, full of emotion. But it was only as long as he was living in Kanoha, serving Kanoha. Well Akage was supposed to think like that. And I really appreciate that Naruto said with a smile. Well, if nothing goes wrong, we should be able to live happily he paused for a moment before asking. Are you content with your life? Hmm. Tsunade stared, trying to understand what Naruto was asking. When she got it, she responded in a quiet tone. I don't want anything more now. Protecting this village is what I can live for I have experienced many things in the past. I won't die with any regrets. Perhaps some time in the future, we shall sit together and share a bottle of sake while talking about those experiences Naruto said. I'm not drinking with you. Naruto just laughed before standing up. There shouldn't be anything wrong with that. I am growing and I am sure I will reach a point where you will feel comfortable to say anything to me he grinned. You know, like how lonely the bed can be at night. The Godain threw something towards the blonde but he dodged it. I shouldn't have sent you with Jiraiya Tsunade said with a stare. Kanoha, training ground 8. Kurina I looked around the training ground the senseis had already gathered as well as their students. They were not supposed to give them instruction but they had to fight for themselves without their guidance. Kurina I didn't doubt her team but she questioned the intelligence of allowing just one person to fight all the other teams. Even though he wouldn't be fighting them all at once, this was simply saying that he was stronger than all of them by a big distance. Naruto had grown, but just how strong could he have become? She hadn't seen anything outstanding during the Chunin exams. He was training under a San Nin, but so has Sakura. But the Godame Hokage seemed to have confidence in his abilities. Kurinai would not question the Hokage. She was just going to watch but she doubted things would be anything surprising. Then again, he was a Jinchuriki he could use the Kyubi's power. Was it safe using it in such conditions though? Kakashi, your student is truly displaying the confidence of youthfulness guy said in a proud tone as he stared at Naruto. To have the confidence to take on a three-man squad, it was outstanding. It was the kind of test that one could set for himself to test his limits. He hasn't been my student in three years Kakashi said with a shrug. He is Jiraiya-sama's student the Jonin said. Where is the man himself? Probably left village already Kakashi said. It is a shame that he isn't here to see Naruto express himself, Guy said with a small nod. Do you think you will do it? Kurinai asked with caution. The others have also grown as well. And they have been training hard over the past months to prepare for future battles. Kakashi stared at Naruto for a moment. He had fought the blonde, and so he would know. He knew that none of the teams could match up to Naruto. He had certainly been training hard with Jiraiya and not fooling around. His progress was nothing short of miraculous. Only Naruto could grow in such a pace because of chakra levels. He is also not constrained to a certain style of fighting unlike the others. You'll see, Kakashi said. I am interested in how your students have grown though. Tsunade clapped her hands to get everyone's attention when she arrived in the training ground with Shizun. She smiled seeing that everyone was present. She was truly interested in seeing what Naruto could do. Jiraiya praised him and Kakashi had nothing but praise as well. But the times coming ahead would require for him to fight not just for Kanoha but for the Uzumaki as well. Maybe some people would disagree with her but she didn't care. She was the Godame Hokage and she alone decided what to do with her shinobi. If she was sending them to war, no one had the authority to say no. I hope you all came prepared because I don't want to see anyone taking things easy. We don't know what will happen in the future, but you must be prepared for anything. It isn't just you who have to be prepared but everyone has to be prepared from Jonin to Jenin. This is a friendly match, but you are fighting with the intention to eliminate. I also want to see if your formations at work. Over the next weeks, we will prepare training specifically designed for each time. Kurinai's team is useful for tracking we will design a training program that will test your tracking abilities. But for today, I just want to see you your abilities. 
If you are fighting in the front lines, how well do you fight? If you disappoint me, I will strip you of your rankings and put you a level below. You will have to enter another exam to regain the rank you lost. This isn't just reserved to just you, there will be many who will face this fate. I have given an instruction for all shinobi to train, if you don't have an improvement, we will deal with you. Even jonins who have slacked off in their training can be demoted to just chunins. Kanoha has always produced the best shinobi because our jonins are strong. A chunin from the Hidden Leaf was usually able to fight some jonins from other hidden villages. But over the years, we have slacked off, but no more. Naruto was amused by all that talk. Many shinobi were chunins but had poor attitudes and not just strong enough. They were going to have to return their chunin vests a pitiful experience that was going to be. But no one could blame anyone. It was apparent that with how things are, people like Sakura and Ino would have never become genin if they didn't improve their levels. So there was no more playing shinobi. Everyone had to be serious. Ah, the future was certainly going to be difficult. I expect all of you to move in if something fatal is going to happen, Tsunade said addressing the jonin senseis. The jonin saluted. Tsunade turned to Naruto. I hope you are ready and will not disappoint me and Jiraiya she said with a stare. This is under your terms, and you know you have a role to play in the future. If you are not strong enough, you will die. You won't be able to protect anything. Simply having the desire to do something isn't enough, you need to have the prowess and will to do it. Naruto nodded. He understood that perfectly, let us start with Team Guy I think they will set the stage he said with a wide smile. Tsunade was certain that Guy's team was stronger than the other teams. Niji and Lee were exceptional shinobi. Lee might not be able to use ninjutsu, but he could not be underestimated. Guy could easily be their trump card if he was willing to pay the price for using the power he could wield. Are you sure? If I lose, I can always be mocked by the others for thinking that I had the strength to take them on. It will also be a challenge for me. Circumstances are always not going to be favorable. Besides, you can always heal me Naruto said with a shrug. Tsunade nodded. No using that power she warned. But we will have to go through that to prepare our shinobi in case they ever have to face a jinchuriki in battle. Normal shinobi. What could they do in battle? Fighting a bijou was simply a way to die for people who didn't have the might to battle against the power of a bijou. Naruto wasn't going to voice his thoughts he simply nodded. Teen Guy Tsunade called out. Anything goes I won't repeat myself. Although Lee was jumping up and down about the prospect of facing someone who was prepared to fight all of them, Niji wasn't so confident. 1010, Niji called his teammate. Keep your distance, Lee and I will get close. When you see an opportunity, use it, I will keep watch with my Byakugan. I will also give you an opening. 1010 nodded. Just make sure Lee doesn't get overexcited, she said. Niji Mir grunted. He wasn't going to be able to do that. The stamina freak wouldn't settle down if he got too excited. Niji was certain that Lee was going to get his match and that would only put him to try with everything he has. You heard her Lee. The taijutsu user merely grinned. I will do my best, Niji Kuen. That isn't what I was saying Niji said before shaking his head. You can start. Tsunade shouted. Lee, make the first move. Niji ordered. Yash, by the time the word reached Niji, the taijutsu user was already darting towards Naruto. Niji followed slowly, covering himself with his teammate. Naruto took a stance seeing Lee charge towards him. The green-clad shinobi flashed in front of him, his right foot swept through the air in blinding speed, heading towards Naruto's left shoulder. Naruto raised his left hand trying to put up a defense. The moment Lee's foot collided with his hand, Naruto regretted it. There was much more strength than anticipated and he was pushed towards his left, slightly. Lee lifted his left foot. It picked up dust as it flashed towards Naruto's face. The blonde channeled wind into his right palm and caught the kick. Lee wasn't deterred his right foot followed shortly, but it was caught around the ankle. Lee held his hands together and tried to slam them above Naruto's head. The moment the taijutsu user did that, Niji flashed behind Naruto, his feet twisting with his right hand glowing with chakra. 
He aimed a strike on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto knew he couldn't replace himself in time to avoid the attack, but he could still attack Lee and move fast enough to hit Niji, but he would still get hit. He breathed in air, wind bullet. He released a wind bullet from his mouth. It sped out in incredible speed and slammed into Lee's chest. Before it connected Naruto had already let go of Lee's legs. The jutsu was sent flying backwards by the force of the jutsu. The moment Naruto's jutsu hit Lee Niji slammed his palm on Naruto's shoulder. Naruto was already twisting around, a wind blade on his right hand. He twisted anti-clockwise, with his right hand stretched out. Niji saw the attack coming with his Byakugan and bent backwards, watching the swift pass through just above him. His left hand touched the ground and he used it as balance before he lifted his right foot and swung it towards Naruto. Naruto was forced to jump away from Niji. The moment he landed, he was forced to look to his left projectiles were coming towards him. He couldn't move his hand from the shoulder because of Niji's attack. He really shouldn't have allowed the Hyuga to get close to him. The projectiles seemingly hit him but he disappeared in a puff of smoke. He appeared small distance away, but the moment he touched the ground, he was forced to leap into the air Lee was crashed down towards him with his right foot stretched out. The Taijutsu user crashed into the ground in a loud boom but a second later, he was twisting around in front of Naruto in midair. Naruto crossed his hands just front of his face as Lee's vicious kick came close. The kick connected, and sent him flying backwards. Naruto flipped several times before crashing into the ground with his hands still crossed in front of his face. He straightened his body and observed the team and smiled. You use your view of the field quite well, Niji. Lee, you move fast. And Ten Ten is waiting to pounce for any moment. But both Niji and Lee are Taijutsu users, they need to get close to me to do any damage. For Lee, covering the distance is quite simple because of the speed. You are a good team. I shall assault you now. You will forgive the pain you will experience, but if you can dance, you will avoid it. Naruto said in a stern tone. He was no longer smiling. There was a spike of his chakra as he fixed up the chakra flow on his right hand. The second that followed, he was gone. There were only gusts of wind picking up dust from his wake. He appeared in front of Ten Ten along with the wind. He created a fist with his right hand and drove it towards Tenten's face. When Naruto felt Lee's presence, his left hand moved up. The Taijutsu user flashed in between him and Tenten. Lee punched Naruto's hand away, directing it away from Tenten's path. In that moment, Tenten leapt away to create some distance between her and the two. Naruto's hand grabbed Lee's outstretched hand with his left hand. You're excellent in Taijutsu and your reflexes are quite honestly frightening but you have one weakness his eyes turned crimson as he channeled the Kyuubi's chakra. Genjutsu he finished. Naruto summoned natural energy before slamming a wind-enhanced punch on Lee's chest. There was a sickening sound when the punch connected with Lee's chest. The Taijutsu user coughed up blood through his mouth as he fell onto his knees. Sensing the incoming Niji, Naruto used his hold on Lee to twist him around and then hurl him towards the Hyuga. Niji cursed as he was forced to catch Lee. Naruto flashed behind him just above the ground, and slammed a wind-enhanced kick on the Hyuga's back. Niji yelped as pain shot through his body before being sent flying away along with Lee. The moment Naruto touched Niji he was forced to look up as he sensed something. He frowned when he saw a huge wave of water falling down on him. The water slammed on his body, sending him crashing to the ground. Tenten summoned the lightning jutsu she had stored in her scroll and directed it towards the water. While covered by the water, the lightning flashed through the water, and shocked Naruto. The blonde had smoke coming out his body after the jutsu stopped. He hadn't even made a sound even though it had hurt like crap. I see, so you can store ninjutsu in those scrolls I thought you could only summon weapons Naruto stated calmly. He had already deactivated natural energy the moment he threw Lee towards Niji, so he had taken damage here. Ten Ten hurried towards Niji and Lee. Naruto held out his right hand, he formed a ball of flames. He jumped into the air before kicking it towards the three, but it blasted above them. They did feel the heat nevertheless. Naruto snapped his fingers. Flame explosion the flames exploded, just after missing the three. 
It created a large cloud of crimson flames that produced increased levels of heat in the training ground. Sakura jumped into the scene and knelt down before Lee. She frowned when she tried to heal him. There was massive damage on his chest. No opponent will allow you to heal an enemy he has just defeated. Sakura froze, hearing Naruto's menacing voice from behind her. There was considerable amount of heat in the atmosphere. She glanced towards the blonde from behind, on the palm of his right hand there was a small ball of red flames. And I won't be nice enough to let you heal him. Aren't you taking this a bit seriously? Sakura asked with sweat on her forehead. If we end up in war, will you be asking that question? Naruto asked before he took a step forward. Ten-Ten threw a bomb towards him. Naruto wasn't able to dodge the paper bomb when it hit him on his chest before exploding. The explosion also set off the jutsu on his palm, causing him to be surrounded by a column of flames. The flames didn't burn for a second as they suddenly vanished. After the smoke screen disappeared, he turned towards Tsunade, this isn't exciting can they all just come at me all at once? Maybe I will be forced to fight he said in a bored tone. Sakura will be healing the others and perhaps Lee will use those nasty gates of life. It will be problematic, but at this stage, I'm not being challenged. Perhaps it was her anger incited by Naruto's bored tone, but Tsunade ordered the others join in. Sakura, you are not to heal him. And unless Naruto is unable to move, there will be no end to this. Naruto frowned. You really want to see me in the hospital, don't you? Later that day. Kakashi I smiled towards Naruto as he landed on the roof of the blonde's apartment block. The blonde was sitting in a meditative position. Senjutsu. He asked. Naruto nodded. I have to learn how to gather chakra quickly. It really is proving to be a challenge, he said with a sigh. Came to see if I am nursing some wounds. Kakashi shook his head. I just wanted to talk to you. We haven't talked since you returned to the village. We didn't even talk much that day I came to visit you he felt awkward saying those words. Perhaps it was the circumstances that surrounded them. He had seen Naruto's progress as a shinobi and he was a little bitter over his failure in being a teacher to Naruto. He wanted to talk about it and perhaps about Minato. Naruto closed his eyes for a moment and then breathed out to break his concentration. What do you want to ask? Do you hate me? Hmm. Naruto looked at the jonin curiously. Why such a question, Kakashi? No longer sensei. Then again, it was what he deserved. Even if Sakura still called him sensei, it was certainly just out of formalities than being a real sensei to her. Tsunade and Shizun taught the girl everything. He couldn't do anything for her. You know already that I was your father's student. You must have assumed that I know some of his techniques like his signature move. Naruto stared at the jonin for a long minute. The man felt off talking about this subject. Seeing him fighting earlier on during the day, Kakashi must have been reminded of his dear sensei. From what Tsunade sent him that other day, Kakashi had been really close to the Yandame Hokage. The man had demons on his closet and his father had been truly there for him. Well, you were his star student, and since Jiraiya knows it as well, I did assume you know it. But I wasn't sure since you never used it. Kakashi held out his right hand. A small raisin formed on the palm of his hand. He then cancelled it before speaking. He taught it to me the jonin paused for a moment. He settled down before speaking to me. I didn't teach you anything even though I was your sensei. Even during the chunin exams, I only found a chunin, who is only a chunin in name. I focused my attention on Sasuke because I somehow felt that he needed it more than you did. I thought if I focused on training him, maybe he wouldn't feel inferior to you and decide to leave the village. But that didn't help Naruto said with a flat tone. Yet yeah, Kakashi said before falling silent. Your father was a sensei to me. He taught me even his prize jutsu, but I couldn't teach you anything. Even at a moment when I should have really taught you something, I showed favoritism, and chose Sasuke. Maybe it was because the Sandaim ordered me, but I still wouldn't have taught you anything. Naruto looked up into the sky for a long minute. It was getting dark. There was a comfortable air that was going to wash over the village very soon and he would enjoy it while at the top of the Hokage Monument. 
Perhaps he could find time to get his mind working on seals. Perhaps he could do something for Lee to help him cover his tracks when it came to Jinjutsu. In cases he ever found himself separated from his teammates, he would be in trouble. But then again, the likelihood that he would find a shinobi who is going to use illusions wasn't much. Genjutsu was difficult to use. The most powerful shinobi haven't been good with the art. The sandame had you trained Sasuke Naruto said in a quiet tone. He then shrugged indifferently. The words you taught me will never leave me, sensei. Personally, you have taught words that I think are fundamental and should be taught in the academy. Your words are what build friendships, a sense of true duty. You know, there is a difference between trying to save someone because you were ordered to do it and doing it because you love them. I think for shinobi that should be a fundamental rule. I came to this conclusion because of how you care for your colleagues. Do you think that is enough? Who can tell? But what do you think is important, sensei? Naruto didn't wait for Kakashi to respond before speaking again. You focused on team building exercises were much more important a connection with your teammates that should be the fundamental step. But ultimately not enough if you are not trained to fight. Naruto nodded. Yes he said. But it doesn't change the fundamental rule. To be principled, stronger, and united, you need not just share a common goal you need to care for each other. The raw emotion of fighting for those you love is stronger than anything. We are humans people of love, hate and anger drive us. You taught me to care for friends, for those I fight for that is why I have become stronger. That is what drives me. I want to protect those I love. Seeing Kakashi looking at him, Naruto just smiled. I guess you are wondering what I want to protect. I never mentioned anything, and probably have never mentioned anything by name. That does make me wonder, but either way, it really doesn't matter to me. If it is Yuzu or Kanoha, it is your choice. I would only fault you if you turned a blind eye on Yuzushio. Regardless of everything, that is the village your mother was born, and you'd probably be treated better there. Naruto laughed, you'll get in trouble if people hear you say those words, sensei. The jonin shrugged with indifference. I wouldn't care. Chapter 12 Yoshino looked at the hidden rain from the tallest tower of pain, his fellow Uzumaki. How many years has it been since they met? It had been his mission to track down all Uzumaki, his mission to work throughout to ensure that Yuzushiogakure was standing. The village was on its feet now, but still not yet ready for anything. The outside world could still not know them. If they became engaged now, things could be troublesome for them. They were tying by all means to avoid disastrous things occurring once again. Nothing ever lasted in this shinobi world that was why they always had to be ready for the worst. For anything that could happen. There was no telling what their enemies would do if they found out any information that was disturbing about Yuzushio. You have built everything well. But I guess the money the Akatsuki has been making helps in this regard. Nagato nodded his head quietly. But it doesn't change that we are surrounded. If we are having a problem of both Kyumo and Iwagakure, it is a big problem. The two nations could invade us in different directions. Defending things now would mean that we will show the world our power and they will be worried. When that happens, the shinobi nations group together and go against us. Conan finished Nagato's thoughts. We cannot let anything happen to this village. She wasn't afraid of the great nations they had been preparing for them. Amage Kure has been preparing to defend itself. It was still a small nation that could not withstand all the might of a nation like Iwagakure, but they could make a stand. It wasn't like IWA would send all its shinobi to attack them. There would be no help if they were attacked, but they didn't need it. Whether it was an army or just Jinchuriki, they could protect Amage Kure. However, she understood the importance of timing. It would be unfortunate if things come to that but we simply must defend ourselves if we are attacked. Yoshino said. But I must ask for your patience. We necessarily won't have to do anything, but they will act for us and we will be reactive before pushing our agenda forward. If this world sees destruction, then so be it. I have seen that when people rebuild, there is a sense of unity, purpose. If the foundations of shinobi villages are faulty, then we must dismantle the shinobi world and start a new foundation. An ambitious project but things would not necessarily go that far. 
Everything depended on how the Great Five reacted but knowing their history and what motivates them it was easy to tell how they would react. With those calculations in mind, they were trying by all means to prepare themselves. War didn't just cost lives, it needed to be funded with resources. Shinobi 8, Shinobi needed weapons. Those weapons got destroyed in wars and they needed to be destroyed. If they were careful in their plan, they may as well profit from the wars. Yoshino shook his head. He was thinking like the Kages now. But they would be relegated. They would not rule the shinobi world for all eternity. They had their time and they used it to abuse and destroy whatever it was that they could destroy. The strong ruled over the weak that was their rule and they would exercise this rule. What are Iwagakure's plans? They are the most active but Kumogakure is still the most aggressive village. If anything is going to happen it might be from them. Nagato said. They have backed away a bit since we eliminated their spies but I wonder for how long it will last. Yoshino said. The rakage favors strength and I believe if he hears something pleasant to his eyes he will make movements the thought did make him frown. Considering how the village has behaved when it has made aggressive moves, he had every reason to be worried. Do you think he will make the same moves they made in Kanoha? Conan asked. Since we won't let them in Yuzushio, they might try something on the wave country, if that happens and we eliminate their people, they are going to make noise Yoshino said. Nagato was silent for a moment as he thought about it. Just because they are strong they think they can do everything they want. These nations enjoy peace, but it has brought us nothing but violence and pain. Yet, at the end, they think we must just forget about it and continue as if nothing happens. If Kanoha and Iwagakure fight once more, we get dragged into the wars that only destroy our lands. These leading powers continue to demonstrate that with power you can do whatever you want. War is never pleasant. It brings nothing but pain, destruction, death, and violence, but for small reasons, they will start wars. That is Iwa's attitude in this. Hatred will continue to cripple this world of shinobi if things continue as they are. These nations must be made to experience war in the same way as we experience it. Perhaps then they will be afraid to start wars. I wonder about that, Nagato. People die in wars, they learn to hate, fear, and experience pain. But when something happens tomorrow, they are still willing to go to war, even when they know that it will only bring death and pain in the end. Every side loses something in a war, yet, no matter what, they repeat the same cycle over and over again. Will it ever change? We must hope that it will change, Nagato said in a confident tone. Jiraiya Sensei once said that he wishes for a world where people could understand each other. I thought people could understand each other through pain. I wasn't completely wrong, but even if people experience the same pain, they are likely to hate each other. I think even today he hopes for such a world. When we were still young, it certainly looked possible. It was possible to fight for good, to protect the weak and teach good to people. But we were weak. Those with power crushed us. We have gained power but all that will be meaningless if we have no confidence in our convictions. Yoshino was silent for a long moment before finally nodding his head. Hope is all we have, huh? It isn't the only thing that we have, Conan said. But it is fundamental for humans to hope. If you cannot hope for something, you cannot give it your all. We hope because we have the desire. We must be able to see a world we envisage, if we cannot see it, what are we fighting for? Just crushing things along the way Yoshino answered with a shake of his head. As long as nothing leaks out, Amage Cure will be safe. I don't think a confrontation with Kanoha and Iwagakure will happen. Not in the immediate future, at least. The Great Nations probably already realizes that Yuzushio depends on the wave, if they think so it won't be long before they hire pirates to attack our ships. It won't be anything more than a pointless exercise to try to determine our strength. We won't reveal much nevertheless. We have the Akatsuki for such purposes Conan said. If something is going to happen, the wave can always hire the Akatsuki. If you involve Kanoha it opens a door for confrontation with the Great Nations. That is something we want to avoid Yoshino said. Itachi ended up choosing what he chose long ago. We didn't interfere because it was better this way. He would have been a problem if he had stayed alive. You continued to use him because you knew he was going to die. 
naturally, Yoshino said. But we still managed to keep him restrained. However, he did make contact with his majesty. The only thing he gained was a way to fast-track his death. Since we were watching him, we made it our mission to take his body and keep it. He could be useful in the near future. And so we have stored his body away. Sasuke would likely go blind because he wouldn't get his brother's eyes to unlock the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan but Yoshino wasn't concerned with that. The Uchiha was by far the least in his concerns. If Sasuke went blind, maybe he would celebrate. It all depended on what the Uchiha was planning to do afterwards. So, is it still going to be silence for the next two years at least? Yoshino nodded. Yes we have already acquired the technology we require from the Land of Springs. The next phase is building and His Majesty will be overseeing it all. I'm sure you'll also have your hands full. During this time, there likely won't be any communication and unless the unexpected happens which will require a military force, we will not require the use of the Akatsuki. But after then, the Uzumaki will make a return. A couple of days later. It felt rather nostalgic being back in this village. Perhaps it had more to do with Itachi's feelings towards Kanoha than his. Sasuke stared at the very gates that he had left when he departed the leaf to gain power from Orochimaru. What a waste of time that had been. The Sanin hadn't given him much. He had done most things by himself anyway. Perhaps leaving shouldn't have been an option for him but then again, if he hadn't felt the village, Itachi wouldn't have bothered inviting him to their battle. Maybe Naruto had more to do with his brother's actions than him leaving. Either way, he was back in the hidden leaf. He wondered though, after everything, would they just willingly allow him to walk through their streets? Sasuke snorted at the thought. He didn't need their approval. If they didn't want him, he could leave any time he chose. With the power that Itachi allowed him to gain, there was nothing that could stop him. Not even Naruto could be in his way now. He was still going to get revenge nevertheless. Itachi might not have wanted it but it didn't matter. It wasn't about what his brother desired. It was about what he wanted. Reviving his clan and revenge had always been his core dream. Not much has changed aside from a few side jobs he now needed to do. When Sasuke stopped by the gates, a squad of Umbu surrounded him. Uchiha Sasuke, the leader of the Umbu said a monotone voice. You will need to come with us. I already came here without you I can make my way towards my destination without you. Sasuke responded in a dangerous tone. Just because he was here didn't mean that he was going to allow them to boss him around never. He had never permitted such anyway. And where is your destination? They were on guard, ready to act in case the Uchiha made any wrong movement. Hokage Tower I need to speak to the Godame Hokage about my return. You abandoned the village, put the lives of several clan heirs in danger after choosing to join the forces of a known traitor of the Hidden Leaf. A person who invaded this village, do you think you can just walk in here and speak to the Hokage? They were directing their killing intent towards him. Sasuke didn't find it amusing. The last time he had been afraid of a killing intent was when Orochimaru stared at him during the Chunin exams. He had been stupid though. He had been impressed by the Sanin strength but he should have seen something glaring right at him Orochimaru had run off from the village with his tail between his legs after his failure of an invasion. If I didn't think so, I wouldn't have decided to walk through the gate Sasuke said with a small shrug of his shoulders. If you are going to lead me, you can lead me towards the Hokage Tower. They stared at him and considered him for a moment before one of them asked. If you came here to eliminate the Godame Hokage? Sasuke stared at these people with contempt. If you are not going to lead me, I know the way around. I'm only asking you to lead me because I don't want to cause unnecessary problems he said. We will take the rooftops we don't want your appearance causing a scene. Yuzushi Ogakure. Gyurin couldn't keep the frown off her lips as she walked through the streets, heading towards the leader's tower. She was just returning from the wave after having received intelligence of Kumogakure's intentions to move against the wave's leader. A disturbing sound that had her running through the streets and heading straight into a boat to stop the attempted attack. She knew that people have already tried asking questions to those close to the man regarding Yuzushio but they were not getting anything. 
Kyumo being the aggressive bully it was, had attempted to kidnap the leader of the country to try to take him back to their village where they would try everything to get him to cough out secrets of Yuzushio. Damn brutes. They were never going to leave them alone. Gyurin knew this when she signed into this job, but there was no breathing room. The damn scums were persistent and it was starting to frustrate her. At least Iwagakure had stopped but that they couldn't do what they did to Iwa's people to Kyumo. There would be one hell of a scream coming from the lightning. No doubt the man would threaten to descend to the ground himself to take revenge over the loss of his shinobi. They were a small nation, and so the bigger boys thought they could bully them. Ridiculous. But Gyurin was starting to see things clearly. Perhaps she was being corrupted by working in this village and Haku. She never certainly saw things in such a manner. She has been working for this village for a couple of years now. She understood its beliefs, its desires the fear that some Uzumaki held at the thought of being destroyed again. She had become part of this village. It was now her home. Yukimaru's home and she was fighting to protect it with everything. The wonders of life. When she stepped into the leader's office, she found him sitting with Haku there too had been waiting for her since she sent a message once she was done in the wave country. I guess I'm not the only one who is concerned that Kumo has decided that we are a cause for concern Gurin said seeing the stern looks on the male's faces. She settled down with a tired sigh. It is a matter of concern Yoshino said with a small frown on his lips. I was hoping that they would treat us as nothing that could threaten them Haku said. He understood that the rakage listened to power and so if they thought they were weak they wouldn't do anything against them. He had been breathing happily under this assumption. If things were going to break out soon, there would be fighting and death. It wasn't something that he really wanted to do, but he would be forced to do it if these people end up attacking them. It wasn't like a mission of his where killing wasn't a necessity but in war, you had to eliminate. Sparing the life an enemy was nothing more than a wish for being stabbed in the back. They still likely don't see us as much of a threat, Guren said. They didn't send anyone powerful to do anything she said. And we still maintain all of the wave's military power within this island training them. As it stands the wave doesn't have the military resource to defend itself but it is fine this way. The elemental nations can think this way, but wave shinobi won't be wave shinobi but rather Yuzushio shinobi Yoshino said with a pause. But it doesn't change that Kumo has moved. Do you think they moved because the other nations are moving as well? Haku asked. They held communications with the Leaf, and their alliance with Kiri was possibly known. Then again, it wasn't something they could keep hidden with how the Mist wanted to do business with them. Possibly, Yoshino said with a small nod. What did you do to them? Nothing, Gurin said with a shake of her head. I figured it would be risky to eliminate them all. So, I just captured them, but I avoided using my abilities. We don't want Kumo seeing the bloodlines or else they will go berserk. Yoshino laughed at Gurin's words. Berserk? It was perhaps an exaggeration but quite fitting. You did well we'll just send them back to Kumo peacefully, but we won't say anything to them. If they try something like that again, we do the same process over and over again until they grow frustrated. But hopefully, if we don't eliminate them, the rakage will think of us as knave and stop with his barbaric actions. If they grow frustrated and send an army? Haku asked. I have spoken to Nagato about this Yoshino said. The wave will hire the Akatsuki if it happens like this. Kumogakure will probably think we don't have the strength to protect the country ourselves and maybe stop being aggressive in order to play the wait and see game. It is something that IWA is currently playing now since Kanoha sent its people. Hopefully, everything works out and we don't get dragged into battles before we finish building. Haku said calmly. It is a little quiet in here it is a pity that it will get dangerous. It is unlikely that the hidden villages will try something against us just like that Yoshino said. You of all people should know that when someone attacks us in here, we have the advantage of sinking their ships before they reach us. It is the same with the wave country. The only way through is by the great Naruto bridge, we can always send you out to freeze the surface and his majesty to destroy the ships. In terms of attacks coming through the sea, they were covered. Yuzu was certainly covered. But it would be a problem if they sent hundreds of ships. They wouldn't have the manpower to defend against those attacks. Yoshino would not say this to Gurin and Haku, 
but it was a possibility he shared with the emperor but they would have to devise a way to deal with it. What is Kiri's position in all these? Doesn't want to get involved, Haku said. Well, the village is still trying to rebuild and it doesn't have to worry about a war happening inland because they are far away from it. It still has a large naval military, so no village would try attacking it in its territory. They do use the mist to their advantage, Yoshino said in thought. We might also have to learn a thing or two about them in cases we ever need such a tactic but for now, Durin, you can send those people back to Kyumo. We don't say anything, and we pretend that nothing ever happened. If you like, you can even offer words of apologies to the rakage. I'm sure he'd read it with a snort Yoshino smiled when he finished speaking. An apology for what? Gyurin demanded with a stare. When a powerful man who is full of pride hits you on purpose from behind, you don't turn around and glare at him demanding an apology he will slaughter you. What you do is you turn around and humble yourself before the mighty man and even apologize for being in his way. And if he decides to take advantage of you and kick you again? Yoshino smiled. The first attack will be cautious, but when you roll over and show him your back, he loses the sense of caution and attacks recklessly. Gyurin stared at the man for a moment before shaking her head she then smiled. Tell me, does the emperor also think like this? Sometimes when it is convenient, Yoshino said. We all learn from him. I wouldn't even be saying this unless I was certain he'd like it. Hokage office. For a moment, Tsunade had thought the umbu were making a joke and she was dreaming when the umbu said that Sasuke was seen at the village gates. The Uchiha had run away for Orochimaru and they had been looking for him for years now. Even when he departed Orochimaru's clutches, he still didn't return to the village. And yet, he had returned just like that. What was happening in this situation? Was it because Naruto had returned as well? But that didn't make any sense to her. Tsunade had just sat still until the Uchiha appeared in the office with a blank look on his face. He had indeed returned. Tsunade didn't dismiss the umbu. She couldn't be sure this wasn't a disguised attack on her. He was still a brat but underestimating him would bring her downfall. But Tsunade still could not put a reason on why he had decided to return on his own. Had he achieved his revenge on his brother? If so, it was remarkable considering that he had failed to defeat Naruto and Itachi wasn't someone who was weak. Uchiha Sasuke Tsunade started in a stern tone. You have some nerve just showing up like this. Sasuke responded with indifference. I came here because I wanted to inform you that I have returned to the Hidden Leaf. I have done what I wanted to do. This is my home, and so I have come back home this was the place that his brother had sacrificed their clan to protect. Sasuke could not simply spit on that sacrifice. That aside, he had greater ambitions than that. He would replace this woman. Tsunade stared at the Uchiha for a moment before bursting out in laughter. You have returned? She asked. Who had sent you away? You committed a crime against the village by running away and joining Orochimaru. We put shinobi lives at risk trying to retrieve you and you think you can just return. Sasuke contemplated telling the woman that he never asked for anyone to chase after him. If he wanted to leave, he could be allowed to do so without anyone saying anything. Besides, after what this village did to his clan, they certainly had no right to say anything to him. Orochimaru was indeed a criminal, but this is still my home. Do you think people will just accept you after you abandoned this home of yours? Tsunade asked in a hardened tone. You did something and there are consequences for them. I know what is happening around the elemental nations. I know there could be war Sasuke said but he didn't say anything to add on that. This village hasn't been above doing cover-ups. You can always say that I was sent on an S-rank undercover mission to eliminate both Orochimaru and Itachi. I have done so if anyone asks, they could always be given those reasons no one can reject them. Sasuke could not have thought of something like this but it was something that Itachi suggested to him. And he knew he had struck a nerve when he told the Godame Hokage that he knew the village was capable of doing cover-ups. Tsunade didn't know about the Uchiha massacre, but she certainly knew of many things the Hidden Leaf has done to preserve its interest and position. Tsunade stared at the Uchiha. He certainly hasn't lost his arrogance. The clan heads were not going to simply stay silent about the Uchiha's return and if he was allowed back into society just like that. 
this was all a problem. The cover-up wasn't a bad plan. She would devise it anyhow. It worked better now that he had returned on his own. They had still planned on using him even after forcing him to return to the village. So you think because there might be war, we might be willing to take you back just like that? Maybe not, but my power is needed. Sasuke didn't need to say anything about that. There was no need. She got the message. I have also given you a way to cover it up. If you feel that you need to do something about my actions, you can do it. I don't have a problem with that. I will consider it, why did you suddenly return? There were certain developments that occurred. That aside, the only reason I had left the village was because I wanted more power to eliminate Itachi. I ended up killing Orochimaru who invaded the village and then Itachi. Sasuke stated in a calm tone. I have done all that, now I must revive my clan. Where is proof that you eliminated Orochimaru and Itachi? I can show you Sasuke offered. Genjutsu. Tsunade asked with a raised eyebrow. The slug princess shook her head. I want something tangible. When you go to collect a bounty, you need the head to prove that you indeed did eliminate the person. Sasuke frowned. Orochimaru is sealed away. When he attempted to take over my body, I ended up absorbing him instead. During my fight with Itachi, I was losing and weakened, he managed to get out and but was sealed away. After I eliminated Itachi, I was so worn out, I passed out and when I woke up, his body was missing. Then how certain are you that he did die? I'm certain Sasuke responded in a firm tone. It hadn't happened exactly as he had said but it was indeed true that Itachi's body had vanished. He just would not say that he had a conversation with Itachi that would raise suspicions. Tsunade stared for a moment before sighing. You won't cause a fuss if they take you away to answer some questions, no? After that, you will remain confined in the Uchiha compound until I decide how to handle this issue. Tsunade said. She didn't wait for the Uchiha to respond before ordering the Umbu to take him away. With them gone, there was nothing but silence in the office. Jiraiya would be returning soon. He had said he would return to the village soon after talking to his former students. If that was the case, then she wouldn't have to wait for too long for his return. She needed to hear his thoughts about this development. Even though she had a problem with his attitude, Tsunade could not deny the benefit of having him in her ranks. But she still needed to do something about what he did. The guard saw him at the gates, it was likely that news of his return was going to spread through the village and she would be having a headache. How was Naruto even going to react to this development? Tsunade couldn't tell. The dynamics of Team 7 wouldn't work. Naruto wasn't a knave child. He didn't seem to forgive easily. Team 7 was dead. It wasn't going to happen even though Sasuke was back. Sakura would certainly cry over this, but she too had to grow. Life wasn't always pretty. Not everything was going to happen in the way you want them. Is something wrong, Tsunade-sama? Shizun asked standing in front of the Godame Hokage. Tsunade blinked. She hadn't even heard the woman walk into her office. Perhaps it was because she was used to the woman's presence. Sasuke just returned. Shizun stared. Just like that. Yes just like that Tsunade said. I'm certain that something happened but I just can't put my finger on it. Either way, it doesn't matter much. He is back and we have to find a way to deal with scenario that is presented by his untimely return. Training Ground 44 Naruto had spent many times in the Forest of Death. He had used this place for training purposes to train his senses, reflexes, and the ability to hide his chakra signature. For the animals with a keen sense of smell, it was difficult to hide from them because even if you hide your chakra signature, they could always track of scent. There were shinobi who were also very good at this. It was a useful ability when it came to tracking down shinobi. The forest was eerily silent, but it had great silence. There were no humans around. There was peace, the danger of nature, the life of nature. Everything that nature had to offer was here life and death. Preys and predators dominated this land and trees seemed to thrive within the soil that gave them life. He was standing still, left hand holding a single hand seal with his eyes closed. 
The wind around him was twisting in a small tornado it was a gentle twist that didn't cause any harm. He was trying to create a defensive jutsu that could help him defend against attacks he would not otherwise be able to dodge. There were those jutsus that were too fast. But you needed to be able to summon an attack in the blink of an eye to defend yourself. Could he though, cause the wind around him to twist in the blink of an eye? It hadn't proved possible, but he was thinking of just twisting around to give the wind a push. The wind around Naruto dispersed as he sensed a presence within the trees. Naoki, he said without looking at the redhead sitting on a tree branch. Have you brought what I requested? Hi, the redhead said before throwing a scroll towards Naruto. The blonde caught it with his right hand. When can we expect to mourn your death? Soon, Naruto said. I will contact you with instructions. I have already tested the seals on my body, so we shouldn't fear anything going wrong. It is unlikely since I have studied their skills and realized that no one can be able to do anything. However, in case a miracle happens, you must be ready to do what needs to be done. We will be ready Naoki said. Should I keep with observations or go back? Do as you like. But when I summon you, you cannot fail to appear before me. As you wish Naoki said. One more thing, organize for some enemy shinobi to attack me. It should be a good cover up. It will be done, Naoki said before disappearing. Naruto sat down and opened the scroll he had been given. The following day. Seeing Sasuke at his place, Danzo couldn't help but frown deeply. He wanted to say that he was unconcerned by the sudden appearance at his hideout but he was honestly concerned. This hideout was a secret, how did someone like Sasuke know about it? He could understand with Jiraiya. Even the Umbu knew of this place but Sasuke had been a naive emotional child when he left the village. He shouldn't know anything unless Orochimaru said things that shouldn't have been said. Danzo cursed himself for not keeping contact with the San Nin. Then again, the snake hadn't been completely pleased with him. Either way, he had this brat to deal with. It was good that Sasuke had returned to the village. He was needed. The Sharingan was needed to protect the hidden leaf. There was war coming and for Kanoha to win and conquer other nations it needed all tools it could use. It was curious why the Uchiha suddenly returned but Danzo wasn't really interested in all that, he was even now thinking of how he was going to use Sasuke for his purposes. He could use the Uchiha for balance when it came to the Kyubi. If Sasuke has learned to control his Sharingan just as Itachi had then there was no doubt that he could manipulate even Naruto. The blonde was a risk to the village as things stood and he couldn't be trusted but a little bit of push and he would become a loyal weapon for the hidden leaf. I wasn't sure it was true when I heard you have returned, Sasuke. Danzo said calmly. Have you come to join my side? Sasuke stared at the warhawk with nothing but pure contempt. If Danzo was someone else, he would have been on his knees apologizing with the kind of look that Sasuke was giving him. He really wanted to eliminate the man. He hated him. Every fiber of his being was screaming for him to crush the man or just burn him alive with the flames of Amaterasu. But Sasuke wouldn't do anything hasty. He would wait and do it slowly just so this man could experience pain and loss. Don't be ridiculous, Sasuke said in a cold tone. The only time I am going to join you is when I die. But you are going to go a bit too soon. But I will join you soon enough. I just have things I need to do in this world. Hmm. Danzo stared with narrowed eyes. Is that a threat? Yes Sasuke said with a firm nod. I am going to eliminate you. And I will do it very slowly. Today, I just came to inform you that I will eliminate you and there won't be anything you can do about it. Before I do anything, you must be removed from the face of this world. Danzo could clearly sense the hate and contempt. Itachi could not have told this person what happened, could he? Danzo had trusted Itachi. He never thought that the Uchiha would actually betray him by doing something like that. Why must I be eliminated? I know you ordered my brother to eliminate everyone, I know you pushed my clan away from the village. I know everything and you are going to pay for it. He activated the Mangekyo Sharingan. I cannot forgive you for what you did. If the leaf itself was responsible, I would turn against it, but it is you who gave the order and those two old people supported you. You will all die by my hand. 
I really didn't think that Itachi would tell Danzo said calmly. But if you know, you understand that it isn't something that must become public. I know that very well Sasuke said firmly. But it doesn't mean you will get a stay of execution. If you know, then you know why Itachi did what he did. Are you going to against the wishes of your brother? I told him to eliminate you but he wouldn't listen and even went on to threaten me if something happened to you. I relented but I see I should have done it myself, Danzo said. He did note the Mangekyo Sharingan, this just meant that the Uchiha had become much stronger which was good. But not that he was being threatened. Of course, Danzo didn't think that Sasuke could do anything. He was just a brat. Amaterasu, Sasuke said as the man who was standing on Danzo's right hand burst into black flames. Danzo wasn't even moved by the screaming shinobi. The flames of Amaterasu there was nothing that could be done. So, this child was serious about threatening him. He couldn't tell Tsunade about it. If he did, it would raise the risk of the woman knowing about the Uchiha massacre. If she did know about it, she was probably going to support his death. Danzo looked away from his shinobi and faced Sasuke. You are walking a very dangerous path. Sasuke shrugged his shoulders before turning away from the war hawk. We will meet soon again. He said before walking away. Danzo-sama. Danzo glanced at the man calling his name before staring at the spot Sasuke had just been standing. Now he also had Sasuke to deal with. And he thought Naruto had been a problem that needed his utmost attention. He would have been pleased if the blonde had taken his offer and gone off to Yuzushio on his spying mission. But that had been rejected. Even so, Danzo wasn't concerned much about it the fact was that their Jinchuriki wasn't loyal to the leaf and the last Uchiha seemed to have ulterior motives. They could both be very useful but instead, they are turning out to be problems that he needed to solve. Sasuke could die, and he could take the Mangekyo. He could always remove the Kyubi from Naruto and seal it into someone else before training them. He could implement a strategy that would make Kyumo and Iwagikyur fight. Tsunade could still give him Sasuke and he could work on something with the Uchiha. It would be much simpler to handle the Uchiha if Tsunade ended up giving him to him. He would need to go out to the Godame and solve it before something happens. He could not allow the Uchiha to keep coming at him. Days later, Tsunade's office. Jiraiya stepped into the office looking tired. It wasn't the journey to the rain that had him tired, it was the mental work that he had been forced to do after a hostile reception in the rain. They hadn't let him in the rain this time around. Actually, when he arrived, Nagato was already waiting for him and told him to go back without saying anything. He had been willing to fight him to get him to go away. Jiraiya hadn't been looking for a fight but when he tried forcing things, Nagato had returned the force and he had been forced to leave the rain with more questions than answers. It just made his visit to the nation all the more troubling. The situation with Nagato was of course very troubling. What the man did in the rain was cold-blooded and just brutal. How can anyone who is looking for peace do something as Nagato has done? He eliminated all those associated with Hanzo. It was just a slaughter of even innocent people. Jiraiya was at a loss that the students he had trained were capable of doing this. What was more frightening was the fact that Nagato had defeated Hanzo. The man was ridiculously strong and Nagato had supposedly destroyed him and then proceeded to eradicate anyone with connections to the man. It was looking likely that Nagato was going to cause nothing but destruction in the elemental nations. If that was so, Jiraiya was going to do everything in his power to stop Nagato. He still had Naruto in his corner, but there were still some concerns regarding the blonde. Even to this day, Jiraiya just could not figure out Naruto. But he wanted to trust him. He wanted to believe that there was good in Naruto and he would not be like Nagato. They were both Uzumaki and that was troubling given this current situation. You look troubled, Tsunade said to Jiraiya after he settled by the window and went silent without saying a word to her. Jiraiya was brought out of his thoughts by Tsunade's words. He glanced over to the busty blonde Hokage and then released a long breath. My travel to Amage Cure wasn't very fruitful. It has left me more worried than ever. I was thinking that perhaps things would be alright but the situation is very deadly. You didn't get anything. Jiraiya shook his head. They didn't even let me do anything. They were willing to fight me to death over it, Haim. 
I think something is brewing up in the rain. It can't be a coincidence that they have locked up their village while Yuzushio has done the same. Nagato is an Uzumaki and a very powerful shinobi. I really think that there is a connection between him and Yuzushio Gakure. If there is a connection there, then we really have to start questioning their intentions. Tsunade frowned upon hearing those words. She had already been told that Nagato had eliminated Hanzo and then went on to eliminate everyone with a connection to the man. This was indeed troubling news. Was Yuzushio going to follow the same destructive path? They'll probably deny connections if we ask. Or they just won't answer us. Their response to our attempts to form a line of communication was that they would respond when ready, and in your visit in AIM, you have been turned back. She sighed deeply. Something deep is happening, she said. Jiraiya nodded his head. I believe so and we have to do something, Haim. We simply just can't wait for Yuzushio to come back to us. I don't want to be the suspicious type but with what the toads told me, we have to be proactive. It will be best to look like we are suspicious people than allowing a disaster to come to us. Do you think Yuzu has the might to do anything dangerous? Tsunade asked with concern. Jiraiya shook his head. I don't really know, Haim. I don't know he said in a firm tone. However, we have to consider that they could be after revenge for what was done to them. We cannot ignore that they were invaded without having provoked any other nation. We must also consider the possibility that they might also turn to us as well. We didn't do anything. What were we supposed to do after their destruction, Jiraiya? I don't know, Haim, Jiraiya said in a bitter tone. But do you know what Naruto said to me? The Toad Sage looked thoughtful for a moment before speaking again. Why is it that even when Yuzushio and Kanoha were allies that none of the Uzumaki came here to seek refuge after their destruction? Tsunade frowned. This puzzles me. Kanoha's shinobi wear Yuzushio's symbol, Haim. Kushina was brought into this village just to be a Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. The relationship between Kanoha and Yuzushio was a deep one that was made with strong bonds. And yet when their village was destroyed, none of them came here. Kanoha did nothing but if they had come here, they would have been accepted and at that time, there was no village that would have dared try to invade us, Jiraiya said in a very serious tone. It is alarming and we really cannot ignore this. What must we do then, Jiraiya? What are we going to do about this? It does look like things are not going to settle any time soon, Tsunade said in an equally serious tone. At this point, she was truly glad that she had managed to get her shinobi to up their training in case something happens. Something looked like it was going to happen very soon. We need answers, Jiraiya said firmly. We need to get them from Yuzushio. I will be willing to force my way into the village to get answers. Now thinking about this, we shouldn't have been naive. Just think of the way the village dealt with Iwagakure's spies. They must have known that killing them and sending them back would only invite Iwa's anger, and yet they did it anyway. Tsunade was silent for a couple of moments. She had tried a diplomatic approach and she thought it was working. However, there were bigger concerns. Yet, they had nothing to prove their concerns. It was all just speculation. However, with how long they have lived, could they really ignore their instincts? Do you think Yuzushio will take kindly to that? It is actually their reaction to how things go when I visit that will determine their standing, Jiraiya said. We cannot overlook anything as things stand. Tsunade nodded her head. I will have to think of something in case there is a fallout, she said in thought. Before she could say anything more, Danzo entered the office. Tsunade groaned loudly at the presence. This was someone she didn't want to see now. What do you want, Danzo? She demanded. Danzo eyed Jiraiya for a moment before nearly frowning. He had this person to deal with in Sasuke. The Uchiha had just eliminated one of his agents just like that and in front of him. He would not forgive it. Shirsue's eyes could work on the Uchiha. It didn't matter if had the Sharingan or not, but Danzo really didn't want to waste the ability. Sasuke has returned to the village and you still haven't given him to me. Tsunade stared at the man for a moment. I don't think this is going to work, Danzo, she said. We had an agreement. We did. If I remember correctly, I said I would need to think about things once he returns. 
I'm still thinking and you are not helping yourself. That aside, things were different before we spoke. They have changed once more. Please leave I am having an important discussion with Jiriaya. Danzo stared at Tsunade with an immovable gaze. Was the woman really just dismissing him like that? He was here because he was concerned. Sasuke now posed a greater risk to everything that he has worked to gain and he simply could not tell this woman. The Uchiha massacre was a village secret and even if Tsunade was the Hokage, she didn't have to know. This was still embarrassing though. After everything he has swallowed to work with this woman, she was still going to treat him like this. Right there, he was thinking of using Shirsue's eye to manipulate her. It had never occurred to him that she would turn on him like this. What is so important? Danzo was forced to ask in a sharp tone. We had already spoken about this. And it is concerning that we discuss his loyalty given how he returned to the village. There are a couple of things regarding village security in future, but nothing you should concern yourself with. You probably won't live long enough to see it anyway, Tsunade responded with indifference. Danzo ignored the last comment. He was certainly not going to ask about what the woman meant by that. But it was going to be a race to see who would be alive then. It was either going to be her or him. If there is something that concerns village security I should be made aware. Tsunade stared at the war hawk. Who are you? Jiraiya almost laughed at the question but he held himself from doing so. He had been worried about how his former teammate was handling the sneaky cripple but it was apparent that there was no need to worry. She had everything under control. But of course, there were certain things that Jiraiya still had to sort out with her. But that would only come if Danzo does something that warrants his presence. For now, he could only watch. You seem to forget who you are speaking to, Tsunade. I have been serving Kanoha for many years now. He was cut off from finishing by Tsunade. And my grandfather founded this village along with the Uchiha. I don't understand what your point is and I really don't want to understand. Either way, I have already told you to leave and you should leave before I order my umbu to help you out. Tsunade said in a stern tone. Danzo stared for a long moment before turning away. He left the office without saying another word. Once he was gone, Jiraiya turned to the blonde Hokage. I didn't know Sasuke came back. In what way did he even come back? Saying this feels a bit weird since he actually ran away from the village he was speaking as if the Uchiha had just gone for some vacation with Orochimaru. A couple of days ago he returned just like that. He says he eliminated both Itachi and Orochimaru. When we asked for Itachi's head, he said it was stolen and I believe him he seemed rather incensed about it Tsunade said with a sigh. He hasn't been doing anything since he returned. I am still working on his cover. I have already drawn up things, I just need to speak to the clan heads once I have completed everything. I'm sure they won't be pleased since the lives of their children had been put at risk chasing after Sasuke Jiraiya said. Tsunade nodded with a thoughtful look on her face. She then seemed to shrug a bit carelessly. Either way, it's not their call to make the decisions and I was the one who sent them out on the mission. I hope it goes well, Jiraiya said. I will be in the village for the next days. But when I leave, I'm heading straight to Yuzushiogakure. We cannot rest without knowing anything about their intentions. Sanagakure. The heart was an uncontrollable thing that Tamari often found she wanted to strangle just to eliminate the emotions it made her feel. There were many things that occurred in this life, but you really could not control the human heart. It was always unpredictable. Sometimes it made you experience things you never thought you would feel. At least now, life wasn't so bad. She was actually happy with how things were progressing in the life and with her relationships. Tamari didn't care about fame and everything, right now she just wanted to support her brother in his work. With a war looking like it was going to occur, the village has been working hard to train its shinobi. It would have been difficult if they didn't have funding to make it in their journey but Gara had managed to get funding from the Wind Daimyo. Suna was able to prepare things smoothly. They were able to stock on the necessities. She was helping Jenins train along with other Jonins. It had been almost sad when no one picked her brother to be their sensei. But he had managed to secure himself students which he personally trained. They had been afraid of him at first. Perhaps her brother made things worse by his stoic mask. 
but they were used to it. They now spoke fondly of him because they spend time with him, they get time to hear him talk and actually listen to him. Most people who actually take the first step of trying to know her brother don't regret it. She was currently busy with her students when a shinobi came to her and told her that she was being requested by the Kazakage. She stopped the training. We can call it for the day. Tomorrow, same time she said to her students. We will stay around here for a little while longer. Temari didn't say anything to reject the idea. They always did that every now and then. She didn't always have time to give them her full attention but whenever she could, she would always see them. The blonde left her students after telling them not to take it too rough. She slowly walked towards the Kazakage Tower. It was busy with people coming in and out, up and down Shinobi coming in for their mission request. It hadn't always been like this, but with time, things do change. Gara was the Kazakage, and although some still didn't accept it, there had wrapped their hands around the idea that he was the Kage and would not be going anywhere. When she arrived in the office, he was just dismissing someone. She settled down calmly and watched for a moment. Is there something wrong? Gara looked at his sister for a moment before looking at the letter he had received from Tsunade. Naruto had returned to the leaf. He had always known that the blonde was returning but she had sent a message to confirm that he had indeed returned. Temari didn't know about it. But he had observed that she had grown quite close to him during his time in this village. She even spoke of him very fondly. He didn't know much about the matters of the heart, but Gara wasn't against his sister growing closer to Naruto. If there was going to be a relationship, he would approve of it. Then again, he had to find someone to marry his sister before the vultures in the wind capital make their move. Either way, he would not be pushing his sister to marry someone she didn't want to marry. Tsunade seemed to think that if the two were given a chance, something could happen since they have already connected. He knew his sister had spent time with that person. He didn't complain. She came back happy every day after spending time with him. Gara shook his head, clearing his thoughts. Nothing is wrong he said. But I need to send you to Kanoha. You can leave tomorrow morning he said. What is it? There is a scroll that must be delivered to the hidden leaf. The Godame Hokage will also give you something before you return. Gara said calmly. He praised himself for playing this well. He hadn't thought he would but he was doing it. Is it about the war that might not happen? Temari asked. She wasn't pleased at the idea of a war but if it happened, they would have to fight. Not only because they would have to offer support to the Hidden Leaf but for their own protection as well. There was no way that those villages would leave them alone if Kanoha was plundered. Gara nodded, but it was a lie. The scroll was empty but he knew Temari would never open it. We are trading intelligence. Our village is small and unlike the others, but we are still a great nation. If there is going to be war, we will have to play our part. Kiri doesn't look like it is going to take part in anything anyway. But at least both Iwagakure and Kumo are not doing anything as things stand. If they don't do anything, we can breathe Tamari said. Hopefully nothing happens. But when dealing with power-hungry people, you can never be too sure about anything. Yes, and we still don't know much about Yuzushiogakure Gara said with a shake of his head. Come back tomorrow morning for the scroll. I'm sure you need to make preparations on this side since you have a team to handle. Tamari was immediately on her feet. If I hurry up now, I will probably find them she said that and walked away. Once she was out of the office, Gara let out a long breath. He played that well. Now he would just have to wait and see what happens in the hidden leaf. Tsunade had already said Naruto would not be going anywhere, so there was no way she was going to miss him. Kanoha. The hidden leaf once more, Temari was finding the journey to be a bit constant these days. She was the one her village sent over here when there was something that needed to be discussed. Her usual partner in crime wasn't there to greet her today and so she had entered the village alone and went straight to the Hokage Tower. Once there, she found the blonde Hokage with her assistant. The woman smiled happily seeing her. You arrived sooner than expected, Tsunade said to Temari. I was a bit faster getting here I want to get back home as soon as possible, Temari responded as she handed the scroll Gara had given her to the Godame Hokage. She didn't sit down but remained standing, waiting to hear what the woman had to say. 
Gara didn't tell her anything, Tsunade realized. He hadn't told her that Naruto was back in the village and that she was simply being sent to see him to see if something would click as it did before. She smiled. Perhaps it was better that way. I won't keep you for long. You can leave any time you want but there is someone who I think you'd want to see before leaving. Temari was curious. Who? Naruto. Temari stared at the Godame Hokage for a long moment. Naruto was back in the village. Temari was surprised. She wasn't expecting this to happen. She certainly thought he had yet to return. Gara hadn't said anything, but surely he knew that Naruto had returned and certainly kept it from her. Was this some ploy to get her to meet the blonde? It was something else though. She could question but she was a little excited that Naruto was back. She would nevertheless demand answers from Gara when she goes back. When did he return? About two weeks ago, Tsunade said. He is currently at his apartment. I can get someone to show you. Temari smiled. That is fine, she said. There was a sign of danger a demon inside. It was a horrible. Temari felt sick seeing the sign. Someone had obviously put it there. These people had no shame, didn't they? She felt like ripping it off in anger but she did not. It was a huge struggle but she managed to rein on her emotions. Sickened and mad as she was, she managed to calm her feelings. It was still a cruel joke though. How do you put something like this on someone's door? Did Naruto see this thing every day when he opens and closes the door? What was he feeling? What did he think about this? Tamari couldn't put herself in his shoes. She could not. She steeled herself and chose to knock on the side of the door where the sign did not touch. She knocked twice, there was no immediate answer. But Tsunade had told her that Naruto was home. He was in this hell hole of an apartment. How do you even put the son of the man who you hail as your greatest Okage in a place like this? Temari shook her head. She was allowing her emotions to run wild. But it just could not be helped. She could understand things with Gara, But not with Naruto. He had looked so lively when he visited the sand. He was a happy person. But it was no wonder he never talked about Kanoha unless you brought it up. Even if the outside world was filled with strangers, he must have felt that it was better than being in a place like this. When the door slowly opened, Tamari's heart skipped a beat. She had known she was coming to see Naruto. But it has been months of complex emotions and troubling questions. But now that she was standing here on his door, slowly opening, she felt unsure. When the door fully opened, he was standing there with a blank look on his face. Upon recognizing her, it slowly changed into a smile. Temari had counted the seconds that went by when his smile took place. Hey Temari greeted a bit awkwardly. Naruto tilted his head to the side, still smiling. He was honestly surprised to see her here. This was his den. He wasn't even expecting to see her in Kanoha during his short stay. But she was here and he couldn't disappear into thin air. It was perhaps either Tsunade or Gara who made it possible for her to make the trip to the village a setup with some political intentions that neither would openly admit even when asked. Temari Naruto said. That awkwardness this isn't the first time you are seeing me I am not like a lover you finally found after years of searching he paused. Or am I? Temari smiled. She was now at ease. Just those simple words from him and her heart was beating calmly. She missed this kind of person. In your dreams, she said a bit sharply. Naruto put on a hurt look. Now that is sad he said with disappointment. I was thinking that perhaps when you heard I'd returned, you ran all the way just to see dear old me he finished with a wide smile. Temari snorted. Yeah right she said. But at least it would show I didn't forget about you. You certainly seem to have forgotten. How could I? Naruto said shaking his head. There have just been issues to handle. I have got limited time. There was a bit of seriousness in his tone. It was curious. It made Tamari pause just to study his expression. But she got nothing and so she brushed her thoughts to the side. Are you going to let me in? She asked. Naruto blinked. I forgot I don't get visitors he said stepping out of the way for Tamari to enter. 
You must close your eyes it is rather messy inside. I doubt that Tamari said. She didn't move deeper as she waited to hear the sound of the door closing. Naruto walked up to her and led her to the neat sitting room. She looked around he said it was messy, but it was not. The place was well kept. It was small, but still nice. The door to the bedroom was slightly open, her eyes narrowed as she tried to peek inside. I can give you a tour if you like, Naruto said with a smile, seeing Tamari's eyes. Realizing she'd been caught getting too curious, Tamari shut her thoughts for a moment before responding. No thanks, she said. So, this is your place she simply said that because she didn't know what else to say to him. She had thought she would have many things to say after he abandoned her but now that he was before her, she really didn't know what she could say to him. Naruto nodded his head but didn't say anything. Not until he was done studying the blonde. This is my place want to move in with me. As you can see, I live alone it can get rather lonely here he said with a smile, arms open wide, inviting the woman. It feels like you are inviting me to your arms Tamari said. She still smiled slightly. That sign on the door she really couldn't get it off her head. Oh, that danger sign, Naruto responded in thought. It was put when I was five, I think. For as long as I have lived in here, it has always been there. I never really bothered taking it out. Perhaps I keep it for sentimental value. It reminds me of where I come from things like that. Tamari smiled sadly. You really had it rough, huh? She said. Would you have a problem sharing it with me? Your past I mean. The following day. Naruto was strolling through the Hokage Tower, hands inside his pockets the fifth Hokage wanted to see him. He could make a few guesses on why she wanted to see him, but he wasn't going to think too hard about it. Nothing much of what was going to happen while he was in the hidden leaf would have much of relevance anyway. But being Carlos wouldn't win him any awards and would certainly make the coming days a bit difficult. He wasn't doing anything life was at ease. He was content with this as it gave him much time to plan things ahead of time. He could also fool around, perhaps now that the situation allowed him to do so. Nevertheless, nothing stupid had to be done. He didn't want to risk things. Sasuke's return in the village was unexpected but it really didn't change anything. But he was a bit concerned by what Danzo would be doing. He had to keep an eye on things before the man does troubling things. Naruto certainly didn't want a situation where he had to fight the war hawk. He didn't want any trouble with anyone. If things remained the way they are now, he wouldn't complain about anything he would die with a blast and a huge smile on his lips. Naruto's footsteps came to a halt when he saw someone coming along the way. He smiled at the woman Kanoha's Genjutsu master, Kurina Yuhi a rather delightful woman with mesmerizing eyes. Maybe Jiraiya was right when he said that he liked older women. Either way, what was beautiful could not be ignored. Perhaps the maturity of the older generation was what attracted him. The younger ones were certainly immature at times. But he had big dreams that not even Kanoha could contain. He shook his head slightly as he eyes stared at the woman with life in them. Kurinai sensei, he started a bit happily, a charming smile on his lips. That smile it wasn't a normal smile. It wasn't smile that he gave everyone. Kurinai didn't need to ask. She didn't need to guess anything. Her instincts told her as much. But she couldn't help but smile in return. There wasn't much difference from the boy she had seen months ago at Tanzaku. Naruto, she said. There was nothing else to say, she wasn't familiar with him. You have a unique frame that really compels one's eyes to stare at you, Naruto said in a quiet tone. You should have been my sensei. Perhaps it isn't too late. You could teach me a couple of things the words slipped out smoothly. Kurinai blinked she was caught off guard by his words. She was certainly not expecting him to say something like that. He hadn't said much last time around but just smiled at her. He wasn't looking at her like a pervert. Those were the eyes that just admired her. If there was a hint of perverted thoughts, she would have smacked him she had no time to waste for perverted brats. He wasn't much of a brat was he? He was all grown a handsome young man and he had a beautiful smile. Perhaps Anko wasn't exaggerating when she said he was a charming young man. Um, thank you, she said. I don't think there is anything I can teach you. 
You did train under a Sanmin and one of Kanoha's finest shinobi. Naruto tilted his head to the side and raised his index finger before wagging it slowly in front of his face. There are some things that not even Jiraiya can teach. Only you can do it better he said. What? Kurinai's response came a bit quickly than she would have liked. Naruto just smiled, Genjutsu, he said. I hear you used to rival even a famed Genjutsu user such as Itachi. No one matches your skills in Genjutsu in this village, no. I have traveled to many lands, been to almost all of the great nations and I haven't come across anyone who is said to be a better Genjutsu user than you. So, yes, in that department, you are better than Jiraiya and you can teach me. Kurinai looked thoughtful for a moment. None of her students really knew her skills to be able to use them. She hadn't been thinking of training anyone in Genjutsu. Genjutsu is really difficult and only those with high levels of concentration and perfect chakra ko, the finger that had been moving in front of Naruto's face was on her lips. Kurinai took a step back. Naruto looked amused for a moment but held up both his hands. If I make time, you can tell me all that in a training ground, Kurinai sensei he said before walking past the Genjutsu mistress. Kurinai twirled around to stare at the blonde with a blank expression on her face. What had just happened, she wondered. Naruto shook his head after walking past the Genjutsu mistress. He wasn't going to actually go to her to train. Perhaps if he had time in the village then he would learn from her just to get closer to her. He really shouldn't be doing this when Tamari was in the village though. She was going to smack her fan on his forehead if she found out he behaved in the same way he did when he was with other people. Well, it was no matter. Tsunade wasn't alone in the office she had the delightful Shizun with her. Naruto smiled towards the woman before turning to the Godame Hokage. You wish to see me, Bachan, he said before making himself comfortable on the chair in front of the Godame's desk. Tsunade stared for a moment before shaking her head. She wanted to be mad at him calling her an old hag, but there were more important matters to deal with than that. Jiraiya wouldn't be leaving soon, so they had things to do discuss before he even leaves the village. Naruto would have to take a role as another Uzumaki who was very much in the picture. We have to discuss important things. I understand you didn't want to do anything with regards to Yuzushio, but we don't have that luxury anymore. Naruto raised an eyebrow there was definitely something that happened. Last time the Yuzushio issue had been resolved. Perhaps not forming any ideas when he came here had been a good idea. This way, he was expecting anything and he didn't show his surprise. If she was saying that he no longer had the luxury to decide against stepping into the fray, it just meant that she was going to force him to do things he didn't want to do. Jiraiya must have returned with a worrying message from Amage Kure. He knew the perverted Sanmin had returned to the village but hadn't bothered trying to seek him out. If something had indeed happened in Amage Kure that has made these people worried, it would naturally complicate things. But it was best since he was on the side. He could do damage control. He was very much curious about what had brought this change though. He wanted to do know what Jiraiya came back from aim with Sasuke had nothing to do with this. Yes, the Uchiha was irrelevant in the picture. What is that supposed to mean? Naruto asked carefully, he managed to sound a little indifferent as he spoke. I was certain that we had already resolved this issue. He said. Tsunade nodded her head. We had but Jiraiya came back with troubling information. We can no longer ignore whatever it is that your clan is planning to do. We have to know. If there is trouble brewing, we have to be ready for it. If they want to start another war, we will have to try to talk them out of it. But it doesn't appear that they will listen to us. You are one of them you should be able to get through to them. What makes you think that my words would have much power to do anything? Tsunade shrugged a bit carelessly. Like I said, you are one of them. This is another approach that we are trying. We don't want to forceful about things but we want to know everything. Jiraiya thinks that Aim and Yuzushio are connected and he is concerned about Nagato's actions as well as the former village's intentions which have remained curious even now. If they refuse to even tell you anything, Jiraiya can use any means. Naruto was silent, thinking. Ah, so things have come to this. Well, it was to be expected of Jiraiya to have thought this much. Perhaps it was the prophecy from the toads that made him conclude that Amage Kure and Yuzushio were connected. 
There was still no proof of it however. If the Toad Sage ends up forcing things with the whirlpools, it was going to be a bit troublesome. There would have to be something prepared for that case. So you are concerned about Yuzushio's intentions, Naruto said calmly. Well that is to be expected he finished in thought. Tsunade stared at Naruto with a hardened gaze. She studied his body language and expression to see if she could get something there was nothing. She couldn't even guess what was on his mind. She couldn't tell if he was wearing a mask or not. He was just there before her, completely looking like he had no thoughts inside of his head. It was frustrating and frightening. I'm saying that if things end up going in another direction, you won't be allowed to fight for your clan Naruto. I know I had said that if your clan is attacked, I would allow you to defend them even if Kanoha wouldn't be able to do anything. However, things have changed. If Yuzushio provokes a reaction from any other great nation, you can't do anything. Kanoha will not lose you either. The message was very clear to Naruto. They wouldn't allow him to leave, even if he was quitting being a shinobi of Kanoha. They would be willing to tie him down just to ensure that he didn't go anywhere troublesome people. But he had known that Kanoha would never let go of Uzumaki Naruto, not the Kyubi's Jinchuriki. He had accounted for everything. Well, I am still a shinobi of the Hidden Leaf, I must do as ordered. Tsunade frowned deeply. She hated the indifference in his tone. She hated his lack of emotion in her words. He was supposed to be mad, but he was not. Perhaps he was, she just couldn't tell. His expression hadn't even changed much after she told him the hard truth. The only thing that came was a thoughtful look and then the indifference. This is a serious matter, Naruto. I want to know, do you love your clan? Of course I do, Naruto responded calmly. Uzumaki was the only thing I had when growing up. People from this village called me the Kyubi brat and everything else that made me look like a demon. Uzumaki gave me an identity I was able to escape the miserable existence that I had been forced to live in this village because the old man told me about the clan and my mother. So without a shred of doubt, I do love my clan. Then why are you still here, Naruto? Why have you not gone to Yuzushiogakure? Why have you not expressed any desire to leave the village to join your home? Tsunade demanded from Naruto in a stern tone. If I had said those words, what do you think would have happened? Naruto asked in a calm tone. You would have never allowed me to leave for the training trip. I would have a squad of Umbu watching over me day and night. I really can't have that, Tsunade-sama. It is already frustrating that I had people watching me when I was younger, I don't need the look of suspicion to having my every movement analyzed and questioned. Tsunade stared at him she was happy he had finally said it. He had admitted he did love his clan. So, now there was a clear motive. If you had to choose between Kanoha and the Whirlpools, what would you choose? That is a tricky question and no answer will satisfy you, Naruto responded with a shrug. If I tell you that I would choose Kanoha, you'd question things and always look at me with suspicion because perhaps it wouldn't make sense. If I choose Yuzushio, you are never going to allow me to leave this village, even for a mission. Even as things are now, you can't leave the village, Tsunade said in a hardened tone. There will always be suspicion but I still need you to answer my question. I refuse to answer trick questions, Naruto said calmly. You have all the answers you need. My words mean nothing. Tsunade shook her head. I care for you, Naruto. I want your word, because I want to trust you. It is important that you tell me your thoughts regarding this matter. My thoughts are irrelevant and whether you care for me or not really doesn't matter. If it comes down to it, when you have to choose, this village you lead will always take the first position. That is your duty as Hokage. It might sound cold, but it is the truth and I have accepted it, Naruto said. I told you I love my clan but if Yuzushio attracts trouble, Kanoha will not help and I will not be allowed to do anything. I have heard you. I don't need to comment. Silence greeted his words. The slug princess was silent for a long minute. She wondered if she had done things correctly. Perhaps not, but she still had to do what was best for both Naruto and Kanoha. Yuzu didn't come into factor when dealing with these things. I really hope you don't come to hate me for this, Naruto. Tsunade said in a quiet tone. There is really nothing for you to worry about, 
Naruto said with a wave of his right hand. Tsunade shook her head. She had a sad smile on her lips. When we first discussed this, I was trying to remain hopeful, thinking that perhaps Yuzushio didn't have bad intentions. But if they do, we can't associate ourselves with them she sighed, and kept her sad smile. I really hope you understand my position, she said. Naruto nodded his head. I understand, he said. Tsunade welcomed those words, but she still wanted him to say some angry words. Now that she thought about it, had she ever seen him angry? He was always calm through anything. His mask never faltered and he never gave anything away. She frowned at those thoughts. She shook her head and thought of something else there was nothing. That is all I wanted to talk to you about, she said. About two hours later. Sasuke was surrounded by a handful of corpses from Danzo's forces. He had waited until Danzo was gone from the hideout before sneaking into the place to set the alarm. They were weak shinobi who couldn't do much to him. He had cut through them without wasting time. The power of the Mangekyo Sharingan was just something else. He was enjoying using the eyes that his brother allowed him to gain. This was the kind of power that snakes like Orochimaru thought they could gain for themselves. Pitiful and they were not even Uchiha. He was currently waiting for Danzo, knowing that the War Hawk would make an appearance any time soon. He had let one slip past him to call forth the master. He wanted to show Danzo that he wasn't afraid of him. He wouldn't do anything quickly. He would allow things to go smoothly and enough to force Danzo to make a hasty decision that would leave him in a troublesome situation. If Danzo attempted to attack him, Sasuke wouldn't mind turning his weapons towards the War Hawk. Anything troubling would likely cause the attention of the village's Umbu to turn to this place. Sasuke wasn't afraid of it. Sasuke activated the rib cage part of his Susano as he sensed Danzo's presence behind him. He turned around to face the cripple with a cold look on his face. I have been waiting for you, Danzo. Danzo was incensed, he was furious he wanted to snap the neck of the Uchiha at this moment. This was unacceptable. He could not accept this. Many of his forces were down. Judging from the numbers, the Uchiha had cut down nearly three quarters of his men. It was a disaster. He wouldn't have any men to do his work now. If he had the QB in his possession, it wouldn't matter, but he didn't have the QB in Sasuke was killing his people. It was unacceptable. Tsunade was even making things difficult for him on the other side. Nothing was going according to plan. The War Hawk couldn't resist glaring at those cursed eyes. He had already known that Sasuke had the Mangekyo Sharingan. But he didn't want to fight him here. He could win in a fight against Sasuke but it couldn't be in the village when there was the danger of the battle being discovered by someone else. It would be disastrous if he unlocked his secrets and Tsunade showed up with her umbu. With Jiraiya even on his case and still in the village, it would certainly be the end of him. Still, he hadn't thought that the Uchiha would go this far though. This was a desperate time. He had to get the Uchiha out of the village and into a corner so that he can do the dirty work himself. If he was successful, he would end up gaining control of the Uchiha using Shirsue's eye. You have gone too far, Sasuke. Danzo stated in a cold tone. I dismissed your intentions and didn't think you'd do this, but it is apparent that I was wrong. If you have a problem, you are free to attack me, Danzo. Sasuke responded with his hands held out wide. For a good reason, he was almost certain that the man would not be too keen to fight him and not because he was thinking that he couldn't defeat him but because there were other ways he thought he could handle the situation. Danzo frowned. I don't want to end up killing such a valuable asset for Kanoha when there is a war that is coming. You could prove to be a decisive matter in the coming battles Danzo said calmly. Certainly, even if Kyomo and Iwagakura attacked Kanoha, he would have the Uchiha manipulate all their Jinchuriki with his Sharingan. In return, he would be in possession of four Jinchurikis, the Kyubi excluded. Kanoha would destroy both Kyomo and Iwa and he would take their bijus and seal them into his own people he could trust. He certainly couldn't keep the Jinchurikis who were under the control of someone else, even if he was in control of that person. But those plans were being threatened. If he had to choose between himself and Sasuke, the Uchiha would have to die. It was very simple. You sound certain that there is a war coming, Sasuke said. Are you planning on making one happen? 
I don't have to do anything to make a war happen. Yuzushio Gakure just has to continue existing and a war will happen. I am quite certain that their plans are not pure either, Danzo responded calmly. You should cease with these actions because they only threaten Kanoha's safety. Kyumo and IWA could both be attacking us in the direction Tsunade is taking us. Your shinobi are worthless Sasuke said with a shrug. They can't win Kanoha any battle except for doing treacherous things. I think it is much better for Kanoha if are not alive when there is a war he said. You have already mentioned this, Danzo said. He looked around. At least the Uchiha wasn't going to attack him. It was good. It would give him the chance to move things in motion. He certainly couldn't allow this brat to do as he pleases while he just watches. Does Tsunade know about this? I'm quite certain she wouldn't be pleased if she knew. Sasuke smirked. What makes you think she doesn't know? He asked calmly. With everything that you have done, do you think she would be happy having you behind her when going to war? There is no guarantee that you wouldn't try to eliminate her to take the Hokage seat for yourself. And about that, as long as I am in this village, you can continue dreaming about being Hokage, but you won't get it. After saying those words, Sasuke walked towards Danzo. He halted a couple of feet away and watched the war hawk respond. I see, you have thought through things. Sasuke snorted. Did this fool think that he would just attack him without tying loose ends? He wasn't known for being stupid. Perhaps he did allow his emotions to get the best of him but this was his revenge, he would get it without interruptions and he wouldn't do anything stupid to mess it up. The next time we meet, it shall be your end. You can start preparing for your death, after saying that, the Susano dispersed and Sasuke blurred away. Danzo stood motionlessly for a couple of moments while thinking about what to do. He certainly couldn't allow IWA or Kumo to focus on Kanoha now. He wasn't ready for that battle. And as things look now, he would have to make a haste departure from the village. Fu, Danzo called out. Hi, Danzo-sama, the man kneeled before his master. Get me those two IWA people, he ordered sternly. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. He couldn't do things any other way now. Besides, this was the only way he was ever going to get Kumo and Iwagakure to focus on each other rather than have them turn on the leaf. Right away, Danzo-sama, Fu responded before going away. Minutes later, Fu returned with two shinobi from Iwagakure. He had already used Shirsue's eye on them. He just had to release them to do what they had to do. Naturally, they wouldn't be able to say anything about him. You two will assassinate the Yandame Rakage. You will rendezvous with someone once you reach the cloud. They will show you the way. Iwagakure needs this to be done quickly. Hi. Lead them out, Fu Danzo said. We don't want them getting caught. Fu nodded and did as asked. Do you think they will succeed, Danzo-sama? Ino asked. Danzo shook his head they were weak. They couldn't eliminate someone as powerful as A. But then again, you didn't need to be all that powerful to assassinate someone. You just had to be perfect in the art and you would get your target man. It doesn't matter if they succeed or not. What we want done is to have Kyumo and Iwagakure fighting each other. Naruto clapped his hands together, appearing out of nowhere. Bravo, Danzo, he said with a smile. In this way, Kumo and Iwagakure get to fight it all out while you rest easy and prepare things on your part. It will be difficult for the Rakage to believe anything from Anoki because they are indeed IWA shinobi. Anoki might deny it but the fact is that his shinobi would have tried to eliminate the Rakage. Bravo brilliantly done. It is also unlikely that Kumo and IWA will even fight to fight each other but trusting each other will also be difficult. After saying that, Naruto turned into a cloud of smoke. Kage Bunshin, Danzo said with a frown. Should we go after him? Ino said. Danzo shook his head. He isn't going to do anything about it. But this simply confirms that he cannot be trusted. It works both ways anyway. If Kumo and IWA are busy fighting each other, they won't have time to focus on Yuzushio. This does clear the way for us to move without interruption. The War Hawk said. Prepare for our departure. Burn everything that needs to be burnt. We will step away from Kanoha for a while. 
Naruto could only shake his head after taking in the memories of his clone. Danzo was truly a crafty old man. He knew what had to be done and what he had to do. It was also filled with the thirst for survival and his fanatical love for Konoha. Naruto would not say anything to anyone. Not even to Tsunade or Jiraiya. Of course, if they knew, they would most likely take action against the War Hawk. They wouldn't openly admit to any of the hidden villages that it was one of their shinobi who plotted the madness. It would only invite Iwa's wrath and Kyomo's anger. Certainly, the hidden cloud would take advantage of the situation and make absurd demands. It wouldn't even surprise Naruto if the Rakage demanded that he be given the Kyuubi's Jinchuriki or else he goes to war. IWA would certainly try to stop that. They wouldn't want the cloud to gain another Jinchuriki. But it was unlikely that the villages would fight. Either way, Kanoha would be in a difficult spot if Tsunade admitted to Danzo's plot. Well, that was what you get for keeping a mad man like him in your corner. He was always going to do something. Naruto wasn't concerned. It worked well for him after all. Sasuke's boldness in attacking Danzo was a little surprising but Naruto wasn't going to say anything to the Uchiha. He had played the ignorant part for a bit too long now. Perhaps it was good that the Uchiha had someone to take his anger out on. It might have proved to be something else if he didn't have someone to blame for the Uchiha massacre. Well, Naruto was happy either way. He wouldn't even need to do anything to get the conclusion he likes. He didn't even need to say anything but just watch the play unfold. That was something else. Naruto looked up for a moment. It was still noon but very soon, the sun would walk away. Time often moved quickly when there was a lot to do. Then again, humans were always fighting about time. The time was limited, so they had to use it wisely. He stood up from the Hokage monument and then jumped down, watching the faces of the past Kages and the present one all five of them. No thought went through his mind until he landed on the ground gracefully and then began to dive into the streets of the hidden leaf. The air was still contaminated with the hatred and contempt. Perhaps it was just his mind that was playing tricks on him. He could certainly walk around the village and there would be no one staring at him with contempt. Some tried to ignore his presence while some just watched. Naruto never really bothered to think deeply about it. He didn't like the people who have done nothing but torment him after all. Admittedly, he was now able to walk a bit freely. But he still held past deep within his heart. He had not forgotten and he would not forget. Naruto made his way towards Tamari's hotel room. The blonde was staying for a while but she would be leaving soon. With everything happening around the village, it was best that she leave soon and with capable shinobi to guard her. Danzo would certainly try to do something to her if he felt that he didn't have much of a choice in the matter. Upon arrival, Naruto knocked at the door and the older blonde opened the door. When she noticed it was him, she smiled and welcomed him into the place. Naruto stepped in silently and waited for Tamari to close the door behind her. When he didn't hear her footsteps after hearing the door close, Naruto turned around to face the woman she was leaning against the door. He smiled. Nervous, dear. He asked. Tamari breathed in and out before meeting Naruto's gaze. He had that small smile of his. He had told her things about his past. His experiences in this village. She felt like she knew him better now. Shaking her head, Tamari responded quietly. A little, she said. Naruto studied her expression for a moment before responding. This isn't the first time we are alone together he said. Maybe Tamari shrugged indifferently as she stepped away from the door. She walked past him went on to settle on the couch. I wasn't expecting to see you she said, her eyes watching him carefully as he beside her, directly facing her. Naruto shrugged. Our time together isn't that bad he said. I like it. Tamari smiled. I didn't think you'd admit that to me she said. He'd always close the door whenever things tried to get personal. Perhaps she shouldn't be surprised anymore since he had willingly told her of his story a truly sad story but what could she do other than smile and hope that things would be well? Well, there was the idea that she could speak to Gara and try to think of something. She wouldn't think of trying to take him out of Hidden Leaf. Tsunade would certainly be mad at them. He had saved her brother and she really did enjoy his presence. She liked him. 
and she wanted to do something for him that would make sure that his life was going well. Yet, she really didn't know what she could do. Why wouldn't I? Naruto asked. Tamari shook her head, and didn't answer his question. Do you like it better than those nights in the bar? I'm certain you haven't stopped with those tendencies of yours she said with a stare. Naruto was amused. Hey, you don't know how it feels like when you are in that place. Besides, it makes me envious of how other people can be careless and when I want to get lucky, I always go there he said with a wink. Tamari shook her head but she still smiled. I knew you were a pervert. You go there for the ladies she said. Naruto shook his head. I already told you I don't he said. But even if I do enjoy the atmosphere there, I really would prefer being with you. The peace that comes with being with you is honestly refreshing. Tamari stared at him. I find that hard to believe, she said in a hardened tone. You're mad that I just left you that day, isn't it? Naruto asked. And I didn't say anything to you afterwards. I didn't even write to you. Of course I am disappointed Tamari said. She had still kept that message he wrote for her. She had kept it and would mostly keep it forever. It was her precious message. She treasured it. It had been the only thing tangible she could hold and think of him. Those thoughts were ridiculous. When did things even come to this point? She hadn't thought that her emotions would drive her this much. But it could not be helped. It didn't even help with anyone now that she was thinking that her brother was trying to set her up with this person. It appears that Tsunade was on it as well. Perhaps for the latter it was for political reasons. But for her brother, it was definitely because he believed that Naruto could be good for her. She was honestly going to have a long talk with her brother about this matter. Naruto smiled at her before he shifted his gaze away from her. I was actually trying not to get too close to you. You know, I have my issues but when the heart is willing it is willing you really can't stop it. Tamari was silent. She wasn't expecting those words. Perhaps it was her confusion but she didn't understand them either. What? Naruto turned towards her, his smile was small but it was the most warming thing that Tamari had ever seen. It made her heart race and she held her hands together. I really think I like you. He said. Tamari stared at him. Her cheeks were painted by a shade of pink. She was flustered. Her confidence in speaking to him now gone. He just sounded so earnest it touched her. It made her feel warm inside. Who has ever told her such words with such honesty? And has her ever felt so excited and happy? Someone liked her and it was someone she too liked. But she didn't want to admit it. She couldn't. She didn't have confidence. What happened to all that bravado you had a moment ago when you were glaring me for abandoning you with just a note? Naruto asked in an amused tone. Tamari glared at him and picked up a cushion. She flung it towards him. Well forgive me for not being like you. She exclaimed, her hands folded across her bust. Naruto laughed. You should get used to it already he said. Perhaps this would come back to bite Tamari more than it would to him. But Naruto truly hoped that she would understand. He hoped that she would not be hurt. He didn't want to do anything, but he couldn't help himself. He suddenly stood up and took two steps towards Tamari. Both his knees spread wide as he put her in between and hovered above her. He could feel her breath. She was nervous, not afraid. He could also hear the sound of her heartbeat. It was perhaps her first time being in this situation. It was of course a bit frightening. She didn't say anything though. He smiled. Naruto leaned closer and placed both his hands around her waist. She flinched slightly but he stopped moving and offered her a reassuring smile. He still didn't say a word to her. She seemed to relax under his smile. His hand slipped through her shirt. She was tense but her body felt warm, her skin was soft. He moved closer to her face. Her hands which had been on her bust melted to the side. Her eyes were staring at him with mixture emotions. But beneath all those emotions, there was the excitement. She didn't hate him. She didn't want him to get off her. This wasn't wrong. And so, he brushed his lips against hers for a second before his tongue slipped out. He licked her lips for a moment. They were soft. 
he captured her lips and slowly started to kiss her. He watched her eyes close. And he followed her. As the gentle kiss deepened, her felt her tension ease, her hands moving up behind him. Naruto's hands slowly caressed the side of her chest as they moved up. They snaked between the clothing and touched her breasts. She stopped the kiss and broke away. She looked flustered, her breathing a bit heavy. She was watching him. Her eyes were searching for something. She searched for a whole minute of silence. Don't do anything you don't want to do Naruto said in a whisper. She nodded her head not once but twice. Naruto figured the first nod was in agreement with his words and the second was permission the permission to continue. He smiled he didn't want to force himself upon her. He didn't want to use other means to be united with her. She was perfect operating on her free will. He wanted her that way. Naruto took off his shirt and moved away from Tamari before helping her undress. He was sitting on her once more. She was truly flustered. Her hands pulled him closer. She was hugging him. There was enjoyable warmth. Perhaps she didn't want him to stare at her br asterisk asterisk sts. Naruto licked Tamari on the right side of her face while moving towards the mouth. Once more, he captured her lips. He did not devour her like a starved dog. He was gentle. And slowly her hold on him loosened. While still kissing her, Naruto's hands moved towards her br asterisk asterisk sts. He gently captured them both. Soft round comforts. They made him excited. He stopped kissing her and let go of her right boob. His tongue played around her ni asterisk asterisk low for a moment before he sucked it. Tamari let loose of a low moan. Naruto's right hand moved towards the space between Tamari's thighs. When his fingers reached at the entrance, she tensed slightly. He whispered something for her to relax and she did. And Naruto dies of happiness and the story ends. Chapter 13 Tamari stopped by the large village gate she already had her fan strapped behind her. The lonesome journey towards the sand loomed large. She had accomplished her mission of coming here, and perhaps gained more than what she had expected. She certainly hadn't thought she would end up seeing Naruto and let alone end up getting closer to him as she did. It was amazing just what a couple of days could achieve and you open yourself to someone. Perhaps it was a rare thing for Naruto to do, but Tamari had enjoyed him. She had enjoyed his comfort, every part of him. The thought made her blush. You're not thinking something naughty, are you? Naruto asked with a wide smile on his lips. Tamari shook her head she wasn't denying what Naruto had said but trying to clear her thoughts. You're not getting into my head, she said a bit quickly. I wasn't trying to, Naruto said. Just curious seeing you blush suddenly when absorbed in your thoughts. Tamari didn't indulge Naruto by responding to him. He was teasing her again, trying to make her feel flustered. She wasn't going to fall for it. She still needed to get used to this. The situation was still a bit confusing. She didn't know what she was going to call him. She didn't know if she was in a relationship with him. She couldn't tell and she didn't know how she could even bring up the subject with Naruto. You can't really leave with me. Tamari asked with emotion. You don't have to reach Suna, you know. She offered him a smile. She really did want to spend some more time with him. I can't, Naruto said with a shake of his head. I'm not allowed to leave this village. I'm currently a flight risk you see. Even now, I have got Umbu watching me he said. Tamari frowned. He hadn't said anything about this before. She hadn't even realized it. It had to do with the situation in Yuzushio. She really wished they had come to talk about it but there was not enough time. She had to go home. Doesn't that make you angry? You are being constantly watched. Naruto shook his head. Annoying yes, but angry? No Naruto responded in a calm tone. It is a bit true that I am a flight risk but that isn't the most important thing. I really wish I could travel with you but I'm tied to this village. Tamari nodded and went silent. She looked down for a moment before looking back at Naruto, cheeks with a shade of pink. WN will I be able to see you again? She said a bit too quickly. Naruto was amused by the way she spoke. It annoyed Tamari. 
she quickly got over her embarrassment and glared at him with a threatening look. Naruto laughed while holding up both his hands. I don't know, Tamari. But I will surely miss you. When I can, I will come to you if you can't come to me. We will talk then. I hope it isn't after many months like last time, Tamari said. Naruto smiled, but didn't offer a response. He pulled her into a hug and whispered into her ear. Have a safe journey, Tamari. Don't worry about anything along the way, although I won't be with you, someone will protect you along the way. Tamari stared at him curiously before asking. Was someone also watching me last time? Naruto just smiled and twirled the blonde around before pushing her away. I will be thinking about you when I visit the bar tonight he said with a laugh. When Tamari twisted around with a glare, he smiled. Just messing with you. She stared at him for a moment but really didn't seem to believe him even though she nodded. She turned away and waved her hand before walking away from the village gates. Naruto watched her leave before he turned away, hands inside his pockets. He hoped that Danzo didn't try anything. Perhaps he would be too preoccupied with his efforts to escape from the village to do anything. Then again, Sasuke had done a great number on his forces, so he was unlikely to do anything dangerous at this point. Looks like you're doing well, Jiraiya said as he appeared beside Naruto, his eyes facing the direction Tamari had disappeared off to. We need to talk, he said in a hardened tone. It sounds serious, Naruto responded in a calm tone, feeling the seriousness coming from the San Nin. The man almost never used such a tone when talking to him. He could use it but it was never really directed towards him. This was perhaps going to be troublesome. But Naruto didn't need to prepare for anything. He was always ready for anything. Besides, after that conversation with Tsunade, he was expecting things to get heated up. It is, Jiraiya said with a nod of his head. He placed his hand on Naruto's shoulder and they disappeared in S swirl of leaves. They appeared atop of the wall that surrounded the village. The Sanin sat down while casting a narrowed glance towards the silent Naruto, who was staring down at the village with a look of indifference. What is this about? Did you ever go to Yuzushio Gakura with the Sandane? Jiraiya asked, in the same tone he had been using when he started, his eyes were narrowed, never leaving Naruto. The blonde turned to face the Sanin with nothing but a raised eyebrow. That was about the only reaction he could give the Sanin. He had gone to Yuzushio with the Sandame Hokage but he wasn't going to tell that to Jiraiya. It was nevertheless something that this person wasn't supposed to know. Then again if he was asking, he didn't know anything but merely working on suspicions. I cannot answer that. Can't or won't. Doesn't matter either way, Naruto said with a shrug. There are a couple of things that I did with the old man and he told me never to tell anyone. Whatever you say or have in mind, I'm not going to answer that question if it's something that I told the old man that I would not tell anyone. The old man didn't tell his secrets, and he was going to do the same. It was only fair and perhaps it was now convenient. Jiraiya narrowed his eyes dangerously. I'll assume that you went to Yuzushiogakure, but what did you see in the village? Was it revived when you went there? He demanded answers from Naruto. I care for you Naruto and I don't want to suspect you of anything, but if you refuse to answer questions, this village will have no choice but to use force to get you to answer the questions. It is no longer just about you but the very security of this village is under threat. And that is where we draw the line, huh? Naruto said silently. Regardless of what you think or believe, I cannot answer that question, sensei. If you think using force is the only way you can get answers from me, you are free to do so. I won't fight you. I have no desire to do so. However, I still won't willingly give out any information. Jiraiya frowned. Even if that information could help us protect the hidden leaf. Protect it from what? Yuzushio Gakure. Naruto was silent for a moment. He suppressed the urge to snort. Yuzushio Gakure has no reason to threaten Konoha. Perhaps if you are assuming I am also a threat to Konoha, then I can understand. I do have all the reasons you can have to see the people of this village destroyed and suffering after what they put me through, he shook his head. But there is no such desire in me. I don't really like holding on to hatred. I am already miserable I'd rather not make things worse. Are you saying that Yuzu isn't a threat to Konoha? 
That isn't my conclusion to make, Naruto said calmly. What did you do when you got to Amigekure, Sensei? It appears that the wheels have suddenly come off just after you returned. I am curious. Nothing but I am worried that Nagato might bring destruction, Jiraiya said in a firm tone. At this stage, I can't tell what you will do and that worries me he paused. What did you say to him when we went to Amigekure? You had some time with him before I came to the tower with Conan. Naruto adopted a thoughtful look on his face before shrugging carelessly. Just greeted a fellow Uzumaki, but nothing much was said. Perhaps he may have said something about the fact that both of us were trained by you the blonde said. If you are not going to take me to Umbu Chambers to force information out of me, I have a date with Raman, Sensei. If you decide to come for me while there, just wait till I'm done eating. I would rather not have to fight over my spoiled meal. He jumped off the wall, leaving Jiraiya alone after saying those words. Jiraiya sighed. Well, he hadn't expected Naruto to leak anything. Even so, it hadn't gone exactly as he had imagined. Naruto was still impossible to read and his nonchalance about the whole issue made things worse. He was certain now that Naruto had gone to Yuzushio before. And he was perhaps familiar with the village. Even if he wasn't familiar with it, he had some connection with it. At this stage, if Nagato was connected to Yuzu, then it was possible that both Nagato and Naruto were familiar with each other and that represented a depressing possibility. What Naruto could do, then Nagato could do. Kumogakure. Yujito stepped into the Reikage's office with calmness about her but she was really nervous about why she was being called today. She was almost certain that it had nothing to do with a mission she recently did. This had to be something serious and it bothered her. It had hadn't been one of the messengers who came to her, but one of the Black Corps who came. It was usually something serious and she really hoped she wasn't in any serious trouble. She hadn't done anything wrong but in the shinobi world, you could never know. You wish to see me, Reikage sama Yujito said to A. The Yandame Reikage was sitting behind his desk with Mabui standing beside him. A nodded his head and looked up to her. Months ago, you had a sparring session with a certain Uzumaki, he said. Yujito nodded her head. She hadn't said anything about it because she hadn't felt it was important. She hadn't even been asked of it. She knew he was Uzumaki and the village seemed to have a problem with the Uzumaki but Naruto hadn't seemed like a bad person. He was actually a very delightful young man. Yes Naruto she said. You remember him well the Yandame Reikage noted with a stare. Well, he does leave an impression on you she said with a slight shrug of her shoulders. Besides, he is another Jinchuriki, so you really can't forget that. He wasn't like a normal shinobi who she could forget after meeting in battle. He had proved to be strong even, so he was someone to remember. A nodded. We have a problem with the Uzumaki clan and very soon, you might have to face him. Tell me about his skills he said. Yujito nodded her head and did so. I'm going to send Shinobi to bring him here, by force if necessary. If something happens, I can always put the blame on Kanoha. You will observe from a good distance along with C. It is likely that they will fail. When that happens, come report to me and I will make my demands to Kanoha. Regardless of what happens, you are not to interfere, is that understood? Hi, Reikage sama Hidden Leaf, Achiha Compound Sasuke's eyes flashed coldly when Naruto walked towards him in his little training ground. He hated the fact that the blonde could just walk into his compound just like that. The blonde was standing in front of him, an amused expression on his face. It did nothing but make him scowl and feel the urge to attack him, but he stopped remembering their last battle. Well, he wanted to test things now. He was not the same person as before, yet this was not the time he was preparing himself to face Danzo. What a nasty look, Naruto stated in a calm tone. Are you still angry that I chopped off your wings and we last met in battle? He asked with his head tilted to the side. Sasuke glared murderously, but Naruto's amusement only seemed to return. He clenched his fists and then responded. What do you want from me, Naruto? I have actually been watching you since you returned, Naruto said calmly. Your activities with Danzo it has been a curious thing to see. I guess Itachi could not completely wipe out that hatred within you. 
Regardless, I know that Danzo is planning to flee the village and you are going to attack him, with the blessing of Tsunade, of course, he said. Sasuke narrowed his eyes dangerously. How do you know that? Naruto merely shrugged indifferently. That isn't the important part. I already know you can't change it. What you should be asking me is why I am telling you this he said. When Sasuke just stared at him, he spoke again. I'm actually getting bored in this village, and so I am going to join you. You will fight Danzo and I will handle his remaining foundation forces. No, Sasuke said in a hardened tone. I don't want you anywhere near him. This is my fight, and I will not let you interfere, he said. You don't have a choice, Naruto said in a light tone, a complete contrast to Sasuke's. If you don't want me there, you can just disable me although, even with the Mangekyo Sharingan, I doubt you can. But if you want to try, you are welcome to do so, the blonde said with his hands stretched wide. Sasuke seated silently. He was thinking of killing the blonde. Well, if he does allow Naruto to join and then shoots him along with Danzo, it could be a friendly fire and the Umbu would be watching to absolve him of any wrong. Things were troublesome with the blonde around the village, if he was not around, then Sasuke could do as he pleases without having to worry about someone he couldn't figure out. I will permit it, he finally said. Naruto smiled. I will see you then, he said before showing Sasuke his back. A second later, he disappeared. Yuzushi Ogakure. Gyurin looked at a group of Uzumakis in a training ground they all had their chakra chains out, learning to use them in conjunction with barriers. The man leading the training was a person called Narihiro, one of the mysterious Uzumakis in the island. The Uzumakis were truly gifted people in terms of chakra. There was always something special about it and above all else, they possessed strong life force. This was truly a village of abnormal people. Orochimaru would certainly relish using them for his experiments. She sat next to Haku who was watching the training. Her eyes glanced at the training ground for a moment before looking at her partner in crime. What is happening? She asked. Things are moving, Haku said in a quiet tone. Gyurin frowned. I don't like that cryptic tone, she said. I know that although I handle the Black Core, there is still some much darker things that I don't know. The village's intelligence people don't even report to Yoshino. You hardly see them, but I know they are all Uzumaki. One of them is rarely in the village. He is always reporting to his majesty, Haku said. I forget that sometimes you don't know everything that happens in the village. Well, then again, your own job is already too much given everything that you have to do. But I am quite certain that very soon, you will have to worry less. He said. Why is that? Kumo and Iwagakure will probably be fighting each other and that means they won't have time to focus on us. Well, the people here were thinking of making it happen but someone beat them to punch. Either way, it works well for them. But we might have a Kanoha problem, Haku said with a sigh. The hidden leaf? Gyurin asked. What about them? They had hosted them and she thought everything was handled clearly. His Majesty says that Kanoha suspects that Yuzushio is allied with Amigekure and that the leader of the latter is probably up to no good. They might be thinking of using force to get the information they need, Haku said. We must expect to see Jiraiya in the village very soon. I will be ready for him. Haku shook his head. Even I know that he isn't someone both of us can handle, Gyurin san, the ice user said in a calm tone. We don't want to start trouble with Kanoha. But if they do use force, we will have to block him. Do you know how this village managed to stay under the radar for so long? What? The Uzumaki did indeed scatter across the elemental nations but they never went to Kanoha because the leaf couldn't be trusted either. It wasn't just paranoia. There were reasons to believe that the leaf was a possible enemy of the hidden whirlpools, Haku explained lightly. A barrier was erected around the village it was a special kind of barrier that messed up with all your senses, much like Genjutsu. You can't see it and it only affected those who didn't have Uzumaki chakra signature in them. If you came here, Dejitsu or no Dejitsu and you were not Uzumaki, you wouldn't see anything. It would just be ruins. Perhaps when Jiraiya comes around, they will use the same barrier. It was deactivated once His Majesty decided to grow the village and allow other people to come into this land. 
I don't know but Yoshino says you shouldn't worry about it. He is likely to come through the gates. Gyurin frowned. I always knew that these people could do some crazy things with seals, she shook her head. I have seals in my body, is there something I don't know? Haku smiled. Don't be too suspicious, Gyurin san, he said calmly. The seals you were branded with do exactly what you were told they do. We are comrades do you think they would lie to you when you have an important job? You were trusted with a job that some people had thought that shouldn't be given to an outsider but an Uzumaki should deal with it. But Yoshino said you could be trusted. And the Emperor? You are here, aren't you? Haku said with a smile. Yoshino might look like he runs everything and indeed he does run a lot of things, but no one serves Yuzushiogakure without his majesty giving his blessings. You are here because his majesty decided that you could be trusted, not because they thought you wouldn't misbehave because they could blackmail you. They don't want people who want to work for them because they are forced you do everything willingly. And that is how you give your best for this village. Gyurin hadn't actually thought that there was some mistrust. Haku didn't keep things from her but there were still things that she didn't know about the village. She knew that there was technology that was acquired from the hidden snow but she didn't know what it was for. Things were even being secretly moved from the snow. What is being built on the east side of the island? Haku smiled. Do you want to see? I wouldn't ask if I wasn't curious Gyurin said. Come on, Haku said, standing up. I will show you what is being built and why the village remains closed. Certainly, the elemental nations would try to invade us if they knew what we are building he paused for a moment. Have you met Karen? Outskirts of Kanoha. Danzo cursed when he sensed multiple chakra signatures on his tail. Nothing was ever going to plan. Had Hiruzen been alive, he would have been blaming him for this. But he still should have known that things would get to this point. He should have known that they would not allow him to just pack his things and go. Still, he had moved things secretly he had thought at least he would have been able to move further away from Kanoha without anyone knowing. Danzo stopped walking along with his two O agents. Tsunade's umbu were still hidden but he could sense them from the trees. He looked up from the ground trying to count them, but his eyes snapped towards a tree branch just above him when Sasuke appeared in a flash of lightning. Did you really think that I was going to allow you to leave, Danzo? Sasuke asked, with his Mangekyo Sharingan, glaring down at Danzo with nothing but pure contempt. Yes, this was the man he needed to eliminate. If Naruto tried to make a move on the war hawk, Sasuke was going to burn the blonde with the flames of Amaterasu or shoot an arrow through his chest. He wasn't going to allow anyone to stand in the way. You truly are a disappointment to the memory of Itachi, Danzo said in a cold tone, his narrowed eyes staring back at Sasuke. So are you a disappointment to the memory of the Naidame Hokage, Naruto suddenly said, appearing below the tree Sasuke was standing on. The blonde had his hands folded across his chest. That voice shocked him, Danzo hadn't sensed the blonde. He had just appeared there as if he had no presence about him. It was truly a frightening thought. Such a presence was required for an assassin the ability to mask your scent, the sound of your heartbeat, your entire existence. I was not expecting your presence, Naruto, he said. I grew bored sitting around, Naruto said with a shrug. The umbu are also watching to make sure I don't even make an attempt to run away from the village, he said before taking a step forward. Now then, can you stand aside so that I can slaughter all you men? I have been frustrated being chained up like this. Your men will do to release my danger, the blonde said. Slaughter. Sasuke looked surprised hearing those words. The blonde had never looked like he was the bloodthirsty type. Then again, when has the blonde ever displayed an interest in anything? Naruto shrugged. Don't take my words literally. I like to mislead people at times, he admitted casually. That aside, saying it like that is a little imposing than saying, I am going to defeat you all. Danzo had his eyes narrowed. No doubt, Naruto was going to engage his men. With everything, he didn't think that Naruto would actually work with Sasuke. The very idea had been ridiculous. Unimaginable. Yet, it was now apparent that it was going to happen and Sasuke was going to face him. I guess there is no way to avoid this then, the war hawk said removing the bandages on his forehead. Naruto tilted his head to the side. 
Oh, Shirsue's eye, he said with a smile. Well, no need to look at it and marvel, let us do this the moment those words left his lips, a dose of killing intent oozed off him, causing the Nishinobi to surround Danzo. The war hawk glanced at Sasuke for a moment before looking at Naruto. He smiled inwardly having seen the look on Sasuke's face. Naruto was going to go after his agents and the Uchiha would not interfere, even if the Umbu were watching and Naruto was losing. If anything, it was apparent that Sasuke would rather see Naruto dead than alive. He laughed inwardly. What a treacherous world he had created. But did Naruto know about this? Danzo had no illusions, the one with a dangerous mind was Naruto. There were still many things that the blonde held to himself. He won't be coming after me, Danzo said in a calm tone. Sasuke won't be moving in until you have apprehended Naruto. Do this quickly, he ordered while stepping away. Hi, Danzo-sama. The Na forces saluted their master. Naruto was still the first to make a move the blonde disappeared along gusts of winds and flashed between the circle the shinobi had formed for Danzo. He was standing there, both hands stretched out, eight kunais held firmly. As he twisted clockwise, his feet dancing on the ground, the Na agents also twisted around to face him. The kunais were coated with wind chakra before releasing them. The first kunai sped through the air in blinding speed, heading straight towards the back of the Na shinobi who had yet to turn around. The kunai pierced through the shinobi's neck, bursting through his throat, leaving a gaping hole that caused blood to gush out. The first one was a test shot. The seven that came out next were hurled through the air simultaneously. Three shinobi managed to dodge the fast-coming projectiles while four were not so lucky. As they twisted around to face the blonde, they were welcomed by kanais that pierced through their throats. All four fell down the ground simultaneously, while Naruto stopped spinning. A Nakunoichi flashed behind him with a kodachi on her right hand. She swung the blade in a downward slash, trying to cut across his back. Simultaneously, another lunged towards him in the front, he was slightly above the ground, his right foot cutting through the air as it sped towards Naruto's face. Naruto reacted in lightning speed by falling forward, knees bent. He tumbled forward, avoiding the flying kick that blasted past him, and the slash that nearly cut through his back. He was quick to get on his feet, his feet twisting around smoothly as he turned around to face those who had attacked him. He didn't get to make any move as another masked man lunged at him from behind. When both his feet touched the ground, his right punch heading towards the back of Naruto's head. The blonde caught the punch with his left hand without even looking back. His grip was firm, enhanced by chakra. He held out his right hand, forming his wind blade. When three masked men lunged towards him, all holding swords, Naruto remained motionless for a second before letting go of the man behind him by pushing him back with force to force him off balance. Naruto bent his knees when all four were in range, and then his upper body while facing the ground. Flashing Wind Sword The sword extended invisible to the naked eye. Naruto then did an anti-clockwise twist that occurred in the blink of an eye. A second later, all four dropped to the ground, cut in half and dying. When Naruto straightened up, a brutal kick slammed into his face, causing him to slide backwards for a couple of feet. When he stopped, the blonde watched the woman who had kicked him darting towards him with a long sword held with her hand. When she got near him, she flipped it to her right and swung it horizontally from her right hand, aiming it just below Naruto's shoulder. The blonde reacted by taking a single step forward while holding out his left hand. The single step was enough to bring him an inch closer to the woman, and his outstretched left hand caught her right hand on the wrist. There was enough pressure on his fingers to stop the blood flow. He did not waste time driving his wind blade through her chest. He cancelled his sword blade as he pushed the woman away. That's nine down, eleven more to go, he said to himself. Come now, we don't want to keep your master waiting. And so, Naruto cut them all. It hadn't been difficult. Then again, he hadn't expected much from Danzo's people. They were still just normal shinobi. There was nothing special about them except for their loyalty to Danzo and lack of emotion. Once done with them, Naruto flashed behind Danzo. That didn't do it, he said to the war hawk. I am tempted to lunge at you, he said calmly, yet a small smile played on his lips. 
Danzo narrowed his eyes behind him but was forced to look directly in front of him when he sensed a spike of chakra. Sasuke was standing directly in front of Danzo, and within the line of Naruto. His imperfect Susano was already out, a bow and arrow held in motion. I will not let you do that. The arrow was released by Sasuke in blinding speed. It pierced through Danzo's chest, and went towards Naruto, only missing him by a whisker. Naruto didn't seem concerned, he had a raised eyebrow. He then disappeared and appeared not so far away Sasuke. He took a couple of steps forwards before placing his hand on the Susano. So this is the Susano, he said before smiling. You tried to eliminate me, didn't you? He asked calmly. But Sasuke could respond, Danzo was getting up, he looked completely fine. Naruto turned to face the war hawk and glanced at the right hand multiple Sharingans clearly visible. My wife would certainly love to have that right hand of yours to experiment on it, he said. No doubt there has been some use of Hashirama's cells there. He then glanced at Sasuke. I won't forget that you tried to eliminate me. Yes, you will surely die one day. He disappeared after mouthing those words with cold eyes. Kumogakure. The Yandame's rakage size snapped open when his senses kicked in his sleep and he shifted to the side of his bed. A kanai pierced through his pillow just after he had rolled. On the other side of the bed, there was another shinobi, but who tried to stab him. But it caught the kanai between his fingers, it drew some blood before it snapped and lightning shot through his body before shocking the would-be attacker. He didn't need to turn around to deal with the shinobi who was on the other side of the bed as another shinobi appeared and apprehended the man. A looked furious at this before the lights were flicked on. He hadn't eliminated the man who had stabbed him, he wanted them alive. He was going to make sure that they paid for this. They would regret even trying to make an attempt on his life. How did they even manage to get past you people? He roared furiously. There was someone outside who got our attention and we had gone after him but he managed to elude us, the shinobi said in fear afraid that the rakage would turn his fists towards him for not being here soon enough. Incompetence. The rakage shouted, slamming his huge hand on the bed. Get out. After a couple of moments, he appeared, dressed properly in the living room, still looking infuriated. Who would even dare make this pathetic attempt on his life? It would have succeeded if he hadn't been quick to wake up. And he said he had guards but a little thing and they all leave their posts. Idiots. He needed better people to guard him at night. Oh, wait, he had been the one to say he didn't need people guarding him exclusively. He hadn't thought that there would actually be an attempt on his life. When was the last time someone even attempted to eliminate a Kage in his sleep? What was happening in this world? His first thought had been Yuzushi Ogakure. He couldn't think of anyone who would want to eliminate him but when he walked into the living room, he saw Iwagakure forehead protectors and frowned deeply. Are they really from Iwagakure? He asked dangerously. It wouldn't be a new trick to dress assassins in another village's colors in case they failed to do their job. Someone was always blamed. I had seen this trick many times, so he would not be fooled easily. Iwagakure looked like an ally at this time, but you could never be sure about anything in this world. Every village was always trying to fight for its interests. The Kanais are from Iwagakure, but we cannot confirm anything at this point, one of the shinobi said. Go confirm it, A ordered. I want answers. If they are indeed from Iwagakure, Anoki will regret even thinking about this stupid decision he has made. He would surely regret it. Although he might not declare war with Iwagakure tomorrow, he was certainly going to do it in the near future if it is indeed Anoki who sent those people. He would not let this slide. Someone's head had to roll for this action. But the situation was delicate. There was still Yuzushi Ogakure and Kanoha to think about. It was dangerous to make a move now when he didn't even know anything about the former village. The Yandame Rakage sat down and waited for his people to bring him the answers he wanted. After an hour, he grew impatient and decided to go the interrogation cells himself. When he arrived at the chambers, the shinobi were heavily bleeding and damaged but he didn't care. What is taking so long for you to break them? He demanded. They confirm they are from Iwagakure, but won't say who sent them one of the shinobi responded to the rakage. 
They say the order came from IWA but appear to be incapable of answering some questions. Why does that matter? I demanded. They are from Iwagakure and that is all I want to hear. It doesn't matter who knew and who didn't know about it. Shall we stop or continue? Continue, the rakage said. If they die, they die. Kanahagakur. The agreement had been that Naoki would hire some people who would try to eliminate him, but Naruto no longer had the appetite for it. He didn't have any desire to cut through worthless shinobi who could not even force him to fight a little seriously. Perhaps this was because he had spent much time sparring with Jiraiya that he had forgotten how to fight weaker shinobi. That aside, fighting weak people really did bore him, and a continuance to it was nothing but just an annoyance. Naruto looked up into a tree as he sensed Naoki's presence. Cancel the order, he said. It is not necessary anymore. Besides, there are many people who would want me dead. That's a pity, Naoki said. What about Sasuke? He did try to eliminate you and if given the chance he will try to do it again. Let him do as he pleases, Naruto said carelessly. He will surely try to eliminate me again. I am nothing more than a threat to his childish dreams. It is only that he doesn't know that I don't care about what happens to Kanoha. Either way, he will surely die. Naoki stared at Naruto for a long moment before shaking his head. Kanoha won't be happy. The hidden leaf is irrelevant, Naruto said with a shrug. Besides, if he tries to eliminate me again, I have more reasons to step on his throat and end the Uchiha, he said. The Uchiha isn't a big picture. What is happening with the search for Kabuto? Still no luck, Naoki said with a shake of his head. Ever since Orochimaru died, he has completely disappeared without any trace he said. That wasn't what he wanted to hear. Kabuto was a child of Orochimaru. He knew too much information and could do a lot of damage with it. His knowledge regarding the things he learned with Orochimaru could also prove to be vital. Gyurin had some information but not sensitive information that Orochimaru and Kabuto worked with secretly. He needed Kabuto to be either dead or working for him. If you can't find him, then stop the search, Naruto stated. It is just going to be a waste of time and effort. Eventually when he wants to be seen, he will make an appearance. You are planning on using him Naoki said. Wouldn't that be dangerous? Someone like him cannot be trusted. Your opinion was not requested, Naoki, Naruto said sternly. When I want it, I will ask of it. Naoki merely smiled. That's rather cold, your majesty, he said. There is still nothing regarding Zetsu. But we have Madara's hideout watched for any sign of movements. So far, there is nothing. That is a nuisance that really does trouble me, Naruto said with a frown. Madara cannot return to this world. We have already done enough to stop his crazy plan, but now the driving force eludes us. He won't be hidden forever, Naoki said. As long as you remain a Jinchuriki, he will have to come to you. I don't want anything that will be of nuisance to my dream, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. That is for me. Naoki nodded and threw a bingo book towards Naruto. Naruto opened the marked page and found an image of himself with a ranking of A. What a pitiful ranking! he said with a frown. Well it matters not. You certainly don't want people assuming that you are all powerful. This situation could dangerous. You are going to die, so it doesn't matter much anyway, Naoki said with indifference. The team is ready to come in as soon as they hear a loud boom. Naruto shook his head. No, wait for them to send a message. Or wait for at least a couple of days before arriving. We don't want unnecessary questions. What more did you want from me? There is also Sabaka no Temari, Naoki said. That is a matter that isn't your concern, for now at least. Leave it as it is, and don't do anything I didn't tell you to do. You can leave the village now and go back home. Your presence is no longer necessary. Naruto said before deciding to take a walk back to the village. I think I will stick around for a while, Naoki said. I've grown to like this village. There are so many things that are happening that just catch your attention. Your interactions are also somewhat amusing. Naruto glanced towards the redhead for a moment with a narrowed look but he didn't say anything he just walked away. Hokage Office
Tsunade looked up when Naruto walked into her office. She managed a small smile as his eyes came to contact with hers. Since he returned from his training trip, this had been his first time coming to her without being called. Naruto, she started calmly. I wasn't expecting to see you. She said. Naruto tilted his head to the side. You mean just after our last conversation, he said. Tsunade frowned. Yes, she admitted. What can I do for you? Are you looking for a mission to keep you from getting bored? I think I can find something that will be suitable for you the Godame said a bit too happily. Naruto didn't remind the woman that she had barred him from leaving the village. She was probably just too eager to do something for him that it didn't register that he couldn't take any mission that would have him leave the village. Missions within would likely be chores and that was for Jennings to do, not him. He'd probably refuse to do them if he was being assigned them. I didn't come here for a mission. He said. Tsunade blinked. What is it? I'm just coming from the forest of death where I was doing some meditation. I was then attacked by some unknown shinobi. I think I left a corpse buried in the ground somewhere there, he said in indifference. I don't know where they are from because they didn't have anything on them to identify them. He said. You were attacked and you are that indifferent? Naruto shrugged. It was nothing serious, he said. Besides, situations like this help train your senses. You need to be active at all times. I think some of them escaped. I didn't bother chasing after them because they were probably not going to give anything. Where did this happen? Just behind the place we had the preliminary round of the Chunin exams, Naruto said. Well, I guess that is that, he said calmly. Wait, Tsunade stopped him from leaving. How did things go with Tamari? She asked carefully, not to sound excited about the idea. She was hoping that things had gone well. The blonde hadn't said anything about it before leaving and since she had some interest in this, she was naturally curious about how well it might have gone. How did things go? Naruto asked. What things? Tsunade frowned. She wasn't dealing with an idiot who failed to read between the lines. She was even surprised that he didn't even twitch when she asked the question. No wonder Jiraiya said that he couldn't read anything from the blonde. The fifth Hokage could only answer the question. I thought you were getting along with her, she said. Naruto shrugged, meh, he said with indifference. She is a good friend, he added. Is there something I should know? Tsunade shook her head. Not now, at least. Naruto smiled towards the Godame. I see, he said. Why are you smiling? Well, you are a Sanmin all right, he said. Forgive me for saying this, but you do know how to lie without leaving anything for someone to read. To answer your question, things were smooth. I'm not sure where they stand, but they were certainly interesting. I think I might give her a call in the near future. Why not soon? Tsunade asked, while ignoring the fact that he had nearly fooled her into thinking that there was nothing. There is much to do in the immediate future, Naruto said with a small frown. I'm still a flight risk in this village and the situation with Yuzushiogakure hasn't been solved. It does weigh down on my mind. Until it is solved, I have the burden on my shoulders. I'm sorry to put you through this Naruto, Tsunade said apologetically. I hope that we are able to solve this situation very soon. It will be better for everyone involved. But it all depends on Yuzushiogakure. We don't force them to do anything. I don't want to suspect you of anything, but just be patient for a little while and all the cloud will be lifted off you." Naruto nodded and turned towards the door. Before he could open it, it opened as Shizun walked into the office. Naruto smiled towards the black-haired woman. Shizun, he greeted with a charming smile. You really must let me take you out sometimes, he said. Go play with someone your age, Naruto. Tsunade exclaimed. Naruto shook his head. A pity, he said before walking past Shizun, but not before flashing her one last smile. She returned the smile before closing the door. She turned her attention toward Tsunade. Why did you do that? This is the second time you did that. Tsunade stared for a moment. Don't tell me you were actually interested in going out with him. She said. Shizun shrugged. It wouldn't have been bad. 
I hear he is a charming young man who knows what he is doing. At least that is what Jiraiya-sama says. And you just took the word of a pervert. Once more, Shizun shrugged. I get lonely at times, she said. Later that day. Naruto was sitting alone in his dark little corner with a couple of bottles before him. This was going to be his last night living in this world. Death. Ah, it was something that everyone feared. Even murderers didn't want to deny. Everyone wanted to live. But the bijou inside of him would probably say that human life was just fragile and that for the Uzumaki, death was nothing. Well, they got to live far longer lives than other humans. They could outlive anyone in this world and they didn't have to experiment on their bodies to get this done. The red hair was a symbol of their life and once it was drained, it changed its color to signify that death was closer. He smiled when Enko walked towards his table with Kurinai, Asuma, and Kakashi, along with another woman. I figured you'd need some company, the snake mistress said to Naruto with a wide grin. Naruto smiled. You figured right, he said, sitting up slightly. I was honestly starting to wonder who would keep me entertained tonight. You know, it does get lonely in this dark corner. Kurinai raised an eyebrow. Didn't you just choose it? Naruto put on a sly smile while watching those eyes of the Genjutsu mistress. How exotic I certainly wouldn't mind waking up to have your eyes stare at me, he said quietly. Anko whistled before shooting a look towards Asuma. I think you have competition there, Asuma, she said grinning. Kurinai-chan might be leaving with him by the end of the day if you are not careful. Anko. Kurinai warned. What are you saying? Anko shrugged carelessly before turning towards Naruto. You will try right? Naturally, Naruto responded with a wide smile. There are few women who entice you to stare at them as she does. But I didn't know Asuma was already playing in this field. He said, staring at Asuma. Asuma shook his head. Nothing from Naruto surprised him these days. The blonde might be young in age, but he had the mind to play with the adults. Perhaps Anko was right, if he wasn't careful, he would find the blonde behind Kurinai. That look before, he could see that the blonde admired her. It was probably something just fleeting. Asuma decided against responding to Naruto to speak about something comfortable, for him at least. You didn't answer her question, Asuma said, glancing at Kurinai. It is a good place to hunt for prey. I get to survey all that is happening within the place while sitting like this. Naruto said while staring at Kurinai. When she glared at him because of his response, he laughed. Of course, I am joking. I just stole a line from Enko. I believe that is something she would say. Then why? Naruto shrugged. I like being alone, he said before turning to Yugao. He stared at her for a moment with his tilted to the side. Umbu, he said. So, Kakashi, I didn't think you dated real women. I have always thought that your only woman was that orange book of yours. What was her name again? I'm quite sure I heard you whispering her name when you are asleep one day during a mission. Anko burst out in laughter. Yugao is his former subordinate in Umbu he was her captain. I should have figured as much, Naruto said with a shake of his head. Kakashi I smiled. You don't have to look so disappointed, Naruto, he said. Naruto shook his head and turned towards Yugao. He then offered her a smile. I have known your hair for quite some time, Yugao-san. I'm quite certain that you have seen some expressions on my face that not even Jiraiya has seen. It is such a pleasure to finally see your face. Yugao returned the smile. A pleasure to finally meet you in person, she said. You two know each other from somewhere? Anko asked while, Kakashi's visible eye narrowed slightly. She is an umbu, and I am a jinchuriki, Naruto started in a slow tone. So, yes, I do know her. As I do with some umbu. Kakashi was honestly surprised by this. He was almost certain that Naruto was lying about the last part. But he was surprised that Yugao had watched Naruto. He didn't know about it. She probably did it after he left. Still, he hadn't known. If he hadn't known and he hadn't heard Tsunade saying something about it, it was more or less likely that the Godame Hokage didn't know about it as well. Had they just revealed a secret just like that? 
The others wouldn't know, but he certainly would since he knew what happened in the Hokage's office. It isn't what you are thinking, Kakashi, Naruto said to the silver-haired jonin. And if it is, please keep those thoughts to yourself, Senpai, Yugao said with a sweet smile. What was I thinking? Kakashi said. Probably that I have had a crush on Yugao and now that I have grown, she has finally decided to put away her mask and return those feelings. Naruto tilted his head to the side. Or something like that. Iwagakure. Anoki frowned deeply reading the angry letter from the Yandame Rakage. He got mad and concerned with each passing word. After he was done reading the letter, he slammed his fist on his desk and shouted some curses while releasing his killing intent. That was his plans gone the drain after that letter. He was beyond furious about this. How could he work with the rakage when things were like this? Not long ago, he had told the hidden leaf that he was willing to go to war with it and now, he had to worry about Kumogakure. Certainly, if he attacked the hidden whirlpools, he was going to be attacked by Kumogakure and Kanoha would try to defend the former. He shouldn't have said those words then but he hadn't known that this would happen. Who could benefit from this situation? Anoki needed someone to blame someone for this because he hadn't given the order for his shinobi to try to eliminate the rakage. Someone had done it and was trying to blame him for it. It was either his shinobi had betrayed this village or they had been manipulated by someone. But the rakage was confident that they were his shinobi and had said he would send their heads so that he could confirm. It wouldn't make much of a difference nevertheless because the man seemed confident that they were his shinobi. If they were his shinobi, who could have given the order? Someone would have to roll over this. Maybe it was either Kanoha or Yuzushiogakure. He wouldn't put it past the leaf to have done this. They certainly had the dejitsu to manipulate someone through genjutsu. Anoki was going to blame them, but what would he base his accusations on? This was indeed a frustrating situation that had ruined things for him. He was certain the idiot who plotted this was currently dancing in joy over this. Curses. If you don't start talking now, I will start assuming that someone has declared war on us, Kuratsuchi said calmly. At this moment, she could only assume that Yuzushiogakure would be the only village to do something like that. She didn't think that it would be the hidden leaf. The leaf couldn't afford that. But she didn't think so with Yuzushio. Nevertheless, village had many reasons to wish for war with Iwagakure. Regardless of what, they would just crush anyone who dares threaten the security of their beloved village. Anoki turned his eyes towards Kuratsuchi and then spoke in a subdued tone but the anger was still clearly audible and visible in his eyes. It has indeed happened like that, he said. Kuratsuchi frowned. Yuzu. Anoki shook his head. The worst case scenario, he said in a slightly gloomy tone. Kumogakure has declared us an enemy after two of our shinobi were caught trying to assassinate him, he said. What? Kuratsuchi jumped to her feet and stared at her grandfather. Are you serious? She asked. Do I look like I am joking? Anoki asked in a flat tone. Well, considering everything this could also be one of Kumo's plots. The village has always been aggressive. He wouldn't be surprised if they tried to demand something from them. It has played the same trick with Kanoha and would probably do it with them. But IWA would not bend over as Kanoha did. They were in a situation to defend themselves against any attack that might come over them. Kumo had two Jinchurikis, but so did they. They would not be intimidated into doing anything, especially when Anoki wasn't even guilty of doing anything. Who is framing us? Kuratsuchi asked. Surely someone was framing them because there was no one in this village who would have given such an order. Her grandfather hadn't done something like that either. I don't know, Anoki said. But we will find out and whoever is behind it, will know my anger. I will not forgive this and I will not forget it. But at least for now we can be content knowing that Kumogakure will not attack first. People have seen many wars they won't likely do anything carelessly. Any village that makes the first move, depending on the conditions might face destruction. If we attack Yuzushiogakure, Kanoha will defend it. The moment we do so because of what is happening, Kumogakure will do it as well. Sunagakure is weak but if Kanoha is attacked, it will also mobilize. Without the hidden leaf, Suna knows it has no chances for survival. In this scenario, 
we are getting crushed in all fronts. We can't have that now. Kuratsuchi was silent for a couple of moments. This was certainly a dangerous situation that was certainly a road to life and death. They had to be careful or else they would face destruction. And this was all because the Uzumaki had decided to come back. She blamed the Uzumaki for this. Had it not been for them, they wouldn't even be at odds with the hidden leaf. The wars of the past were but because of this, the roads were clashing once more. What are we going to do? We are going to see who is responsible for this, Anoki said. In the meantime, I will meet the wreckage. If I have to go to Kumo to see these shinobi while they are still alive to question them, I will do so. I don't want anything to happen between the two villages before the issue with Yuzushio is as it is. Isn't that dangerous? Kuratsuchi asked. Kumo could try to use this to eliminate him as well. Or maybe the person who was framing them would even try to eliminate both Kages when they meet if they do meet in a neutral location. It is, Anoki admitted. But we cannot run away from it. This is the only way we can temporarily close on matters and avoid war with Kumo. Who knows, although I highly doubt it, we might end up solving this issue if we meet, he said. What happened to those people who hired? They haven't come back, but I am not expecting them until the next couple of days, Kuratsuchi said. But Kumo Gakure has already put him in their bingo book as an A-rank shinobi. It doesn't mention much, but it's still something else. They do say he can control some of the Kyubi's powers. That is worrying, Anoki said. Because the Kyubi is the most powerful, its Jinchuriki becomes the most powerful if he can control its powers. Let us hope that he doesn't have full control. I am more interested in his personality and mindset. For now, as long as he doesn't know his father's jutsu, he isn't a threat. Why his mindset? It gives us an image of what is his opinion regarding Yuzushio. If he is willing to jump into the defense even if Kanoha isn't going to do, we have a problem of a Jinchuriki on our hands, Anoki said. That is a possibility we have to face. Kuratsuchi looked thoughtful for a moment before speaking. I could just arrange to meet him to discover more about it, she offered. I don't know how I would get in contact with him, she added. You can just go to Kanoha, Anoki said. We haven't had any diplomatic relations with Kanoha. I can send you there to discuss more about the current issues. Jiraiya was here to inquire about our viewpoint, I haven't heard from you. While there, you can get your chance to meet Naruto. It will also give you a chance to see about the leaf security and what they are doing in this time of tensions. Ikaraka Ramen Naruto stared at the food before him with an unblinking look. He was certainly going to miss having this ramen. There was just no way he was going to find a place that prepared better ramen than Ikaraku. What was he going to do about this? Perhaps this was more than just food. Sitting here like this held some sentimental value for him. This place had been the only place he could eat without worries, the only place that didn't overcharge him if it bothered selling to him. He had spent many days with the third Hokage in this place. Maybe it was more than just the ramen, but the memories it represented were pure. Is there something wrong with the ramen? I am asked, staring at Naruto with a curious look on her face. Naruto lifted his eyes towards Ayam and shook his head. He then smiled before taking his chopsticks. I was merely thinking. Sometimes I let my thoughts wander a little, he said. What were you thinking about? It obviously had something to do with ramen, Ayam said. She was at least glad that there was nothing wrong with the bowl she had served him. It would have been the first time that Naruto complained about food after being served. He always enjoyed his meals. If an emperor offered you a chance to open your shop in his land and also serve your food to him personally, would you take it? Naruto asked, his eyes staring at Ayam. Ayam tilted her head to the side before shaking her head. That would be something else but I can't just leave Kanoha for no reason. I'm not a Kunoichi, so there is no loyalty question but if I am going to leave Kanoha, it has to be for something worth more than just wealth. Naruto smiled. What is more valuable than wealth? Happiness, Ayam said. Good answer, Naruto said. He turned towards his food and started eating calmly with a small smile on his lips. Once he was done eating, he placed his hands inside his pockets and slowly walked through the streets of the hidden leaf. The air was a bit tense, 
but it was certainly different from the atmosphere that greeted him when he was younger. Perhaps his showing in the Chunin exams, his association with Jiraiya had caused some changes, but Naruto really didn't care about it. He certainly had no desire to buy these people's love with anything. When he arrived in his apartment, he closed the door behind him and released a loud sigh. He was being watched, but at least things were safe in this place. He walked towards the couch he had shared a special moment with Temari. She was probably going to hate him but there was really nothing he could do. He could not risk anything or else there be a situation that could potential undo all efforts placed to make sure that things happen in the way he wanted. Naruto settled down gracefully and placed both his feet on his coffee table before closing his eyes. Boom! Naruto's apartment burst into a loud and powerful explosion that was heard almost throughout the hidden leaf. The explosion sent debris flying into all sides with crimson flames burning through the place within seconds. The apartment block was immediately surrounded by a squad of umbu which did put out the flames. They had been quick to act knowing that the apartment belonged to the hidden leaf's jinchuriki. If something happened to him, there was the chance of the kyubi breaking free. And they would have an irate Hokage who would be demanding answers. The village was immediately put on lockdown after the explosion. Tsunade flashed into the scene along with Jiraiya with Umbu watching over. She had a deep frown on her lips. She was only glad that there was no damage on the village itself and there was no sign of the Kyubi. But she was afraid that something might have happened to Naruto. The explosion that occurred wasn't a small thing. She had felt it in her office. She was honestly afraid but she could not break down when the village was like this. There was a chance that there could be an intruder in the village. There hadn't been any sign of anything like that, but you never know. The Godain was standing on the roof of the building nearby when an umbu appeared before her with Naruto's burnt body in his hands. The Godain slammed her fist of the roof, shattering it in anger. She immediately disappeared towards the Hokage Tower with Jiraiya following her along with the umbu. The Toad Sage felt something pang within his heart. He felt like a failure seeing Naruto like that. He quickly rushed towards the umbu holding Naruto after they made their way towards the top of the Hokage Tower. He examined the blonde with a pained look for searching for a pulse. There was none. And everything stopped. Jiraiya felt like he needed to sit down because after a couple of seconds, his world seemed to start spinning. There was no pulse. Naruto was dead. Once more again, he had failed to protect those he loved. He had failed to protect Naruto from his young age, from the abuse of the villagers and now this. Some of these people were probably going to celebrate his death or just be indifferent to it. Naruto hadn't done anything of noteworthy for them to remember him by they were just going to say that the child who held the beast that eliminated their loved ones was finally dead. Jiraiya was going to be sickened if things happened like that. He was going to be infuriated with them and he would not bite his tongue. Naruto was dead. Jiraiya felt dead. How could have this even happened? Did it have something to do with the attack on Naruto? Did it have something to do with that attack? But they didn't know who did it. Could they just assume that one of the great nations planned this attack? Jiraiya couldn't figure anything out. He wanted to cry, but he held his tears. This wasn't a dream, this was a nightmare. This was a cruel reality. After a miserable childhood, is this how someone was supposed to die? J. Jiraiya, tell me this isn't really happening, Tsunade's pained voice brought Jiraiya out of his thoughts. The toad sage turned towards the slug princess with a saddened look. Naruto was dead. He wanted to tell Tsunade something else, but there was nothing he could say. The truth was pain. What was even worse was that they had been dealing a lot of pressure on Naruto in the past days. He hadn't been allowed to leave the village they had been suspecting him of something else. He could not have died with a smile. Jiraiya looked away from Tsunade and turned towards Naruto's body with unblinking eyes. Was this really the reality? Was Naruto really dead? Jiraiya? Tsunade shouted. Tell me something. Jiraiya still couldn't say anything and this time around, he couldn't even face her. Tsunade slammed her foot down nearly exploding in anger, before stalking towards the San Nin. She pushed him to the side and knelt before Naruto. She attempted to look for a pulse, but there was nothing. She stood up and glared at the umbu. 
what the hell happened? We don't know yet, the umbu said. You don't know? Tsunade asked with a bitter laugh. Then why are you still standing here? Go find out what happened. If someone did this, I want them found. No one leaves and comes into this village. We are on lockdown until I say otherwise. She shouted furiously. Hi, Hokage-sama, the umbu saluted disappearing. Hospital. Tsunade hadn't immediately taken Naruto to the hospital because she knew he was a Jinchuriki and there were dangers there. Still, she was curious why the Kyubi hadn't been released. With Naruto's death, the seal was supposed to lose its power and then it would be released. It would have been a disaster if that had happened. Last time around, it took sealing the Kyubi to stop it. This time around, who would seal it? Who would even be able to hold it down to even get to that point? But there hadn't been any of that. Naruto's body was laid on the bed within the hospital it was just her, Shizun and Jiraiya within the room. There was no one close by around them because this was something being done in secret. She certainly wasn't going to let other villages know that Kanoha's Jinchuriki was dead. They would certainly be happy knowing this. But with what was happening between Kyumo and IWA, there was no fear of an invasion. Even so, Tsunade had lost someone who was truly precious to her once more again. She walked over to the blonde with her hand glowing light green. When she tried applying chakra over his chest, marks formed across his entire upper body. She didn't step back when the marks appeared. My chakra can't touch him, she said with a deep frown. She removed her hand and the marks disappeared. Jiraiya stepped forward and touched Naruto's chest and tried applying his chakra and the seals appeared once more. He could not make of what he was seeing. He couldn't understand the damn seals. It wasn't just one seal. There were multiple seals that were just tied together making just one complex web of seals that he couldn't even understand. The frown on his lips deepened. One of the seal is blocking chakra from entering his body, he said. When you channel chakra, the seal immediately activates. But I don't know what it does or what they do. I don't know anything. He said with frustration. Can't you release them? Tsunade asked. I can't release something I don't know, Jiraiya said with a shake his head. Tsunade mirrored Jiraiya's frown. This just means we can't see what happened to him and how he died. Although his body is burnt, the burns are slight and would have healed soon. They were not what eliminated him. We will take his blood and try to see if it was poison that eliminated him. But if it was poison, would there have been a need for the explosion? It could have been used to conceal the evidence. The flames burnt everything that was in his apartment, Jiraiya said. There was no progress anyway. This could not simply be a dead end. Not now, not ever. Someone planned this and they would get to bottom of this. Tsunade swore in her grandfather's name that she would find out who plotted this. But so far, there was no evidence to even suggest that someone had planned this. There hadn't been someone in his apartment. Someone was watching it and there was not a report of anyone breaking into Naruto's apartment. The umbu were also positive that Naruto had been alone when it happened. This was just a strange thing that almost made her think that this could have been suicidal. We need to get Inoichi to read his mind to see what happened. That's not going to work, Jiraiya said. What were you thinking, Haim? Tsunade stared at Jiraiya with an expressionless mask on her face. Naruto appeared happy he seemed fine. I can't say he was miserable. Despite smiling, he always admitted to being miserable and he often spent time alone just staring into the empty space ahead of him. I could never get into his mind to see what he was saying. Tsunade nodded. I just thought what if it was suicidal. I think someone did this, but we have nothing other than that attack on him. Even so, that is nothing to go on by. He admitted that this wasn't making him happy. And he wanted it to change. What if he had been lying and saw no end to his misery before deciding to end it all? It could explain why he has these seals that keep chakra from entering his body if we can't even enter his mind, it makes things even more suspicious. Jiraiya refused to think that way. That would mean that they were responsible. It would mean Kanoha was the one that eliminated Naruto. Besides, Naruto wasn't the suicidal type. Something had to have happened. Naruto didn't take his life, 
Heim, the toad sage said confidently. Uchiha Compound Sakura strolled through the Uchiha Compound, heading towards the main house where she knew that she was going to find Sasuke. Her beloved crush who has been doing nothing but ignore all her attempts to see him. Last time she had been here, he told her to leave and didn't want to talk her. Talk about being rude, but she still did not give up. She would not give up on her love. She would love Sasuke for life and nothing was going to change. Of course, it did pain her when he was unpleasant towards her, but her love for him was enduring. She would endure this rough patch. Sasuke would come around and they would be happy together. At least she did dream about this. She hoped that this time around, he would at least see her. She was here on painful news that he had to know. Even though he spent his time around the compound, Sakura was quite certain that Sasuke knew about what had happened to Naruto. Even the whole village knew something had happened. There hadn't been anything from Tsunade. She hasn't said anything but since his apartment exploded, there was the thought that something happened to him. There hadn't been a sign of him since after all. Sakura was honestly saddened by this reality. She had been rude and unfriendly to him. Although it was something of the past that they had seemed to get over but she could not help but think about it now that he was dead. Naruto had been her teammate and he played his role perfectly. Sasuke had at times forgotten about her in the heat of the moments and it had been Naruto who covered her, who protected when she needed it. She was saddened for his passing. She truly was. When she arrived at the main house, she called and pounded at the door until Sasuke opened the door and stared at her. What? What? Sakura was surprised. Naruto is dead, Sasuke. So? Sasuke asked. He was just cold and indifferent. Sakura shivered at this. How could he be like this at times? Naruto had been their teammate. He was their friend. No one could accuse him of having been rude and unfriendly. He had been pleasant to everyone. It was the least she could say for Sasuke. If he died, she was probably the only one who would cry. The others certainly didn't care much about him because of the way he had been before he left the village. Excuse me? Naruto is dead so what? What do you want from me? How can you look so cold, Sasuke-kun? Naruto was our friend. He was our teammate and he saved our lives a couple of times. How can you be so indifferent? Sakura didn't raise her voice. She wanted to do it, but she loved Sasuke too much to do it. I love you, Sasuke-kun, but I was sad that you left Kanoha. I would have left with you. Now, I am just disappointed. You tried to eliminate Naruto before, but I thought that it was just because you really wanted to go. Sakura shook her head. We are going to be with others later tonight at Naruto's favorite eating place. If everything I have been thinking about you isn't just illusions, you will actually come. I really hope you do come, Sasuke-kun she said with a sad smile on her lips. The following night. Jiraiya and Tsunade were out drinking together. They didn't do it often, but this felt like the appropriate time to drink and talk about how miserable their lives were. Jiraiya had been sad in his life many times, but fewer moments were much more miserable than this. Do you think we drove him to this, Jiraiya? Tsunade asked in a miserable tone. Since he came back, we did nothing but told him that he was a flight risk. I barred him from leaving the village and he couldn't do any mission because of it. Do you think we could have handled things better? Do you think he will forgive us? I don't know Haim, Jiraiya said in the same tone as Tsunade. I really don't know. He smiled bitterly. I spoke to the toads to ask about Naruto's name in the contract, but they said that he it had disappeared. I thought they would say that his name would have still been there. Naruto's body was still in the hospital. They hadn't moved him. Perhaps they wanted to think that he would come back to life. Tsunade was even thinking about talking to Sunagakir to ask about their kinjutsu in reincarnation. Maybe they could do something to bring him back to life. Should we inform the Uzumaki and Sunagakir? I think Gara will want to know about this. There doesn't seem to be anything to do now, Jiraiya said. Nothing in his body is going to work as long as those seals remain in place. How do I start with the letters, Jiraiya? What do I even say? Chapter 14 
When Yugao walked into the Sarutobi compound, she was assaulted by a massive dose of killing intent. She found the Sandame Hokage pacing around inside his small study with his pipe blowing out smoke. He didn't stop even at her presence. She realized, he hadn't noticed her. What could be in his mind that he would be so absorbed like this? Sandim sama Yugao congratulated herself for managing to stay calm in this situation. The killing intent was frightening it made her feel uncomfortable and afraid. It took a moment for the third to turn to her. He blinked once before smiling towards her. Ah, Yugao-chan, he said calmly, acting normal as if nothing wrong ever happened. Is there something wrong, Hokage-sama? Yugao asked cautiously. The third stared at the umbu for a moment before going to sit down. Once settled, he let loose of a long breath before staring at Yugao with an expressionless mask on his face. Does anyone know that you are here? Yugao shook her head. I did as you instructed, Hokage-sama. No one followed me and no one knows I am here, she responded firmly. Good, Hiruzen said. Sorry about that, he said of his earlier show. Yugao merely nodded. The Sandame didn't have to apologize to her. But this just confirmed to her that there was something was indeed wrong. There was something that was happening that was making him like this. It was either Danzo or with Naruto. Hardly anything within the village worried him much since they were at a time of peace. Aside from the trouble with the hidden cloud, there were no major issues that would get the professor pacing around as she saw him. I made a huge mistake, Yugao. A very huge blunder that will cost Kanoha, Hiruzen said without emotion. Yugao was alarmed. What is it, Hokage-sama? What I am about to tell you is something that will not leave this room. You will not tell anyone about it, is that understood? Hi. Hiruzen was silent for a minute before finally speaking. I shouldn't have told Naruto about the Uzumaki. I should have just told him about his mother not the Uzumaki. I shouldn't have even taken him to Yuzushiogakure. Naruto will eventually leave Kanoha and I can't say anything that will change his mind nothing. The Sandame slammed his fist on the desk before him. Naruto loves his clan. Some of the Uzumaki are very much alive and if Naruto connects with them, he will join them. And there is nothing I can say to him that will make him stay. Can't you just stop him from leaving by using force? Hiruzen shook his head. I underestimated his drive, his desire to be Uzumaki. Naruto understands Fuenjutsu in ways that I didn't think. One day, I caught him studying space-time ninjutsu. And when I asked him about it, he said he didn't understand it. But he was lying to me, Yugao. Naruto lied to me. The third realized he'd shouted and apologized to Yugao. I have also lied to him, I shouldn't complain much, but it seems to me that Naruto knows things he shouldn't know. If he knows space-time ninjutsu, then we can't use force to stop him from leaving. I have two options, Yugao. In both options, I must confront him. In the first option, I must manipulate him using a powerful genjutsu to ensure that he never leaves Kanoha. That robs him of his freedom and Minato would probably never forgive me. There is also the danger of the Kyubi. We manipulate his memories not the Kyubi. If the Kyubi tells Naruto and shows him the truth, he will truly hate Kanoha. The second option is to make sure that Naruto never becomes an enemy of Kanoha, he paused. Which option do you think is best? Which option is best for Kanoha? Yugao asked. I don't know Hiruzen shook his head. What is best for Naruto? If I tell the council, they will no doubt try to extract the Kyubi from Naruto, thus killing him. They would not want a Jinchuriki who is not loyal. If Naruto dies, Minato will not forgive me and I'll have failed both him and his son. Even if they succeed in killing him, they will make sure Naruto is never free. They will send people after him. Kanaha Gakur. Tsunade sighed tiredly as she moved away from the paperwork that has been in front of her. Every day for the past two years, it was signing things and assigning missions to her shinobi. There was nothing much to do other than to indulge in regrets and self-pity. Naruto had disappeared from this village. It had looked like a dream, but it had happened and they had ended up burying him. She had seen some Uzumaki who had come here to bury one of their own. Still, it didn't ease the pain, the guilt, and the regrets. 
Perhaps if she had done things differently, he wouldn't have died perhaps not. You could never know in this world but the reality was that Naruto was dead. And it has been two years since he died. The one person who Tsunade had pitted was Jiraiya. He had truly been miserable in the wake of Naruto's death. He had blamed himself. He had said so many times that he had failed once more to protect those close to him. But at least he hadn't lost himself. She too was still here, and they were doing their jobs. They had the memories of the past and they would not forget. There were worries around the village, but nothing disastrous had occurred and it was rather peaceful without too many things to worry about. The past two years have peaceful, for Kanoha at least. Kumo and IWA have been doing some sparing sessions. They were close to a full blown out war but worried because neither had a good relationship with Kanoha. If anything does happen, Kanoha was ready. The village had been preparing itself after all. She would not be defeated. Kanoha would survive anything that happens. She wasn't afraid of either Kumo or Iwagakure. They had their tools. The Godain turned towards the window as Jiraiya appeared well, at least some things never changed. She smiled at the thought before speaking. You have been gone for a while, she said. Had some business in Nadashiko, Jiraiya responded with a smile. Tsunade looked curious. What were you doing there? I'm surprised you even returned in one piece, she said. Perhaps the question about his business there had been stupid. Nadashiko was a land of woman. Jiraiya would certainly feel at ease being in that place. Jiraiya shrugged carelessly in response to Tsunade. You underestimate my escape jutsu, Haim, he said. Tsunade stared, wondering if he was serious. She shook her head. This was Jiraiya she was talking to of course he was serious. I really hope that one day, someone cuts off both your hands so that you don't get to weave hand seals, she said a bit coldly. That would be cruel, Haim, Jiraiya said, wincing at the thought of being alive without both his hands. What could he do without hand seals? Could he even master a transformation jutsu? What would he do? If he could not do anything, it would be better to be dead, wouldn't it? Nothing you don't deserve, Tsunade said. What do you have for me? Jiraiya turned serious in the blink of an eye. Well, I had gone to Nadashiko because of my research but I stumbled upon something curious, he said. Don't keep me waiting, Tsunade said impatiently. It does appear that Nadashiko also has a relationship with the hidden whirlpools. They would not confirm it but I saw at the moment I arrived in the village. I saw someone belonging to the Uzumaki clan in the land. At this stage, it does appear that Yuzushiogakure covers the nations around the land of water. We already know that it has connections with Kirigakure. It wasn't anything troubling. Nadashiko had skilled Kunoichi, for sure, but it certainly wasn't a village you would worry about in terms of war. However, the problem here was Yuzushiogakure's ability to move about the elemental nations without anyone knowing. Nadashiko was a bit away from other lands but there was no telling how far Yuzu's reach went. Well, he could understand why Yuzu's leader called himself the Emperor. Jiraiya nearly snorted at the thought. There was still no sign of the said Emperor. No one has said they have seen him and Yuzu continued to be closed as before. It was even worse now. Jiraiya was beginning to think that there was no emperor and those people had just made the rumor to keep some mystery. They wouldn't have been the first to do something like that. In this way, the hidden nations continued to waste time and effort searching for the identity of the emperor while Yuzushiogakure moves quietly with its business. He had gone to Kirigakure and the beautiful and dangerous Mizukich had said that although she had a relationship with Yuzushiogakure, she still had yet to meet the emperor despite her many attempts to do so. There were really many questions about Yuzushiogakure that refused to be answered and the revived village did nothing to ease the worries or to give some answers. Kanoha had managed to form a communication line with the village. The villagers now knew just how valuable the Uzumaki had been to Kanoha. They now knew that the person they had dealt with contempt had been the child of one of their greatest hero. The thought was ridiculous but it was at least something that made Tsunade smile. She had at times laughed at how miserable some of them were when they realized the truths about Naruto. Some of them had even gone as far as to try to reject the truth. It had been all amusing for her to watch. She hadn't pitted them they had deserved it. 
They had been the ones to treat him like cabbage when he had just been a child. Tsunade shook her head. She shouldn't get into such thoughts. Why would Yuzushio be allied with Nadashiko? What would they want from them? Jiraiya shook his head. He didn't know. He couldn't figure out anything. But they knew that Yuzushio was the kind of village that made movements for a reason. There was always a calculated reason behind everything. Regardless of how much he tried, he just couldn't break through some of its puzzles. I don't know Haim, the toad sage said with a shake of his head. Yuzushio is calculating we know this. But I don't think there is anything interesting in Nadashiko. I have tried thinking, I can't figure out anything. It is like with the emperor, it might all be just a smoke made to hide the truth or attract attention. I wonder who really pulls the strings in that village, Tsunade said in thought. Perhaps she should inquire more about it. They certainly knew how to secretly handle their business. That man Yoshino who runs Yuzu is certainly someone you don't want to underestimate. He makes me uncomfortable, Jiraiya said in a firm tone. His eyes turned towards the streets for a moment before glancing towards the Godame Hokage once more. What is certain is that Yuzushio has great minds. That and we still can't figure out what they are trying to do, Tsunade said with a hint of frustration. Yeah, Jiraiya nodded silently. We will find out something eventually, he said with confidence. I wonder about that, Tsunade said with a slight shake of her head. She then smiled, seeing the look on Jiraiya's eyes. You're always positive. Then again, you've always been this way while some of us lose ourselves. The toad sage smiled it was a bitter smile that hid his regrets and pain. Well, if I also lose myself, who'll bring you back to your senses Heim? He managed to finish with a grin. Besides, I think when you lose hope, you stop living. I don't want that for my life. I believe that I continue to live, despite my failures, for a reason that is why I continue to be positive. Silence reigned for a couple of moments as Tsunade absorbed those words. She had lost people and fled Kanoha to drown in bitterness and pain. It hadn't brought her anything. She'd only been miserable and drowning in gambling debts. I hope you never change, Jiraiya. She said with a smile. Jiraiya grinned sheepishly. You know I'm going to remain the same, Haim, he said. There was silence. It lasted for a couple of minutes, both lost in their thoughts. There were thoughts of pain, love and the joys of life the past and the happiness and the present and a bit about the future. All thoughts came to a halt when a certain Uchiha came into the office. Tsunade stared at the raven head, since she permitted him to move about without restrictions, he has certainly used the freedom to do many things. She could confidently say Sasuke was one of the best shinobi she had. He certainly stood out from the rest of his generation. He was unique and served the hidden leaf well. He had ambitions to become Hokage, Tsunade knew this but she didn't concern herself by giving it much thought. It was too early for Sasuke to be thinking about being a Kage. Since Naruto's death, he has taken it upon himself to be Kanoha's guardian. He worked solo. Tsunade didn't complain. No one aside from Sakura complained. Things were even better that way because Sasuke stayed out of trouble and just minded his own business. Everyone was happy well almost everyone. One thing that had rubbed off Tsunade the wrong way was his apparent happiness in Naruto's demise. Perhaps the blonde had been competition or a threat. She never got around it. She never bothered about it, because quite frankly, she didn't want to know. What do you have for me this time? Tsunade asked in a reserved tone, eyes watching the Uchiha carefully. There isn't any shinobi activity around Yuzushio, Sasuke said, his voice lacking any emotion. Expected, Tsunade grunted with a nod, her tone mild. Yuzu remained as secretive as ever. But we do know that they have some military presence. Sasuke nodded to this. Without doubt, he said. Kyumo and Iwagakure haven't picked up anything on it. It is better this way, Tsunade said. Since IWA started to have troubles with Kumogakure over the failed assassination attempt of the wreckage, Anoki had diverted his attention to the cloud. It was the most dangerous. Tsunade wasn't concerned much about it because it didn't affect Kanoha. Those two could fight but Kanoha would not get involved. 
Things don't appear like they will change soon unless something happens, Sasuke said. There have been some rumors about ships moving from the islands within the water country heading towards Yuzushiogakure. It does appear that the village has been building something. Tsunade frowned upon hearing this and turned towards her former teammate and a longtime admirer. Do you think it has something to do with Princess Koyuki's visit? We didn't get anything on why she visited but we know it had something to do with Snow's technology. The Wave Country had certainly benefited from this. The country's population has increased massively due to its economic growth and Yuzushio's influence. The water feudal lord even viewed the nation as an enemy. One thing that was unique in the wave was its method of transportation trains. They were not there in Yuzu but there was no doubt that they were developed there because of Yuzu. Most probably, Jiraiya said. I think that they are also using the same technology in building the bridge that connects Yuzushio and the wave. The damn bridge. Tsunade didn't have anything to say about it. It was just after Naruto died that they made their plans known that they wanted easier method of transportation between the wave and Yuzu. The bridge has been in the process of being built for the past two years now and it was still being built. It should soon be completed. About that, there does seem to be some cooperation between the wave and Amige Cure. The Akatsuki has also been offering protection to the bridge builders and we have established that the organization is located in the rain. Perhaps it is time we stop thinking the organization as more than just a mercenary group. Tsunade nodded to this. Your brother was a former member, what did he say about it? The Akatsuki likely has a deeper relationship with Yuzushio. He didn't say why, but he mentioned that Yuzushio hired his services in a couple of occasions and he'd spend months there. Sasuke said with a shake of his head. I will stay for a while before heading out to check the borders between the cloud and Iwagakure. Tsunade nodded and watched the Uchiha leave without saying anything. Once he was gone, she turned to Jiraiya. How long do you think this will last? She asked curiously. I don't know Haim, Jiraiya said with a shake of his head. He closed his eyes for a moment, thinking deep. I don't think it will last long though. The fifth Hokage agreed to this but she didn't offer an immediate response. Kyumo and IWA are still busy with their problems but eventually, when the bridge is completed and we will find out more about Yuzu's military strength, they will act. No doubt, Jiraiya answered in a quiet tone. And Kanoha was going to be dragged into it if Kyumo and IWA decide to go after Yuzu it was going to be war. Yuzushiogakure probably doesn't care isn't it? Despite how they might act, we have to start thinking that the village isn't as innocent as it likes us to believe. The secrecy doesn't even help matters, Jiraiya pushed back his frustration over the way Yuzu tried to handle matters. He had told those people to at least try to reach out to both Kyumo and IWA but they refused. They didn't care about any of. Yoshino's response to his warning about a possible attack from IWA had been indifference and words along the line of, it would be unfortunate. The indifference really did bother him. But at least with how things are, it will be difficult for IWA and Kumo to work with each other. Tsunade knew she shouldn't smile about this, but she did. The fact that those two couldn't trust each other could save them from war. But it still won't stop either of them from making move. Yeah they could even call a temporary truce, Jiraiya said with a thoughtful look on his face. He amused himself with the thought that the moment the fight was over, they would fight. For now, they were restrained but once they got into the fighting spirit, there would be no stopping. If IWA moves, Amage Cure is in trouble. Tsunade frowned deeply. She hasn't become too cold-hearted that she would ignore the misfortune of another village because it didn't affect her. Amage Cure has always been used as a battleground during wars. IWA would use the rain as its path and its shinobi would eventually head to the village. Looking for food a troubling situation that only gave rise to war orphans on lands that aren't even involved in the fighting but just caught in the crossfire. Have you spoken to Nagato about it? Jiraiya shook his head he had a frown about him as he responded. He has refused to speak to me. They won't even let me walk into Amage Cure. Last time, I was literally kicked out. Is it their connections with Yuzushio? Most probably, Jiraiya said with a nod. I will keep trying. If something is going to happen, Nagato will take part of it. He is the last of my students and he holds the Rinnegan. If he turns out to be the enemy. 
Jiraiya shook his head. With how he dealt with people in Amagekure after replacing Hanzo as leader, I believe Nagato wouldn't have hesitated to eliminate me if he thought I could be an enemy. From what Jiraiya had said, the Rinnegan wielder had slaughtered anyone he so much as suspected to be a traitor. All those related to Hanzo wiped out young, old and innocent. He eliminated everyone without discrimination a brutal method of strengthening your grip on power. Iwagakure for long, Anoki had come to conclude that his war with Kumogakure would not go anywhere. He shook his head. It wasn't his war. He had nothing but disdain over the fact. If the rakage had allowed him when he visited Kumo, the sand-aimed Tsuchikage would have turned those men into ashes for their foolishness. Who tries to assassinate the rakage? He had faced disappointments before but that had been one of those worst moments he looked at Shinobi from his village with contempt and pure unadulterated anger. If they wanted to do a job right, they shouldn't have failed. If they failed, they shouldn't have gotten caught. What a bunch of idiots. He was certain though. He had been certain before then when the rakage spoke to him, it was either the rakage was making up the attack to get something from him or someone was trying to frame him. After seeing the situation, he could not deny that the attack had happened and the shinobi were his. Idiots, yes. Complete fools and disgraces to the IWA name, yes but they were still his shinobi and that was fact he could not escape as hard as he may try. Still, Anoki hadn't planned the attack. He has continued to deny it even to this day because he hadn't planned it. Would it have pleased him if the man was dead? Most certainly hell, he would have even celebrated. Without A, Kumo would be weakened. It would no longer have the fastest man in the shinobi world. He hadn't denied this to the rakage. He had told him straight ahead that if he had died, he would have been happy but he'd never gone as far as to plot for the man's death. Someone had plotted it and then blamed it on him. Someone was framing him. Anoki was certain of it. Those were his shinobi. He could not deny that. But shinobi could be bought they could be manipulated. It gave him no pleasure thinking that his shinobi would betray him the hidden stone but it would be naive for him to ignore the possibility. He hadn't sent them to Kumo and he had searched this village upside down, interrogating people and threatening people left and right but nothing came out of it. The culprit wasn't here he was somewhere between Kanoha and Yuzushiogakure. Who benefited from Iwa's war with Kumogakure? Kanoha would certainly benefit and given his conversation with Jiraiya it had a lot more to benefit from the war. Yuzushio could not be taken out of the picture. There was no telling what the village was capable of doing. And with their continued bickering with the hidden cloud, it was evident that the village benefited greatly. A coordinated effort by the villages could not be taken out as well. Either way, Anoki would find out who did it and he would make them pay dearly. The sand-aimed Tsuchikage sighed tiredly and put away the latest letter from the fourth rakage before leaning against his large chair. He closed his eyes for a moment to sort out his thoughts. Once done, his eyes snapped open. He saw Kuratsuchi staring at him intently. A pity, Kuratsuchi said with a small frown on her lips but her tone was laced with mild amusement. I thought you'd kick the bucket while sitting like that. Anoki snorted disdainfully. I still have many years to live, he spoke through gritted teeth. Because he was speaking like that because he was trying to show that he was still at the top of his game. Which is indeed a problem for me, Kuratsuchi said and stared at her grandfather for a moment before turning away from him she walked towards the couch in the office and threw herself at it. Seeing her relax, Anoki spoke. You want to replace me that much? Yes, Kuratsuchi answered in a hardened tone. I almost want to help you reach that level of death. If I knew where the bucket death was, I'd drag it towards you just so you can kick it. Anoki sneered and his expression twisted with anger not with Kuratsuchi. Not at her words. You must at least do an excellent job unlike those idiots who were bold enough to get into the rakage's house but yet still fail to eliminate him. I'm not a fool. Then at least you won't turn out to be a disappointment, Anoki said a bit sharply. What do you have? Anoki had acknowledged that Kumo wasn't going away and the Yandame Rakage wasn't going to believe him he had come in terms with this fact. Kuratsuchi was the only person who could succeed him. She was the future of Iwagakure and so, he'd been shielding her from the whole Kumo incident. He didn't want anything bad happening to her. It would break him. 
Iwagakure would have suffered a great loss. He had shifted away her attention to Yuzushiogakure. There was a less chance of getting eliminated. Kanoha and Yuzushiogakure can't coordinate anything. It is highly unlikely that they work together, Kuratsuchi said in a tired tone. What gives you that impression? Both nations have become allied once more, Anoki said. Kuratsuchi nodded to this it was truth. Kanoha Gakure and Yuzushiogakure were allies. But, Kanoha probably knows as much as we do about Yuzushio. The village remains locked up and doesn't reveal anything to Kanoha. It is almost as if they don't trust the leaf. That doesn't surprise me, Anoki said but he didn't explain the reasoning behind his response. Any military activity? Kuratsuchi shook her head. None whatsoever. I hope it keeps being that way, Anoki said. He certainly didn't want a strong Yuzushiogakure. If the village strengthened, he would be in a dangerous situation because he would be tempted to invade it. But the moment he does so, Kyumogakure was going to attack him from behind. He could not underestimate Yuzu. He could not forget that Kyumo could strike any moment he displays an opening. What of Kanoha? Nothing good, Kuratsuchi grunted. Aside from the loss of their Jinchuriki, they have been steadily strengthening over the past two years. Anoki frowned. I shouldn't have reminded Jiraiya had we outnumber them. If I hadn't done so or even threatened them, they would have continued with their peaceful ways. I was careless. At this moment, he cursed that conversation he had with Jiraiya. If he had known, he would have done things differently. But he had not known. Well at least they no longer have a Jinchuriki. And what is this that I hear that Naruto was as strong as Jiraiya even without the Kyubi? I don't know for sure but they seem to think so. It doesn't matter anyway, he is dead, Kuratsuchi said. Although she didn't display any emotion, there was bitterness inside of her. They never became friends. He had died before anything could happen. Anoki smiled. Well, at least that is something good that happened. We can say, bless Kanoha for losing one of their assets. Yuzu. The silence, the peace and the feeling that he was outside of the human world it was certainly a feeling Naruto enjoyed. He couldn't tell what was happening within the village while in the throne room but he did not complain. He had made it this way for his peace, his solitude. He was mostly alone in this place. But he couldn't have it any other way. If he wanted to get a feeling of what occurred in the village and being down on earth once more, Naruto could always sit in the normal throne room. This was for his solitude his peace and his sentimental time. It was slightly dark while he was alone. When someone stepped into the throne room, the lights would turn on. But it was made that it would slightly shadow his face. Then again, he never really received people in this place. He had yet to even receive anyone in the other throne room. The time had yet to come but now it had arrived. He had to step away from the shadows and face the elemental nations. Not as Naruto Uzumaki. But as the Emperor. Naoki's form materialized from thin air just beside the throne. He leaned over to Naruto's left ear and whispered. Lady Karen has arrived, your majesty, he said. Naruto didn't offer any reaction to this for a couple of seconds before finally nodding his head. He then smiled. I guess it is time to face the shinobi world, he said. Naoki shared the smile but he shook his head. You get too excited easily he said. Naruto's eyes glanced towards the man for a moment before shrugging with nonchalance. You have no right to tell me that. Besides, I have been in the shadows for a bit too long I have to get excited about facing the light once more. To face the darkness was your choice, your majesty, Naoki reminded in a firm tone. Everything has been by your desires. Regardless of who the enemy was, we have always been ready to serve you. I wasn't complaining, Naruto said in a flat tone. It appeared to me that you were, Naoki said, staring straight towards Naruto's eyes. When the emperor fixed him a look, he blinked and changed the subject. Should we get moving, Karen can be quite impatient at times and she gets very difficult to handle when she is high. Naruto thought about it for a moment before slowly standing up. We will walk. I want to know about what has been happening with Sasuke along the way. Naoki glanced at Naruto curiously before showing the blonde the way. He knew that the emperor didn't give a damn about the Uchiha. 
he just acknowledged the fact that Sasuke could be a major threat if not handled carefully. Perhaps it was the fact that he had managed to be lectured by his elder brother. But it had all been according to his majesty's desires, hadn't it? Once they stepped out of the throne room, Naoki looked up into the sky for a moment before responding to Naruto. He has been doing his missions and using the Mangekyo Sharingan. Naruto grinned. Then all is according to the script then, he said. Very soon, he will be getting blind. Tsunade can't heal him. She might be the best, but there is nothing she can do about the blinding of the Sharingan. It doesn't appear that he has been talking to her about it either, Naoki said. Well, it is something that is genetic. As long as he continues to use the Sharingan, he will continue to deteriorate his vision, Naruto said he was still smiling. I wonder if we should let him go blind for a couple of years. If I didn't know any better, I'd say that you were really angry about his attempts to eliminate you, your majesty, Naoki said. Naruto snorted with disdain at the thought. Ridiculous thoughts, he said in a flat tone. I know, Naoki said. You could have stopped him from leaving if you wanted to. I could have even stopped him myself. It would have been inconvenient, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. The atmosphere within the village was truly delightful. The air wasn't diluted and polluted with hatred because of the hatred and anger. There was life here. There was no longer the sense of dread and despair that had once filled this village when he came here. Things have changed. The buildings had grown tall. People surrounded the buildings. The streets were filled with people his people. The Uzumaki were at home. They were the nobles of this village. It didn't make anyone less of a secondary citizen. Yuzushi Ogakure had grown. He had turned it from a village of despair to a village of hope and desires. This was his home his village and he had a duty to protect it its people, because they were his people. Things have worked out nonetheless, Naruto added smiling. We must be ready for anything. I have prepared myself fully to fight any kind of battle against anyone. After walking for a bit around the streets, the two shun shined away and appeared in the middle of the forest. They walked for a bit and arrived in a clear field where a large airship stood on the ground. Karen was checking everything with Guren and Haku standing a distance away from the airship. It was a majestic crimson bird with no wings. It was slightly rectangular in shape, its body made of steel. It was a warship. It had weapons fitted for massive destruction. He could lay waste to any village if he wanted. Operating it was the major problem. It required massive amounts of chakra. Naruto could either use natural chakra or the Kyuubi's power to power it up. This was his personal battleship and his method of transportation. Naruto had to thank the spring's technology as well as the Sky Nation's relics for this bird of his. Your Majesty, Gyurin greeted with a small bow while Haku greeted with a smile. This is beautiful, isn't it? He asked calmly. It is, Gyurin said. When do we get to ride it? Who said you would? Naruto asked with a raised eyebrow, an amused look spreading through his lips. Gyurin blinked. But I thought Haku said we would be assigned as your guards when you start getting out. If we are getting out, we should be getting in that thing. Naruto shook his head. You are not getting on that. I am only taking Haku with me. You have your duties to handle, he said a bit firmly. Gyurin frowned at the thought. It was cruel being deprived of the joys of flying in the air. She almost stiffened and Naoki put a sympathetic hand on her shoulder. Well, we will tell you how it is like to fly, he said with a grin. Amused, Haku spoke. Don't listen to them, Gyurin. They are cruel people who are just messing with you, he said calmly. Your sadistic tendencies better not fall on his majesty, Naoki, he shot the Uzumaki a glare. Naoki laughed. Don't be ridiculous, Haku. This woman is a sadistic herself, he said in a mild tone. He then tilted his head to the side. Do you really believe that I am capable of influencing his majesty? Haku turned towards Naruto for a moment. The blonde appeared to have lost interest in the conversation the moment he mentioned that they were playing with Gyurin. His eyes were firmly on the airship. Was there anyone who could manipulate the emperor or become a bad influence? Haku shook his head. Yoshino has said it a couple of times that despite what people say about him, 
he had learned from Naruto. Naruto wasn't cruel. But Yoshino was. Perhaps when Naruto said eliminate someone, they took it a step further and they saw it as approval when he said nothing about it. He was the one who was superior to all these people. I don't think anyone can, Haku finally admitted. He glanced back towards the ship feeling Karen walk towards them. He smiled at the lady of Yuzushio. She was a woman amongst other women. You like. Karen ignored Naoki and spoke directly to Naruto. The blonde nodded his head. You have outdone yourself this time, wife, he said with a wide smile. Karen put her fingers on her glasses and flashed a smile. I want to take the credit but I didn't do much with this thing. You'll have to thank the team who worked around the clock to build this for you. This is also the land of Springs technology. We should also thank your other wife for this. There is no need to thank Springs. They were merely returning the favor for our support to get them out of their poor economic status after Koyuki took the position of feudal lord from her uncle, Naruto said. But since they have been faithful, I guess we can thank their cooperation to our dreams. Didn't we bother helping them because you saw the potential? Naoki asked. Yes, but I didn't think she would end up asking me to marry her though. Well, no matter, he said with indifference. When can we take it for a spin around the great nations? I feel like announcing the greatness of the Uzumaki already, he said with a wide smile. Karen shook her head. Any time you wish, she said. It is yours after all. You are correct about that, he said before tilting his head to the side. But I thought you were laying claim to everything that I own, he said. Karen shrugged. I wanted to make you feel better by not saying it is mine as well, she said while smiling. I imagine it is going to be a huge battle of control, when we break up, he said. Who said we are going break up? We made a vow, even if I can't stand you or have thoughts to murder you in your sleep, I will fight the urges because we will not separate. We will die together. Together is a long time, especially for us. I want to take those words back, Naruto said. Naoki cleared his throat before the conversation could drift any further. Shouldn't you leave that for private? Karen shrugged carelessly. Haku will show you how to operate it. I'm going back to the island. I was hoping you'd spend the night in our bed, Naruto said. Karen stared at him for a long minute before shrugging. I'm sure you have a mistress to keep you company. But I better not find anyone in my bed when I come back. There will be consequences should that occur. You better not stay away then, Naoki said with a smile. I'm almost certain that your husband is going to Suna the moment he gets on that airship. To see. Karen asked with narrowed eyes. He managed to find a certain blonde there the sister of the Kazakage Naoki said. What is he talking about, Naruto? For a moment, Naruto considered telling Naoki that he was fired from his job. He decided against it before shrugging. He is talking about things that don't concern him. I'll have to rewire him so that he can function as needed. Karen stared at Naruto strangely before agreeing with him. Well, when one of your tools doesn't operate the way you want, there is no other way other than to rewire it or just dispose of it. Naoki blinked. How had it come to this? He had been merely trying to get Naruto in trouble or just trying to stir up things because he knew that the blonde would not care. If he was serious with Tamari, he would not be mad because it was something he was eventually going to discuss with the lady. Um, your majesty. Naruto ignored the man and spoke to Karen. There is Tamari from Sunagakure. We will talk more about it when you come back home. We don't talk about these things since you prefer sitting in that island than being in my absence. Karen shrugged indifferently. I know the moment I arrive back to the compound, I will be expected to drop babies like a bird laying eggs. I'm not ready for that. Era Naruto smiled with amusement. I thought we married for love and your return would be so that you can love me. Karen laughed. There is that, she said. We will get to it when the time is right. You did things in your terms and stayed away from Yuzushio, I can be offered the same opportunity. Naruto smiled, head tilted to the side. Well, I am the emperor, aren't I? He asked pleasantly. But it is fine, you can do as you like. Everyone seems to do as they please around here he said. 
Karen smiled happily and shortened the distance between them before kissing him on the right cheek. I'll see you soon, she said. I'll be overseeing the prison building and my other projects. Don't invoke too much chaos in the world otherwise there will be no peace. Why do you make it sound like I would go all the way out to invite trouble? Naruto asked, eyebrow raised, his voice sounded honestly curious. Karen stared at him for a moment before walking away without saying another word. Naruto turned to Haku and asked. Am I that bad of a person, Haku? He asked. Haku smiled. Of course not, you are a delightful person, he said. Guren raised a brow and stared at the ice user for a moment. You know, it does sound like out of everyone close to him, you're the only one who says that, she said. Are you suggesting that I am not a nice person, Guren? Naruto asked. Guren shook her head. Quite honestly, he was a tolerant person and sometimes convenient. He sometimes did allow his subordinates to do as they like as long as they followed his instructions when necessary. But she had come to understand that sometimes the instructions depended on your interpretation especially with Naoki and sometimes with Yoshino. The latter's excuse will be that the emperor would like it better being done that way. No, Guren said with a shake of her head. His majesty is a good person. It is just that people don't usually say it which makes it a bit interesting and curious. Naruto thought about it for a moment before shrugging. I should order them to say nice things then, he said. Naoki, you stay behind, I will depart with Guren and Haku. Yoshino should know what to do in my absence. I won't spend much time away. I am just going to make a stop in Suna before returning. This is a better way to announce my return from the dead. Suna. Guren asked just to see if Naoki had been right to say that he was going to the hidden sand. Naruto merely smiled and motioned for the two to lead the way towards the airship. Haku led him towards a large entrance at the right side of the ship. The doors automatically slid open as they neared and stepped into a silent passage. They walked for a bit before reaching two paths. Haku pointed at the narrow passage ahead and spoke. You have resting chambers on this side, he said as they turned to a corner. The bridge is this way, he said. They stumbled upon the heart of the ship it was like a throne room. There was a large throne that Naruto settled on while Haku and Guren stood by both his sides. The blonde smiled as rested his head on the palm of his right hand. I can get used to this, he said. Haku shook his head. Not too used to it, I hope, he said. Naruto nodded his head and glanced at Haku, who was on his right side. Where is the heart of this thing? He asked curiously. Haku pointed below them. Your throne is fitted with chakra receivers and a chakra absorption seal. You can either give supply the chakra to start the airship, or you can activate the seal to start absorbing chakra from you. It is also fitted with chakra storage seals to be able to function without any help from you. How much chakra are we talking about? It only absorbs much when it is starting but when we get into the air, it doesn't use much chakra. The weapons though will be the ones that drain much chakra, Guren responded. I haven't seen their destructive force but I really want to see it. She said with a grin. So do it, Guren, Naruto said with a smile of his own. But it won't look good if we are just firing at nothing. It looks much better when there is an enemy in front of us that we can use as a test subject. I doubt we will come to this point though. My only interest is intimidation. Perhaps we will use it for those who come to us through the sea but it is by land, we fight head on, he said. Haku shook his head. I hope you take into consideration that not everyone loves a good battle as you do, he said. Naruto merely shrugged and asked for how the activates the seal that absorbs chakra. Haku showed him and he did so. The airship breathed a bit loudly before it slowly started to pick up into the air. When it got into air, Naruto frowned because he could not see the view of the world and the vast quite clearly from the bridge. Well, this is rather unpleasant. He said. Make sure we head straight above the hidden leaf as he go to Suna and be at full speed. Yes, your majesty. Do you think that all will be well in Sunagakir? Haku asked in a quiet tone. Naruto hadn't told Tamari that he was going to play dead. He had indeed died but he could have still told her that he was alive, but he did not tell her anything. 
she was most definitely going to be angry with him if what Naoki had said had some truth in it. I don't know, Naruto said in a thoughtful tone. Well, if it doesn't work out, we can't force the issue, can we, Haku? People are free to choose who they like and who they want to associate with. If Tamari decides that I am not worth her time, we cannot force her to do anything she doesn't like. We will accept it. Freedom, huh? Yes, Naruto said. Everyone loves it after all. Sanagekure. Gara was standing at the walls that surrounded the hidden sand, hands folded together with an expressionless mask staring at the airship that had flown above the village. It had been alarming and a dangerous situation. Any hidden village would certainly struggle from aerial threats. Perhaps it was what had made the Sky Nation dangerous. The moment he had seen the ship, Gara had moved out and prepared his shinobi. They were living in a dangerous world. Anything could happen. He hasn't made enemies but it didn't mean that someone wouldn't try to attack them for some other reason. It was such world. Gara glanced at his right as Baki flashed before him along with a number of shinobi. Is the village, secure? He asked in a stern tone. Yes, Baki said with a slight nod of his head. Do you think we are under attack? I don't know but you can't be sure about anything in this world. We haven't made enemies out of any nation that would be bold enough to attack us like this, the fifth Kazakage responded. But we still have to be careful. Baki nodded. There was no harm in being cautious. There would be nothing lost just something gained. If it was indeed an attack, maybe they would have attacked while still in air he offered. I considered that, Gara said. But he was not expecting anyone. None of the villages he was allied with had something like this. It was not Kanoha. It certainly wasn't IWA or Kumo. What would those two even want here in the first place? If it was them, wouldn't they have just decided to attack without a warning? We just have to wait and see, he said. Naruto stepped out of the airship in majestic crimson robes with the word Emperor written on the back. Both Haku and Guren were flanking both his sides. When he touched the desert sand, he stopped and stared into the sky before breathing in the air. The wind was still strong as before. The air was truly speaking to him. This was the wind country the land that made his blood excited and his senses going haywire. So this is the wind and that is Sunagakir, Haku said as he looked around. How uncomfortable, he muttered with a slight frown on his lips. At least to you, Guren said to Haku. Someone seems to be enjoying the atmosphere she added glancing at Naruto who was still motionless, eyes cast up into the heavens. Wind is his natural affinity, Haku said. He should enjoy feeling strong wind like this, he said. I have grown to use to better conditions than this. This kind of place is certainly not a good battlefield for someone who uses water and ice. I wouldn't have any such problems, Guren said. I can fight in any environment. But when you have an environment like this, it is easy to see why even though Suna has always been the weakest of the Great Five it has never been invaded by any village. They are in their home field like this, Naruto said. The Kazakage also manipulate sand. If you end up coming here to fight them, even if you win, you suffer massive casualties. Well, at least Yuzushio has no beef with the sand. After saying those words, Naruto held out both his hands. Guren and Haku looked for a moment before taking his hand. Wind surrounded them and formed like a twisting tornado. But when it started moving, it moved like a wind gentle gust before stopping near the shield of Suna Shinobi and their Kazakage. Gara's eyes widened slightly. How long has it been? But his eyes were not mistaken. His senses were not mistaken. He was seeing Naruto Uzumaki before him. It hadn't been someone else who came to threaten him and his village. This unannounced visit was from a person who was thought dead. No, Naruto had died. He had seen his body. He could not have faked his death because Tsunade would have realized it. She was the best medic after all. Naruto had died two years ago. But he was standing right before him. He could not have faked his death because he had indeed died. But how was he before him looking very much alive? Why was it that for the past two years he had remained dead and then now he suddenly appeared? Out of everything he knew about Yuzushio Gakure, he knew that the black-haired person was a shinobi of the whirlpools. 
That aside, both shinobi surrounding the blonde were wearing yuzu foreheads protectors. Unlike last time, Naruto's clothing did not display his clan's symbol. Gara crumbled into dust before materializing in front of the yuzu group. Both Haku and Gurin didn't react and the Kazakage appeared followed by his shinobi. You feel and seem like Naruto, but are you really, Naruto Uzumaki? Naruto smiled. It was perhaps understandable that Gara would offer this kind of greeting. Tsunade would have certainly lunged towards him with every intention of breaking every bone in his body. What do you think, Gara? Naruto shook his head. Kasakage. Gara stared at Naruto for a moment. He could not mistake it. He had been right. This was indeed Naruto. You are Naruto Uzumaki. Naruto shook his head, making Gara tilt his head to the side with confusion. I am indeed Naruto Uzumaki, he said, smiling. What am I missing? Last time I stood before you as Naruto of Kanoha, but today, I stand before you as Naruto Uzumaki, the emperor of Yuzushiogakure Naruto introduced himself. He did notice that the people around the Kazakage stiffened slightly at his words but he didn't pay it too much attention. Gara stared. It was already a shock that Naruto was alive and not dead even though he had seen his corpse. There was no doubt on the dying part. It was a shock to see him but for him to turn up as Yuzu's emperor. It was ridiculous. Gara couldn't believe it. But it was in front of him. Naruto had just said it and these people with him were shinobi from the hidden whirlpools. What was happening in this world? This was a shock that was going to turn this world upside down. Who could have thought that the person who appeared in this village while training was actually an emperor? Not just an emperor but the emperor. Gara glanced at the airship behind Naruto. This just meant that the death had been a ploy. Naruto, the emperor of Yuzushiogakure. It was truly unbelievable. How had it even happened when the blonde had been in Kanoha his whole life? He wasn't privy to the inner workings of the leaf but he at least knew that there hadn't been a point where Naruto disappeared from Kanoha for some time. No, the blonde had been around. If there had been a connection, anyone would believe that the Uzumaki had approached him. But not that he was the emperor. They simply could not have just made him the emperor because he was a Jinchuriki. No, there was a reason and not like why he was made Kazakage. Gara stared at Naruto with an expressionless mask. He did not display happiness even knowing that the person he once called friend was very much alive. This person had deceived them. He had lied to them. I really can't say I am happy to see you alive, Naruto. Gara said in an honest tone. I didn't expect you to dance at the sight of my presence, Naruto said with a careless shrug of his shoulders. Gara was silent for a minute. Their indifference was still there. It seemed that not much had changed. That was at least something good. Then you are prepared for anything. Of course, Naruto said with a nod of his head. I heard that some people cried for me when they learned I was dead. Heard? Gara asked with a raised brow. Well, I was dead for a while before raised from the dead, Naruto said calmly. He spoke as if it was nothing serious. Perhaps for him death wasn't a frightening thing. Maybe the Kyubi was right to say for the Uzumaki, the state of being dead was merely a state of being, inactive. How did they manage that? Sanagekir has a forbidden jutsu that reincarnates a dead person but it comes at the cost of one's life and there is really only one person who knows this kenjutsu, Gara said with curiosity. Clan secrets, Naruto said in a dismissive tone. Are we going to be allowed to enter the village? We really can't stand here all day. Naruto said to Gara, but he wasn't looking at the Kazakage, but the person who was standing a bit away from the group. Gara glanced behind, Tamari. It was likely that Naruto hadn't come here for him but to speak to his sister. They were probably the first to know that he had returned from the dead and by looks of things, his death had been planned. His sister had been hurt. She had been wounded by his death. She hadn't known anything. That was certain. I wonder about that, Gara said calmly. Naruto tilted his head to the side. You wonder. What is it that you wonder, Kazakage? It is really simple, you choose to let me enter your village, if you don't want to, we leave. Is it really that simple? We have come to learn that nothing is ever simple with you Uzumaki, Gara said. Naruto smiled. 
people just misunderstand us, he said calmly. But yes, it is that simple. You are the one who said he considers me a friend. And I am here because of that. Not my sister. Ah, Naruto continued smiling. I misspoke. I did come here for your sister. She was crying at your death. She has been in pain and your death is something that appears to have been planned. I wonder if I should really let you go near her because you might hurt her again. I still consider you a friend, but I really cannot allow even my friend to hurt my sister. I understand that, Naruto said with a slight nod of his head. This is why I say to you, you choose what you want to do. Gara stared at Naruto for a long minute before standing aside, letting Naruto know that he could move ahead and see his sister. You two may return to the ship, Naruto said to his company. I trust that I will be safe in the care of the Kazakage. I won't take long. I'd like to see the village a bit, Haku said in response. Do as you like, Naruto said before he started walking away. But if you stay for too long, I will leave you behind. Guren blinked and turned to Haku. Is he serious about leaving us behind? Haku nodded. His majesty will allow you to do as you please, but when he says we leave, we leave if you stay behind and get attacked, he might not help you out. If he allows you to do something, you can do it, but when you are needed, you are needed. Anything less is a problem. A few minutes later. Temari was shaking in anger. There was no relief seeing this person. If it was there, it was buried under the anger she felt. He had died and she had seen his body. She had cried thinking really he had died. He hadn't spared her from the pain even her. He had let her cry for him. She had been pained and he had probably just watched her agony without care. And now he turns up like this. What did he want from her? Naruto wasn't smiling as he faced Temari. I came here prepared for anything, Temari. If you feel that you must shout at me, you can do it. If you feel that you must slam your fan on, before he could even finish speaking, Temari had only hit him with her fan. She didn't hit him once. She hit him with until she grew tired. Naruto received the hits without wincing. He just stood there and took the pain. Once Temari grew tired, he moved closer to her and pulled her to his chest. She dropped her fan but her hands did not touch him. He could feel her body trembling. Naruto wrapped his hands around her and whispered. It's difficult for me to empathize, but I am truly sorry for your pain. But for my village's survival, I had to die. My life means nothing, I live for my village. Perhaps I should have informed you, but I did not. If you want to hate and curse me, you can do it. If you tell me that you no longer like me and don't want to see me again, I will leave you. But I came here because I want you closer. That is my wish, my desire. About an hour later. I wish you could sit with me so we can talk, Gara said to Naruto he was walking the blonde towards his airship alone. Naruto could not deny that the person who called him a friend truly had a lot to say to him and questions to ask but Naruto hadn't come here for that. He didn't want to entertain any questions about Yuzushio. Besides that, his mood was a little put off by what had happened with Temari. There will be time for that, he said after a moment's of silence. Gara shook his head. I figured that you came here for my sister, but this revelation tells me you understand what is happening in this world, he said in a firm tone. Naturally, Naruto said, casting a curious glance towards the Kazakage. Does something bother you about my appearance and my connections to Yuzushio? It is curious and if I said it didn't bother me I wouldn't be honest, Gara managed to say after a couple of moments of thinking you were dead and now you suddenly return as the emperor of Yuzushio Gakure. What are the other nations going to think about your appearance? What is Kanoha going to think? What Kanoha thinks is irrelevant, Naruto said with indifference. Gara didn't find this surprising. Naruto's problems with Kanoha ran deeper. His childhood in the hidden leaf hadn't been pleasant but as far as he was concerned, the blonde hadn't held contempt towards the leaf. It could have been fairly hidden at this stage, nothing much would surprise him. This was the very person who literally died and then came back from the dead on his terms. Do you hate the hidden leaf? That is irrelevant to any equation, Naruto answered. Irrelevant? Perhaps with how Naruto saw it, it could be not make any difference but other people would care. 
Still, this just told him that whatever Naruto would do and his relationship with Konoha will not be based on his thoughts regarding the village. It was probably going to be based on convenience. I see, Gara said with a thoughtful look on his face. Then answer me, Naruto, are we enemies or friends? Naruto stopped and glanced at Gara before asking. What is that you think, Gara? I think we are not enemies, but that is solely based on the fact that you came here for my sister, nothing more. I don't know of your intentions. With how Yuzushiogakure has been doing things and your role as the emperor, there is something that is being planned. Do you still consider me a friend? Yes, Gara said with a nod of his head. Even if we become enemies, I don't think that anything will change. Naruto smiled. The Kazakage would stab him even if he does still consider him a friend. Perhaps it was like how Jiraiya viewed Orochimaru. Despite what the snake has done, Jiraiya still saw the friend that he once had. If I am your friend, then you have nothing to worry about. Yuzushiogakure will not provoke anyone, but it will defend itself. Kazakage, someday, we will talk. Naruto waved at the Kazakage and disappeared off to this airship. Gyurin and Haku were already present. He smiled seeing them. Disappointing, he said. I thought you'd be still in the village. Just so you could leave us behind. No, Naruto said. Just so I can watch you travel all the way back to Yuzushiogakure. You two are already known in the elemental nations and if you were to travel on foot, it would be interesting to see how shinobi react to your presence. Would they attack you or just leave you alone? You know we will be attacked, Gyurin said with a stare. I don't know that, Naruto said with a shrug. He settled on his chair and released a long breath, resting his head on the palm on his right hand as he did. This was rather disappointing. Well, the human heart is something else. You can't always predict what happens. You can only blame yourself for messing up things, Haku said in a stern tone. You could have told her about it. I'm sure she would have been able to keep quiet. You could have also branded her to ensure that she can't talk about it either, but you did not. You chose to let her suffer. If she hates your presence that is all on you. Naruto's eyes glanced towards Haku before he spoke. That is rather cruel of you to say, he said. But it is the truth, Haku said with a shrug. Why did not you not tell her anyway? Who knows? Naruto said. I can't explain some of the things I do perhaps I didn't fully trust her or I just wanted to see if she really cared for me. Her tears in my death would mean that she cared. Well, this is nothing more than a challenge that I can climb. Things would be interesting if you two decided to enter relationships his eyes moved towards Gyurin. Has anyone approached you? Gyurin blinked, why would you ask that? You are my subordinate, Naruto responded calmly. And I did tell you that you have to create a clan, he said. Have you taken a liking to Yoshino? That man? Gyurin shook her head. He makes me feel uncomfortable sometimes. Naruto smiled, I can share those thoughts, he said with a small nod of his head. Well, the Uzumaki males are operating under some laws they are not permitted to marry anyone who is not Uzumaki. Why? Gyurin asked curiously. She had noticed though, every Uzumaki family was full of redheads. They associated with other people in the village but they still didn't enter relationships with other people. They want to grow their clan and they don't want to see their blood die out, Haku said. But there is another good reason, and it has nothing to do with growth. You know the Uzumaki have a strong life force and utilize chakra chains this diminishes when you are not a full-blooded Uzumaki. The value of the chakra diminishes and if they continue to mingle, they will eventually lose all the traits that make them special. You are already married to Princess Koyuki, and she wants a child, what is going to happen there? Gyurin asked Naruto she already knew that not all his parents were Uzumaki. Who knows? Naruto said with a shrug. You two should think carefully though, your slow pace in settling down is being tolerated now especially for you, Gyurin. Time is moving, and very soon, we will be fighting. You need to make preparations before those fights. Chapter 15 Flashback Hiruzen stared at the danger sign at Naruto's door. There was indeed danger inside. Not in the way the villagers thought. No, there was something much dangerous than what anyone could begin to imagine. 
Naruto was not the Kyubi he had never been. But Hiruzen had come to learn Naruto possessed a dangerous mind the passion and dedication of a mad lustful demon. He could compare Naruto's passion towards the Uzumaki with Orochimaru's obsession over immortality. Perhaps Naruto's will was greater. He indeed possessed the patience to wait for years even when nothing looked like it was happening. It had just been over two years since they went to Yuzushio the greatest blunder of his life. But Naruto had looked so innocent and he had asked earnestly. Hiruzen had not thought that things would change. He had not thought he would come to the realization that there were members of the Uzumaki clan who were still alive. Itachi had said he came across one of them. The Hokage sighed deeply before opening the door. He did not knock this time. He just stepped into the apartment. It was dark. But he knew, while other kids were sleeping, this person was not. It was just as he expected when he opened the door to Naruto's room, he found those blue eyes staring at him from the window, body motionless. He almost froze at that look. For a moment, he had thought it had looked so cold that it sent a chill down his spine. We need to talk, Naruto, Hiruzen said to Naruto in a serious tone. The blonde turned away from the Sandame Hokage and faced the outside. The moon was at full force. Perhaps it was a time that called for this kind of engagement. Preferably, I would have wished for things to never come to this point, old man, the blonde said in a quiet tone. So, did I, Naruto. But when I lied to you about the space-time ninjutsu, I knew I had messed. It was a stupid mistake on my part a massive blunder that I should have just avoided by telling you the truth. But I had known that you possess a mind that I feared. Still, it would have been much better to tell you the truth than be caught lying, Naruto said in a flat tone but there was anger and frustration over his inability to sell the act to the third. I have also lied to you, Naruto, Hiruzen admitted. Perhaps I underestimated your ability to ready between the lines. But I had never actually thought that the Uzumaki would still be around. Honestly, if I had known, I wouldn't have taken you to Yuzu. No doubt, Naruto said with a nod. What do you want to talk to me about, old man? The Uzumaki and if you have connections with them know, at this point, it is likely that you have a connection with them. There might have also been something in the whirlpools that I did not see. Your clan is good with Fuenjutsu it would not surprise me that they would create barriers that would even fool a Dejutsu. You are probably learning that Jutsu to be able to travel between here and them, Hiruzen said. Do you hate Kanoha? What are you planning with them, Naruto? I'd hoped that we would never have this conversation until I was ready, but it does appear that there is no avoiding it. However, if I agree to talk to you, you cannot talk to anyone, write to anyone or even leave notes about anything regarding me and the Uzumaki. Hiruzen narrowed his eyes. What is that supposed to mean? We are going to keep things just between us, Naruto said. If it doesn't happen like that. Kanoha has not loved me. I do not care for it. I do not love it. My father may have sacrificed himself for this village, but it doesn't mean a damn to me. They have tormented me, day and night. They have accused me of being evil, the child of a demon and blamed me for what happened in the village. I will not forget that. I will not just get up and work for this village when I must bring my own clan from the shadows and into greatness. Hiruzen had never heard Naruto speak like that. He was concerned, worried. Naruto, you have to understand that they are just angry. Naruto cut off the Sandame before he could finish talking. Don't take those excuses with me, Sandame. I respect you don't make me lose that respect by telling me irrational things. They are angry and sad. You can understand it, right? But you don't condone their behavior. Then it is very simple, old man. If you can apply those same standards to them, you can apply them to me. I have every reason to be angry with them, he then smiled bitterly. What have I done to deserve this, old man? Hiruzen could not say. After all, there was nothing that Naruto had done. He was just born into the family of Minato. Nothing, Naruto you have not done anything wrong. And I am sorry for what has happened. I told you about your clan because I wanted to give you an identity. And I have found it, Naruto said in a quiet tone. My words to you will not change nothing of this will be told anyone. And you have my word, and as thank you for what you have done for me, 
although I will never forget what this village has done to me, I will not attack it. Not unless it decides to attack me. You are threatening the hidden leaf, Naruto. I don't think even you have the arrogance to assume that you can do any harm to this village. The killing intent was massive. Naruto nearly thought of jumping out of the window. Frightening, Naruto thought. He then smiled, head tilted to the side. He then placed his right hand on his belly, I've learned enough about this village to understand that you're the only one aside from Jiraiya who is familiar with Fuinjutsu. But the San Nin is not in the village. If I feel that living is no longer worth it, he snapped his fingers a bit of the Kyuubi's chakra was released, causing Hiruzen to freeze. The Kyuubi can have another feast. I know you are not going to try to have me re-educated because of what I have spoken. I know you are a genius, and I cannot match that. Openly saying that, Hiruzen said with a bit of his killing intent dozing out. The Uzumaki are indeed alive, and probably watching. They are probably in this village. I understand you well enough to know that you wouldn't say that to me unless you were sure you could get out. Besides, space-time ninjutsu affords you that mobility. He then paused, shaking his head. What do you want to do with the Uzumaki clan, Naruto? I just want to raise my clan from the dead and make it become great again that is all I wish, Naruto said in a firm tone. I do not have war with anyone. And those responsible for the fall of the clan? I would have more reasons to hate Kanoha than those who were responsible for the destruction of the clan, old man, Naruto said in a flat tone. I can't trust your promise and you can't trust my words but we can trust the majestic work of Fuinjutsu, can we not? End of flashback. Kanoha. An airship belonging to Yuzushiogakure this represented aerial threats from the whirlpools. This was dangerous news. It was going to get nations like Kumo and Iwagakure panicking. People were going to die. The shinobi world was staring at chaos as things stand and the Uzumaki were fueling it. There was no need to show it off like this unless they wanted people to see it. They wanted the shinobi world to start talking and thinking about their new toy. They were pushing villages into a panic mode. Anyone would feel threatened by this power. How could they guard against aerial threats? This was nothing like what the Sky Nation had done. This was doom. Tsunade now understood why Princess Koyuki had gone to Yuzushio. She now knew that her village had participated in the building of that thing. She had been used. Yuzushio had been in lockdown because they were hiding things. She should have demanded more information. She laughed bitterly thinking that if Danzo had been alive, he would have been laughing at her. He would have been telling her that she should have listened to him to avoid this situation. But who would have thought that things would turn out like this? The Godame Hokage stared at the message from the hidden sand once more. She had read it and handed it to Jiraiya to read it before he returned it. Everything was clear, yet she was failing to accept it. Her former teammate had been silent since reading the message. Tsunade glanced at him for a moment before staring at the message once more. She was hoping it would change that maybe she had been reading it wrong. The message did not change. The words were clear but it was difficult to accept. I should have known, Jiraiya finally spoke, his tone was filled with anger and bitterness and his eyes were sharp, hiding the pain and relief he felt. How could you have known? Tsunade asked in a quiet tone, eyes staring at the toad sage. The signs were there, Jiraiya shook his head. I was just naive. I didn't want to believe it. I wanted to see what suited me because I was afraid. Is there something I am missing? Tsunade demanded in a hardened tone. Is there something that happened during the training trip that could have set off the alarms that you didn't tell me? Jiraiya was silent for a couple of moments before shaking his head. No, he said. There was nothing that could have set off the alarms. Naruto behaved. Then what am I missing? Tsunade asked with frustrations leaking into her voice. He didn't appear like he had any connections. And even if he had connections, there was nothing that gave it away. We were all fooled. He fooled all of us. The Godame Hokage slammed her fist on the desk, cracking it. She was pissed off she was angry. Why? She had received a message from Gara saying that Naruto was very much alive. The damn brat she had cried for the blonde she had buried was alive. 
He has been alive these past two years, hiding and enjoying himself in the comforts of Yuzushio and plotting the Uzumaki's agenda while they cried at his death. It made Tsunade angry. What had she done to deserve this? He had fooled her. Tricked her and now appears in the sidelines with another village. Naruto was Yuzushio's emperor. The man they had been searching for in the last couple of years had been in front of them. Naruto had been playing them this entire time. He had been Yuzu's emperor while playing a shinobi of the hidden leaf. Yeah, he got us, Jiraiya said in a bitter tone. And he had helped the blonde train. No, there was still a lot more about Naruto's skills that he didn't know. But what did you mean by saying you should have seen it? After our visit to Amage Cure, Naruto did mention that the best way to disappear without people searching for you, was to play dead. He had meant those words. He played the same trick. We had his body. We saw him dead. We could not have looked for him. We could have suspected the reasons for his death, but there was no denying that was indeed dead. We weren't going to look for him. He planned this. He wanted this. Haku was also returned from the dead, so the Uzumaki have this ability. The slug princess frowned deeply. We couldn't even do much to his body because of the seals, she said. Jiraiya nodded. I think those were also in place to keep the Kyubi from leaving. The seal would have weakened he shook his head. The seal was already weak because Naruto was using the Kyubi's chakra. The more he uses it, the weaker it becomes. He must have known this and put measures to avoid it leaving knowing that he would return. He also didn't want us to study his body. Why still go such length? Jiraiya shook his head. I'm not sure Haim, he said with a sad smile. It wasn't a pleasant experience. He had mourned the blonde after all. But now he was back and hadn't even bothered to see them or tell them himself he just flew above them. But I think he didn't want us looking for him. I can't understand that, Tsunade said with a shake of her head. But even if she did not want to understand, what was it going to change? But now that he is showing himself, does it mean that he is done with whatever he was doing? Jiraiya nodded this was without question. Naruto was done with his preparations and was ready to face the world. He could have kept hidden for a little while longer. But he made his appearance now with Yuzu's new toy. It worries me, he said in a serious tone. It would be stupid not to worry, Tsunade said a bit harshly. What do you think he is up to? I can't tell. There is something that Naruto did well during our time together hiding his thoughts. He never showed me his desires. He always hid everything behind the mask of indifference and speaking objectively and rationally in each subject, Jiraiya said with a deep frown. That should have been a warning but sometimes we talked and laughed. I just thought, there was no way there was something dark behind that mask. Is there now? We don't know, Jiraiya said with a slight shake of his head. It is likely that Kanoha is safe, but one thing is certain Yuzushio has been preparing for war for years now. I think the same can be said for Amage Kure. Last time I checked, it had been heavily militarized and its shinobi were of high caliber. That was by no means pleasant news. But she has always known that Yuzu was busy with something. She just never thought that it would be this big. So, there is no doubt now that Yuzu and Amage Kure are connected. Yes, Jiraiya said. The Sanmin then laughed bitterly. He laughed like a madman. You should have seen him in the presence of both Nagato and Conan. In my presence, he didn't speak to either nor did he even look at them. He just wore his mask of indifference. Even when we spoke, he didn't even slip. I guess Fukasaku was right in how he expressed his concerns. Tsunade stared at her friend with concern. What did he say? Said something like this village could be filled explosions and people would be screaming in despair and Naruto would still have sweet dreams, Jiraiya said. I thought he was exaggerating then and I didn't think much of it. But I should have seen it. Unless he chose it, Naruto hardly reacts to anything. Minato could appear in front of him say he's been alive these years and he wouldn't as much as blink. Aren't exaggerating, Jiraiya? Haim, Jiraiya put on a stern look. How did Naruto become Yuzu's emperor? How was he even able to move about without anyone knowing? Tsunade frowned deeply. This was something she could not answer. No one in this village could answer. 
And yet, it had happened right under their nose. What do you think? Do you think Sensei knew? Unlikely, Jiraiya said. If Sensei knew, he would have made sure that we knew about it. Sensei loved Konoha more than anything. If he felt that Naruto could leave the village, he would have tried something. Then how did it happen? We will have to ask Naruto, Jiraiya said. If he decides to come here and answer questions. With how he is, he might not even answer questions, the Godame said. Do you think he wants war? I don't know but I know he has been preparing for it. Amage Kure has been preparing for it. They don't have to do anything. IWA or Kimoga Kure will do everything for them, Jiraiya said. But this just meant that there was going to be trouble. They had also been preparing for war and perhaps Yuzu could have been preparing because it knew it was going to be attacked. But some actions seemed to be just blatant provocations techniques meant to steer things towards a certain direction. Certainly, if Yuzushio had bothered engaging Iwagakure, it might not have had to fear for itself. But now it does seem that the village wanted for those villages to attack. Naruto wasn't stupid but did he think that Yuzushio could stand the power of a great nation? Jiraiya thought it was a ridiculous thought but he was talking about Naruto he wasn't going to close the chapter on a miracle. If it is so, we must talk to him as soon as we can, Tsunade said. We have also been preparing his appearance will get both the enemy to blink. They are going to act soon and we want to know how Yuzu will react. It's obvious, Jiraiya said. They are going to defend themselves. They will return the violence. I don't know how it will go but Yuzu will certainly respond in kind to any threat. We should stay away from that path when we can. Tsunade nodded. If there was the option that she could avoid a war, she would take it. Well, Gara does say that they are still friends. It is understandable with Sunagakir but what I know is that the Whirlpools has a problem with what was done in the past and Konoha may be at fault. Naruto asked me questions why was it that even though Yuzushio and Konoha were more than allies, the Uzumaki didn't seek shelter here. Why didn't Konoha even do anything? Jiraiya frowned, thinking. Rationally speaking, you'll ask those questions. But I think for Naruto, it was personal because this was his clan. Tsunade was silent for a couple of moments. She wanted to believe that Naruto had no problem with them. She wanted to believe that Konoha would not go to war with Yuzushio. Regardless, the situation is troubling. How strong is Naruto, really? You saw him playing with his friends, Jiraiya said. Naruto is powerful. I can't tell how powerful because he never revealed everything unless it was convenient. Tsunade nodded. At least there was still Sasuke. Regardless of her thoughts about his personality, he was Kanoha's most treasured asset as things stand. How did things even come to this point though? How did Naruto play the emperor under your nose? I know you said we'd have to ask him, but this is still something that makes me curious and frustrates me. Same here, Jiraiya said with a nod of his head. He was silent for a couple of moments before speaking. It obviously started when Sensei told him about the Uzumaki. It looks more likely now that when Sensei disappeared with Naruto, they'd gone to Yuzushio. We don't know what they found there. But knowing Sensei, he did go with someone else he trusted. And what if the person is dead? Tsunade said a bit hopelessly. Before Jiraiya could respond, Sasuke appeared in the room via lightning shunshin. Is it true? Tsunade stared at the Uchiha for a long moment before nodding her head. It is true, she said. Naruto has returned from the dead and has returned as Yuzushio's emperor. Sasuke frowned deeply. It would have been much safer if he stayed dead, he said. You don't like him very much, do you? Of course not, Sasuke was quick to say. He turned towards Jiraiya and spoke. You should know already that my brother had some moments with Naruto. What you don't know is that Itachi was there when Naruto and the Sandame Hokage went to Yuzushio. He told me that they didn't find anything it was just ruins. But it was possible that Naruto found some Uzumaki there. Why didn't you say anything before? Sasuke shrugged. It didn't matter because he was dead, he said in a cold tone. What are we going to do? We are going to defend the Hidden Leaf. Training Ground 44 Kakashi looked up to a tree and saw Yugao sitting alone. 
He I smiled and waved his right hand towards the woman. Yo, he greeted calmly. Senpai, Yugao smiled. I was surprised when I received your message. You never call me out like this, is there something wrong? Can you stop calling me senpai? Kakashi asked. I'm no longer your captain. I'm just Kakashi now. Yugao shook her head. You'll always be a senpai to me. Kakashi sighed. It was the same with Yamato. He just couldn't get away from it no matter how hard he tried. He glanced at Yugao with a serious look and spoke in a stern tone. I was with Tsunade-sama and she showed me a message from Sunagakure. I think you already know about it. Yugao stared down at the jonin for a long moment before asking. Yes, she said. Is that why you called me? Kakashi shook his head. I want to know about your relationship with Naruto. I don't have a relationship with him. Kakashi shook his head. I don't know what the third did with Naruto. He didn't trust Naruto with other people. But I am almost certain that you knew certain things. Yugao smiled. Yes, she said. But I cannot say them. What I can tell you is that Naruto is not a threat to Konoha. He has never been a threat and never will be. Kakashi stared at Yugao curiously she had said something that he hadn't expected the idea that she could not say anything regarding Naruto. But her message was quite clear. Kakashi had always known though. He had always known that Naruto would never attack Konoha. If he had those thoughts, he wouldn't have stayed in Konoha for this long. There had been a reason he stayed. He was certainly afforded free movement by being in this village. Then did you know he was alive? Kakashi asked. I cannot answer that, Yugao said. My role was never to know many secrets but simply to ensure certain things unfolded the way the Sandame would like and for the benefit of the hidden leaf this is the will of the third. Nothing really mattered except for what is good for Konoha, isn't? Kakashi asked calmly. It still surprises me that the third would allow Naruto to leave the hidden leaf. What if he realized that he couldn't stop it from happening because of the choice that he made and decided to just do damage control? Talking to other people and leaving traces of things mean ruining all his plans. She then paused, shaking her head. Well, it was not like he could talk about it even if he wanted to. Yuzushi Ogakure. Nagato appeared in the throne room along with Conan they were in the form of holographic images. He looked around for a moment before turning his eyes towards Naruto. This wasn't the first time he was appearing in the throne room before Naruto. For how long has he known the blonde Uzumaki? Yoshino introduced them and since then, they have shared some conversations. This was still the person who drove the birth of the Uzumaki Empire and tasked Yoshino into gathering the others were still alive. Had it not been for these people, Nagato would have still been under the control of that man who walked like Madara and spoke like Uchiha Madara, but he was not. Abito had been just a man on a cruel mission that could enslave the entire world that was his peace, his redemption it was ridiculous. Where was the peace in putting all humans in a Jinjutsu? At that point, there would be no one who was alive the entire human population would have been left without a conscious. But he had been freed from that illusion and he was now after something that could earn him his peace. It would come through some troubles, but it would come. The Uzumaki desired nothing more than this and establishing their dynasty. Have you already gone out? Nagato asked Naruto in a calm tone. Naruto nodded his head and his eyes turned towards Conan he smiled pleasantly. Lady Angel, it is always a pleasure to see you. Conan shook her head at this greeting it was more of the same thing he did whenever she was before him. Perhaps a little worse when he was in Amage Cure. She preferred it that way. She had nothing against the emperor he was honest. At least to those he considered his friends. They were more than that, weren't there? Yes, they were family. You still seem well, Naruto, she ended up saying. There is nothing to complain about when you are at home, Naruto said. It was your choice to be away from home, Conan reminded him in a stern tone. Everyone seems to like reminding him that what he has done till this far has been his own doing. He was now certain that if he ended up being eliminated, these people would simply shrug and say it is his fault. He shook his head and then went on to serious matters. Has Zetsu made an appearance? Nagato shook his head. Not since we took care of Abito he has not. 
Naruto frowned. This was really worrying because there was a player he could not predict and yet had to worry about. In terms of physical prowess, there was nothing much to fear about Zetsu but since he completely disappeared after Abito was ambushed and torn apart. Naruto had been worried that he might be up to something he didn't want anything disturbing the best laid plans. He could allow some things to surprise him but when it came to this side he could not allow any problems to arise. Tracking him down isn't bearing any fruits either, Naruto said. He stared into the empty space ahead and then shook his head. I have stopped the search for him. If he wants to appear, he will appear and we will be ready for him. For now, we have other things to worry about. Nagato nodded. Will Kimogakure and IWA stop their battles to focus on us? Naruto was quite certain that they would do so. They wouldn't have to do anything to encourage the nations to put their troubles aside and focus on a common enemy. Yes I have already taken the airship out in the open. We just have to wait and see how they react to this. If the reaction isn't good enough, we will consider doing other things. But all things considered, this should have been enough to set them off. Then it is war, Nagato said in a firm tone. Naruto nodded. Yes, it indeed war and a war we shall win. Of course, we have to ensure that the other players don't get involved in this war. We don't want to end up having to fight all the great nations. If we did that, there would be many deaths in the shinobi world. These deaths would only give birth to pain, hatred if things go that point, we won't be safe, Nagato said. We won't achieve anything. Hatred is what gives birth to wars and meaningless conflicts between shinobi. If we can work things out, we should be in a position to be a power that will be able to stop future wars from happening, Nagato said in a firm tone. At the same time, we must work be careful not to grow too strong to make even allies nervous, Conan said. If we are too powerful, the cycle will just repeat itself. That would be unfortunate and I would have failed in my role as the emperor of Yuzushiogakure, Naruto paused for a moment, thinking. Because the war will be designed by us, we will not reveal everything about our powers. If things remain this way, you will fight Iwagakure along with Conan without your shinobi getting involved and I will handle Kumogakure this should keep some of your weapons hidden. We can deal with IWA, Nagato said. What about the future? We will handle that in a careful manner, Naruto said. I will go to Kirigakure to try to win them over to our side. Suna seems to be won. As long as we don't throw in the first stone, we should be fine with other nations. Besides, we will only be defending ourselves. Naruto said those words with a wide smile on his lips. Nagato merely shook his head. We must still not be too idealistic as Jiraiya is Conan warned. Of course, Naruto said with a nod of his head. People will always fight there will always be conflicts. As long as we live and remain unique, we will disagree. The problem now is that there is no one to manage the conflicts. This is why there are always wars and great nations do as they please. But we shall show them that there is a consequence to an action and evil will be punished. The following day. Durin watched with an amused look as Haku checked Naruto properly to ensure that he was dressed like the Emperor. The ice user truly cared for the blonde there was not a doubt. At some point, she did think that he perhaps cared more for him than other Uzumakis in the village did. Then again, even though he was Uzumaki, Naruto was still somewhat of an outsider since he hadn't been born in this village and he was still not Uzumaki by full blood. No one could still argue with him though he hadn't been put as emperor by anyone as far as Yoshino has said he made himself emperor. I don't think the people who look after him will be too pleased with you, Gyurin said to Haku with the amused look on her face. Haku shrugged. I just have to make sure, he said. But he seems capable of handling himself just fine, Gyurin said. The emperor was not a messy person his hair was something he didn't seem to care for though. There were days it would be so wild you'd think he had been fighting with a civilian girl. I know but I can't help it, Haku said. Besides, we are going to an important meeting with the Mizukich. We have to look our part. His eyes turned towards the hair and he frowned. No matter what he did, Naruto would not allow him or anyone to dictate how his hair must look like. Would you like to take over? Naruto asked Gyurin with a smile on his lips. I wouldn't mind if it was you. Gyurin stared at Naruto for a moment before shaking her head. 
I don't want to get eliminated by Karen, she said calmly. Naruto laughed. She wouldn't go that far, he said. You don't know her, Guren said with a shake of her head. I have seen that woman when she is angry. Naruto shrugged. That is nothing but I did hear that my mother was also like that in her days, he said calmly. Do you think the Mizukage will like me? Guren blinked. She was quite certain that Naruto wasn't going to Kirigakure to get the Mizukage to like him in the way he seemed to suggest. She shook her head he was thinking something personal. One day, we are going to get into trouble because of such things, she said. I wouldn't put the Empire over risk by something like that, Naruto said. He checked himself for a moment before nodding his head. Let us go, our ship is ready for us. He said as they started to move away from the throne room, heading out. There was silence until they reached the streets. The people in the streets welcomed them with open eyes. Guren soaked it all, feeling good about herself. It wasn't often that she got to walk around like this with the emperor of the nation. There was nothing better than this moment. Naruto was sure loved by his people. Then again, he had seen the nation rise to this state and the people enjoyed the empire's riches. He didn't care for much but seeing the empire grow into a powerful force that could be compared to the great nations and he had set himself apart by calling himself the emperor. After they reached the village gates, Naruto teleported the group towards the harbor they found ships waiting in line for their next journeys. There was a small ship that was painted in crimson, the emperor's small ship. Guren looked around for a moment before boarding the ship. Naruto settled on a large chair and the captain of the ship docked. I thought Yoshino would see us, Guren said with a slight shake of her head. Had it been in Otogekure, she would certainly worry and be suspicious of certain characters. Everyone looked suspicious in this place. Sometimes she could even question Yoshino's loyalty to the Emperor. He was the one who brought her here but the past years with the Emperor had made her feel that she owed everything to him her loyalty was not anyone but to the Emperor. He is busy with other things, Naruto said in a carless manner. He then released a long breath, a frown on his lips. Is there something wrong? Haku asked. The old fools that I picked up and convinced to start the village once more are not growing some spine because the village has grown. Well, Yoshino had been theirs but I didn't expect someone to openly say that he should be the emperor instead of me, Naruto shook his head. They could have just done that when I was away. Haku was surprised upon hearing this. I didn't think there were such politics in with the empire's court, he said. Everything had always looked normal and fine. Naruto after all has been able to do as he pleases without any restrictions. Then again, he was the emperor they couldn't do anything to stop him. You are with people, of course thoughts will always differ, Naruto said with a shake of his head. People see things differently. You don't need people who will disagree with you in your court, Guren said in a firm tone. Orochimaru would have gotten rid of such people and I would have done the same. There is no telling what they will do behind your back. If you do such things, you only lead by fear, Naruto said with a shake of his head. You need people to cooperate with you to create something that will last. I don't need to have people fearing me. I allow people to express their thoughts. I am not naive. Of course, anything treasonous will be handled. But there is just the case of someone disagreeing with you. I can't eliminate people for that but I still expect them to follow my orders. Guren shook her head. Well, you have us to watch your back, she said with a smile. Yes, Naruto said. What did Yoshino say about this? Haku asked curiously. Yoshino was many things but he was not a backstabbing idiot. He would not betray Naruto and he was certain that Naruto knew this. We both laughed and asked the man if he was trying to lighten the mood, Naruto said with a smile. Of course, he said he wasn't and we both were disappointed but we did not reproach him for it. Why would anyone want to remove you anyway? Guren asked. I am not a full-blooded Uzumaki like them, Naruto said with a shake of his head. If it was up to me to revive the Uzumaki clan, the only thing that would be revived would be the name but the blood would eventually die out. Well, if I don't try it with another Uzumaki. Guren looked curious. Naruto certainly had the pull to make everyone bend to his will. But he doesn't do that. The people in Yuzushio didn't fear him. They were not afraid of pissing him off. 
Of course, they were always conscious of his thoughts, especially when it involved Yuzu. Naruto ruled differently from Orochimaru. Perhaps Naruto's way was the reason there was actually harmony in their village. There was competition, but nothing as dangerous as people thinking about killing each other. Why do you permit this? He thinks it is more fun that way, Haku said with a shake of his head. He doesn't want people who will just nod their heads when he gives instructions. He wants people who are alive. But it's more fun that way, why does it give you a problem? Guren asked Naruto with a raised brow. It doesn't, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. It just annoys me when it comes at the wrong time. Some people fail to read the mood at times. This is how you made things, you shouldn't complain. Besides, you can always change things any time you want you are the emperor, Haku said, staring at Naruto without blinking. Naruto shrugged. We'll see, he said. Kirigakure. Despite everything, Mei smiled seeing the emperor of Yuzushiogakure. He was truly a handsome young man. She hadn't been expecting to see someone like this. When they said the emperor, she expected to see a greasy old idiot with red hair but she was seeing a handsome young man with long wild hair. He had a charming smile on his lips. But the appearance was very familiar. She could not forget the image of Kanoha Shinobi who died about two years ago. Even so, the Godain Mizukic put on a smile and greeted the blonde warmly. Your Majesty, she greeted respectfully with a slight bow of her head. He held out her right hand, wanting to shake it. Mizukic sama Naruto returned the respect and looked at the hand for a moment. I usually keep the hand shaking with men. He said calmly. May raised an eyebrow for a moment, trying to figure out his words. By his smile, she figured what he meant and smiled slyly. What do you usually do? To strong women, I prefer to be embraced by them, he said but took May's hand. The touch was warm and gentle. But let me keep my hands to myself, for now at least. I wouldn't have minded either way, May said with a smile. I can see that, Naruto said before turning to Haku. You didn't tell me that I would enjoy my conversation with the Mizukage, Haku. He said with a stare. I considered it but I figured you'd get overly excited if we told you, Haku said with a shrug. There are serious matters to be discussed he stressed those words. Naruto shook his head. You and Naoki need to get punished, he said. But this is a good surprise. Perhaps we might get along. Or maybe not. I hope we get along, May said she was smiling but there was a serious undertone in her voice. Likewise, Mizukic Dano, Naruto said calmly. Shall we? I'm afraid we have a long journey ahead of us and we will be quite busy over the next weeks. I'm certain of that, May said in a serious tone. If he had chosen to make his appearance known, then he was certainly going to be busy with the interests of other villages. Please follow me. Naruto silently followed Mizukic in silence. As they walked, his ever-curious eyes glanced over the village, amazed that it had managed to rebuild and repair itself like this. He wasn't talking about the buildings, but the peace that seemed to flow within the atmosphere. It was certainly something interesting and it spoke volumes about the kind of leadership the Mizukic had over this once great nation. When they arrived at the tower, May had the guard stay outside the office because she wanted to talk alone. Guren and Haku didn't object. It was only May's guard who had objections but it was quickly handled. Naruto settled gracefully in front of May's desk and stared at the Mizukic who was staring at him with curiosity while studying every inch of his face. So you have finally decided to meet me after all these years, May said to Naruto. I'd given up hope in ever meeting you. All in good time, Naruto said calmly. Wasn't that you were still busy playing a shinobi of Kanoha? May asked with suspicion, her eyes never left him it appeared that she didn't want to miss anything that might slip from his mask. There was that but if it was a good time to meet you, I would have done so, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. Playing shinobi was quite fun though. I can't imagine. May said. Naruto shrugged and didn't bother trying to explain anything to the Mizukic. I will get straight to it Yuzushia would like to form an alliance with Kirigakure. We have already ironed out trade deals and I think we should move to the next level. May stared at Naruto with an expressionless mask before folding her hands across her chest. Why? Why not? 
The Mizukic blinked. She certainly didn't expect him to give that kind of response. Yuzushio's situation is unique and we don't know your goal. While it would be great to have an ally, Kirigakure will not associate itself with just anyone. Oh. Naruto smiled. He wasn't the least deterred. It wasn't nothing less of what he expected from this person. What are Yuzu's intentions? Nothing bad, Naruto said with a wave of his right hand. Yuzushio only desires to grow into a powerful nation. And for that, we do need allies. Of course, there will be enemies and regardless of whom the enemy is, they will be crushed. May frowned slightly. You say that you don't have any bad intentions, but it looks like there will be war. It does look that way, Naruto said with a nod. And Yuzu will defend itself and its allies. We will not allow history to repeat itself. I'm sure you don't want that. Not anyone would want that, May said with a slight shake of her head. But I believe that you could have stopped this situation if you wanted to do it. You could have done things differently but you did not. What do you think about war, Emperor? Naruto tilted his head to the side and stared at the Mizukage for a couple of moments. He decided to give a simple response. War is bad really bad. He was amused at his own response. May merely stared at him. Can you take this a little seriously, she said in a firm tone. No doubt, from how amused he looked, she was certain that he was fooling around. Was this just a joke to him? She was talking about something that could claim the lives of many people and he was looking at her with an amused expression on his face. Did he not care about the state of the world at all? You ask an interesting question, Naruto said calmly. I have not seen war I have not experienced it. But you have you understand war better than me. People have different views on war, but no one can disagree that it brings nothing more than pain and hatred. You are asking me this question because you want to know if I would willingly throw the first stone to start a war, isn't it? I don't think you have to go that far, May said with a stare. You already know that the situation is tense and you just have to do certain things and the others will react. Perhaps it will be over the top but nothing you didn't calculate. I could be wrong of course, but that is what I think in this situation. I believe that Yuzushio's actions so far have been calculated and with the intentions to start something. Naruto smiled. We are not that devious, Meisan it is fine if I call you that, right? The Mizukage nodded her head. A person's thoughts about war are irrelevant, in most cases anyway. Whether you understand the pain of war or not will not stop you from moving towards it. Shinobi are the kind of people who often struggle to grasp difference between right and wrong. Shinobi villages often stray on the path of what is morally right but will only do what is right when there are consequences for doing the wrong thing perhaps this comes with the human nature. In any case, Yuzushio is a peace-loving nation. And we will not attack any nation. Anyone who has a problem with what we have been doing needs to be mentally checked for paranoia. We have not threatened anyone we have not done anything against anyone. Those who feel threatened have major problems and we cannot help with that. We will not apologize for growing our village. No one questions the great nations when they grow their military strength and we will not apologize. We will not apologize for being alive, Meisan. And we will defend our home, from anyone or anything. Those words they came in a chilling tone. May frowned hearing them. She was certain now, if Yuzushio Bakure really had the strength, it would not show mercy to anyone who attempts to do anything to it. But she didn't want to get in the crossfire of things. Kiri supplied the ships during Yuzu's destruction, are we going to talk about that? This village has just seen a civil war, you are a peaceful nation and what happened in the past has happened. You were not there when things happened if you were there, we would have a major problem. But it is a fact that this village did offer its assistance in our destruction. But we still won't hold it against this village. We don't want to destroy the peace you have created here, we don't want to be a nation that destroys peace this is why we are trying to form an alliance with you. Strategically, we benefit from an alliance we are all surrounded by the sea after all and we rule over them. It would be best not to make enemies of an unknown quantity. Yuzushio was dangerous there was no doubt about that. May didn't want to make enemies with the nation. Well, they have been able to work around things in the past couple of years even though there was nothing formalized in terms of an alliance because she had refused to sign anything unless she saw the emperor. 
There was an agreement that I had discussed with Haku and then with Yoshino, we can just add a few things on it. You could have signed that agreement with Yoshino he is the leader of Yuzushiogakure and would be well within his rights to make a trade agreement. Naruto said. My agreement with you will be on behalf of the Uzumaki Empire and that will include certain villages. The information is confidential, and we hope it keeps that way. Mei frowned. Well, no wonder you are called the Emperor, she said. Which villages? You have Amage Kure, the Wave and Nadashiko. The latter is a great friend of ours and we have a good relationship. We don't rule over it it is just a strategic partner. And very soon, we shall add another. An hour later. Mei was staring at the empty space ahead of her Naruto had just left. She had realized she was dealing with people who certainly knew what they were doing. Yuzushio was indeed dangerous. Naruto wasn't some stupid man who was after power. He was a person with a clear idea of what he wanted to achieve and Mei was afraid of it. He had seemed honest with her though. Yet, she wondered if the agreement she signed with him would be held up. So far, they had worked well in the informal trade deal. So far, they hadn't given her any reason to think they couldn't be trusted, but you could never know when it came to shinobi nations. People could stab you in the back while smiling pleasantly. When Ao walked into the office, Mei stared at the man for a long minute before speaking. It appears that we must prepare for war, she said to the man. Ao frowned. With Yuzu? Mei shook her head. She doubted Yuzushio would want to go to war with them. It had to deal with Kumogakure and Niwagakure on the other side and those two villages were superpowers. Perhaps this was why they were trying to form an alliance. But Naruto hadn't requested that she give him aid in terms of military. I don't know but this world is heading into war and we must be ready for anything. With Naruto. Naruto settled down gracefully and looked into heavens for a long minute before closing his eyes. He opened them and glanced towards Haku. The Mizukage is certainly a person of personality. Did you expect her to be a pushover? Haku asked with a raised brow. Naruto shook his head. It wouldn't have been fun if we could push her around. She is a Kage who has experienced many things, so there is that. But things will work out, right? Haku said with a stare. He didn't think that trouble with Kirigakura would do them any favors. No, they could not afford it. It would only put them in a corner because now they would have to defend in all angles and that would stretch their resources. Naruto nodded. They will he said. Whether she likes our method or not, we can still have a working relationship that is beneficial to both sides. We don't have a problem with them and they don't generally have a problem with us but they suspect us of certain things. Either way, there will be no problems. Haku smiled. That is at least a relief, he said a bit happily. I hope it stays this way and our enemies will only be Kyumo and Iwagakure. I doubt a clash in the sea will work out for them. But I do hope things remain civil. Naruto said. I would like to make it personal but I am currently limited to where I sleep. Is that the only thing you think? Gyurin asked with a stare. Of course not, Naruto said with a shake of his head. I just think that it is sometimes important to have those lasting relationships that will stay strong even in the next generations. Blood ties are much more important and perhaps it could be useful for domination. He paused for a moment before speaking once more. You must get Yoshino to teach you politics. Why? Because very soon, you will be promoted into a role that requires you to play politics. You will not be within Yuzushiogakure forever, Naruto said. What is that supposed to mean? Naruto merely smiled but did not respond to the question. Iwagakure. Anoki couldn't help but loudly curse at the recent report he had just received. He didn't need to deal with this now, not when Kumogakure was just around the corner and waiting for a moment he lost it before attacking. On the surface, it looked like IWA and the Cloud had managed to find some common ground, but it was not the case. Their shinobi were not fighting because they knew if something like that happened, they would actually fight it out and in a situation where three other great nations were not fighting, it was unfavorable. It only worked out when all of them were fighting. Anoki was conscious of the fact that a war with Kumo would only give Kanoha the advantage and the cloud was very much aware of this. They had avoided war because of this. 
If not for the Uzumaki, they would have certainly tried everything to make sure that Kanoha got dragged into the war. Anoki would not have minded pulling the strings to attract this danger. But he had been cautious because he honestly didn't want to fight Kumo it would do IWA no good unless he was thinking of plundering the village in the aftermath. He glanced up when the person he had called walked into the office. Why the hurry to call me? Kuratsuchi said to her grandfather. For a moment, I would thought you were dying. Anoki frowned. Couldn't she read the mood? Or maybe she could and she was saying this because of the mood. I still have many years within me. Apparently, Kuratsuchi grunted before sitting in front of Anoki's office desk. What's wrong? Kumo has not made a move, has it? That would be troubling. Kumo was a heavyweight nation. It had the shinobi population. It had the Jinchurikis to fight and its rakage was a beast. IWA would not come out of the war unscathed and if Yuzu turns out to be the enemy, there would be danger a massive danger for their very survival. There was still Kanoha to consider and her grandfather had already pissed off the village with his remarks. Anoki shook his head. At least for now we can forget about war with Kumobikure because we have a common enemy, he said with a small smile it was a relief and something he had been looking for. Which enemy? Kuratsuchi asked. Yuzushio Gakure, Anoki said. Kuratsuchi was silent for a couple of seconds before finally speaking. They have been silent over the past years. I have been checking their movements with an open eye. Have they finally moved? Anoki nodded his head. He had a frown on his lips as he responded. They have shown something that could be a problem. A couple of days ago, an airship was seen flying over the fire country and landed in Sunigakure. It was belonging to the whirlpools. Kuratsuchi matched her grandfather's frown. Aerial attacks so that is what they have been building. What else have they been hiding? Did this thing show any capabilities? It doesn't have to do anything. They just have to show that they have it and we will all jump. We are all thinking now, at any moment, they could just fly over us and drop bombs. That would devastate the village and we wouldn't even be able to do anything to stop them in time. There was also the fact that they didn't even know how many airships the village had. Perhaps this had been done intentionally. Yuzushio wanted them to see its creations. It wanted them to move to its tune. Anoki hated it. He hated the person who was behind such moves. The village was playing a game with them. It didn't have to launch a strike. No, it knew they were wary of its revival and the moment they felt it was indeed a threat, they would do something. It felt like they were being baited into a trap. Anoki had underestimated the whirlpools. This coming war, it was crafted by them. They just didn't want to be the one to throw the first tone. He should have moved when he heard they had revived. Now they had weapons and he didn't know how many. He didn't even know of their military strength. We have to do something about them then, Kuratsuchi said in a firm tone. Whether they attack us or not doesn't matter, this is just risky. Anoki laughed. It was a bitter laugh. He amused himself thinking that Yuzushio had been expecting something like that. Snakes. He was dealing with crafty people. I assume that is what Yuzushio wants, he said. Kuratsuchi looked confused she didn't understand those words. What do you mean? I mean that Yuzushio planned this but it doesn't matter anyway. If it is war the village wants, it is war it shall get, Anoki said in a firm tone. Its emperor turns out to be someone you know. Who? Naruto Uzumaki. Kuratsuchi stared. That person? That indifferent blonde Jinchuriki who got her drunk and attempted to play her friend before dying when she wanted to meet him? Wait, he was dead. Isn't Naruto Uzumaki dead? It turns out that he is very much alive, Anoki said. He stood before me and said he had no connections with Yuzu. He even looked indifferent when I spoke about destroying it. But he was its emperor. I should have suspected something was off and turned him into dust. Naruto had told her that he wasn't her enemy. Had he lied to her? Kuratsuchi cursed. That idiot probably wanted to manipulate her and she had almost begged him to stay and talk to her. I guess I can use that invitation now. He was saying he wants to be my friend. I can try to invite him. And then you must eliminate him. 
Anoki said in a stern tone. If he agrees to it. It must be somewhere away from Yuzu and you must get close to him. Once you do, you know what to do. He likes to drinking, I will offer him something and then wait for him, Kuratsuchi said with a grin on her lips. I will write the letter and send it to him. I know the perfect place to meet him. I don't think he will disagree. If he disagrees, you are not going anywhere near Yuzu. We can't trust them and I can't let you fall into enemy hands, Anoki said firmly. Can you handle him? They said he was strong, but I will handle him grandfather. When you do, we can think of invading Yuzu and we need to do it with Kumogakure. We can't afford to send men to Yuzu while Kumo lurks. The moment we do that, they attack us, Anoki said. Naruto was sitting on his throne, his back leaning against it, eyes narrowed sharply with power and authority radiating within them. He was staring at a group of forty Uzumaki jonins who were kneeling before the king, led by Yoshino. Naoki and Naori were flanking both his sides. Lift your heads, Naruto commanded in a stern tone. Yoshino, tell me, what was the state of this place when I first came here? We were living in constant fear of another invasion and we had hidden ourselves from the outside world. We did not want to reveal ourselves to the world because we were afraid. Yes, before you came here, the Uzumaki were a fearful people. Let that not leave you until you die, Yoshino. That doesn't exclude all of you. Remember where you were before I came to this village. Remember and never forget. Naruto paused for a moment to allow the words to sink in. Tell me, Yoshino, who was it that encouraged you to start things from scratch and create this village? It was you, your majesty. Who was it that laid the first stone for the empire to be built? It was you, your majesty. Who was it that gave you a mission to look for the other Uzumaki who were scattered across the elemental nations? It was you, your majesty. Who is your emperor? Naruto Uzumaki. Good, Naruto nodded. Then you will remember what I said. You will remember that I promised to make Yuzushiogakure a great nation. You will remember that I said the Uzumaki Empire will become great greater than the great five nations. We are heading there. But before we become the greatest, we must fight. We must go to war. You said you would follow me to pits of hell in the pursuit of greatness and I expect nothing less. I will tolerate failure but I will not tolerate cowards and incompetence. The emperor will not tolerate men who run from battle. My men fear nothing. They fear no man and they shall be victorious because I will lead them into victory. We are not going to be destroyed. But we will win. We will become winners. We will become a great nation. We believe that your majesty, Yoshino said confidently. This is why we fight for you. This is why we follow you. Good. Good. Naruto said with a nod of his head. We are going to war soon. Just this group will be enough. Yes, this group of 43 will defeat a great nation. Those who attack us will know our power the great nations will learn to fear Uzumaki. The odds might look like they will be against us but we will be victorious. I will lead you into victory. Be ready Uzumaki, the next time I summon you here, we will be heading to a battlefield. We will be ready, your majesty. The fifty saluted before disappearing from the throne room in the blink of an eye. Once they were gone, Naruto smiled. Acting like the emperor is taxing, he said calmly. I thought you were getting a kick out of it, Naoki said to Naruto. You're usually playful but isn't this the real side of the emperor? If you joke around too much, people won't respect you. Naruto shook his head. You lack a better understanding of respect, Naoki. If you are serious all the time and people have to hurry to their knees each time they see you, it is no longer just a sense of respect that they feel when they see you but fear. I won't lead my people by fear. They must follow me because they want to follow me. Puppets controlled by fear will not work out for me. As you say your majesty. Naruto's eyes turned towards Yoshino for a moment. The man was already on his feet, looking at them with an expressionless mask on his face. Your Majesty, will this work out? How certain are you that Kanahagakure will not try to interfere with the battles? If they start fearing us, they too will take part and we can't handle that. Didn't I tell you? Naruto asked calmly. 
tell me what? Yoshino said. I know that it was Danzo who sent people to try to assassinate the Rakage. If Kanoha tries to interfere, they will be warned not to do anything or this information will reach both IWA and Kumogakure. I am quite certain that both villages would quickly settle their petty disagreements and march over to the leaf, Naruto said calmly. That represents a problem though, Naori said. If IWA and Kumogakure stop fighting, they will be able to send a bigger army towards us. Nagato would certainly be able to handle that, but it won't be without loss. We want to ensure that we suffer minimal loss in this war, and if things change, our strategy has to change. Then we make sure that Kanoha doesn't do anything stupid because we can't afford anything troublesome. Naruto said in a stern tone. But if we are pushed, we will be forced to use the airship. But that represents major losses that will leave our nation as being known for massacres in the battlefield. We don't want to do anything that destroys our good image. You are playing a gamble, Naoki said with a slight shake of his head. But with how things have become so far, nothing will change in the situation between Kumo and IWA. We have already blown the trumpet, they will make their move soon, Yoshino said. Kanoha is a just a factor that we can't ignore. When the time comes, I will go to them, Naruto said calmly. How are things in the sound? We must start moving things speedily now that war is upon us. We have developed everything that needs to be developed with Odogekure and we have placed a worthy feudal lord. Odogekure remains closed and information is guarded but it has become a real village instead of just a web of hideouts. We have destroyed everything that has Orochimaru's name in it. We must start thinking about changing the name of the village. We cannot possibly use the name that Orochimaru used, Naruto said in a thoughtful tone. We will work out something, Yoshino said with a nod. When do we begin the expansion? Are we going to start now or afterwards? Afterwards, Naruto said. It will be a whole lot easy to do it after everything. Right now, we'd have many questions and even our allies will start second-guessing us. We can't afford that now. It is much easier to move around when people trust you. When you are not trusted, things become a little dangerous. I thought that was the kind of situation you like. Not when it concerns the Empire's future. There are times for one to enjoy a little bit of fun and a time to be serious. Chapter 16 Yujito almost thought that she had done something wrong when she walked into the office of the rakage and found the man looking stern-faced. He has seen better days and with the struggle against Iwagakure, his tolerance levels have been very low and his mood usually foul. And the village was preparing for war. As a Jinchuriki, and one of the most powerful in the cloud, Yujito had already been briefed that they would end up going to war with Iwagakure it was simply a matter if when they would go, but the battlefield had already been set. You wanted to see me, Reikage sama Yujito said. She hoped that it had nothing to do with the war. At this moment, she'd prefer the Reikage saying she had done something wrong. At least she could argue with it because she hasn't done anything wrong. AI nodded and continued staring at Yujito for a couple of moments. When he finally spoke, his voice was cold and stern. I have a mission for you but first, you must know something, he said. Naruto Uzumaki is the emperor of Yuzushiogakure. He isn't as dead as everyone thought, apparently even Kanoha thought he was truly dead. Yujito stared, a bit shocked. That indifferent blonde Uzumaki she had fought with Samui watching wasn't dead. Kanoha had reported him dead. The whole shinobi world believed he had died. This was just ridiculous. Not only was he alive, but he was also the emperor of Yuzushio. What else was a lie about him? Was he even blonde? Yujido shook her head. It wasn't like she had anything personal with him anyway but still this was shocking revelation. How? She asked. AI shook his head. There was clear frustration in his eyes and his tone didn't betray the feeling. Nobody knows. We don't know anything. When he came here and sparred with you, he was already the emperor that is certain. But Kanoha was fooled like everyone else that at least gave AI something to smile about. Yujido shook her head. Just unbelievable. That person had appeared before this village wearing a Kanoha headband but really he was Uzumaki at heart and by blood. It was almost laughable the situation that is. He truly knew the art of deception. 
But then again, he had shown that he was indeed Uzumaki with what he wore. He hadn't hidden it from anyone and proudly declared his love for his clan. But who could have thought that things would end up like this? Well, she had been told before that she would end up fighting him if he became an enemy. What is my mission, Reikich sama We still don't know anything valuable about Yuzushio's military strength because they have kept a tight ship, Ai said with a deep frown on his lips. He hadn't tried as hard as he should have tried. There was no excuse. He just thought, what could a village of few that had nearly seen extinction do? He has received his answer. There was indeed something happening in the whirlpools and he had to know before deciding if he should put on hold his troubles with Anoki to crush the village. One thing was certain though, after crushing Yuzushio, he would be heading straight to war with Iwagakure. He was ready for it. They had held if off for too long. Perhaps even now with Yuzushio involved, Kanoha would involve itself. But the wave country is deeply connected with Yuzushio. Anything that goes to the island passes through the wave you are going to infiltrate the wave and kidnap its leader. You won't do the deed yourself but a squad of special corps will handle it. Yujito processed the words within seconds before asking. You want me to act as a diversion for the real attack? A.I. nodded his head. Yes, that is your mission. You will receive a signal once they have captured the leader and then you can return. Any chance of encountering him? There is the possibility, A.I. said in a firm tone. This is why I am sending you. I can't trust anyone with the mission. The wave doesn't have shinobi to protect it and even if Yuzushio reacts, it will only move to stop your attack and not the real attack. Yujito was slightly nervous now but she didn't show it. The rakage expected her to fight an entire village if she came across Yuzu shinobi, it would not be pretty. At least he wasn't sending her alone. So it should be fine. Still, she didn't want to face Naruto he was no weak person and fighting him would leave her with a less chance of succeeding and if she lost, he could capture her. She shook her head she shouldn't be thinking about such things. How many men are you sending with me? A small group of fifty. It should do enough to test things out with the wave even. But our objective is the wave's leader. If we get him, we have access to Yuzushio, AI said. If you are losing, retreat. C will be offering communications from a safe distance. I will be careful, Reikage Sama, Yujito saluted. When do I leave? Tomorrow morning, the Yandame Reikage. Naruto was sitting on his throne, eyes staring at the letter from Kuratsuchi it was an invitation to a friend. He snorted at the thought. She was such a devious woman. She was using friend because he had used it. Even if she was his friend, she was still planning to stab him in the back when they meet where they first met. He was going to accept her invitation he had predicted that something like this would occur the moment he returned from the dead as Yuzu's emperor. Without thinking deeply about the issue, Naruto burnt the letter and closed his eyes before resting his head on the palm of his right hand. Everything was moving together now. He was going to be fighting soon. Yuzushio would have enemies and the world would be looking at him. How long has he waited for this moment to come? For this time to finally grace him? His existence would no longer be ignored and the Uzumaki would rise from the ashes to become a great nation no one was going to stop it. No one was going to stand in the way. All threats and enemies would be dealt with. Whether death or locked up in a prison cell, it didn't matter, as long as they were out of the picture. While he was thinking, Naori appeared from thin air and leaned over to his ear. Naruto didn't open his eyes as he listened to the man. Kumogakure is moving, your majesty. We are not sure what their target is but they are moving and led by Yujito the Nibis Jinchuriki. It looked like he was going to get some workout soon. He had missed a good battle to death and he was going to get it. Kumo has always been aggressive and the rakage isn't subtle like Anoki. Do you think they are actually trying to come to us? Naruto shook his head slightly. He still did not open his eyes as he responded. No, he said. The wave. Naori frowned slightly. The Akatsuki won't arrive in time to stop the attack from Kumogakure. We don't need the Akatsuki now, Naruto said calmly. We left the wave without Shinobi for this purpose it doesn't have anyone defending it. But we will do it. How big is the force? It's a small group of shinobi. 
Naruto was silent for a moment as he thought about the detail Naori had given him. They are definitely targeting the wave perhaps in an attempt to draw us out as well. But this plays out better for us, he said. Are you thinking of capturing the Jinchuriki? Naruto nodded. Go call Gyurin and Yoshino he paused, thinking for a moment. And summon Narihiro for me. Yes, your majesty. Naori saluted before disappearing without a trace. Kumogakure was making a move and Iwagakure as well. It was a perfect moment to rejoice when things fell into places. It was a pity that he would have to end up locking up Yujito in a cell, but it had to be done and it would surely invite Kumo's anger. But it couldn't be helped. Not when the village was attacking them and this was war. Yujito was a great asset to Kumo's military strength. Her absence damages them, but not so much that they would think of stopping war efforts. It was just less problems for Yuzushiogakure. He just hoped that nothing went wrong. With the likes of Zetsu lurking in the shadows, you could never know what would happen. But he would be on guard. He would not allow things to turn upside down because of a nuisance that had other plans. When he sensed chakra signatures before him, Naruto's eyes slightly opened his posture did not change. Naori was standing right beside him. Yes, he and Naoki were his true guards but because of their other skills, he used them for something else. Besides, he didn't need to be guarded. You summoned us, your majesty, Yoshino said. He was on his knees along with Gyurin and Narihiro. As we speak, Kimogakure is marching towards the wave country. This is a declaration of war from the cloud and we shall treat them in such a manner. We are already at war. We have been at war with them since they defiled this land and laid waste to our home. Naruto's tone was of authority and there was not a trace of emotion in it. Gyurin swallowed hard looking at those eyes that displayed power. He was in the mood. Those eyes of his eyes demanded nothing but respect. She wondered how Naori could be still next to him without flinching. She was always uncomfortable whenever he was like this. Yoshino seemed to sense it because the moment he arrived, he immediately went to his knees he normally didn't do so. Naruto could laugh and tolerate many things, but he could still be a frightening person when he wanted to be. When he wanted to remind you that he was the emperor he did it in a way that satisfied you. I will take the front lines to defend our interests. Yoshino, your duty is to ensure that this village is safe while I am battling the enemy. We don't know what might happen while I am away. For all we know, this could be a diversion, his eyes then went towards Gyurin. You know what you have to do in the wave, Gyurin. Hi, Gyurin quickly saluted. Narihiro, you will join me in case Yujito decides to transform into her bijou form. For now, I have no interest in fighting a fully transformed Jinchuriki, Naruto said in calm tone. But you will not fight. I will do everything myself. Permission to speak, your majesty, Yoshino said, looking up at Naruto. Are you offering a different way to dealing with this situation? Naruto asked. Hi. Request denied, Naruto said in a stern tone. He then lifted his left hand, telling them to stand up. Naoki brought me a message from Iwagakure Kuratsuchi wants to see me in Tenzaku no Gai within a week. Yoshino didn't complain about his request being rejected like that. It had happened at times. Sometimes, you didn't get everything that you wanted. Then things are proceeding as His Majesty planned, he said with a smile. Naruto shared the smile while nodding slowly. I must buy Jiraiya a bottle of sake for presenting me with the opportunity. Had I not met her earlier, we wouldn't have been having this wonderful chance. Indeed, Yoshino said with a nod. I will find one of our best bottles and send it to him. Gyurin blinked with confusion. She didn't follow the conversation but at least the atmosphere was now light. Am I missing something? What is going to happen with the meeting? Kuratsuchi will most likely try to eliminate his majesty if she sees a chance. Yoshino said calmly. Both Kyumo and IWA have thrown their dices and they will lose this round. Gyurin shook her head. She shouldn't even be surprised that these people didn't care that someone was planning to eliminate Naruto. He was still going to see her even knowing the risks. With what they were saying, it was likely that certain things had been manipulated for Kuratsuchi to even think of inviting him. Are you going to eliminate her? Naruto shook his head. 
It would be much simpler to do so he said. But it invites a lot of anger and a swift response from IWA. We don't want Anoki sending out all his men towards us. Kumo would certainly do the same and we would not survive such a war. We will certainly get crushed and this time they will make sure we stay dead. I am going to keep her as my prisoner. I wouldn't mind having her, Guren said with a smile. She is next in line to replace her grandfather. She surely knows about the ins and outs of the hidden stone. We have methods to make people talk I am sure we can get her to sing. I'm quite certain you are just thinking of enjoying torturing her, Naruto said with a shake of his head. She will be a spoil of war and an attempt on your life is an unforgivable sin, Guren said in a firm tone she tried and failed to hide her smile. You sadistic woman, Naruto stared for a moment. We cannot forgive anyone who does attempt to assassinate me, can we? Even if we are responsible for it. We cannot forgive, Narihiro said. It isn't like she will be compelled to do anything. Fine then. Guren, if she does try to eliminate me, you can make her talk. But I want her to live and she must remain intact, Naruto said in a cold tone. You may leave. He straightened himself after Guren and Narihiro left. Yoshino remained behind and stared at Naruto. I received a letter signed by both the Kazakage and the Godame Hokage. Naruto raised an eyebrow. And? Temari-san is coming to this village for a diplomatic mission along with personal reasons. Are you assuming for the latter or was it in the letter as well? I was assuming, Yoshino said. Your Majesty, you are not forgetting the laws that you helped draft for the clan, are you? Naruto frowned. No, he said. The clan laws are absolute but I am still the emperor. I have some leeway because my word is law. However, when it comes to protecting our blood, there will be no compromise. But it still doesn't mean that I can't have a relationship with her. I am just reminding you of the limits, Yoshino said. Temari cannot live here even it improves diplomatic ties with the hidden sand. I know, Naruto said. Then, where are you? I have found someone but I want to get this chapter over with before anything else Yoshino said. Should I engage in the diplomatic ties? Just open communication lines but we are not taking any of them as allies, especially not Kanoha. It would be an insult to our pain to take Kanoha as a close ally once more, Naruto said with a shake of his head. Once we have established ourselves, we can open those other lines. For now, we gain nothing from Suna or Kanoha. Understood, your majesty, Yoshino said. Two days later, Fire Nation. Yujito watched the great bridge of Naruto from a distance with a small frown on her lips. The people who were supposed to head to the wave had already gone in. It wasn't that difficult to enter the country since it wasn't closed to people from outside. Well, given that it was a nation that survived on business, it could not afford to have gates that were locked. Merchants were always coming in and out of the nation on a daily basis. Her reason for frowning was the lack of resistance. She wasn't disappointed she was nervous. There was a reason a notoriously closed village like Yuzushio would keep the wave unprotected like this. She didn't even know what would await her the moment they entered the nation. But because they had been a small group moving secretly, they had managed to avoid encountering shinobi from the hidden leaf or any nation. But still, they were too close for comfort. She had expected Yuzu to know they were coming. But there was nothing to suggest that the village was ready to meet them. Yujito looked down from a tree as C appeared from scouting near the bridge. She had given him the mission to check for traps and any shinobi that might be lying in wait for them the moment they start walking on the bridge. How is the security? Yujito asked quietly. There is nothing, C said with a frown. It's empty. There is no one nearby and there are no traps. We are certainly being invited to come in. Yujito looked away from the jonin and turned her eyes towards the bridge for a moment before speaking. It is looking more likely that they have a trap waiting for us in the village. Likely, C said. But I didn't sense anything. You can send someone to scout the area. We have already done it and there was nothing to see, Yujito said with a slight shake of her head. There was nothing. They only saw civilians. I thought they were perhaps hiding that is why I sent you. At least Naruto wasn't around she didn't have to face him. 
if he was around, C would have sensed him. The blonde had massive reserves that just could not be hidden away. Although his absence from the path increased the chances of success, it still didn't make her comfortable. There were still many questions that she had to answer and she didn't have the damn answers. She wouldn't even get an idea unless she marches forward which was a greater risk but she would still have to take it because there was no other way around. It is something that is unnerving but we can't back out now. Yujito smiled toward C. I didn't know we had that option, she said. We have orders and we must follow them regardless. They could not go back and say that it was too dangerous. It would be a failure on their part and if the others learned of this, the cloud would become a laughing stock with the rest of the great nations. C nodded in agreement to those words. You just have to be careful once you get in. If anything comes up, I will send a message for you to pull out. Don't forget that A.I. Sama said we can't afford to lose you. Yujito knew that. She was going to be careful. Being reckless wouldn't do her any good it would cost her. I trust you will keep your eyes and senses open, Yujito said before jumping down. I will. Yujito nodded. Let's move out, she said while holding out a hand signal. The shinobi hidden within trees flashed around her and they began to move ahead towards the bridge. C didn't have a good feeling about this, but he still didn't say anything. He hadn't had a good feeling about the whole mission. Whether it was wrong or right was irrelevant. But if Yuzushio turns out to be the enemy, their actions would be justified. Either way, he was just a shinobi who had to follow orders of the rakage. He jumped onto a tree branch and checked the earpiece on his right ear. He then hid his presence smartly before settling down. The second he relaxed, his body tensed as two figures suddenly appeared out of nowhere, flanking both his sides. C could not sense anything from them. It was impossible, but he couldn't sense their chakra. They are suddenly moving, Naori said to Naoki. Indeed they are, Naoki said before smiling. How long do you think it will take for his majesty to finish this? Depends on his mood, Naori said, eyes firmly by the bridge. Naoki nodded to this. If the emperor wanted to enjoy the battle, he would prolong it as long as the opponent was worth it. If not, he wouldn't waste time playing around. Then it is going to be short. He didn't even put on his armor. Naori nodded before. Then let us enjoy the show, he said. C's body was tense. There was no escaping these two. They had appeared as if they were not paying attention to him, but he could feel at any wrong move from him and he would drop down to the ground, dead. They must have obviously been watching them since they arrived here. It also meant that the wave was fully prepared to handle the danger. Do you think His Majesty will be pleased that we announced our presence to the enemy? Naoki asked. Are you planning on telling him? You could always forget to tell him Naori said. Or, we could just eliminate him. He said eyeing C. Seeing C's tension increase, Naoki laughed. Don't worry, we just came to keep you company. We have orders not to interfere with anything, even if that means allowing the enemy to flee. C narrowed his eyes. How generous of you he said. You may as well just talk about what is going to happen and pretend I am not here. Naoki laughed. At least you have a sense of humor, he said. We don't know what is going to happen that is why we watching with you. Great Naruto Bridge. Yujito's movements came to a halt when she sensed something. The men with followed her lead and halted without question they too had sensed an overwhelming presence heading towards them. Further ahead, Yujito could see it she could see Naruto slowly walking towards them. She frowned he looked rather menacing. At least he wasn't wearing his armor. Perhaps he wasn't here for battle. She doubted it though. Yuzushio was notoriously merciless. She was ready for him. It was undesirable, but she was ready for him. She had battled him before and she could do it again and perhaps this time around, it won't end prematurely, she will win. No, she had to win. I was honestly not expecting for you to come here, Yijido said with a small smile on her lips. Really? Naruto said still continuing with his movements. You are here to attack my nation shouldn't I step in to stop the attack from happening? It was only natural. Even she would be stepping up to protect anyone who is trying to attack Kumogakure. Even so, I'd thought that perhaps you'd be occupied with other things. 
There is nothing here, Naruto said with a shake of his head. I am expecting someone very soon, so I'd like to finish this quickly. Can you be merciful and allow these people to leave here? I will be your opponent, Yujito offered, stepping forward. At a time like this, you should be looking to escape while they hold me back. You are much more valuable than them, Naruto said in a cold tone. Perhaps those words were a little cold and the shinobi might not think that because she was a Jinchuriki but it was precisely because she was a Jinchuriki that made her much more valuable than a simple jonin. Logically, his option was the best one but it wasn't likely that they were going to follow it and he wouldn't let Yujito escape his grasp, not when she was a valuable asset to Kumogakure. I care for their lives more so than I care for my own, Yujito said in a firm tone. How noble, Naruto said calmly. Regardless, you came here prepared for anything face up to it and we will be done soon enough. Yujito frowned. Naruto wasn't going to do as she pleases. It was unfortunate but there was no helping the issue. She didn't have any other choice but to engage him. If that is what you want, then so shall it be. Yujito's senses flared up as her eyes widened slightly Naruto had suddenly disappeared from her view and appeared behind her. The reason she hadn't moved was because he hadn't tried attacking and his eyes were not even on her he had his back facing hers. That movement had be. Naturally the emperor must always get his way in such situations, Naruto spoke in a silent tone, eyes staring at the Kyomo shinobi in front of him. They had assembled a good team it would certainly give normal people some trouble, but he was not normal. The emperor was born for war. You can leave if you want to but if you decide to stay, know that you will most definitely die, he spoke in a low growl, a massive killing intent leaking it was much that even Yujito felt uncomfortable. The Nibis Jinchuriki turned around to face her comrades, if you want to leave, you can leave he is also a Jinchuriki, I can handle him. One of them shook his head. We cannot run away from the battle, the man who stepped up said in a stern tone. This wasn't their mission but the rakage would certainly not forgive them if they went back having abandoned Yujito. There was war coming soon with Iwagakure Kumogakure needed her power. They could not lose her now. Yujito understood. She would love for them to leave but she also knew that their other mission was already taking place. Yet, with everything going around, she could not afford to fall in the enemy hands. They were probably most worried about their lives. But regardless, Yujito could not allow herself to fall into enemy hands. This is going to be dangerous but I am not taking things easy with you, Yujito said before jumping into the air. While still airborne, she transformed into her bijou form and crashed into the bridge. Her massive form shook the bridge. Naruto eyed the woman for a moment before shaking his head. He could not fight her at this place. The bridge would only get destroyed. It would be irresponsible for him to destroy this vital piece of infrastructure for the Wave Country and Yuzushio. He could not allow her to go on a rampage. He held out his right hand and made some hand motions. A second later, Narihiro appeared into the bridge just behind Yujito. Adamantin sealing chakra chains, the Uzumaki summoned the Adamantin chakra chains from his body and they burst through in speed before wrapping themselves around Yujito. The Jinchuriki cursed when she felt the binds were too tight, that she couldn't move once they had gotten held of her. She tried struggling to break free, but the chains would not budge. She felt herself losing power as the chains suppressed the Nibi's chakra. She cursed silently. Was it that simple to deal with her? They just had to summon those damn chains and it was over with? Yujito wondered as she fell onto the ground, the chains still binding her. It was ridiculous to think that it would take just one person sneaking in from behind to subdue her. Perhaps this was what made the Uzumaki a bit more dangerous for a Jinchuriki. You certainly don't want to fight someone like them. As she struggled with her binds, Yujito glared at the man holding her down. He merely smiled apologetically. It made Yujito feel the urge to curse him. I would not have preferred to end things this way, but if the place was right, his majesty would have fought you. Yujito had forgotten that she was on a bridge. She should have realized that he wouldn't want this bridge to be destroyed. Having transformed, she would have wasted it. But last time she faced him, he had said collateral damage could not be avoided at times. You seem rather kind, Yujito noted from his tone. So it seems, Narihiro merely said without offering his thoughts. 
Naruto glanced at Yujito for a moment and then Narihiro, telling him to keep her like that. He was now going to lay waste to the people that she came with. With Gurin. The guards stationed at the leader's tower were just mere chunin. They hadn't put up much of fight to the Kumogakure shinobi. So far, they hadn't met any other cautious situation. The intel had been right, this was truly a civilian nation and Yuzushio didn't seem to have any desire to have any desire to change it. It certainly had the potential to have its own shinobi with how its economy was growing. Do you think Yuzushio keeps things this way just to make sure that the wave continues to rely on it? One of the Kyumo shinobi asked as they silently moved towards the office where their target was located. Most probably, the other responded. The last leader met an unfortunate incident. It also seems that there is always a change in the leaders. I heard that Kanoha's black orps once apprehended the leader and tried to extract information from him. I don't know if they were successful but Yuzushio didn't make noise about it. It is almost like they really don't care about the leaders. But it isn't that simple. It never is with Yuzushio. But at least Intel was right this time they came to a halt as they sensed Yujito's transformation. I guess they are busy on that side. We should move ahead. They both nodded before checking their henges for a moment. They had arrived at the door of their target. Seeing that the masks were still firm, they knocked at the door. Come in. And they did walk into the office. There was an old man sitting behind the large desk within the office. What stopped them from doing anything was the chakra signature they felt hiding within the shadows. We know you are there, one of them said with narrowed eyes. Gurin materialized from the shadows, grinning. Well, we knew you wanted something, but to think that your target would be this one. Regardless, to get to him, you need to get through me. We came prepared for that, Gurin san Gurin merely grinned. That is what I want to hear she said. Great Naruto Bridge. Don't take your eyes off the opponent, a Kumo Jonin said to Naruto as he flashed in front of the blonde, lunging forward with his right fist pushing the airwaves, heading straight towards Naruto's face. Didn't they teach you that at the academy, your majesty? Another said mockingly while his feet danced as he twisted around, a sword strike directed towards Naruto's neck. Naruto saw both attacks coming his way he held out both his hands, flicking a kunai on his left hand before moving it towards the incoming swing from Kyomo Jonin. The wind-enhanced kunai collided with the sword, stopping it in its tracks. A second later, Naruto's right hand caught the punch that was directed towards his face. If you are going to do a surprise attack, be silent about it, he lectured in a stern tone. Mm. Two more shinobi blasted past him. He realized, they were going to try to free Yujito. Narihiro was occupied with holding her down to be doing any other fighting. He sighed before vanishing in the blink of an eye. He moved so fast that he managed to catch the two before they could even touch Yujito it was a bit too close for comfort though. The two were silently above the ground, had their right hands stretched out to get hold of Yujito. Naruto flashed between the two and grabbed both arms around the wrist. That was close, he said looking at Narihiro. You should perhaps retreat to a safe place or otherwise this is going to be annoying. Before Narihiro could respond, a lightning jutsu was launched, rushing towards his back. Without even twisting around, Naruto strengthened his grip on the wrist he held with his right and flung the shinobi behind him in a quick motion. The man could do nothing to avoid being literally shocked by the lightning wolf that hit him dead on. Naruto lifted his left foot before slamming it on the back of the man he held. The man yelped as he brutally crashed to the cold hard concrete with his face and Naruto only increased the pressure by pumping chakra on his muscles. Seeing the threat neutralized, Narihiro spoke responded. Or, I could just put a barrier around me. That would be best, Naruto said after a second of silence. He noticed Yujito was glaring at him and looked at her with a raised eyebrow. What? How can you talk so normally in a situation like this? Naruto merely shrugged. Do you want me to shout? Yujito only hardened her glare but it did nothing to Naruto. He just continued staring at her with that raised eyebrow. What are you going to do? Naruto knelt to the ground, and ran his right hand across her cheek. Such defiance, it's amusing he said with a smile. I can't let them go back home. I gave them the chance they rejected it. 
I was thinking of just killing them all. There is new jutsu I wanted to test I think it would work best here. Do you perhaps think I shouldn't? Do you even need to ask? Naruto smiled before standing up. You will live. I gave them a chance to live as well and they rejected it. You also gave them the chance and they rejected it. They die. He finished in a deathly cold tone. Naruto didn't wait to hear Yujito's response he first brutally kicked the man below him the kick sent the man hurling towards the water below. Naruto then took a single step forward while smiling at the thought of unleashing a jutsu he had been practicing but before he could do anything, he sensed a spike of chakra and looked up above him. Haku landed gracefully in front of him before slamming both his hands on the concrete floor. Hayatan, Ice Goddess Breath The air went cold as snow started to materialize out of thin air. From the ground floor, a thin layer of ice spread towards the enemy lines in speed. It covered the entire bridge within seconds, starting from where Haku stood. The Kumo Shinobi were frozen in place, their bodies were turned into frozen statues by extreme cold generated by the Jutsu. Haku then snapped his fingers, causing the ice on the ground to burst. That is some impressive work, Haku, Naruto applauded work but a second later, his expression was stern. I don't remember inviting you here. Should I have just locked you in a prison cell? Forgive me, Naruto Haku chose to call Naruto by his name. They were still people and when you didn't leave with your armor, I was certain you were going to do something dangerous that would have most likely ended up destroying the bridge. It can be rebuilt he said with a shrug. Yet, you avoided fighting her because you didn't want to get the bridge destroyed, Haku reminded the emperor. Is it only fine when you are the one destroying things? Naruto sighed but did not offer a response to Haku. He merely twisted around and started walking away. Suppress her chakra and carry her. We go back to Yuzu, he said. About them, Narihiro said, looking at the frozen shinobi. Haku will deal with it. It is his mess to clean, he said with indifference. Meanwhile. C wasn't happy with the situation. He hadn't been wary for nothing. This had indeed turned out bad as he had felt it would and it hadn't even taken more than five minutes for everything to be done. And it hadn't been a battle. There was no fight that occurred. It wasn't even a massacre it was just a brutal subjugation. Well that was rather anticlimax, Naoki said with disappointment. We should go before his majesty notices that we left Yuzushio. Don't you think he has already noticed? Naori said with a raised eyebrow. You never know, Naoki said. And they were gone after he said those words. C didn't linger around for too long. He knew this was no kindness letting him leave unharmed. No, they wanted him to be a witness to their power. They wanted him to go report what they have done today. He was their witness. A, I wasn't going to be happy though. He was going to go on a rampage after this. Yuzushio was devious. They had left the wave open for attacks because they wanted people to attack it. It had been their mistake and it had cost them dearly. He hoped that the others had succeeded. Because if not, they were going to have a serious problem. More so than before, Kimogakure now had a reason to invade Yuzushio. Yuzushio. Tamari looked around the village with a curious look on her face the buildings were tall but there was nothing taller than the red tower that stood on the other side of the village. Village leaders always sat at the tallest building, so there was no doubt that she was going there. She did wonder if Naruto lived there though. No, she shook her head. From what she received from Konoha, Naruto had his own compound. She wasn't here for him though perhaps later. But first thing first, she had important matters to handle, representing both the interests of the hidden leaf and sand. The village seemed rather peaceful though. The air even felt fresh. Perhaps it was because this was an island. Her escort led her straight towards the tallest building in the village without any trouble. One thing she noticed was that the village was a lot bigger than she had first thought. It was still a small village but you could not mistake that it had a lot of people living within it and it didn't look poor at all. Then again, this village was led by that person. When Tamari arrived at the office of the leader, she was surprised to see the man Tsunade had talked about she wasn't expecting to see him but Naruto. She thought since Naruto had come out of hiding, he would be acting in his role. He was the leader of the empire, wasn't he? 
Yoshino smiled seeing the look on Tamari's face. Disappointed to see me? He asked calmly, while pointing at a chair in front of desk. Tamari noticed something the floor was one giant crest of the Uzumaki clan. She shook her head she hadn't seen a clan that loves itself as much as the Uzumaki do. She settled quietly before looking at the eyes of Yoshino. She didn't know if she was going to like him. I was expecting to see Naruto. She finally said. His Majesty, Yoshino said a bit sternly, while still smiling. You came here for diplomatic ties with Yuzushio, didn't you? Tamari nodded. Yes, she said. Then you should not be disappointed. You are talking to the right person, Yoshino said pleasantly. Tamari stared at the man curiously. According to Tsunade, this man had presented himself as the leader of Yuzushio when Niji and Kakashi came to this village. Perhaps he was still the leader even though Naruto was the emperor. It appears so, she said with a sigh. Yoshino Uzumaki, I am the leader of Yuzushio Gakure no Sato, Yoshino presented himself to Temari. Temari blinked before following the man's example. Temari Sabaku, Jonin of the Hidden Sand but here as a representative of both the Hidden Sand and Leaf. Yoshino studied her for a moment before speaking. This is rather rare. It isn't so often that another village would trust someone to carry out such a mission in its behalf. You never know with Shinobi. As you are with Suna, Kanoha wouldn't be wrong to think you'd screw them over in an attempt to benefit your village more. Yet, the Godame Hokage trusted you with this mission. I have to say, this must mean that you two share a very trustful relationship not seen in the Shinobi world. Well, we have a long history and the Kages have been working together over the years since the invasion to make the relationship better, Tamari. Perhaps she could also thank Tsunade for being a willing participant in Suna's attempts to smooth things between the two villages. Had it been someone else, Kanoha would have invaded Sunagakir and they would have been enemies now, but Kanoha had no better ally than the Hidden Sand likewise for her village. That is what makes it something to admire. Unless there is an enemy to be fought, Shinobi villages rarely work together in this form. Relationships in the Shinobi world are always conditional. It is never about mutual trust but about using the other for what you can gain, Yoshino said, his smile slipped for a moment before he paused. Should we get to it? Temari nodded her head. Both Kanoha and Sunagakure would like to form an alliance with Yuzushiogakure. Kanoha is a traditional ally, and is still technically an ally of Yuzushio. We want to reaffirm this relationship for a better tomorrow. Both villages have no problem with the Uzumaki and would be willing to back it in case both Kumo and Iwagakure attack. Yoshino shook his head. Given the current situation, that is no longer a question those two will attack us. Is Kanoha offering its services? Tamari was a little uncomfortable with how Yoshino stared at her. Those searching eyes made her think carefully about her response. Tsunade had already taken her through the history between the Leaf and Yuzushio, but this does appear to be a troublesome situation, as Shikamaru would say. Yes, but so is Sunagakure. Yoshino smiled, it was a flat smile. I find it curious. But you are not the person I will about this with. Perhaps if I was talking to someone from Kanoha, it would do. But you are not from Kanoha, you can only try to look at things from the point of view and that makes a difference. His voice didn't betray the flat smile on his lips. Why should we make an alliance with Sunagakure? We offered protection. Yoshino spoke before she could finish. Protection? He laughed. You people seem to be under the impression that we cannot protect ourselves. I also find the notion of Kanoha offering its services quite honestly baffling. They failed to do so the last time around, and we cannot possibly trust them this time again. That aside, we don't need protection. He stressed the last word in a slow tone. What else can you offer us? We were just thinking that we should be allies, the emperor of this nation still considers the Kazakage as his friends. Shouldn't they be allies if they are friends? In a normal world, yes Yoshino said with a nod of his head. But at the moment, being allied with Suna or Kanoha doesn't benefit Yuzushio in any matter. For now, we will handle our issues. To be quite frank with you, until we have handled our problems, there won't be any alliances because we don't need it and we don't want it. It will only complicate things. 
you can come back after we have handled our enemies. Tamari narrowed her eyes. This wasn't going anywhere. She wasn't even expecting this kind of response. She had thought things would go well since Naruto had called Gara his friend and given their history, but this was the cold welcome she was receiving. She was shocked but she did not display it. Is Kanoha considered an enemy? Who knows? Yoshino said with a shrug. Has the leaf done anything against us? No, not that I can think of. Then there is no need to worry about anything, Yoshino said. Yuzushio will not have a problem with any village that doesn't pick up arms against us but those who do so will be crushed and those who stand in the way will also be crushed. Temari frowned. Suna and Kanoha included. Yes, Yoshino said in a hardened tone, his eyes flashing cold for a second. If you want to speak to his majesty, someone will escort you to the compound, if not, we will send you to your hotel. That just signaled the end to the conversation just like that. Tamari wanted to curse the man for the way he conducted things. But she bit her tongue. Gara wasn't going to be pleased to hear this. She was going to speak to Naruto and interrogate him so much about this. But given his personality, she doubted she would even get anything unless he was willing to speak to her. If it was an interrogation, she was unlikely to get anything. I will see him, she said. Yoshino smiled. Throne room. There was only a frown on her lips when Tamari found Naruto sitting on his throne in a relaxed pose. She could not forget the kind of pain that he had caused her with his lies. She wasn't pleased with him and she really didn't know if she could move past what he did. He had allowed her to think he was truly dead when he was alive. Do you really do that to someone you love? Tamari didn't think so. She wouldn't do something like to anyone. But he had done it to her and when he came his apology hadn't been something she truly accepted because she didn't think that he truly meant it. It was likely that if the situation was upon them once more, he would repeat his performance and that troubled her. She sighed tiredly, and shook off her thoughts before bowing slightly. Your Majesty, she addressed him before looking up to his eyes. Naruto had an amused look on his face. It doesn't feel right coming from you, Tamari, he said his amusement clearly evident in the tone of his voice. Well, aren't you, his majesty? Tamari asked calmly, keeping an expressionless mask on her face. I am, Naruto said with a small nod of his head. But last time I was before you, you still called me Naruto. I would be okay if you still call me as such. Nothing has changed in the way I view you. Tamari. Nothing had changed, and nothing would ever change. Perhaps some circumstances might change, but he would not change so easily. Last time it hadn't sunk in that you were the emperor of Yuzushio and I was still mad at what you did and made me experience. The pain of losing someone you love you don't know what that feels like. But you made me experience that even when there was a choice for you to spare me from the pain, Tamari said in a firm tone. I see you're still mad about that, Naruto said, his eyes displaying none of his emotions. But I didn't expect things to go so easy. Admittedly, it is a little troublesome and if I could just wipe out the memory of your pain, I would do that it would be much simpler. Tamari scoffed. Is that your solution? Make me forget about everything? Naruto stared for a long moment. Those words had come a bit harshly. It wasn't often that someone spoke to him like this. It was a bit refreshing but because the situation was serious, he resisted the urge to smile. You still need time to think about things I understand that and will not push you. I was at fault for making you experience the pain, after all. He paused for a moment. How long do you intend to stay? I leave tomorrow morning, Tamari said. Why so early? You could stay for a bit and enjoy what Yuzushio has to offer. I could do all that I can to make sure that you enjoy your stay here, Naruto offered with a small smile on his lips. I'm afraid I didn't come here for pleasure and yours right now isn't the pleasure I would enjoy, Tamari said in a stern tone. She wasn't going to budge Naruto's side when he realized this. This was truly a troublesome woman. Then again. Tamari had always been a strong-willed person with strong opinions. She certainly didn't shy away from voicing her opinions. If you are like this, then Gara must be very displeased with me. Tamari managed a smile but it was a bitter smile. He is, she said. Had you been just Naruto Uzumaki, 
I am sure you would not have left Suna unscathed. This time, Naruto didn't hide his amusement. I had a feeling that he did debate about whether he should permit me to see you or not. Well, what has happened has already happened. I can't take it away. You didn't come here for pleasure, for what reason did you come to see me, Temari? I wanted to see if you standing in front of you didn't piss me off, Temari said in a stern tone. And I wanted to ask if those words I received from Yoshino-san are the same words that you would tell me. Naruto tilted his head to the side and stared at Temari with an expressionless look on his face it made Temari feel uncomfortable just staring at him. A long minute of silence passed before he finally spoke. Most probably, he ended up saying. Will you join me for dinner tonight? Probably, Temari said. It was nice seeing you again, your majesty. There was a small barely noticeable smile on her lips when she said those words. Naruto shared the smile before standing up. He walked towards her in a slow pace. Once he reached her, he spoke. Would you allow me to walk you towards your hotel? He asked carefully. This is your village, Tamari said with a shrug, turning away from Naruto. The blonde smiled. You don't have to be sarcastic, he said following her. I don't fully understand how hurt you were but liking you was not a lie. I'm not a man of many lies. Says the person who lied about his death and played a shinobi of Kanoha while he was in fact the emperor of Yuzu, Tamari said in a bitter tone. Well, technically, I didn't lie about my death. I did die I just never told people that I had returned from the dead, Naruto said, smiling. Tamari's hands moved towards her fan she had a frustrated look on her face. If I hit you right now, would your people come after me? Naruto stepped away from the woman, smiling, hands held up. You're still violent I see he said. You used to be so fun when flushing and getting some bursts of anger at my moments. That was before you decided to die. Temari shouted. When caught herself from saying anything more when she noticed people staring at them. I was sad you annoyed me with your perverted comments, but being around you was fun. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments before nodding his head. It was indeed fun, he said. And I really hope we can pick up where we left off. Kumogakure. C could only breathe a sigh of relief when he finally reached the village gates he was finally home. It had truly felt like an eternal journey back to the cloud. He hadn't been sure that Yuzushio would not choose to run after him. There was that chance even though those people had chosen to let him go. You could never be sure with Shinobi. Those two had seemed to be the type of people who would let you escape their sight just so they could enjoy hunting you down. The thought had made him a little restless but he was finally home and alive along with the company he had with him. The man with him was one of the specialized shinobi who had been tasked with trying to kidnap the leader of the wave country. He hadn't escaped fully intact though and had it not been for him, he would have probably died along the way. The man had his right hand missing it was likely an end to his career as a shinobi. The arm had been ripped off from his shoulders. C had considered that even though he was in this state, it was likely that he had been let go since Yuzushio had seemed prepared for their assault. They were quickly surrounded by Shinobi when they reached the gates and then taken to the office of the Yandame Rakage. A. Isama, C greeted in a cautious tone. He swallowed seeing the glare from the man this wasn't going to be a good briefing. If possible, he would rather not be the one doing it. He would certainly need a good rest after this. A. I looked around for a moment before frowning deeply. He was only seeing two people and the other one looked utterly useless now. But he could be wrong about the usefulness. He didn't dwell on it though. Where is Yujito, C? The Yandame Rakage demanded in a low and dangerous tone. C didn't offer an immediate response he hadn't thought of how he was going to deal with this he couldn't even think of a better way to tell the Rakage. She was taken by Yuzushio, he ended up just saying. What? A.I. managed to keep calm despite the news, but it was clearly evident that he was holding himself from exploding. And knowing the man, he was going to explode soon. It was even remarkable that he had managed to keep himself from destroying something after hearing those words from C. Yuzushio appeared ready for us they knew we were coming C shook his head. Even if they didn't know, they appeared ready for anything. There wasn't even a fight that occurred during the encounter. 
Yijito must have known that the emperor was strong and she decided to transform but that was her undoing. The moment she transformed, an Uzumaki appeared out of nowhere, and restrained her with powerful chakra chains that even in her transformed state, she couldn't break free. These chains also suppressed her chakra. Hearing about that ability, the Yandame Rakage frowned deeply. So it was true after all, he said in thought. We have always known that the Uzumaki possess unusually strong chakra and these chains are unique to them. You could say it is their bloodline, but it isn't confirmed by anyone. He paused for a moment, looking a little grim. So, are you are telling me that the Uzumaki just released those chains and it was over? C realized what this meant. Kumogakure certainly boasted about the power of its Jinchuriki and Yuzushio could make that advantage meaningless with its ability. They didn't know if the power could even hold back a bijou as powerful as the Gyuki but considering that Naruto was a Jinchuriki of the Kyubi, there was a chance that it would. Fighting Yuzushio with Jinchurikis was a risk. They had already taken away Yujito and if B was taken to them, there was a chance that they would do the same. Yes it wasn't a fight. The emperor himself isn't normal. Not to mention he is also a Jinchuriki. C said and then frowned. The ice user we heard about. He made an appearance and used a single jutsu to freeze the men. It was apparently to stop the emperor from using whatever jutsu he wanted to use. AI leaned back to his chair, looking thoughtful. He hadn't thought that this would happen. But now he had more than enough reasons to invade Yuzushio. They were unlikely going to do anything to Yujito if they took her away. It wasn't a bad thing. He didn't think she would be turned against Kumogakure. So he wasn't worried about that. But she would still be needed in the war against Iwagakure. He could get her back. Naruto himself didn't use these chains, right? Yes, C said with a slight nod. Well hardly surprising considering that he isn't a full-blooded Uzumaki, AI said in a stern tone. He turned towards the other. Then. The shinobi shook his head. They were waiting for us, he said in a bitter tone. AI was silent for a couple of moments before nodding his head. Make sure that Iwagakure hears about this soon enough. They too have Jinchurikis, once they learn about this they will do something to protect themselves. We don't have to worry about them turning on us because they really don't want a war with us for now at least. What about Yujito? Yuzushio will not do anything to her. They are likely to use her as a bargaining chip, Ai said in a thoughtful tone. Either way, this does gives us a reason to march towards Yuzushio. We won't do anything until Iwagakure comes to us. We don't want to do anything that would leave us exposed to an attack from the stone and they wouldn't want to do anything that leaves them open as well. So the best option for both nations is to move together. Kanaha Gakur. Naruto had no lingering emotions seeing this nation once more. He had departed and would never return as its shinobi. Then again, he had merely been playing a role when he wore the leaf's headband. Naruto had stopped having thoughts about Kanoha when the Sandane told him about his clan and he had started dreaming about the greatness of the Uzumaki clan once he had seen Yuzushiogakure. He could have left early or fooled the world a bit earlier but things would not have worked out better than this. The current environment was perfect for everything the Uzumaki clan wanted to achieve. Naruto looked down at the hidden leaf for a moment from the Hokage monument before closing his eyes. He vanished from the place along with gusts of winds. The gusts picked up just away from the Hokage tower. He stood still for a moment, absorbing the foul air of contempt that had once filled his life. Kanoha had been a village of hate. People might say it was enjoying peace but Naruto had never seen hateful people than this. The Uzumaki were not happy about what was done to them but they didn't hold the kind of contempt the villagers of this great nation held in their hearts. There might not be wars but the people here had been loaded with the burden of hatred. Well, at least when he died, things had changed for the better. Not that he cared for it anyway. Naruto ignored the shocked looks he received from those who saw him and the umbu watching him closely. Perhaps they didn't want to get too close to him and force things because they didn't want to do anything that would displease him. If he wasn't pleased, he could leave without answering any of their questions. There was no obligation for him to do anything or even explain things to them. Kanoha was a past and a past he had created for himself. The emperor slowly walked towards the tower. No one spoke to him along the way. 
he didn't question it he could not have had it any other way. When he arrived at the tower, he was led to a different direction from the Hokage office by an umbu. He didn't question it he had spent a couple of moments at the Hokage monument. Tsunade must have used the time to gather her troops and prepare for him to make an appearance. Naruto was led into what he could describe as a war room. He looked around the room openly for a moment before smiling. He walked over to the large rectangular table and sat down across Tsunade at the other end Jiraiya and Shikaku were flanking both her sides. What is the barrier for, Jiraiya? He asked calmly. We don't want anything leaking, Jiraiya said in a stern tone, his face not displaying any emotion. Naruto was truly alive. There was no doubt that it was indeed him. He had entertained the thought that it could have been an imposter, but this was reality he was seeing. Naruto was very much alive. The pain he had felt back then when he thought that the blonde was dead had been for nothing. No, Naruto had indeed died, it was just on his terms it had been his plan to fool them. I doubt anyone would eavesdrop, especially with Danzo out of the picture, Naruto said, still smiling. He knew that Kanoha had never released the details of Danzo's death to the public. People suspected but the leaf wasn't going to admit anything well, it was their problem, not his. Tsunade slammed her fist on the table, glaring at Naruto heatedly. Why, Naruto? Why did you do it? Tsunade demanded in a hardened tone, her killing intent leaking. Naruto kept his smile, and tilted his head to the side. He didn't offer an immediate response. He turned to Jiraiya and asked a question. When we went to Amagekure, and you found out that Nagato's death had been massively exaggerated, what did I say to you? Jiraiya frowned. Something about playing dead as the best way to hide from people. Naruto nodded. There you have your answer, he said to Tsunade. I was just passing by this village. I'm afraid I don't much time to sit with you. Though given this setting, you must have a lot of questions. I am willing to entertain them but I might not answer unless it is necessary. I would rather avoid unnecessary troubles along the way. Naruto Shikaku shook his head, a small smile on his lips. Your Majesty, when did you become Yuzu's emperor? Since the beginning, Naruto said with a shrug of his shoulders. I see you haven't been able to discover anything. Hiruzen had always been too cautious for his own good. Then again, he was a crafty old man who moved in ways that you wouldn't think of him. You are bringing up the old man, are you saying that he knew everything? Jiraiya demanded from Naruto. It was ridiculous to think that his sensei would know about something like that and still not do anything to stop Naruto or even warn them. His sensei would never allow Naruto to leave the village not under any circumstances. But of course this still does raise the questions of why he went far to hide everything he did with Naruto. I'm not saying that, or maybe I am, Naruto said with indifference. Shikaku knew that Naruto wasn't going to bring any answers to that subject he was just going to leave them with many questions that would just confuse things. He smiled thinking that the blonde could have even brought up the Sandame's name simply to change the line of questioning. Perhaps he did that because he wanted to control the flow of conversation. By your response, from the beginning, are you saying that you that since the reformation of the new Yuzushio, you have been emperor? Most probably, Naruto said. I've always disliked dealing with you Naras because of your genius. Having the old man on my back was already a problem for me. Shikaku didn't allow Naruto to lead him astray, he went right back to his line of questioning. This likely started when you went to Yuzushio with the Sandame. I doubt he had anything to do with the rise of the Uzumaki. He probably didn't know anything until it was too late and when he realized that he couldn't do anything, he was forced to make some deals with you. Going with you to Yuzushio in secret was probably a way to avoid suspicion from within and outside of the village. Given how things at Yuzu ended, any appearance in the land by Kanoha would ultimately raise suspicions. How accurate am I? Naruto looked thoughtful for a moment before replying, about he said with a raised finger. Tsunade shattered the table in anger at the kind of responses Naruto was giving. She tired of them. She could not stand for them anymore. What was the use of coming here if he wasn't going to answer questions about how things went? Listen here, Naruto, she said in a hardened tone. You took your time here in this village, playing a Kanoha shinobi for years. I believe you owe us an explanation. 
what have we even done to you? Both Jiraiya and I have always been trying to help you. Is this how you thank us? Naruto sighed tiredly. I really didn't come here for this nonsense. We have a reality that we must face and nothing you say to me will change anything I have in mind, he said in a cold tone. Instead of getting emotional, you should be asking me about how discussions with Temari went. I know she hasn't arrived here yet. Seeing that Tsunade was about to explode, Jiraiya started speaking. Nagato, what are you trying to achieve with him? What do you even want, Naruto? I only want the Uzumaki to reign, Naruto said in a calm tone. Have no fears we have nothing against the hidden leaf. I guess you can thank the Sandame Hokage for that. Chapter 17 Yoshino looked around a hidden cloud, this was not his first visit in the village, but he had never come here looking for a talk with the Reikage. The last time he was here, he had been looking for survivors of the Uzumaki clan. He hadn't found anyone who'd ended up wandering into this aggressive village that loved power and bloodlines with everything. They would not get their hands on Uzumaki though. Not now and certainly not when the current emperor reigned supreme over all the Uzumaki. He was certain though this was not going to be a pleasant conversation with AI. But it still had to be done. He had been sent to deal with the outcome of Kumogakure's little adventure in the wave country. Sighing tiredly, Yoshino stepped deeper into the village, heading towards the Rakage Tower. Flanked by two shinobi who had insisted on walking him and would have certainly used force to take him to the Rakage's office had he not made some force of his own. By the time they arrived at the office, Yoshino realized the man was armed and ready to attack. The office had a couple of shinobi and a censor Naoki had mentioned was with Yujito before the attack. He was glad he was a clone. Otherwise, he was unlikely to leave this place. Why had the emperor sent him when he knew this? He shook his head, perhaps it was some sadistic sense by the man to make him sweat over this meeting and to entice Kumogakure as well as have some reasons on why they should be enemies with the cloud. All moves were usually calculated, unless the reason for doing things was simply convenience. I have been trying to get one of you Uzumaki for some years now, the Yandame Rakage started in a flat tone. I didn't think that you'd actually walk in the village like this. Circumstances force me to be here, Yoshino said in a quiet tone. My name is Yoshino Uzumaki I am the leader of Yuzushiogakure. I have been sent by His Majesty to talk to you about what has happened to Yujito. We have nothing to talk about if you are not going to bring her back, I said in a stern tone. Yoshino had not expected anything less from the man. He just smiled. I'm afraid that we are not going to do that. It is possible that she might not even live that long, he explained, eyes staring at the rakage. A.I. stood up from his chair, glaring heatedly at Yoshino. Are you saying that you will eliminate her? She attacked the Emperor Yuzushio does not forgive that and nor does it forget, Yoshino said in a hardened tone, matching the rakage's. Emperor. A.I. snorted coldly. You mean the Kyubi's Jinchuriki? He is just a boy. That is your perception, though for your own future, I implore you to change that thinking. You really do not want to see His Majesty as just a boy you will not live long enough to regret it, Yoshino stated. The moment those words left his lips, he was hit by a wave of killing intent from all directions. It also appeared that the rakage was also doing everything he could to stop himself from lunging at him. I take that as a threat to my life and we will not respond kindly to that, AI said with a dose of his killing intent directed towards Yoshino. Yoshino shrugged carelessly. Before we step away from the reason I even came here, please allow me to talk, Reikich Sama. I have a question rather. What? AI demanded with narrowed eyes. Your attempt to get into the wave country was not something of chance. It was a planned attack. And the wave belongs to the Uzumaki Empire. We have a question was this declaration of war. Does it change anything regarding Yujito? I only want to talk when I know you will be bringing her back. If not, I will lay waste to Yuzushiogakure. Yoshino narrowed his eyes dangerously. The change of atmosphere was noted by everyone in the room. The man did not address the threat to destroy his village nevertheless. It changes nothing really. The moment Yujito decided to challenge the emperor, her life was to forfeit. She will not be returned. Not now, not ever. We own her and if Kyomo does try anything, there will be hell to pay. 
I assure you of this. A.I. would have looked amused by the situation but he grew serious. It was now certain that the Uzumaki were shedding their skins. The calculated red-headed bastards were looking for this. If they didn't want trouble, Yoshino would not say such words to them. That does sound like a threat, the rakage said. This makes things simple for me. You are not going to leave this village. You are the leader of Yuzushiogakure, and until we get Yujito, you will be our hostage. Yoshino laughed upon hearing those words. Predictable, he said with amusement. I do apologize, but that will not be happening. Only an idiot would come to you without thinking that you would resort to such methods. We know how Kumogakure operates and we have taken account of it. I shouldn't even be asking if you are declaring war on us perhaps you could say I am just going through the formalities, but the moment we took Yujido, we were certain that we would have a problem with Kumogakure. Do what you want, but we will be ready, and will not be very forgiving. After saying those words, the man burst into a cloud of smoke. Where did he go? A demanded, looking around for C. C blinked for a moment, expanding his senses. He shook his head. He should have known. These people were not stupid. He had seen it with those two who sat with him and then just let him go like that. They did not fear Kumogakure that much was certain. Yoshino had come here knowing that they would simply not let him go. This was perhaps a warning to them. That was possibly a clone one of those Kage Bunshins the hidden leaf uses. A.I. frowned he was not going to let this go, he was not going to forget this. He settled down. He could not forget that he had Iwagakure to think about. And if they do learn that one of their Jinchuriki has been taken by Yuzushiogakure, they were going to grow confident enough to try to attack them. But he could still attack Yuzushio without leaving Kumogakure open to any attack. Well, he would just have to play his hand smartly to avoid making careless mistakes. If he moved recklessly, it would be a dangerous situation for his village. Should we talk to Iwagakure about this situation? Mabui asked the rakage who was deep in thought. Without doubt, the Uzumaki have not forgotten about the past and this heavily affects both our villages. From how that man spoke, we can assume that anyone who threatens Yuzu will probably be given the same message. We don't want Anoki to know about our situation, he said in a firm tone. However, surely, he too would be interested in knowing that Yuzushiogakure is not as innocent as it would like us to believe. Tenzaku no Gai Naruto was sitting at a corner in a bar, alone with just one bottle in front of him. He hadn't touched it since he came here. Not long ago, he would have already indulged in the alcohol, but now, he had plenty to think about. His eyes sharpened slightly when someone sat across him by the table. What are you going here, Naoki? The man was in a henge looking like a middle-aged black-haired man wearing civilian clothes but Naruto could tell it was him he could not mistake the scent of one of his men. Why does it sound like I am not welcomed, your majesty? Naoki asked, sitting down. That is because you are not welcomed, Naruto said calmly. I don't recall inviting you. And I recall my job to being your guard, Naoki said with a shrug of his shoulders. In any case, I just came here to give you support. I know you won't need it but I just thought it would give you some assurance if you knew you could be as reckless as you want to be because I will be watching over you, the man said with a smile, urging the emperor to do as he pleased. Naruto raised an eyebrow, looking at Naoki carefully. What kind of recklessness are you talking about, Naoki? You know, last time you got her drunk and then ended up taking her to her place. This time, you don't have to be careful about anything, you can drink along with her, without being concerned about whether your drinks are poisoned or not. It would be fine if you get drunk as well and end up going with her to her place. I will be watching to ensure that nothing dangerous is done to you, Naoki said before pausing. He turned his eyes behind him and then glanced over at Naruto he smiled. The prey has arrived he said. I thought I was the prey in this situation. Naruto said with a smile. Sarcasm doesn't do you any justice, your majesty, Naoki said before standing up. Naruto merely shook his head and then turned to face Kuratsuchi as she walked towards him with a smile he could tell was nervous. He didn't mind it he just smiled and pointed at the seat Naoki had just vacated before speaking. You have certainly become even more so of a beautiful woman since the last time I saw you, friend he said the last word purposefully and as smoothly and normal as he could. 
Kuratsuchi stared at Naruto for a long minute he has changed, he really did look manlier now and there was a certain aura about him. Last time the only thing you got from him was just indifference. But now she could sense something. She could sense power. He was certainly a man who called himself the Emperor all right. She gathered her thoughts quietly before addressing the blonde. Friends. Last time I checked, friends don't lie to each other. Naruto raised an eyebrow and tilted his head to the side. I lied to you. He asked. You didn't tell me that you were Yuzushio's emperor. Kuratsuchi snapped. Naruto kept his brow up before raising an index finger while wagging it slowly. I don't remember lying to you. I just didn't tell you about it, he said as a matter of fact. You seem to struggle with that but did you really expect me to spill the beans on everything that I do and am? Kuratsuchi stared at Naruto for a long moment with a frown on her lips he was going to give her that kind of excuse. It was indeed true that he had never lied to her about it but he did say that he didn't have anything to do with the Uzumaki clan. And he had also given her the impression that he was nothing but just a normal shinobi of the hidden leaf. She had been misled. If she truly thought deeply about it, she would have expressed her anger but she did not. She was not here for such things but to try to eliminate him. He was truly open for her to make any move but she was not going to take a chance. You misled me that is without doubt, Kuratsuchi said after a couple of moments of silence. Naruto didn't deny this he actually nodded his head. Yes I did do that. I have misled a couple of people in this life of mine. Perhaps one mistake I did was not willing to divulge certain things to other people because I believed that they could understand. An error on my part not everyone thinks like you. I should know this, but I still continue to think otherwise, he said with a slight shake of his head. That sounds a little personal, Kuratsuchi said in a curious tone. Naruto smiled sadly, but he didn't respond to Kuratsuchi's statement. You wanted to see me I assume that it has everything to do about my status as Yuzushio's emperor and how that affects Iwagakure. You have always put your village before everything and surely now, you have not come here because you are concerned for me he paused for a moment before asking. Did you cry upon my death? Kuratsuchi refused to comment on the last part. Your position is the reason I called you but when you spoke about friendship, you already knew what I did not know. You wanted something from me, she said with a stare. The question though is what did you want from me, Naruto? I didn't want anything from you, Naruto responded in a firm tone. When Kuratsuchi just stared at him, he spoke once more. What? Is there something you think you can offer me? Kuratsuchi blinked she did not expect to hear something like that from the blonde. She held herself from saying something that would give her away. She then raised her right hand, waving it without looking at the bar. But she had given the signal. Perhaps there is nothing but Yuzushio and Iwagakure are not allies and given the past, there is no doubt that there is some enmity between the two villages. The past does make up for an uncomfortable reading of the present with Iwagakure being part of a group of villages that decided to destroy my village despite no threat whatsoever. Naruto paused, staring at Kuratsuchi curiously. What would you do if that were you? You assured me you'd eliminate me if I was an enemy of Iwagakure should I not be angry and try to do the same thing that you want to do to me if you are a threat of course. Kuratsuchi shrugged. I would expect nothing else from a shinobi, she said with cold indifference. We always want to protect what is ours. The only right in this world is acting in the best interests of your village. If you threaten my village you must be dealt with. Naturally, if you also feel threatened by us, you'll also try to crush us. So, it is a world where the strong get what they want Naruto smiled at this. If you wouldn't hesitate to eliminate those who are enemies of your village, why do you come to hate those who bring trouble to your village? A couple of bottles were brought to them by a barman. Naruto didn't waste time getting into the drinking contest. Kuratsuchi wanted him to get drunk. He would indulge her and see what she wanted to do. No, he already knew what she wanted to do to him. He was just playing the role she wanted him to play. You have to be angry if someone precious to you is eliminated. Then you give me the right to be angry over what Iwagakure did to my village, Naruto stated in a calm tone. Even now, I cannot say that IWA isn't a threat. No, that doesn't matter you already destroyed our village before, even though we did nothing against you. You could do it again, 
and we have not even received any apology for the sins of the past. Kuratsuchi frowned deeply if there had been doubt before, it had been dispelled by those words from Naruto. She had to eliminate him. An apology, huh? She put on a thoughtful look on her face. What would it change? Nothing, Naruto words came out a bit coldly. But it goes some way to say that you regret what you did and you should not have done it. Of course, words are meaningless without actions to back them up. And superficial apologies are truly bothersome, he said with narrowed eyes. Admitting that they were wrong. Kuratsuchi had not been there but she knew Iwagakure had no regrets over its actions. As long as they did what they felt was best for their village, there would be no complaints from the village and they would fight anyone who says otherwise. Kuratsuchi took a bottle and took a sip before speaking once more. What about our friendship? You offered that once even when you knew how things would end up does your offer stand? If we could work out something between us we could end up saving lives from being lost in a situation where Yuzushio and Iwagakure have to fight. I know my village views yours as a threat because of what happened in the past. But my friendship with you could dispel that. Naruto smiled upon hearing those words and then took a large gulp before slamming the bottle on the table it cracked slightly. Then let us talk about our friendship, he said with a smile on his lips. Five hours later. It was already late the night birds were already singing. Kuratsuchi was helping Naruto in the slow streets within the town, heading towards the hotel she had booked for herself. The emperor had no problems with gulping large amounts of alcohol. She had not even attempted to do any competition with him knowing that she would not win. She had built up her tolerance after the humiliation of the last time she was drinking with Naruto but competition was still not something she was going to do. After arriving at her room, Kuratsuchi helped Naruto on the bed. She watched the blonde shift slightly, his eyes barely opened. She stared at the blonde for a moment he really did look out of it and smelled with alcohol. She hadn't thought that things would come to this point so simply. Kuratsuchi smiled she was getting this done. She was going to eliminate the emperor of Yuzushiogakure. Her grandfather was going to be proud. She stepped over the blonde, sat on him gently and ran her hand over his face. Harmless. It was ludicrous. But she was going to end the emperor of Yuzushiogakure. This was for the sake of her village. Kuratsuchi allowed a kunai dipped with poison to slip into her fingertips. But she did not stab him immediately she stared into his face for a long moment. Naruto stirred slightly and she pressed the kanai on the bed before leaning closer to his face. She hated this part. But she still needed to do it. She had to. Her lips brushed against his. The warmth of her breath seemed to jolt him to life and he responded to the kiss. Kuratsuchi did not allow it to distract her. Her right hand moved slowly towards the side of his neck. She was going to stab him. She was going to poison him. Even if the stab was not deep, the poison would finish him. Kuratsuchi suddenly halted when she felt a firm hand gripping her right arm. Her heartbeat increased as her eyes snapped towards Naruto's. You really planned to eliminate me, it was Naruto's voice that startled the black-haired Kunoichi. She forced herself away from the blonde jumped away from the bed but she had left her kunai behind. Naruto got up from the bed and sat up, eyes staring at the kunoichi. I knew this was your plan and played along for merely convenience. Kuratsuchi frowned deeply, staring at the blonde with cold eyes. You tricked me into thinking you were drunk, she spat venomously. Not particularly, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. I could have sent a clone to do the drinking for me but I chose to drink because it was more interesting that way. That aside, I did need to catch you in the act so that I would have no guilt over what will happen to you. Those words it made her realize that she was dealing with a dangerous person. He had surely come here knowing that she wanted to eliminate him. At this point, she was even starting to think that he had planned for this to happen. She took a step back, readying hand signs in case he made the wrong move. What do you mean what will happen to me? Naruto waved his right hand, you'll find out about that eventually, he said carelessly. Naoki, he called. The Uzumaki flashed right behind Kuratsuchi. When she sensed his presence, she could do nothing to stop the chains that had managed to wrap themselves around her. Kuratsuchi felt her heart pound. The emotion she felt was fear. 
It was not so much as the fate that awaited her but the person behind her made her afraid so much more than Naruto. She could not see him, but she sensed him and her hair stood up. This was not a friend this was an enemy to be feared. Before she knew it, she could not move. She glared at Naruto who was staring at her with indifference. You idiot. My grandfather will not let this pass if you don't let me go. He will destroy Yuzushio. Naruto just smiled and walked towards her. It is much amusing when a rat backed into a corner tries to bark threats. He said in an amused tone. But don't worry, I expect Anoki to attack but he shall surely die. It might not be in the first engagement but it shall surely happen. A realization dawned on Kuratsuchi and she widened her eyes but before she could say anything, a hand slipped over her mouth. Given the tension on her body, it appears she has discovered our purpose, your majesty, Naoki said with a smile. Irrelevant, Naruto said with a slight shrug of his shoulders. He placed his right hand on Kuratsuchi's shoulder and they disappeared in a flash. They appeared inside the throne room. Take her to meet her new friend and call Yoshino for me he said walking towards his throne. Hi, Naoki said before disappearing along with the bound Kuratsuchi. Three minutes later, Yoshino appeared in the throne room. He did not get on his knees but walked closer to Naruto before speaking. Is it done? Naruto nodded. We have the required pieces we need to get both Kumogakure and IWA to make their moves. History will certainly favor us. They attacked us and we had every reason to capture them. Bullies cannot be allowed to do all they want without punishment, he said with a smile. Our world has a history of only remembering the winners. Yoshino reminded. That is because they are the ones who write history. In this generation and the next, the Uzumaki will rewrite history and write new chapters to the Chronicles of Shinobi. Naruto said in a firm tone. Take the ship and head to Iwagakure to deliver the message. Yes your majesty. Yoshino said he turned to leave before twisting around to speak. There is also a certain visitor from the Hidden Leaf who wishes to see you. Naruto tried to figure out who would want to see him from the Hidden and then when he could not think of a specific name, he asked. Who? Shikamaru Nara, Yoshino said. Given his curious mind, I had kept him away and was planning to send him back to Kanoha without even talking to him. But given that he isn't here because the Leaf has sent him, I thought you might be interested in seeing him. What damage could be done by seeing him? Nothing much his majesty is good at keeping things to himself and unless you decide to let in on certain things, Shikamaru will not discover anything. However, it is likely that he came here because he has his suspicions on certain things and has come here to confirm. Yoshino said. Naruto was silent for a moment before waving his right hand. I will indulge him, he said. Yes your majesty, Yoshino saluted before disappearing from the throne room. It took about ten minutes for Shikamaru to arrive in the throne and when he did, Naruto stared at him with an expressionless mask. The Nara had a look that clearly said that this was troublesome but he could not afford not to be here. I was surprised when I learned that you were here to see me. I generally got along with you, but we were not friends. That is because you avoided me, Shikamaru said in a measured tone. Naruto simply shrugged. Then, how might I be of service? I know you are a busy person and with what is going on around this village, I am certain that there is much for you to do. I do however think that there will be major changes to the shinobi world very soon, the Nara said in a stern tone. I know there will be battles soon, and it will be because the Uzumaki want it to happen. The state of the shinobi world determines just how safe Kanoha is. And your duty is Kanoha, Naruto said in a flat tone. You people think in a fundamentally wrong way that is why you continue to do things in the wrong way. You always think about your village before everything, and disregard all the evil you to others. I will admit that the way shinobi think is flawed and perhaps it is what results in conflicts being handled through bloodshed battles that only up defining two things a winner and the loser. But we cannot deny that we think first about what we love the most before anything else. Yet, that does not excuse putting others in danger simply because we want to protect what we love. Perhaps what shinobi lack is the moral sense of what is right and wrong. Perhaps. Naruto shook his head. You just lack it. It's not something you need to think about. You. 
What about you, your majesty? Shikamaru posed the question to Naruto. Instead of responding to Shikamaru, Naruto spoke. I find it curious that someone who has never shown any interest in taking a lead over anything would come here, Naruto said to Shikamaru with a raised eyebrow. You find this troublesome and yet you came here. Shikamaru would not deny that he had hit himself at the thought of coming here. It was indeed a troublesome situation but he still had to do it because some people didn't seem to understand the danger. I was speaking to my father about you and the Uzumaki. The one question I had about this was why you have nothing against Kanoha. Any rational person will ask this question. You should have reasons to resent Kanoha. And I would understand those reasons. But you'd still try to stop me from doing something. Shikamura smiled. There was no question about that. He was still a Kanoha shinobi and he could not just watch someone try to destroy it. The Uzumaki your childhood. You have every reason, yet why did you tell Kanoha that you have nothing against it? It would have been reasonable if I told them that I loathe Kanoha, wouldn't it? Naruto asked. But at the same time, it would have made me an enemy of the hidden leaf. I don't generally think you have a problem with that, Shikamaru said in a firm tone. But I also think you don't want to face all great nations because you probably wouldn't survive. Even if you do, I doubt this village would remain standing. Even so, the reason I got up is because I see what is going to happen. And I am certain that even if you have said you have nothing against Kanoha, you won't hesitate to turn against us if we stand in the way. Of course, Naruto said. I have watched you since the academy days. My father understands the situation way better than both Tsunade and Jiraiya-sama seem to grasp. We are both aware of the danger. It is our understanding that you probably made an agreement with the Sandame Hokage. I think that is why you won't attack the leaf. But there is a condition. Shikamaru smiled weakly. The fact that you managed to hold an agreement with the professor which he was seemingly unable to get away from means that you have a frightening mind. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments before shaking his head. I don't have that kind of genius. You are smarter than me. I was actually afraid of the Sandame. He said calmly. You are here because your father sent you what does Shikaku want? My father thinks you are not going to talk to both the Godame Hokage and Jiraiya-sama about anything because of how close they were to you he sent me here to form a communication line with Kanoha. We want to understand your goals and find a way that we can coexist without war, Shikamura stated. Of course, when I get back to Kanoha, we will discuss things with the Godame Hokage. Oh, you want to play politics? Naruto said with a smile. You have already said you know what is going to happen. Then there is no need for me to say anything. Just go back to your village you'll know when the time is right for us to talk. When that happens, I will indulge you. I have your word. Yes you have my word, Naruto said before closing both his eyes. It would be most pleasant if you could work with Temari. There was no laughing at Kumogakure's misfortune over the loss of their Jinchuriki. Anoki had managed to attain this information and yet he could not laugh. He could do nothing about it because the cursed village that struck the cloud had also struck his. His beloved granddaughter had been taken away by Yuzushiogakure and they had murdered everyone he had sent her with. Those cold bastards were merciless. He had been afraid that something would happen to her. But he had shrugged off those thoughts. They would do nothing to her. Not when he was still alive. If so much of a hair was touched, he would burn Yuzushiogakure down to the ground and this time around he would ensure there were no survivors he would ensure every one of the Muzumaki was buried six feet under the ground. The Sandane Tsuchikage's eyes snapped up when an Uzumaki was brought before him. The man was being manhandled and yet he had an unconcerned look on his face. It was not the indifferent look of Naruto this was just a look that infuriated you. I have been waiting for you, Anoki said as he leaned against his chair. My apologies for keeping you waiting, Yoshino said in an apologetic tone. I had other important matters to handle before thinking of coming here. Anoki glared. This was not that important that he could not drop anything. This was infuriating but he held himself from turning the man into dust. I see you decided to bring your airship with you but that isn't of concern to me. I imagine you are most concerned about your granddaughter, Yoshino said. Anoki nodded. 
If you didn't come with her, you are not leaving this office and even if you leave, just know that until I get her back, Yuzu and everything related to it is not safe from me. I will destroy everything until you give her back. We don't take kindly to threats made to our village, Suchikich, Yoshino warned in a dangerous tone. Kuratsuchi may or may not be alive. She attempted to eliminate our emperor. Such an offense is punished by death. If you want her to live, you will die in her place. For a moment, Anoki laughed at this joke before standing on his chair. He held his hands together. Give me one reason I shouldn't just eliminate you now. Yuzu has your granddaughter and we are not afraid to snap her neck, Yoshino said with a snap of his fingers. We will not give her back. She has become a property of Yuzu and she will remain so until the emperor decides whether she lives or returns home. If you want to fight us over it, you are welcome to do so. You are no longer hiding the fact that you want war, Anoki said in a stern tone. Yuzushio Vikure will be destroyed. You have already pissed off the cloud. You will face your end. Well, I wouldn't complain either way. Yoshino shook his head. I pity you, he said in a quiet tone. You are very experienced and yet remain full of yourself. Are you really the same person who had this village enter a ceasefire with Kanoha in the last war? You underestimate us. And you will surely pay for it with your life. Yoshino disappeared in a puff of smoke after saying those words. It is war, Anoki said sternly. But how was he going to go about this? Kyumo would surely want to take part in this. Yuzu had taken their Jinchuriki. If IWA attacked, they would take the Jinchuriki for themselves. He had to send a message to the Rakage and they would talk about this. They would make a plan about dealing with Yuzushio and deal with it they would. It was indeed a time for war. Kuratsuchi had a long frown on her lips, bruises over her body, and some blood. She had been beat up a bit they had said. That sadistic woman had said it was nothing. There would be more pain to come. Kuratsuchi would not say anything about her village nothing at all. They could cut off her limbs if they wanted but she would protect her village against all threats. And these people. She was thrown into a cell with another woman there. She immediately recognized her as the Jinchuriki from Kyumogakure. But unlike her, she didn't appear to have been roughed up a bit she looked perfectly fine. Kuratsuchi took her corner and glanced at Yujito for a moment before staring at her hands. How did things even get to this point? She had been certain that she would eliminate him but now she was locked up in a prison cell, and would be a puppet for someone's amusement. If she does manage to escape, she was going to personally mutilate that woman. No, she would get out of here. Her grandfather would come for her. It is useless to think about escaping, Yujito suddenly said to Kuratsuchi. The black-haired Jonin's eyes snapped towards the blonde Jinchuriki. What is that supposed to mean? It means that unless they let you out, you can't leave your chakra is sealed, but you should still be able to use your senses, Yujito said. Kuratsuchi stretched her senses and then frowned deeply. She could not feel anything aside from the woman beside her. She could not feel the world around her. What is this place? She demanded from Yujito. Yujito shrugged and closed her eyes. Kuratsuchi bit her lip from cursing the Jinchuriki. If she didn't think the woman would be needed for an escape, she would have cursed her right there. But she did not want to burn bridges now. Not when she was still locked up and could not even tell where she was. The bastards had kept her blindfolded whenever she was moved. How long have you been here? More than a week, Yujito said without looking at Kuratsuchi. What did you do to them? Kuratsuchi realized the woman was asking her about the bruises she had. I tried to eliminate the emperor. She said bitterly. What did she trailed off when she sensed something? Naruto was by the unguarded steel bars that kept the two locked up. He opened the cell and then stepped in. Good day, my prisoners, he greeted with a smile. Kuratsuchi lunged towards him like a bullet, with her right punch aimed at his face. Naruto simply caught the punch and held it firmly before slamming a brutal left punch on her gut. Kuratsuchi dropped to her knees, clutching it while coughing. Naruto ignored her and then walked towards Yujito. He settled besides her, leaning against the wall. Just this once, I'll sit with you, he said calmly. I do apologize for not coming to see you after you were brought here. 
I have been a little busy. Apparently, Yijito said with a look towards Kuratsuchi. Ah, her Naruto smiled. She requested a meeting with me in a disguised attempt to eliminate me. But I'll be honest I had planned for this to happen. I figured such actions would spur both your villages to make a movement. I planned nothing for you, but when you appeared, I could not just let you be. It doesn't explain why she was tortured, Yujito said. Tortured? Naruto looked amused. No, no, my dear she hasn't been tortured. She was just roughed up a bit to see if she can experience pain he said with a smile. Kuratsuchi had to freeze upon hearing those words. She crawled away from the two blondes and then glared at Naruto. You can do whatever you want but I will not tell you anything. Naruto shook his head. You are mistaken, he said. Your pain will not be an attempt to get you to talk. If we want you to talk, you will talk. Gyurin is just a sadistic woman who likes pain in the eyes of other people. And I permitted it because you get to live. We normally eliminate everyone who tries to eliminate me. The simple way in which he said those last words made Kuratsuchi realize she was dealing with a person who would not blink when killing people. He didn't even seem to care about anything. How fortunate I am that I get to keep my life, she said sarcastically. She is an angry bitter woman, isn't she? Naruto said to Yujito. Yujito not figure this person out. He was the emperor and yet he was sitting in a cell with her. She hadn't even been asked anything since she was brought here. She was tortured and you just told her there will be worse. She tried to eliminate me, Naruto responded in a flat tone. And that should make her feel comfortable. Naruto shook his head. It should make her feel grateful that she only gets to experience a bit of pain. I had not done anything bad to her and yet, she sat with her grandfather and decided that I needed to be eliminated. You'll still die. Kuratsuchi said confidently. My grandfather will not let this go until I am brought back and this village is destroyed. We suffer for nothing, Naruto said with a shake of his head. Those words from Kuratsuchi just spelled out everything that was wrong with this world. Those who were powerful could do everything they want and get away with it. IWA had to eliminate him and yet when he stops the attack and tries to punish the one who tried to attack him, he must be the one to suffer. This world is just wrong. But then again, I have been able to move around because it is flawed. So, I can't complain. For nothing. Kuratsuchi scoffed. You just admitted to have planned for such things to occur. You can't blame us if your plans fail to succeed. Naruto shook his head. You misunderstand something, he said. I may have planned for such things to occur but I did not manipulate you into doing anything. It was your choice and nature that led you to this position. Kuratsuchi glared at the blonde. She had done nothing but act in the best interest of her village. She had been trying to ensure that things work well in her village's favor. No one could fault her for that. You are not going to let me go. She asked in a subdued tone. Naruto shook his head. Not now at least, he said. You'll just have to suffer a bit more before we decide on what must be done to you. We have already spoken to both your villages they have declared war and neither of you will form part of it he said before turning to Yujito. I actually came to see if you were being cared for. Yujito raised an eyebrow at this. Why do you care I am here because of your orders she said. I don't hate you, Naruto said calmly. My visit to Kumogakure was fruitful because of you and you are a fellow Jinchuriki I don't mean for you to suffer any more than you have already. If I didn't think you'd try to escape, I'd let you live normally. Perhaps that is something for the near future, he said before standing up. Why am I being locked up then? It's quite simple, Naruto said. I just need to ensure that Kumogakure is slightly weakened. And I want you to become a Kunoichi of Yuzushiogakure. He said while walking towards the exit. As for you, he said, addressing Kuratsuchi. Once your grandfather is dead, and Iwagakure is conquered, you might be freed. Well, things could change and you might join Anoki in death. Kuratsuchi spat out. But she was very much aware that Naruto held her life in his hands. It was apparent he didn't give a cent about her and would eliminate her if it suited him. And to think you wanted to become my friend. Naruto laughed upon hearing those words. Aren't you the one who called me to talk about friendship and then attempted to eliminate me? 
To tell you the truth, if you had not attempted to eliminate me, I wouldn't have done anything to you. We would have just talked and then go our separate ways. I find that hard to believe given all you have said. Naruto shrugged. Decisions were made based on character. I ascertained something when I met you you'll try to destroy anything you think is a threat to Iwabikure and you'll betray friends if it means securing your village. My meeting with you was even by chance I guess I must thank Jiraiya for it. How did things even get to this point? Shikamura breathed entirely as he looked around the Hokage office. He should not have listened to his father. He should have not even spoken to Naruto. If he hadn't gone to Yuzushiogakure, he would not have been in this position he would have been at home, sleeping or just sitting outside getting some fresh air. But because he just had to be concerned, he was in this situation that was going to get him to move around the village and outside a bothersome mission of being a diplomat. Shikamura glanced at Sasuke. He hasn't been seeing much of the Uchiha in recent months. The Uchiha was hardly even in the village but when he was around and the people saw him, they had the tendency to treat him like he was their lord or something. Perhaps it was the fear that Naruto would be coming after them. He was a Jinchuriki and they knew what they had done to him. They feared he might come back to haunt them. Their savior was the Sharingan. It was ridiculous but after speaking to the emperor, Shikamura didn't think Kanoha had to worry about an attack from Naruto. Temari gave me her report and she told me that Yuzushio has no interest in forming an alliance with Kanoha and they also laughed at our attempts to offer protection from both Kumogakure and Iwagakure. Tsunade said to the people in the office. What made you think that you could achieve something when it is apparent that they have no interest in Kanoha? Logically speaking, Yuzushio shouldn't have a problem with forming an alliance with us despite the past, Shikaku started in a slow tone. And it is a past that they have not forgotten, Jiraiya added grimly, thinking about what Tamari had said. Yes, but they are facing two great nations and none of the other great nations are going to help them in the war, which means that they plan on fighting themselves if they refuse help. I thought given the situation, they would act cautiously and accept our help, but they have refused which means Naruto believes that they can win, Shikaku said. Naruto isn't the arrogant person who likes to believe that he can defeat anyone he faces, and the fact that he thinks he can win a battle between him and two great nations is frightening, Shikamaru gave his own sense. Although he wants nothing to do with Kanoha, I don't think the door is closed. From what he said to me, there could be a future. Jiraiya stared at the Nara for a long moment before asking. Why in the future? Because whatever they are going to do, they want us to stay away. It is likely that they know we won't agree to some of their actions, hence their refusal to ally with us. I suspect that Naruto will only open that channel once they are done with what they want to achieve, Shikamaru explained lightly. And if we stand in the way? Sasuke asked. They will try to remove us, Shikamaru said in a slightly firm tone. While Naruto has no intentions for war with Kanoha, if we seek it, he will act on it. I had those thoughts in mind when I decided that Shikamaru should go to Yuzushio, Shikaku said. We already know that Yuzu has both Kuratsuchi and Kyumo's Jinchuriki and by the looks of things, they are not going to give them back. Kyumo and IWA are probably plotting for Yuzushio's downfall. The only issue that remains is that they are wary of each other. Jiraiya nodded to this. Neither wants to make the first move in fear of the other taking advantage of it. Obviously, they are going to send a bigger force to Yuzushio. They would need to be in the same page for either to make a move, he said. Amage Kyura will probably play an important role in derailing Iwa's march. I assume Yuzu's forces will deal with Kyumogakure. Yuzushio Gakure and Amage Kyura were in the same group there was no doubt about that. Nagato's power was still something that bothered him because Jiraiya could not figure it out. But both Nagato and Konan were S-ranked shinobi. You did not have to forget that the Akatsuki had other S-rank members. It was going to be a difficult situation that would not be as easy as the Rakage and Tsuchikage thought. If the other Uzumaki are like Kushina, then the power of Jinchurikis becomes irrelevant, he added with a deep frown. We don't have to be concerned about that, Sasuke was quick to say. If things come to it, I will face Naruto. How certain are that if he does manage to win against both Kumo and IWA, he will not come to us. Tsunade frowned deeply upon hearing those words. There was no guarantee that things wouldn't come to that point. She hoped that they would not. 
There is no assurance and there is nothing but just Naruto's word. We can't take his word, but we have done everything to prepare for war. If the worst case scenario does occur, we will defend the leaf. The Godain Hokage said in a hardened tone. Shikamura didn't think things would come to that point, but he did not voice his thoughts. He just went silent and allowed the leaders to talk about their business. Well, it didn't hurt being prepared for anything. The problem with Naruto was that nobody seemed to know what he was thinking and that was a major problem. If you could not determine what he was thinking, there was no way they were going to predict his movements. Wave Country You have never even once asked why we did not revive Zabuza but only brought you back, Naruto said standing in front of where Zabuza had been buried. Yoshino had also dug up Haku from this place before the rebirth ritual was performed. I figured he was not needed, Haku said. Honestly, he had been saddened that his master had not been brought back from the dead. There is that, Naruto said in thought. You have not regretted your second life, I would hope. Zabuza lived his life the way he wanted. I thought perhaps it would be excellent to have you. That aside, you were a pleasant person when we met. I spoke to Yoshino said, you really have to bring that person back to life. My only regret was not being as useful as I could have been to Zabuza-sama. But I enjoy my current life. I have been living it for a couple of years now. Any regrets would just make me miserable, Haku said with a small smile on his lips. Naruto looked up for a moment. Yes, they had still been rebuilding when he came here for that mission. There was still much that needed to be done. Had he not found a village with people, he would not have been able to do what he wanted to do. He turned his eyes behind when he sensed a powerful presence. He then smiled seeing Kisame just the person he wanted to see. You made it, Naruto said to Kisame with a smile on his lips. I didn't seem like a, I had a choice, Kisame responded casually, yet still grinning as he moved closer to both Naruto and Haku. Naruto shook his head. You could have refused to come it's not like I could have just forced you to come here. But given that you were Itachi's partner, I'm certain you shared a couple of things with him that might have contributed to your decision to come here and my decision to call you here. Kisame grinned hearing Samahada's giggles. The sword was even drooling. It was the massive pools of chakra from the blonde. It had nothing to do with the fact that he was a Jinchuriki. Kisame could not sense it but his sword could and Itachi had said that the blonde's chakra levels were ridiculous. He'd never been this close. Samahata was confirming it. The former Kiri Nin gripped the handle of his sword firmly. He was thinking about swinging it towards Naruto but he held himself. He could see what the blonde wanted before swinging the sword. Itachi just could never trust you. He was always cautious about everyone. I never did like that side of him, Naruto said in a flat tone. He was always probing and probing. It annoyed me at times. I'm honestly happy that he is dead. But he died on his terms, Kisame said. He had always planned on dying that way. I just wish he had died on my hand. I'd always wanted to fight him to the death. But you respected his wish, Naruto said with his eyes staring at the grave in front of him. It was something strange. But still honorable and it did say something about Kisame's character and his friendship with Itachi. I doubt you called me out to talk about Itachi Kisame said without responding to Naruto's statement. I'm curious about what he said to you before he died. Surely he said something, Naruto said. But I called you here because you are the only one who was familiar with Abido and know about Zetsu. You were briefed about what he wanted to achieve with the Akatsuki, no? Kisame would not forget that Abito suddenly disappeared a couple of years ago. The other members would not have noticed because they did not know him. But Itachi had known. The Uchiha hadn't given the exact details but he had said Abito was dead. Of course, Itachi hadn't known the true identity but this person in front of him and the leader knew. They knew. Nagato and the Uzumaki had eliminated Abito. Zetsu had told him about this. Pain hadn't said anything about it. I was told, Kisame said, seeing no reason to hide it since the blonde likely knew the answers. I didn't think that Pain would actually manage to eliminate him though. It was not an easy battle, Naruto said. Has Zetsu appeared before you? Yes, but only to tell me that Abito was dead, Kisame said. Naruto frowned. 
it did look like he wasn't going to get any leads on that plant. It was a problem and he wanted to solve it as quickly as he could. But how could he solve it when he didn't even have a lead? Disappointing, I thought he might have appeared. I really want him dead. Haku shook his head. You shouldn't say such things like that, he said in a stern tone. He cast a glance at Kisame he was wary. The man looked like he was ready to lunge towards them any moment he saw an opening. Naruto shrugged. It is the truth and there is no way I can put it nicely, he said. So, Kisame are you still willing to fight for the Akatsuki even though the one who recruited you is dead? And if I no longer plan on fighting for the Akatsuki? We will have to negotiate your release, Naruto said calmly. But it does please me knowing that you are still around. We have a war coming and your strength will be needed. Kisame hadn't said he would still continue to fight but the blonde had said those words. Perhaps he already knew and was merely asking just because he could. I could fight, but I do want to see just how strong you are he said holding out his sword. Naruto glanced at the man for a moment before looking away. That would be interesting but I am not in the mood and it would be pointless. I have no problems with a good sparring session, but this is not the right time. I have to go back to Yuzushio. I wasn't planning on giving you an option Kisame said before lunging towards Naruto, with his sword swinging through the air. Haku jumped away to create some distance while Naruto twisted around, right hand held out a long sword appeared in a puff of smoke and he positioned it vertically on his left side. Kisame's sword slammed into the sword mercilessly, but Naruto did not move, not even an inch. It isn't really necessary to do this, but perhaps I will indulge you one day, Naruto responded in a measured tone. He then burst into a cloud of smoke. Kisame turned towards his right and saw the emperor walking away with Haku. He sighed deeply. Next time, he said. Pain will contact you, Naruto said in response. You should move towards the borders of Earth Country, nevertheless. What does the Uzumaki even want to achieve? You'll find out eventually, Naruto said. But if that is a condition for you giving your best to the task at hand, you can ask Pain. Maybe he will tell you. That was really disappointing, Naruto said as he walked into an office within his compound. The office was spacious but had no windows. The walls were mounted with bookshelves. A large desk faced you when entered the office. On the right side, there were five single sofas surrounding a small wooden table. On the left side, there was a crimson couch. Haku stared at the mountain for paperwork that Naruto had on his desk. The blonde focused on sitting on the throne then handling his other administrative duties. It was a problem. There was never a problem about this when he was still wearing a Kanoha headband. He watched the blonde settle on his comfortable chair before responding. Considering he knew of Abito and the real mission, I always figured that he would have something. So did I, Naruto said in a thoughtful tone. It takes us back to square one. I'll have to just play the waiting game. It is no fun nevertheless. But there is little choice, Haku said. Naruto nodded. Indeed, he agreed. Get me Yoshino. I'll try to sort this desk out and other things before the day ends. You plan on sitting here for the rest of the day? Yes it is important that I do. Besides, if I don't sit here, nothing in our other nations gets done. Yoshino can't do anything because it isn't his responsibility and he does not have the authority. Naruto explained. He paused for a moment before speaking once more. Bring me a bottle when you do return. Haku just shook his head and walked away. With Haku gone, Naruto opened the drawer on his right side and took out a rolled sheet of paper. He closed the drawer and then stood up, walked towards the single sofas. He settled down and unfolded the sheet it was a map of the shinobi world. It was not just the elemental nations but the whole world. There were certain places that were marked. Naruto stared at the map for a couple of moments without shifting until Haku returned with Yoshino. The man settled across him while Haku placed the bottle he held atop of Naruto's desk. He then joined the two. Cloud and Stone are making preparations to meet soon. Neither wants to move before the other makes a move, Naruto said while staring at the map. Understandable, Yoshino said with a small nod of his shoulders. They still have their problems and probably still plan on sorting them out once they are done with us. 
Indeed, Naruto said. It is a pity that those plans will not succeed. For us, a loss in the war means extinction. It would certainly put a stain on our prestigious name. There was no room for failure. For them to fail, it meant death. It meant the destruction of their land and everything that they have built. It was not going to work out like that. They had to succeed. They had to win. Failure is not an option, otherwise our nation will be raped, Yoshino said. Naruto glanced at the man with an amused look on his face. It was amusing hearing those words, being put in such a way. That is a very vulgar way of putting it, he said. But he did not disagree with it. Have you considered ruling the entire world? Haku stared at Naruto while Yoshino just smiled and responded with a smile that did not display any emotion. I have had such thoughts but only with the shinobi nations. He said. If his majesty has such a dream, we can fight for it he said staring straight at Naruto. You can't be serious. Haku exclaimed. Yoshino shrugged indifferently. It would bring order into this world that has no order. There would be no shinobi village that does what they want. We live long lives, once that dominance is executed, we can make sure that generations live in a world that we have created. And also rewrite history in the way we want. But eventually, there will be those who will grow strong enough to challenge the rule. There are not many of us to be able to effectively seize control, Naruto said in thought. Not unless you put Guren in a position hunting down dissent and eliminating it. It would just be murder every day and would fill Uzumaki rule with bloodshed, Haku said in a stern tone. Both Yoshino and Naruto stared at Haku for a moment before the latter spoke. We should get down to the real business he said staring down at the map. The Fire Nation is surrounded by river, storm, mushroom, canyons, sound and land of hot steams. For it to enter into any other great nation, it needs to go through on of these nations. We already have storm and sound. But we'll extend the sound's borders to the nameless country that borders canyons. Naori is already at work in forming communications with the feudal lords of the remaining nations. We are busy arranging for them to be absorbed into the Uzumaki Empire. If the feudal lords refuse? Haku asked. There will be no need to even march into their nations. We will just force them into doing it. I doubt they will agree to anything though. But we are prepared to force them into giving the borders of their countries to us, Naruto responded in a hardened tone. If we move now, the Fire Nation will take notice and try to act, Yoshino said. That is why you suggested we do it only after the war, he said, nodding his head in understanding. Kanoha will not want to be surrounded by us. But if we get both Kyumo and IWA, there won't be much of resistance. If they do try, we will step on their throats, Naruto said casually. I want you to be ready. Because, we will start talking to them now. You will be the one handling the negotiations. While I focus on both earth and lightning. Yoshino nodded his head. And the water lord? He asked. Although we have managed to talk things with Kiri, he remains an issue that tries to block our path. Naruto glanced at Haku for a moment before responding. I will leave that decision for Haku. He will decide what is best for the Empire and the Water Nation. The blonde said calmly. Order Guren to move out to the Sound to start familiarizing herself with the environment and her new role. Her unit will be based there. Should I also order the agents to move into the Sound be closer to her? Naruto nodded. Naoki will split from Naori in handling intelligence. Naori will handle it. Naoki can be the intermediary between Guren and us. I will have it done, your majesty, Yoshino said. Have Narihiro prepare Kuratsuchi. We will release her once he is done with her, Naruto said. What is the progress with the bridge? 90% complete the surface itself has been completely built. Installing the rail tracks shouldn't be an issue, Yoshino said. Gado's money has already been dried up and the Akatsuki's money is not doing anything. If we don't change things, we will drive the wave and Yuzu into poverty. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments before finally speaking. We can't build the rail tracks to the other nations now. They will simply be destroyed and we don't have the resources. Once we have both earth and lightning, we will have those resources. 
For now, we can shell those plans on focus on the war. But the bridge must be finished. I don't mind borrowing more money to complete it. If we must defend it, we will. Yes, your majesty, Yoshino said with a nod. My duties remain many if you permit it, can Haku be given the authority to dish out your orders? My focus will remain with Yuzushio and other nations. Naruto looked thoughtful for a moment. What will the others say? They won't complain. Haku is trusted and is a kind-hearted person. We agree that he is good for his majesty, Yoshino said with a small smile. Fine, Naruto said with a wave of his right hand. Will you be able to zero handle it? I considered your character when asking this. I will Haku said firmly. Naruto closed his eyes for a moment before nodding while he stood up. Both of you may leave I want to work alone. Chapter 18 Strange things did occur in this world but Naruto didn't often allow them to surprise him. Perhaps it was because he understood that not everything could go exactly as planned. He had not the mind to control all situations. He had not the power to make all men bow before him. He was just a mere mortal. He had held a great deal of control over things, but he was still just a mere human. Naruto had no desire to be God. What would possess him to leave the riches and beauty of simply being alive and human? Kabuto appearing before his very throne with Naoki was not a surprise. No, Naruto had been expecting this. Perhaps not in this fashion but when he called off the search, he had come to realize that Kabuto would not be caught easily and he would make an appearance soon enough. The emperor did not greet the wanted man with a smile. He had nothing but an expressionless mask on his face. He could simply order Naoki to behead him. Perhaps there would be some consequences but he could deal with it. He did believe that nothing was truly impossible. There was no situation that would arise and be beyond his limits. Naruto could handle it. But it was important to handle things with care. He didn't want to end up doing something that would take away his focus from his beautifully crafted war. He needed his war to succeed. He needed things to fall into plan for his dreams to become a reality. Naruto's stern eyes faced Kabuto for a long minute before he finally spoke. You played your card right, he said. He didn't need for Naoki to tell him, but the reason the man was here was because he had allowed himself to be caught. I figured if I tried to live in hiding, I was likely to be eliminated, Kabuto said those words in a measured tone, yet with no hint of nervousness in his tone. Kabuto had known that once Orochimaru died, he had become a wanted person. It wasn't his physical prowess that made him a threat but his knowledge and resourceful. Yuzu wanted to get rid of him. He had gone into hiding because he wanted to avoid this mess. He wasn't even sure if he would be allowed leave even now but he came prepared for anything. He came prepared knowing that despite what he had to offer, these people might just decide he was too much of a threat and then eliminate him. I still want to eliminate you, Naruto said calmly. But perhaps since you came here, you have something to offer me. Indeed, Kabuto said with a nod. It will be my pleasure to share my knowledge with Yuzushiogakure. I could also be useful to the Empire and its agenda. We don't need you to cooperate with us, Yakushi, Naoki said in a stern tone. We can just get the information we want from you from your head. There isn't any amount of security that can you put on your brain that will stop us. Kabuto smiled. He did not doubt those words and he did not wish to test them. For certain, these people had ways and tools. You would need to have a brain for you to do anything, he said calmly. Naoki resisted frowning upon hearing those words, that was possible. Kabuto could destroy his mind and in such situation, there would be nothing they could do. There would be nothing they can do to change things. Your Majesty, I should take him down before he does anything he said to Naruto, ready to eliminate Kabuto. Naruto shook his head. I'm certain Kabuto didn't come here to die. Besides, he must have known that coming here was the best thing he could do for his life. Kabuto nodded to this. During my time in hiding, Yuzu's reach became quite obvious to me and I knew that the moment I went out of hiding, I would not live for too long. I came here because I want to help and really don't want to die, yet. You think I won't eliminate you? I don't know but I know I can bring my unique set of skills to help you achieve your goal or should I say the Uzumaki's goal? Naruto raised an eyebrow. 
You have said something before, he said. What is it that you know about us, Kabuto? Our agenda, specifically. Kabuto smiled. Not much I just know that you seek domination. In the near future, the shinobi world will probably be ruled by the Uzumaki Empire. He said. I see, Naruto said without confirming or denying anything. What is it that you can offer us? You certainly made some precautions to avoid being eliminated but I can be reckless and wouldn't care much about it so whether you can live or die depends on your answer. Kabuto had not expected anything less. From observation, he had concluded that Naruto could be reasoned with. He was not a difficult person. This did not mean stupid far from it. This was just the kind of crude person you did not want to underestimate. I know you have been observing Yamato for his Mokutan Jutsu and have a black Zetsu problem. Yamato is a product of Orochimaru's research. I can provide that to you. I A L S. Naruto raised his left hand to stop Kabuto from saying anything further. You will tell me more about your research some other day. The Mokutan part seems as interesting but I don't have the time for it now. Naoki, take him to Yoshino. Once done, you will take him to Karen. He said, standing up. Where are you going? Kiridikure, Naruto said. It appears that the Mizukage has some concerns about our actions. Mei's concerns were nothing unexpected. The Mizukage was a person with a clear conscience. She did not want anything to do with war. Perhaps it was because her village had just been in a civil war that claimed many lives. But Naruto was not going to get Kiri involved unless the other villages decide to force it to enter into the fray. He would even work against anyone trying to force the village into war. There was no telling which side Kiri was going to take and he did not want to be surrounded by enemies. It would certainly prove to be a dangerous situation. Kirigakure has never been factored in as an enemy and should things change now, it would force us to reconsider our strategy, Naoki said. Well, if the Mizukage becomes a problem, we can always remove her from the picture. He said coldly. That would be foolish, Naruto said in stern tone. Mei is loved within her home village and any attempt to remove her would leave us with an entire village vying for our blood. The situation would become a little uncontrollable and we cannot have that for the moment. Naoki shrugged. I don't play politics, he said. But that is the exact situation we will have when we have to face both Kyumo and Iwagakure. Naruto shook his head. Stick to your job and leave the decision-making as well as politics to us, Naoki, Naruto said in a measured tone. Leave, he said waving his right hand. Yoshino's Tower. Yoshino smiled seeing Kabuto being brought into his office. The only reason this person could be here would be because Naruto had permitted him to work for the Empire and nothing else. It was a possibility that Naruto would be swayed to put this person into work. The Emperor was a very rational person at least when it was convenient. Naruto would not miss a chance to gain a valuable asset because of some negative perceptions. If the benefit outweighed the consequences, he was going to do it. Kabuto Yakushi, Yoshino relaxed behind his chair, with a flat smile on his lips. We meet again, he said. Indeed, Kabuto said with a smile of his own. Though, I did not think we would meet once more under these circumstances. Things are continuously moving and changing in this world. Things do not fall in a straight line, Yoshino said with a wave of his right hand. I assume you have already spoken to the Emperor. I have, Kabuto said with a nod. He fixed his eyes on Yoshino for a couple of moments before asking. Tell me, Naruto did not do much in terms of hands on building Yuzushiogakure and forming alliances with other villages but you did it. You could never say that Naruto was behind it all because he didn't actually do anything. You did everything. So tell me, who is the real leader of Yuzushiogakure? He shook his head. No who is the real leader of the Uzumaki Empire? Yoshino looked amused. One would expect such curiosity from a spy, he said. It is all just curiosity, right? Of course, Kabuto said. Then I don't have to respond to that you will eventually find out who reigns supreme within Yuzushiogakure as you are going to remain here until you die. You have already been given the Uzumaki seal you will be with us until we decide otherwise I don't need to tell you how you ought to behave you studied Yuzu long and hard enough to have your conclusions. 
Kabuto hadn't expected to be given all the answers. Things here were very interesting. Naruto was the emperor but there were still other things that had to be done. There were still other forces that were at play within the empire. Well, he would find out about things eventually. Kirigakure. Mei stared at the smiling face of the Yuzu emperor with a cautious look on her face. The last time he was here, he had made his intentions clear but Mei had not expected things to move so quickly. It was getting dangerous and it would just be across the sea. There was a chance that she was going to get dragged in this war and she didn't want anything to do with it. If cutting ties with Yuzushiogakure was what she needed to do avoid getting dragged into a pointless war, then Mei was going to do it. She was still mindful of the past of course. There was a chance that Yuzu would turn on them if they did anything, but she was fairly content with her village's military strength. Mei managed a small smile as the emperor grew closer towards her desk her eyes never left him. She was afraid she might miss something. In such a situation, it could be dangerously suicidal to miss a hint of some mischievousness from the blonde. Hello, Mei, Naruto greeted quietly before settling down in front of the Mizukich desk. His head faced up for a moment before turning to face Mei. The tower was under heavy guard. It was unlikely that he would leave without a massacre if he tried to do something to the woman before him. It was truly difficult to be trusted these days. Everyone always had their backs covered and he came here alone. Such a disappointment but it could not be helped. This was his world. This was the world that he birthed him. It was corrupt to the core. If you did not watch your back, even your children could stab you in the back. Allies were just allies in names. Friends could turn enemies if it suited them. It was such a world. Though disappointing, Naruto did not fault Mei for having such measures. Naruto, Mei responded. I'm glad you could make it. You expressed some concerns and it would be quite honestly irresponsible for me to ignore them. Are you just not afraid of losing your only ally? Fear. No, Naruto shook his head. And as far as I am concerned, we have not come to that point we can call ourselves allies. Partners? Yes, I can agree to that. You still have some concerns with us. I cannot, however, deny that it would dangerous for me to have our current agreement scrapped. I imagine so, May said, watching the blonde carefully. You were quick to come here which is rather curious given your attitude towards the hidden leaf. I cannot treat Kanoha like a child, Naruto said with a small shrug. But please expression your concerns. I cannot be far away for too long. Either Kumo or IWA could attack my village any time soon, so I need to be there to defend. It wouldn't be like you didn't provoke them, Mei said sternly. But their actions couldn't be helped either. Either way, it does appear that I was right. You orchestrated events to get this situation. You wanted both Kumogakure and Niwagakure to make the first move. I won't deny that things have been by design but I won't take credit for everything. Certain things just happen to fall into places and we use this to our advantage. Regardless, I want to think that I am not a bad person. Not a lot of people actually think they are bad people. Evil always thinks it is doing right. People become so corrupted that they cannot even tell between right and wrong, good or evil. I certainly hope you are not that kind of person, your majesty, May said in a stern tone, her eyes just as hardened. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments before responding. I am able to define right and wrong. Then I hope you will do the right things, Mei said. To whom? The emperor asked. Something might be right, but still interpreted as wrong by some people. Our standards differ on what is wrong and right. Very few share a universal code of the right morals. You must know this well. Our morals end with our borders. We do right within our villages, but outside, we don't care. Naruto shook his head. I did not come here for this kind of discussion. Perhaps we will have this debate some other time. But this discussion is part of my concerns. I don't want to be seen siding with people who are morally corrupted and flawed. If you have no disregard for what is right, despite what you bring to this village, I cannot continue to side with you. Interesting, Naruto said. You are more bold and daring than I thought. But that is fine a pushover for a Kage would have been disappointing. You must stand for what you believe in I respect that. 
But? No buts, Naruto said with a shake of his head. I won't lie to you and say Kiri is a fundamental partner in future events. Yuzu has no need for this village. Our efforts have so been to ensure that we don't collide because it would not benefit any of us. Although I have been giving Kanoha the cold shoulder, my message to them was the same however, I have not gone as far as I have with you. Why? Because you are not like any other Kage. Your viewpoint isn't limited to what is within your borders but you also look elsewhere. Your sense of duty isn't just to this village but to the shinobi world. I don't want to become an enemy to such a person. We don't agree with objectives as now, but I understand and believe that we will soon see eye to eye once this situation has been resolved. Mei leaned back to her chair and stared at Naruto for a long moment before speaking. Once more, you seem overly confident that you will be able to handle both Kyumo and Iwagakure. We are not as stupid as to try something without measuring ourselves against those villages. We did our research. We studied those villages, their power, their defenses, their personalities, their structures, and moods. We are not idiots who act without thinking. May frowned deeply upon hearing those words. Assuming all movements have so far been a calculation, it was safe to think that even their actions towards this village were because of this study they did. They must have studied her personality before deciding a better way to deal with her. If she was someone who did not listen, they would not have bothered using this approach. They came to talk to her because they knew she would listen. She was not the stubborn person like the Sandame Tsuchikage and not hard-headed like the Yandame Reikage. For Kanoha, it was simply a test of their resolve. Would they be willing to attack him even if he has said he has no plans to do so? She was obviously dealing with dangerous people. But simply because they were dangerous didn't mean that she would just cower to them. No, May would do no such thing. She would stand for her beliefs and would not allow anyone to abuse her people and use this village. She would protect the village she shed blood to free from the reins of Yugura. As if he was reading her thoughts, Naruto spoke. You need not concern yourself with us doing anything to get behind you, the blonde said calmly. While Kiri has not factored into our plans, we don't want it to make an enemy out of you. Besides, Nadashiko would be in trouble if we did something. Our movements also factor in those around us. We do not walk around like a tall giant, careless of what we stomp. I hear that you are saying but I am still worried. You said we orchestrated for things to happen this way, and I did not say anything about that. Let me correct you we did nothing. I won't deny that a war is what we wanted, but we did not manipulate anyone into doing anything. No, but you moved into a position that would force other people to react. Naruto smiled. But your reaction was not the same with those villages. You see, greed and fear determined the reactions of both Kyomo and Iwagakure. Perhaps if they had reacted differently, we would not have done anything. But things have occurred because of those villages' nature. I assume if we had done something, we would have also been marked. Naturally, Naruto said without blinking. If your first reaction to seeing something you don't understand is to attack it, that thing will attack back because in its view, it is being attacked for simply existing. If Kyomo and IWA try diplomatic means to resolve the issues that have been caused by their attempts on Yuzu, will you be open to listening? Naruto stared for a moment before bursting out in laughter. You'll forgive me but I haven't heard something so ridiculously unrealistic in quite some time, he said with a smile. It is good to be optimistic but some people are just not worth the effort. Of course, if you want to try it, I will offer you an opportunity to try to talk those two kages out of going to war with Yuzu. I will even give you a helping hand by releasing the Tsuchikage's granddaughter. But a warning, your efforts will be futile and one of those two will even go as far as to threaten you into taking against us or face the risk of an invasion. Naruto added those words in a cold tone. May put on an indifferent mask, but those words really shook her. Just how was the situation hopeless? That sickening laughter was the laugh of a man who had no hope that both Anoki and AI could change. Was he really willing to give this a chance or was it just another calculated move? No, May shook her head. At this point, those two have already declared Yuzu an enemy that needs to be destroyed. You could also not forget the past when coming to that conclusion. Kiri will continue to partner with you in the case of food security and other things that affect the well-being of our people. 
Outside of that, in terms of military collaboration, the door shall remain closed. We will however continue to voice our political opinions regarding your actions. If there needs to be a political pressure we can put, we will do so. Naruto smiled. I accept but you should know that politics mean nothing outside the borders. Kingdoms, feudal lords play politics, but hidden villages play military games. I truly hope things do come to a point where political pressure can even make the strongest cave in, he said while standing up. Is that your object? To create a world where talks can achieve something? Naruto just smiled before waving his right hand. He was gone along with gusts of winds. Once he was gone, May released a long breath before closing her eyes. Naruto's Compound Throne Room The Lion of Yuzushiogakure was sitting on his throne. The only sense that could detect him was eyesight. Guren could not feel his chakra, his scent. Nothing, her instincts couldn't even react to that ridiculous ability of his. The emperor had his head resting on the palm of his right hand, eyes closed. It was more like the scene that had welcomed Guren when she first came here. At least this time around, there was no darkness. Still, when he wanted to be, Naruto could still be a frightening person. There were moments when that agreeable and seemingly careless attitude was thrown out of the window. Guren honestly preferred it when he was in a happy mood and allowing people to express their thoughts. She walked into the throne room along with Haku. When they both kneeled before the emperor, Naoki made his appearance before the man. He was just standing there, his presence almost non existent. The only person who has so far been successful in diminishing his presence was Naruto. Naruto's slightly opened eyes turned towards Naoki without shifting his head. When he spoke, it was in a whisper. I don't remember calling for you, Naoki. Although he was often allowed to say whatever he wanted to the emperor even in serious moments, Naoki knew when not to cross the line. The look Naruto was giving him told him this was not a moment to say anything stupid or else he would find himself gasping for air. You did not, your majesty. He said cautiously. Naruto looked away. Then leave, he said. I apologize your majesty, but what brought me here will affect what you have to say these two. It may even force you to reconsider your decisions. I'm not reconsidering anything. And no one will force me to change the decisions that I have made, Naruto said in a sharp tone. Leave Naoki you will tell me those concerns once I am done with these two and you will explain it to me why you are only deciding to tell me now. The man hesitated for a moment before nodding his head. Once he was gone, Naruto's eyes turned towards both Haku and Guren before he settled straight up. He did not speak for a couple of moments. Guren I want to thank you for the service you have given to the Empire ever since you were brought in. You have been useful, and you proudly wore our symbol in all the battles you fought against spies and our enemies. We thank you for that. Guren shook her head. There is no need for His Majesty to thank me, I was simply happy to serve in the opportunity that I was given. Yukamaru has been given everything here and I have been able to feel useful once more that is more than enough. Humility has never been your biggest traits. It bothers me when you do something that seems to express humility, Naruto said those words with indifference. Regardless, Yoshino has already informed you about the sound in your promotion, yes? He did so. Our plan was not to immediately have the village linked to us at this time, but there is no helping the issue. We don't know what might come tomorrow. It will be useful to have emergency forces stationed somewhere else to call upon in case we are boxed. The moment he said those words, Guren realized that the empire was spread out in different locations systematically. No one could really surround it. Getting to the point of surrounding the island of Yuzu would be damn near impossible to begin with but other items attached to the empire were spread through various lands. That meant that it could attack in different locations. Naruto wasn't concerned about spreading his forces too much. Amigekyur had a monster living there, and on this side, there was another one. The emperor was an army on his own. Nagato was a man who could destroy an army. You will be leaving today to assume your new role in the sound. Don't concern yourself with any village we will handle the threats that come your way. I will also have some members of the Akatsuki come to you to offer that protection. What of Yukamaru? For the moment, he will stay here. The sound will not provide a safe environment for him. 
you are to continue with your operations while still there. Should Kanoha try to form communication, you are free to do as you please. But you are not to reveal anything and if you do anything dangerous, it should not come to this side. It stays between the borders, Naruto said in a stern tone. Understood, Gyurin said. She was a little sad that she had to leave Yukimaru behind, but she understood that if things go in another direction, the sound could become a war zone. Naruto might not have mentioned it, but there was that possibility. You are the leader of the sound we have taken out the sound's feudal lord. No one from Yuzu will question you on that and no one will tell you what to do without my understanding. If there is any message from me, you know where it will come from. Gyurin nodded it would come from either Naoki or Haku, perhaps even Naori. She was going to be in the same position as Yoshino. But his position was a little bigger because this was Yuzu. Either way, there would be more freedom in her new position. She also understood that inner politics were starting to play a role within the empire but Naruto was not having any of it. You may leave. Haku watched the woman leave silently before turning his eyes towards the emperor. How did things go in Kirigakure yesterday? He asked calmly. Issues solved I don't think we will have a confrontation with them, Naruto said calmly. The Mizukage is a person who understands things. She doesn't act rashly like certain people. Were you that worried about things? A little, Haku admitted. Depending on the situation, you may have decided to make Kiri a target. Naruto shook his head. You should know that we don't really hold grudges against the villages that attacked us and nearly wiped us out of existence. There is some bitterness of lost families. But if vengeance was the reason for our movements, even Kiri would have been put into the mix. I do not want to get the village involved. Haku smiled upon hearing those words. The mist had already seen much blood shed. The wounds of the civil war were still fresh. That aside, the Mizukage looked like a decent person. No, she was really a pleasant person. With your permission, I would like to visit the Mizukage today, if possible. We don't know when our enemies will attack, I'd like to solve issues with the water country before they attack, Haku said. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments. I was planning on having you accompany me when I go out today. He paused, thinking. You can still leave later. You have my permission but you'll still need to accompany me into the fire country. What is happening? It appears that Zetsu is trying to get around some members of the Akatsuki. I guess since we ruined his plans, he is going to try to ruin ours. Naruto said with a shake of his head. I knew he would make an appearance, but not like this. I really hope he doesn't insert himself in anything. Well, with what Abito wanted, we can say that whatever happens in this world is simply trivial to him. Who are we going to meet? The zombie brothers, Naruto said with a smile. Their immortality is also quite interesting. Well, at least Haydn's. I am quite certain Karen would love to cut him up to study just why he cannot die even if you chop him down to pieces, the blonde said. I thought Karen was no longer conducting such work, Haku said. Naruto just shrugged his shoulders before getting on to why he had called Haku. You do understand what your new role entails, right? Yoshino was more or less my right-hand man. Within the empire there is still no one with more influence than him. You will become my new right-hand man. What you say will represent what I say. When you speak, I am the one who is speaking. Anyone disrespects you, they disrespect me. Naoki made his appearance known once more. That is the reason I was here, your majesty, he said. I figured as much, Naruto said. Why did you wait only to tell me now? Surely even though Haku's new position was only proposed yesterday by Yoshino, there have been some people who were not content with his proximity to me, he said. I did not say anything then because it was nothing that needed his majesty's attention. Yoshino knew all these before he even proposed anything. I'll even wager that he did it purposefully. Yoshino's role is not to fill me in on the whispers that is your role, Naoki, Naruto said. But you are probably right about the last part. The emperor shook his head at the thought. What are the whispers? They are more like voices of disapproval, really, Naoki said. The council sat late last night. Yoshino was summoned, so was I. Those immortal geezers were complaining about why a non-Uzumaki is taking on such a role. 
There is also some discontent with Guren's position as well. As well as mine, Naruto finished with a smile. What else? Our financial situation. Naruto frowned upon hearing those words. And war is still going to cost us. Quite honestly, we will be going to negatives but we can still recover the costs once all is finished. He said quietly. Schedule a meeting with them, I will address them. For when? In three days Naruto said. Guren should have already arrived in the sound, and Haku should be away in Kiri handling his business then. I will get it done, Naoki said. Should I accompany you? No, Naruto said with a shake of his head. Just mind your own business and stop being an annoyance. You should also stop eavesdropping on my conversations. If you are going to do it, don't let me notice you. And don't let me see you. And don't make it obvious you were doing it. If I catch you, you'll go back to training. That isn't fair his majesty expects me to completely disappear from his senses. I chose you and Naori because of your stealth skills. You are supposed to be better than me in that department. No one should be able to get behind me, but you should at least have a second of free movement before I can react. If you don't have that, you are not worthy of being my guard and I'll stick with Haku. Wouldn't that be a little extreme? Naoki asked carefully. You have never complained about our work before. I'd always assumed we did everything perfectly. Naruto did not offer a response to this question. Make sure that Guren has everything and that those people are present for the council meeting. I won't return until the day of the meeting. Naoki was silent for a couple of moments, wondering where Naruto could be going. He was never gone for too long. Even when he left, he always returned from late at night. Perhaps it was his concern for threats to Yuzu. But now it was no longer just safe for him. He was marked in both Kyumo and Iwa's bingo books. They'd put large bounties on his head. Even worthless shinobi would now be attacking him. Was it really safe to allow him to leave with just Haku? The ice user was strong Naruto had ensured he was strong but it was his reluctance to do what needed to be done that bothered him. Haku could never massacre people for Naruto but Naoki could do it without even blinking. Naoki was not going to suggest that Naruto was not thinking things through. He was the emperor. He knew what he was doing. Perhaps at times he allowed convenient things to occur for his amusement, which could give rise to dangerous situations but he was not the kind of person one would need to worry about. There was no one in this island who could match the blonde in power. The great nations were certainly going to be shocked and they learn more about his frightening power. Please be careful and don't do anything reckless, Naoki ended up saying. Are going to see Tamari? That is none of your business, Naruto said in a flat tone. As your guard, it is my business to know your whereabouts. If something happens to you, it is my head that will roll, Naoki responded in an even tone. Naruto glanced at the redhead for a moment before taking steps towards Haku. Your job is what I say it is, he said. Prepare for your departure. I am going to see our prisoners. Haku nodded. It was not for the departure to see Haydn and Kakuzu. He was still going to do that but he would just not be returning to this village once he leaves. He was going to head straight to Kiri after they are done with the two Akatsuki members. Two minutes later. Kuratsuchi snarled seeing Naruto standing in front of the bars that kept her locked away in this world that seemed detached from the rest of the world. He was nothing but the subject of her contempt. She could not forgive him for everything she had been put through. It didn't matter that she had tried to eliminate him he had given her enough reasons to eliminate him. The self-righteous part of her didn't even think that she did something wrong. This idiot was the one who was wrong. The anger within her, the complete and pure desire to strangle him made her body tremble slightly. If her eyes could glow, they would have glowed with the fire burning inside of her. She was even lucky her intestines were not burnt to crisp, because the fire was truly too much to be contained. There he was, standing there like he owned everything, like he ruled this world. He was nothing. He was nothing compared to her grandfather and Kuratsuchi would make sure that one day, he was kissing her feet. But she would still not allow him to die. No she would burn this village to the ground and slaughter everyone one of his clansmen and then, she would permit him to die. Because of him, she had been made to suffer in the hands of a sadistic woman. 
It was just plain abuse. Looking at me with that kind of look only amuses me, Kuratsuchi, Naruto said in flat tone. I have been subject to contempt through most of life. The look you give me now doesn't even make me cringe. It's actually pitiful that you have been reduced to this. From what Kuratsuchi understood, Naruto had been hated by Kanoha's villagers. They had blamed him for the killings the QB made when it went on a rampage. She could imagine them looking at him with contempt, for killing their loved ones. She laughed madly at the thought. Once done, she looked towards Naruto and spoke, can't say you didn't deserve it. And I can't say you didn't deserve the pain Gurin has made you suffer, Naruto responded flatly. He then smiled. Oh, will you look at it we both deserve what has fallen upon us. Kuratsuchi spat out, you idiot, I will make you pay for this. I swear I will. Naruto completely ignored those words. While we have both suffered, at least I stand outside of this cell and you there, at my mercy. I can still make you suffer more pain if I want to. Kuratsuchi gritted her teeth, she could not curse him. She didn't want any more of it. She has already suffered enough. She could not go through more of that anymore. Her body could not take it anymore. What do you want? I came to free you, Naruto said calmly. Your grandfather has declared war on us and has said that he will destroy us if we don't release you. Of course, we could hold you as hostage in case he decides to do something, but we are not that cruel. Yeah right, Kuratsuchi responded with bitter sarcasm. I told you my grandfather would not let you get away with it. She said triumphantly. Naruto unlocked the cell and waited as Kuratsuchi stood up. He watched her slowly walk towards him with that smile of hers. She indeed believed that she was being released because of the pressure from her grandfather. It was indeed sad. He really wanted to just slam the cell shut and burst in laughter when he sees her hopeless look. But he was not that of a cruel person. Kuratsuchi stopped just inches away from Naruto and stared into eyes. I will be sure to return the fave. A firm hand grabbed her by her throat before she could even finish what she wanted to say. Kuratsuchi tried to force Naruto to release her but the grip would not loosen and his hold was making it difficult for her to breathe. When he picked her up into the air, she kicked out hysterically, while being suffocated. Finally, after what seemed like eternity, she was dropped to the ground. She fell on her butt and started gasping for air whilst both her hands were on her throat. I'm not that merciful and you are not going back to Iwagakure because we fear your grandfather. I believe I have already you that your grandfather will surely die for your sin. There is a consequence for every action you take, Kuratsuchi. Of course, just because we intend to punish your grandfather doesn't mean that if you do things that warranty your death we won't do it. Naruto stated in a hardened tone. I'm simply releasing you so that you can have a front row seat to watch your grandfather die. You won't be able to do anything because until I decide otherwise, you will not be able to use your chakra. If it wasn't because she was afraid, Kuratsuchi would have lunged at the blonde right there and then. Naruto snapped his fingers and Naori appeared from the shadows. Break both her legs and drop her off at the gates of her village, he ordered coldly. When Kuratsuchi's body tensed up, he smiled. I'm just messing with you, he said. Or not. Naori didn't wait for anything further from Naruto but just forcefully grabbed Kuratsuchi and took her away. Once the two were gone, Naruto turned to face the silent person still sitting within the cell. Your silence is curious, he said without stepping inside. Yujito didn't offer an immediate response. But what could she have said about the situation? Honestly, she was pleased she didn't have to sleep in the same place as that woman. Kuratsuchi was truly a bitter person who grumbled too much. She was still sad that she wasn't going to be released, but at least she would not have to listen to Kuratsuchi's ramblings. Nothing I would have said was going to change anything, she said with a slight shake of her head. You underestimate yourself, Naruto said calmly. I'm sorry I won't be releasing you. I cannot give Kumogakure any more power than it already has. Things could become troublesome for us, he said with a shake of his head. I held no illusions that I would be released, Yujito said. You don't have to be so hopeless about the situation, Naruto said. No one is going to hurt you, no one is going to do anything to you and you will eventually leave this place. Apparently, Yujito said. 
my stay hasn't been that unpleasant except for where I am made to sleep. Naruto looked thoughtful for a moment before responding. I will come back to you on that one. Hopefully, we can give you a better place to stay but you will still not leave this village. Not anytime soon. My hope is that you don't leave, but if you want to leave, you will be permitted to do so just not now because there is war. And if Kumogakure manages to get into the island? Naruto shook his head. We have taken measures to ensure that such a thing doesn't happen. He said calmly. Both Kumo and Iwagakure have already declared war on us. Very soon, they will be sitting to discuss a truce and form their strategies. We will be fighting soon. I will keep you updated on what is happening. If you can't. You can't really believe that everything will go your way and you will win this war. But I do believe that well, not the part that everything will go my way but at the end I will win this war. AI and Anoki will be dead in the end and the Uzumaki Empire will usher the shinobi world into a new world. Fire Country. What was it? Everyone worked for their own benefit. Everyone had an agenda. The strong men always had something planned up and they always wanted to achieve something by using others. Kakuzu had lived a long life to be a mere puppet to someone else's game. The years he has lived have taught him many lessons which he was never going to throw away. He could not say for reminder of his life or until he died, because he really, was not planning to die any time soon. Kakuzu intended to live a very long life. He would surely stay with this godforsaken partner of his. The cursed Haydn could never shut up, but he was at least a partner who could just not die. The internal battles of the Akatsuki didn't mean anything to him. He didn't care for them and had no interest in following them. It wasn't the agenda of the group that made him follow it it was the protection that it offered him that he felt he could follow them. He was saved here. Zetsu could try to poach him into doing other things but Kakuzu was not stupid. He had not lived this long life by being a stupid man who could be fooled by just anyone. The fact that Zetsu was even coming behind pain meant that he could not fight the leader. He was weak. It would be illogical for him to follow such a person no a creature. A rock hit him on his forehead and Kakuzu looked towards his partner. The man was sprouting something but he had turned off his ears to listen to his thoughts. For a moment, he got annoyed at being hit by a rock but he reigned over the emotion and listened to what the man was saying. Team, are you listening now? Contempt and frustrations Kakuzu could tell those emotions from Haydn's tone. But he really didn't care for it. He was Haydn's partner, not his sponsor. What? He demanded. And if you hit me by a rock again, I will eliminate you. He threatened. Haydn grabbed his scythe firmly, wanna have a go at it? I dare you right now to have a go at me and we will see who will eliminate who. Always ready to have a go at someone this reckless idiot. One day, Kakuzu was going to sever his head from his shoulders and then sell it to someone for a high price. He could always retrieve it at a later date. It wasn't like there was nothing that could be done to destroy it anyway. It would be rather unfortunate if you two eliminated each other, Naruto suddenly spoke, appearing into the clearing with Haku walking beside him. Kakuzu was sitting on the stairs of a temple with Haydn standing below. It appeared that a battle had been occurring here. Who the idiot are you? I have heard that you have a foul mouth, but I didn't think it was like this. Does your god permit such a foul rat to be his worshipper? Naruto asked calmly, with an indifferent look on his face. What do you know about Jashin-sama? Nothing, really, Naruto said with a shake of his head. You two are still wearing the cloak of the Akatsuki, which is good. I thought Zetsu would have poisoned you into betraying the organization. And if we had done so? Naruto smiled. Isn't it obvious? He asked calmly. Both of you have large bounties on your head. I would have been forced to chop of your heads from your shoulders and turn you in for the bounties. It would have been rather ironic given that this has been your job for a long time, isn't it? Kakuzu wasn't amused by this statement. He knew who this person was. Haydn might not know because of his ignorance but Kakuzu knew. He was alive because he knew what was happening in this world. You also have a bounty in your head, a very big one. If we capture you, I could make a killing. Indeed, Naruto said with a nod of his head. I'm quite certain that Anoki would even give you a bonus for your service. 
But you speak like you are part of the Akatsuki no, you have connection with pain if what Zetsu said was true, Kakuzu said in thought. I'm not part of the Akatsuki but I do know the man you call pain, Naruto said calmly. I actually came here on his behalf. We are doing some cleaning of the house. We really don't want people backstabbing us. We are going to war and we need to know where we stand with you people. We are still members of the Akatsuki, Kakuzu said. Naruto nodded his head. I want to believe that, but he suddenly lunged towards Haydn with a sword gripped fully on his right hand. The sword cleaved through the air in a vertical slash. Haydn blocked the swing with the back of his scythe and tried to push the blonde away but he realized, the blonde was not budging. That is impressive, Naruto said to Haydn, who had managed to block his sword and still managed to stop the momentum while also trying to push him away. Impressive? Are you mocking me? I was expressing my delight in your physical prowess as well as instincts, Naruto said calmly before doing a slight jump backwards to create some distance between him and Haydn. Haydn charged towards Naruto holding his scythe. He then swung it from his left, cutting towards Naruto's left shoulder in impressive speed. But Naruto still saw everything perfectly. He avoided the swing by ducking under it. His eyes watched it pass just above him in speed before he straightened up. He then twisted around, flashing his sword across Haydn's chest but the man managed to hold out the handle of his scythe just in front of him to block the sword. Naruto absorbed a bit of wind before releasing powerful gusts of wind from his mouth whilst his sword was still pressed against Haydn's scythe. The gusts slammed straight into Haydn, causing him to be hurled backwards. While he was still airborne, Naruto flashed above the man, both his feet crashed onto his chest. Boom! They crashed into the ground, with Haydn hitting with his back and Naruto on top of him. The Akatsuki Nin brushed it off like it was nothing as he cursed Naruto. That hurt. He shouted while pushing the blonde away from him. Naruto jumped away from Haydn and landed a distance away. The moment he touched down the ground, Haku also landed behind him, back turned against him. He narrowed his eyes towards the ice user before turning his eyes upwards the entrance of the temple. Finally, Naruto said while looking towards the black figure that had made its appearance in the scene. His sword disappeared from his hand. Don't take your eyes away from me. Haydn yelled, while lunging toward Naruto. He was holding his scythe with both his hands, swinging it towards Naruto's chest. Naruto's coated his right hand with wind chakra to harden it enough to be able to block the swing. His movements caught Haydn by surprise as he appeared to block the scythe by his arm. Naruto pushed the scythe away from him before taking a step forward in the blink of an eye. A brutal and resounding punch connected with Haydn's gut, causing him to spit out saliva. He dispelled the wind and placed the palm of his right hand on Haydn's chest. Marks began to spread through the man's body, restraining him. Close your eyes and count from one to hundred, the seal should be gone by the time you finish counting. For now, you are no longer of interest, Naruto said in a cold tone before turning his attention towards Zetsu. Haku then froze Haydn's legs to the ground along with the scythe to keep him from moving. Kakuzu was certain that Naruto had no intentions to seriously fight Haydn. If there had been the purpose to eliminate them, even Haku would have taken part but the black-haired shinobi had just been observing. Naruto's dismissal of Haydn the moment Zetsu shows up just confirmed that the blonde had merely been interested in Haydn perhaps he just wanted to test his immortality. He did not get up from his position, nor did he strain his neck trying to look at the lurking shadow behind him. I figured you'd show up if I did things this way, Black Zetsu said without stepping out of the shadows. Of course, if you were serious, you could have chosen better candidates, Naruto responded calmly. I wasn't expecting to see you though. I thought I would just do my business and be on my way. I can't appear in Yuzu admittedly, it's a little dangerous, so is appearing when you are free to do anything you want, Black Zetsu admitted. I really had no intentions of turning these two against Nagato. I just wanted to draw you out and let you know that I am able to ruin things for you. I could have let the secret out to Kanoha long ago, I could have informed Anoki before you even went to Iwagakure. But I did not because I do not want your plans to fail. I want you to succeed. And when you do, Madara will come back in this world and destroy everything. You will watch everything you build be destroyed Black Zetsu disappeared after saying those words. 
Naruto sighed after the figure disappeared. Well, at least I don't have to worry about him interfering with my plans he said calmly. Express a little concern for this Haku cautioned. He knows too much and just confirmed that he still plans to revive Madara. But we know that the only way that can happen is through Nagato. Zetsu doesn't have the capability to defeat Nagato, Naruto said carelessly. But you are right. It won't be right to discard things. By Madara does he mean the legendary Uchiha Madara? Kakuzu asked with interest. The same man who could stand toe on toe with the Shodai Hokage. I forget you once fought Hashirama, Naruto said in thought. But yes, he does mean that infamous Uchiha he said. I have a message from Pain please move towards the sound country. Your next assignment shall come from there. There is a war coming, and you will play a role. Can we still collect bounty? Naruto smiled. Of course, he said. It was good I brought you along, Haku. You can't really know what happens when walking in these paths. You can go to Kiri now. I'll depart toward the wind. You are not going to cause any troubles, are you? You must be annoyed that you didn't get to finish your sparring session with Haydn san Haku said with a stare. Naruto waved his right hand dismissively. Kakuzu watched Naruto leave with an expressionless mask on his face. While he had no interest in the deeper workings of the Akatsuki, it was indeed apparent that there was something going on in the shadows and if it involved the return of Madara Uchiha, it could very well be interesting. Yet, Naruto didn't seem bothered by it. The blonde was still a brat but this was still the shinobi world. Black Setsu had been so cautious that he didn't even step closer it meant the blonde was dangerous. Well, it could explain why both Kumogakure and IWA have put large bounties on his head. Either way, unless there was profit he mostly definitely could not ignore, Kakuzu wasn't going to get involved. Some matters you just stayed away from to save yourself. Sanagekure. Training exercises were being done by everyone, although she had students, Tamari also took some time to ready herself. There was war coming and while it looked like they would only become spectators, it was also safe for them to be ready for anything. There was no telling what would happen tomorrow. Even Kanoha had been preparing for war over the past years. Suna wasn't as strong as the other villages but at least in this village, in the middle of the desert, an invasion was unlikely. Not when Gara was still alive. Her brother could turn the desert into a mass graveyard for any army that tries to attack the sand. Tamari wiped a sweat over her eyebrows and released a long breath. She missed having a partner. The time Naruto had been here in this village, she had been challenged and met someone who controlled the wind around him as if it was an extension of his body. Naruto certainly had unique skills with wind. She prided herself in being the best wind user within the wind country, but she certainly could not compare to that person. His skills were outstanding. You'd think he had a bloodline but it was all just control and an understanding of how futon chakra works. Thinking of the blonde just made her frown. They had a good thing going before he ruined it. And when she went to see him in Yuzushio, he had been cold. She had ended up leaving without even having that dinner with him. She could not have handled sitting beside him. He was really different from the teasing blonde who had warmed his way into her heart. He had been cold sitting on that throne. She hadn't known anything about him. Then again, he had never been the most revealing person despite never refusing to answer questions. Tamari held her fan and tried to use it but a slightly cold air washed over her. It was a gentle breeze that made her turn around quickly. And there he was, he was wearing civilian clothes, hair black, but she could not mistake his eyes, his presence. The little smile that had annoyed her many times he was in her presence. I think you were just thinking about me, he suddenly said. I thought I should honor this by making an appearance. Tamari scoffed. Yeah, right. Naruto didn't lose his smile. There is no need to shy. I know you were thinking about me he said calmly. I also think about you and the things and did when it was just the two of us. Do you remember the first time we did it? How could she forget? At that time, she had completely surrendered herself to him. She had allowed this man to do what he wanted with her. He had undressed her. Caressed her and made her feel good. The thought made her cheeks flush slightly but she quickly shook it off and replaced it with anger. Is that why you came here? 
to remind me about the old days. Yes and no, Naruto said. But those days were good, yes. Temari refused to answer this. What do you want, Naruto? No, your majesty. She amended with mild sarcasm. Naruto sighed. Sarcasm isn't really helping with anything, he said. Do you know how I was able to make the air feel slightly cold? It is because I was trying to recreate ice. Wind and water make ice. I thought if I could combine the two elements, it could work, but it did not work out. You were trying to recreate something that is possible through a bloodline. Temari responded with a flat look on her face. My wind control is excellent, and I thought there was no jutsu that was impossible to learn, Naruto said. You must have been crushed. Disappointed, yes, but I was not crushed. A pity, Temari said. Now that is just cold, dear, Naruto said with a stare. I am dear now. You were cold towards me when I came to Yuzu. You pretty much had no interest in the business I had come to conduct with you. I won't deny that, Naruto said quietly. But I have not come here for business. I am here on personal issues. That is why I even bothered wearing a disguise. And yet, still couldn't get rid of the Uzumaki clan symbol. Naruto didn't need to look at the symbol on his chest, he just shook his head. Couldn't help it. It would feel weird wearing clothing that does not have any symbol on it. You need help. Naruto laughed at this. I don't think things need to go that far. We all have certain things we simply don't want to separate from. I love my clan, and the symbols make me feel proud to be Uzumaki. I'd say it is useless being in a hench and yet still maintain that mark, Tamari said in a flat tone. Perhaps, Naruto said in thought. He moved closer to Tamari who backed away when he got too close for her comfort. He didn't force the issue though. What do you want? I came to see you. Why? Naruto looked up into the sky while he responded. I grew to know you while in this training ground. Of course, there was a certain distance I kept. But it did not change that I found you likable. Perhaps for the first time in my life, I had learned to like a girl. Dealing with that was not my strength. I also had many things to do and I prioritized. Admittedly, I failed. I went wrong in some parts. I failed you, Tamari. He faced her, staring deep into her eyes. I admit that, he smiled bitterly. And I am sorry for making you go through the pain of losing me. I am sorry for not telling you anything. I should have but a flawed part of me at times thinks everyone has emotional problems like I do. So you admit you have problems, Tamari said. Perhaps to you, I have been nice. But with most people, I feel nothing, I express nothing. My childhood forced me to keep things locked up. The Sandam once tried to have me make friends. I tried. I really did. But you know what? Those people had no desire to befriend me. They pretended and then led me into a death trap. From then, I just stopped trying. I'd always thought you were different from what my brother was. In some ways, I was different but not a better person. That is at least what I tell myself. The good thing is that I taught myself not to hate long ago. There was too much for me to hate. Each time I thought of my anger, I could hear the voice of the Kyubi. Its chakra would leak out. It scared me. You know why? Because I knew if I did not deal with my anger, I would eventually lose myself and I would never become what I wanted to become. How did you deal? I adopted a partially logical thinking mindset Naruto paused for a moment, gathering his thoughts. I understand you were hurt. And I am at fault for that. You understand? Temari asked in a bitter tone. And yet you just watched me suffer without even telling me anything. You could have saved me a lot of pain if you just popped out of nowhere and said I'm actually alive, but you just decided to watch me suffer. Naruto did not give an immediate response. Perhaps following what other people had said would have put him in a different situation but he had decided to do things this way. I'm not that cruel, Tamari. She watched him with narrowed eyes. What is that supposed to mean? I could not have brought myself to come here and watch you suffer. I did not even watch Kanoha or step out of Yuzu for that matter, Naruto explained. 
I don't want you to think that I am a cold-hearted person who does not care about anyone. It actually looked that way to me. Naruto smiled. I don't blame you for having such an image of me. Regardless, even if am I called cold-hearted, I want you to know that this cold-hearted person still admires you. I came here for that. Not because I want to see you naked. Could you not say such things with a straight face? Why? Does it make you feel embarrassed or did you just picture something naughty? Tamari was close enough to swing her fan towards Naruto's shoulder. But the blonde jumped away to avoid the blow. He still smiled. I did not know you become such a naughty girl, Tamari he said. I'm not. Really? Naruto disappeared in a show of extreme speed. He appeared behind Tamari in a blur. Both his hands moved over her and held her by her waist before he leaned over to her right ear. If I were to move my hands downwards while whispering sweet things, would you not have dirty thoughts? I'd grab that thing between your legs and break it before you say anything. What would please you if you did such a thing, Tamari? I don't remember you having such contempt for that thing. I remember you were very eager for me to put it inside of you. Tamari stomped on his right foot with all the strength she could muster before speaking. You are seeing illusions. I never said you satisfied me. Naruto laughed. Both hands moved up slowly, feeling the shape of her body and stopped just below her breasts. He kissed her on her neck before speaking. See, you are not denying me. And you had a pleasant look on her face when in Kanoha. Tamari decided to get away from Naruto. He did not stop her. She twisted around to look at him. He had that smile. She glared at those lips. God, she had missed him. Tamari shook her head. Naruto laughed once more. It was a pleasure speaking and seeing you once more, Tamari. Please invite me when you want to see me. I will be eagerly waiting for that invite. He smiled once more before disappearing along gusts of winds. That was cruel, Tamari thought mildly. Naruto had just come and gone. She hadn't even been able to ask him anything about his plans. Well, what would he have said that he couldn't have said to her when she was at Yuzushiogakure? She would not be as naive as to think that she could get the blonde to tell her his secrets by being in a relationship with him. Naruto could be closed as a cage. He did not leak. He did not say what he didn't want to say. He was closely guarded and Tamari was not going to get ahead of herself. But on a personal note, this had not been so bad. Perhaps she could invite him sometime and Gara didn't need to know he was here. She shook her head. She could not keep that from him. Not when he had been so supportive over the past couple of years. With that in mind, Tamari turned toward the Kage Tower. It was a slow walk. She was still a little tired from the training she had been doing. When she got to the tower, Tamari went straight towards Gara's office. She was surprised to see Shikamura there with him. Hey, Tamari, the Nara greeted lazily. Shikamaru, I didn't know you were coming to Suna, she said before settling on a chair beside the Nara. It was something hurried, Shikamaru said. Tamari nodded. With Shikamaru around, she could not tell Gara about Naruto's personal visit. If it had been politics, she would say. So, what brings you to the hidden sand? War, Shikamaru said in a slightly serious tone. Or at least how we observe it. Kanoha does not wish to take part in any of it. Even if Yuzu is being destroyed. Shikamaru nodded. I spoke with the emperor. He made it absolutely clear that he did not want help. He also gave you the same message, Tamari. Besides, if Kanoha gets involved, Suna gets involved and it becomes a wide-scale shinobi world war. There is more loss and damage when things happen like that. But it would still be cruel to see another village being destroyed and do nothing, Gara said. I don't think Yuzu will get destroyed. Even if the Uzumaki lose the war, Yuzu will most likely remain standing, Shikamaru said with confidence. On another note, the Emperor said he was willing to open dialogues and engage in something useful. Probably when the war is over and he would like it if you and I could work together. Why? He dismissed me the last time I was there, Tamari asked curiously. A calculated move, Shikamaru said. But if you think the emperor is going to take decisions that favor you on account to history with him, you are mistaken. 
Still, we have a chance, and we have to work something out that is why I am here. Naruto was sitting by the back of his compound, leaning against a wall, left knee raised, with his right foot touching the outside there was the sound of water running through the small streams created in the garden. There was a bird chirping within the garden. But Naruto wasn't listening to it. His mind was elsewhere. On his left inside, inside the house, there was a bottle and a saucer, just sitting, a book that had been taken for the purpose of being read but the moment he had sat down, he had lost interest in it. It wasn't often that he came here with many things to do here, but whenever he felt sentimental, he did come here just to be lost in thought, and enjoy his peace. If he hadn't destroyed his apartment in Kanoha, Naruto would have made time just to go there and seek by the window, lost in thought and ignoring the world around him. Naoki flashed beside the emperor and stared for a long minute before clapping both his hands. Naruto didn't even blink to the sound or the presence of the man. Naoki then leaned over to Naruto's ear and whispered. Your former sensei is waiting for you in the throne room, he said. It took more or less a minute for Naruto to finally respond. His lost expression did not change and his tone was distant. Who invited him? You should know he needs no invitation to move around. Naruto went silent once more before responding. Bring him here, he said. I would rather not move for a little while longer. Yes, your majesty. Two minutes later, slowly and cautiously, Jiraiya walked towards Naruto. He had been brought through the back. The Sanin could not feel Naruto's presence. The blonde had not even reacted to his appearance. It was one of those days. He was glad he came when Naruto was like this. Had the blonde been sitting on the throne, he probably would not have been entertained. He had only been taking a chance even coming to this village. Since Shikamaru was entertained, he figured perhaps he could get some minutes with the blonde as well. Besides, he hadn't come here being a messenger of Kanoha. Of course, he could not forget the last time he spoke with Naruto. It had been an unpleasant conversation that the Hidden Leaf and Naruto had just shown them cold eyes that had told them he didn't care about them. It had wounded him he had taken Naruto away because he thought they could bond. Well, perhaps they did bond. Before the incident, they really did get along, despite Naruto never truly showing his personality. Jiraiya settled down with a heavy and tired sigh. He glanced at Naruto through the corner of his eyes for a moment before staring at the beautifully crafted garden. It was truly such a waste that it was made for Naruto. The blonde could not see it, he couldn't breathe it, and he couldn't feel it. I see you're still sentimental, Jiraiya said the first words. He summoned his bottle from a storage scroll as he waited for Naruto to respond. Naruto only shifted his eyes for a moment before staring back into the empty space ahead of him. I have not lost of things, he said. I wonder about that, Jiraiya said in thought. I don't see women around here. This place is rather lonely and I didn't hear any word of you hitting the bars to pick up girls or just sitting there alone. Can you imagine the emperor sitting in a bar alone, staring into nothing? Naruto asked rhetorically. I don't seem to recall always being surrounded by women. Sure, I had my moments, but not always. Jiraiya nodded. I'm hoping you can use your influence to get me a present before I leave I saw some beautiful girls when coming here. With you around, I'm sure I can get some fine material for my next book. I think I will call it. The Emperor's Paradise, Naruto finished for Jiraiya. You're growing old, Jiraiya. Do you think it is wise to waste your life working on your books? You'll die without leaving a legacy behind in this world. Jiraiya frowned deeply. He had no student like Minato to leave behind. Things could have worked out with Naruto but the blonde never really felt he was his student. Who should I blame for that? Your attitude and negligence, Naruto said in a flat tone. That's rather harsh, Jiraiya said before taking a sip of his drink. Naruto shrugged carelessly. I don't recall having been gentle with you. Besides, you are not a child anymore. And nor are you a woman. What about you? What of me, sensei? Naruto said purposefully. Nagato still calls you sensei. I do believe that you will always be remembered in his heart. Well, you did form a great deal of his happy childhood, the blonde said in thought. Jiraiya snorted. I find that hard to believe, he said. 
he was willing to eliminate me not long ago. And the Nagato that lives now is not the Nagato that I trained long ago. For their dreams, people will do everything, and anything. It doesn't matter if we care for someone, if we think that you are standing in the way of what we want to achieve, we will get rid of you. The same can be said for me. If I ever thought that you would stand in my way, I wouldn't hesitate to put a knife on your back, Naruto said. The only thing that comforts me with those words is that even facing someone as strong as me, you wouldn't use such a tactic to get rid of me you would give me the honor of a death in battle. Jiraiya said while eyeing Naruto with the corner of his eyes the blonde wasn't looking at him. What kind of legacy are you going to leave behind, Naruto? That question doesn't deserve a response, Naruto said in a flat tone. I'm in a good mood today. You are welcomed, but tomorrow you will not be welcomed. Use your time wisely, Jiraiya Sensei. Jiraiya frowned. Things were really quick to escalate with Naruto. He should have known though. I'll probably get ignored if I talk about your goals, he said bitterly. Shall we reminisce about the days we spent together? Chapter 19 Jiraiya will no doubt try to go to Amagekure to speak to Nagato unless something happens that keeps him grounded, Naruto said to both Naoki and Naori. He was sitting on his throne, watching the two with an expressionless mask. Warn Nagato about this. We don't want a nuisance ruining anything. Naoki found it amusing that Naruto would call Jiraiya a nuisance given that he had just been sitting with the Toad Sage, sharing a drink with him while talking about the past. He wasn't going to point this out as it appeared the Emperor was no longer fooling around. Do you think he would leak anything to either Kyumogakure or Iwagakure? Naruto shook his head. But he will try to stand in the way, he said. Jiraiya was a hypocrite and would not doubt try to stop things in the quest of his peace. But Naruto did not care for the man's peace. He didn't care what his father would have wanted. He had made his own choice as Minato had made his own to sacrifice himself for the sake of Kanoha. For the sake of the Uzumaki, he would step on the throats of the Kages and make them obey him. If Jiraiya was going to stand in the way, he would be removed. Nagato would even do it himself. He was much more merciless than he was. He was just cold, Nagato was brutal. Kanoha has already been warned. It does appear that Sunagakir will not make any movements, unlike Kanoha. The village is very nosy. They haven't made any movements in the sound country, but they will surely do it once they learn of it, Naori said. Gyurin will deal with it without involving U.S. You will offer her the support she demands, Naruto said calmly. We have been talking about war for a while now we must now make sure it happens. If Anoki and AI are being slow to act, we must force their hands. They are actually meeting soon to discuss their strategy, Naori said. Naruto could not hide his smile upon hearing those words. He was glad that Naoki had told him about this. He could go on and make a small show. He hasn't been stretching his muscles in quite some time. A small exercise with the Kages would not hurt anyone. Besides, if it could intensify things, Naruto would gladly ruin their meeting. Do you know the location? Naturally, Naori said. We will go there and I will have a small sparring session with them. I should give them some reasons and make them mobilize quickly. They are acting too slowly for my liking. I am getting bored now. If nothing happens, I am most likely to attack one of them myself, Naruto said. You must not get too excited, your majesty. If you do that, it will change the direction we decided to take, Naoki was quick to say. Directions can be changed any time. Besides, I am the emperor if we want to do things different, we will do them. He paused for a moment. But I will restrain myself. I will certainly explode in the battlefield though. I will be forgiven, he said with a shrug. I wonder about that, Naoki said in thought. Do you want me to go with you? Naruto shook his head. You annoy me these days Naori will move with me. You can never know what happens there. It will be good to have some backup he paused and stared at the two with a cold look on his face. You two revealed yourself to a person from Kumogakure and I remember specifically telling you not to interfere. There was silence. They looked at each other and Naoki spoke. Well, we didn't interfere. We just observed, coincidentally, 
it happened while C was watching, he said with a weak smile. Naruto stared at the man for what looked like eternity. You are lying, Naoki I dislike that kind of thing about you. You think you know me best and tend to act knowing that I will be fine. Normally, if things don't backfire, I am fine with it, but when things go wrong, and when I have told you not to move, it displeases me very much. Naoki's smile vanished but it was Naori who responded. Has something happened, your majesty? Why do you two think that I kept you away and introduced myself as the emperor with Haku and Guren acting as my guards while you are my real guards? Sometimes you act too much for your amusement and don't consider certain possibilities and scenarios. Naruto shook his head. Nothing happened, but you appear in conversation as C reported you to AI. Naoki, I know it was your decision to go out if this happens again, you two are done. Understood, your majesty. Naruto offered no reaction to this. How is Haku doing? He is moving slowly in the wind Daimyo isn't, Naori said. Naoki, remind him that he needs to act decisively or else I will have the Daimyo eliminated. I know I gave him the responsibility but if he is unable to handle it, I will do it for him. Giren would have just removed him from the picture if he could not listen, Naruto said in thought. Then again, just removing him will complicate things with Kirigakure. Indeed, Naoki said. We could try other methods of exercising control, he suggested. Naruto thought about it for a moment before nodding his head. Present the method to Haku as an option and see what he will do. Naori, you will come to me and we will travel to have a little bit of fun with Anoki and the Rakage. What about your meeting with the council, your majesty? I no longer have interest in going, Naruto said in a flat tone. But I do have to go to make them obedient, don't I? Council Chambers Politics was a hardcore game. Yoshino had observed it from many nations. It was perhaps much more cruel than the game Shinobi played. At least in politics no one was really an enemy. Today they could fight, and tomorrow they'd be partners trying to win an office together. The game of politics was like that. It was dangerous. It was a game filled of lies and propaganda. It wasn't the kind of game Naruto could enjoy playing. No, his emperor was a shinobi and while he had his moments, he was not a politician. He did not have the patience and attitude to play it. Appearances were everything in politics. Most often Naruto did not care for it. But it wasn't to say he didn't know how to play his cards. The council was filled up with old geezers who've been playing the game of cards for a number of years. They had nothing better to do than to play cards when the clan was playing extinct and many of their clansmen scattered throughout the elemental nations. They were trying to play their hand with Naruto. They were trying to play politics with Naruto. It was a dangerous game. Yoshino respected them but he did not follow them. They taught him many things. Hell, they even taught Naruto certain things about Uzumaki arts. Though, neither can claim to be teachers of Naruto when it came to Fuenjutsu in general. Yoshino looked around the round table for a moment before his eyes stopped at the old man who raised him. He nodded towards the old man, but said nothing. They played this game. They said nothing toward each other in public. Perhaps it was the old man's presence in the council that was driving them to push him towards the throne of the Uzumaki Empire. Yoshino did not deserve it and he would not admire it. He had his own throne, and it was the helm of Yuzushiogakure and the Uzumaki clan. Yoshino, it has come to our attention that you were the one who proposed that Haku be put in his current position. He is indeed a bloodline holder but he isn't Uzumaki. The old, yet firm voice of his, grandfather, said. Naruto had yet to arrive. He was not late. He would come in time for the meeting to start. They just started early each time. Yes, that was my proposal, Yoshino said with a nod. Why would you propose something like that? Naruhiro could have played that role. Naruhiro would not offer his majesty the kind of protection he requires. That aside, I require Naruhiro's services here in Yuzu. Protection. There was a snort. It isn't like Naruto needs any protection from anyone. Regardless, that is what we have determined and it shall be so, Yoshino said. He was not going to budge. He was not going to become a puppet of these people. You have changed, Yoshino. 
if you cannot see things in the same light as we do, we will train someone else to take over Yuzushiogakure and groom that person to become the next emperor. I suggest you start training someone now because I don't plan on being leader of this village for the rest of my life. As for who becomes the emperor, as far as I am concerned, Naruto determines who succeeds him. Rules can be changed any time. Besides, Naruto will not live a long life if he still plans on releasing the Kyubi. He has already used some of his life force to get himself where he is. Yoshino was not going to tell them that everything could be offset if Karen was successful in her experiments. With Kabuto in the mix, it was going to be a success and Naruto would get a chance to live a long life worthy of someone with Uzumaki blood. That may be true Yoshino stopped when the doors flung open and Naruto slowly walked into the council chamber, alone with an expressionless look on his face. Naruto took his rightful seat and placed both his hands on the table before speaking. I won't take much of your time. We just need to sort out a couple of issues and remind everyone of their roles and everyone will go back to their jobs well at least some of us who have jobs. What is that supposed to mean? No one here has forgotten the rules we established. Each one of us consented when the rules were formed because we believed they were the best for the empire. Perhaps we should be reminding you of the rules we set up, Naruto. Naruto shook his head. If you people have not forgotten the rules, what is all this politicking? Not long ago, there was the word that this council wanted Yoshino to be emperor and now my decisions are being questioned. I have to say, it wounds me that you people would turn on me so quickly. Don't take too much on things you hear from the street. But if Yoshino was the emperor, we would not complain. You are more suited to lead us through war and once war is over, you can fold to the sidelines and allow Yoshino to rule. We don't trust your urges. You might lead us into another war just for your amusement. These people were never in agreement with the thought of going to war again. No, they wanted nothing to do with it. Even no, they had no say in it because they did not want to be involved. They never held contempt for what happened in the past. They just had fear. They were afraid of coming out of the shadows because they might suffer again. He had taken advantage of the fear to get what he wanted. Yoshino had been a big help because they seemed to have the same thoughts. That says a lot about your confidence in me Naruto ended up saying. Well, it was Yoshino's efforts that brought things to this level. Had it not been for him, we wouldn't be in this position. Naruto looked amused. Yuzushiogakure is the land of the Uzumaki. This is our home. And because I respect this place, I made Yoshino its leader and you were all pleased with it. I don't even interfere with how Yoshino runs this village. You even made him the unofficial head of the clan but not Ashiko, the Wave, Sound, Amage Kure and others who have been financially supporting us, they are all me. I brought them to the table. You did not. Yoshino did not. The empire is mine. And you will not tell me how I run it. You can do all you like with Yuzu, but the bigger picture is mine and you don't have a say in any of it. I will rule until I die. My child will succeed me. That is the law I have placed and it shall not be changed. You are free to work around the rules we created, like meddling with my marriage affairs, because ultimately, clan protection and the survival of this village is your duty, nothing more. Remember this. If this attitude of yours, continues, I will have you all placed in orphanages in the island. Anoki could smell the scent of treachery in the air, perhaps not directly from the muscle head parading as the rakage, but from his people. A.I. was not the kind of person who plotted to backstab people. He was a muscle head who liked to show off strength. Anoki saw it as a disadvantage. The man was not able to use tricks that would save him time and valuable men. He was still going to work with this man. It wasn't because he really wanted to work with A.I. it was just the situation that forced him to working things like this. He could defeat Yuzushiogakure on his own, but he could not afford to go to war alone. A.I. would have his men march over to Iwagakure. The past actions have not been forgotten. A.I. still thought he was the one who tried to eliminate him. Even to this day, Anoki still denied it. He had been many things. Ordered some nuisance to be removed from the picture, but he had not done something as stupid as to order someone to eliminate the rakage. If he wanted A.I. to be dead, he would have done it himself. Well, there wasn't even a reason for him to wish for the rakage to be eliminated in the first place. 
Iwa's traditional enemy has always been Kanoha. The leaf didn't even get along with Kyumo. He had brought around 30 shinobi with him, compared to the rakage 17. This was still a neutral place and there was no one else close by. A tent was set up for the two leaders to talk and once everything was set, they sat facing each other, the rakage glaring at Anoki. No matter how you look at me, I am still not going to admit having attempted to eliminate you. If I was going to try to eliminate someone, it would have been someone in Kanoha, the sand named Suchikage said in a calm tone. I'm no longer concerned about. It might be that you have been telling the truth when you said you didn't plan anything. But it still doesn't change that it was your shinobi and you refused to take responsibility for them, the rakage said sternly. Anoki shrugged. Taking responsibility would be admitting that I did it and I am not going to do that, he said. But this isn't why we came here. AI was silent for a couple of moments before speaking. Yuzushio has taken one of my jinchuriki and sent someone to inform me that it is war. The same was done to me but they had taken my granddaughter. She was brought back, but useless as a shinobi. She can't do anything at this point. It doesn't change that they had taken her and want war with us. I suggest we put on hold our little problems and focus on Yuzushio. We cannot afford to underestimate them. In the past, it took three great nations to work together and apparently that was still not enough, Anoki said. You are not going to attack me while my forces are moving towards, Yuzushio, are you? AI demanded. I really can't trust you with anything. Neither can I, but we have to agree that Yuzushio is the bigger threat now. We even have a greater opportunity to do everything now since they have no allies in any of the great villages. Kanoha won't be forced into doing anything but we could force the hidden mist, Anoki said. Regardless, we are still going to attack them and this time, we will ensure that we destroy them. Destroy them? The rakage shook his head. My village is still interested in having an Uzumaki. I will be taking some of them to Kumogakure. Anoki shook his head. This has always been the case with Kumogakure. Their struggles with Kanoha have been because they always want to take power by force. The Hyuga incident was even birthed because of this attitude. If you are taking some, then we will also do it. But since I can't trust you, our forces will have to invade Yuzushio together. You can't move in before we are in position to do so. I'm not against that you might decide against invading and march to our village while we are busy with Yuzushio, the rakage expressed with suspicion. Anoki sighed one ones. How many are we each contributing? We can't move all our forces. Our villages will still need to be defended. Ten thousand each, the rakage said. Twenty thousand should be enough to crush them and intimidate anyone who will try to get involved. We are not precisely positive that Kanoha will just sit back. They might think after Yuzushio, we will be coming after them. You can't forget that they have been preparing for war for the past years. Anoki frowned thinking about this. He always liked the hidden leaf that was focused on peace rather than wars. No doubt the village had recovered and its shinobi were strong once more. The village has always had a record producing the finest shinobi. No doubt it will be a threat in the near future, he said. Perhaps when another Kage comes in, but Tsunade is a student of the Sandame Hokage, she won't be doing anything reckless to start war. The leaf of the old would have already marched out with its forces ready to take us both, the rakage said. Naruto landed in a loud boom as he crashed into the ground. Large amounts of dust picked up around him for a couple of moments while the shinobi around took their attack positions. When the dust cleared, Naruto started walking towards the shinobi in a relaxed manner, unbothered by the fact that they had their weapons drawn up and ready to attack him. In his eyes, their threat was minimal. He could not sense any chakra that made him pause to think twice. Thinking of this, he halted for a moment and narrowed his eyes behind him, there was the Iwagakure group behind him. The front was covered by Kumogakure Shinobi. I didn't think you'd be arrogant enough to appear here, Anoki said as he appeared, floating above the ground, with AI just behind him. They had just stepped out of the small tent they'd been having their discussion. Naruto only shifted his eyes to look at Anoki. He did not address at that such a kitsch statement. I forget that you can fly, he said. I have to say, I am rather envious of this ability. 
I can manipulate the air currents around me to propel myself into the air and float for a little while longer but it is not flying. If we were not enemies, I would have you teach me this ability of yours. Anoki was annoyed that Naruto had chosen to ignore him and speak about his ninjutsu instead. I see you are truly the same brat who came to IWA and still didn't blink when I threatened to destroy Yuzushiogakure. Why are you even bothering to talk to him, Suchikich? AI demanded. We should just capture him now. And we will be done with this war. Who will take me if you capture me? Naruto asked, just out of curiosity. Both of them did want him dead and would want to eliminate him themselves. They were probably going to fight for him. That is a valid question but we won't be drawn to have this argument, Anoki said in a firm tone. I wasn't trying to have you argue. In fact, I am happier if you can work together. Even now, I would be happy if you could team up and attack me. The Rakage doesn't want to talk. But I think such people talk easily when they are in battle, Naruto explained lightly. I am happy to indulge you. Besides, I do want to hear your thoughts. You think you can take on two Kages by yourself? The Yandame Rakage said with a snort. Hm, I don't know what I can do. I think I can but I am here to test it out. I don't know my limits because I haven't had anyone to challenge me. Naruto said calmly. Ridiculous, Anoki said going through hand seals. Dotan, Gorimu no Jutsu. Anoki spat out mud from his mouth. The mud hit the ground before starting to take shape. Naruto was not able to watch it all as the rakage was upon him in the blink of an eye. The man's right foot slid through the ground in a quick motion, heading towards Naruto's feet. The blonde reacted by jumping up slightly to avoid the leg sweep. As if he had been expecting this movement, AI threw a right punch towards the blonde's gut. Naruto's reaction was just as quick he caught the punch with both his hands. AI's pushed chakra into his feet to strengthen his muscles before using Naruto's momentum against him. He pulled, twisting around, using Naruto's hold on him to drag the blonde along his movements. He hurled the blonde towards Anoki's golem. Hmm. Naruto's eyes didn't even open widely as he saw what he was heading towards. The golem was slowly balancing its feet, its right punch positioned alongside its right side, ready to smack him. His eyes shifted quickly to AI and then to Anoki before holding out his right hand. He created a fist before swinging it towards that of the golem. The two fists collided in midair and a second later, the golem's arm shattered. The rest of its body followed suit. Naruto had no time to recover and position himself as the rakage flashed beneath him and tried to kick him up into the sky but Naruto had already measured up the man and Anoki before he decided to act against the golem. Before AI's kick could connect with him, Naruto flashed away, and appeared a couple of feet behind the rakage, standing gracefully. I didn't think you'd work well together. This is very interesting he said. Shall we talk about our war? Your obsession with power rakage and Anoki, your stubbornness and refusal to listen to other people. What about the war? It is your war not our war. Don't pretend that you didn't want this, Anoki said while flying towards Naruto. Dotan, Kengan no Jutsu. He encased his right fist with a rock. It was a huge fist that he slammed towards Naruto's face when he got closer. Naruto folded both his hands across his face to block the punch. He gritted his teeth as the punch collided with his defense. It was no good and sent him sliding backwards in speed. AI took advantage of his and flashed behind him, right hand held out cutting through the air in lightning speed. He seemingly cut through Naruto, but the blonde turned into smoke but blood still gushed out. An IWA shinobi fell down, the right side of his gut bust open. AI didn't even blink, he just turned his attention towards Naruto, who was standing between the IWA shinobi. I will not pretend this isn't my war. But you two deserve every bit of what is coming to you. I don't dislike the rakage as much as I dislike you, Anoki. But still, you two are going to war with me and we will fight this. Are you not curious about my reasons? You idiot. That was cowardly. The shinobi closest to him shouted while trying to punch him. He had used a replacement jutsu. He was always thinking steps further in the battle. You did need to know what would happen if you reacted in a certain manner. 
Naruto leaned back slightly to avoid the punch. It just went past him in the blink of an eye. Before the shinobi could even do anything else, Naruto gripped his face with his left hand. You cannot afford to react with such anger in battle, otherwise, you move recklessly. The others created their distance while you decided to jump in and this is what happens. Naruto heard a buzz of lightning. The rakage was in front of him, surrounded by his lightning cloak. The man was above ground, he looked to have just jumped towards him as his body was positioned slightly horizontally with his right foot aimed to slam into his gut. The moment it seemed like AI was about to touch him, Naruto burst into gusts of wind. The rakage crashed into the ground in a loud boom. Naruto appeared some distance away but he was forced to stretch out both his hands to defend himself as walls burst out from the ground and started to press against him. Both rock-solid walls collided with his hands and started to press. Naruto frowned when the pressure became too much. His hands burst through the walls before they slammed into him in a brutal explosion that shattered the rocks. When the debris cleared, Naruto was still standing there, but looking messy with dust all over him. He was given no time to dust himself as the rakage flashed in front of him. The man's feet crashed into the ground as he used all the force he could before driving a right punch towards Naruto's chest. The blonde's movements were fast enough to surprise AI, he folded both his hands just across his chest just in time for AI's fist to slam into them. The brutal punch sent him rocketing backwards. Naruto flipped twice to regain his balance but when he touched down the ground, he was still being pushed back by the momentum of AI's punch. He hits rather hard, he said to himself as he felt discomfort on thin arms. AI rushed towards Naruto once more. He went airborne for a moment before crashing down towards Naruto, his right leg outstretched, aimed at slamming the back of his foot on the blonde's forehead. Naruto once more held out his hands on defense. There was a loud crash when the attack connected. The ground burst, with Naruto's feet getting buried into the ground. The moment this happened, two hands made from rock burst out of the very ground and grabbed both his legs. No good, Naruto said sensing movements from the rakage. He didn't want to dish out free hits. He was no masochist. A violent gust of wind with cutting ability blasted off around Naruto, cutting through the rock hands and forcing AI to depart from him. The rakage landed just below the tsuchikage and looked at himself, that was dangerous. Had it not been for his lightning cloak, he would have received some massive cuts. I guess it is my time to be on the offensive. Perhaps I will motivate you to be a little serious, Naruto said before taking single step forward. Gusts of wind started to pick up around him before turning into a full blown out tornado that surrounded him. The tornado became so massive that it rose high into the air and started pulling things towards it. Anoki instincts kicked in and he flashed his eyes to his left side, floating above the air was Uzumaki Naruto and another just above him. The one above him had a raisingan on the palm of the right hand. I figured the rakage was most likely to dodge this given his speed, the blonde said before slamming his jutsu into Anoki's back. The sand aimed Suchikage hardened his skin to avoid damage from the raisingan. When it slammed into his body, it did no damage as the Naruto on the side grabbed him by his right foot and then twisted around. He slammed him into the ground like a bullet, along with the weight of his body, Anoki crashed with a loud boom, creating a crater on the ground. One Naruto flew towards the Tsuchikage in speed with a Raisingan at hand. But as he got near, AI appeared from behind and slammed a forceful punch on the blonde's back. He turned into a cloud of smoke. The real Naruto flashed behind the rakage with a wind-enhanced punch aimed at the back of the rakage but it never connected as the man disappeared in a blur. More speed, Naruto thought before blurring away as well. The moment he landed on the ground, he was surrounded by both Kyomo and IWA Shinobi. Naruto's eyes just moved around for a moment before he spoke. I am quite effective when I attack. I have learned a bit of your abilities. But still I did not have the desired conversation I wanted. Well, no matter. The next time we meet, it shall be in battle, he said before taking a couple of steps away from the trembling shinobi. He then disappeared. The shinobi fell down on their knees, breathing heavily as they did. Well, that was dull, Darui said as he walked into the scene. How can you not be nerved after being subjected to that sinister chakra? C questioned, hand on his stomach. 
That was dangerous. He thought such sinister chakra belonged to murderous beasts but the emperor was very much capable of exuding one. It was beyond human. I didn't say I wasn't, Derui said. Quite honestly, that was unnerving. If he had to face a person with such murderous intent, he'd have not gone through the hassle of a fight. He would have just given up. AI ignored the talk of his subordinates and turned towards Anoki who was dusting himself. I may have underestimated him. It was apparent that his was just playing around. He said sternly. Playing around? He did not even bother calling this a battlefield and was not even the least serious, Anoki said in a bitter tone. Dangerous foe that we have both clearly underestimated. But this is more reason we must fight this war, AI said in a hardened tone. I will prepare my shinobi for battle. We have a war, Tsuchikich. Indeed, Anoki said. I have already sent out some shinobi to sound a warning to Amage Kure. I have heard that it has some connections with Yuzushio. If we can remove them without having to fight, it clears the path for my shinobi. We will go through the sea and land, AI said. But I expect to hear from you soon. Move out as soon as you can so we can discuss progress. We will should meet at the land of hot waters within a week. You don't need to tell me that. Naruto was walking slowly with both his hands, folded across his chest, Naori walking beside him. The distance was safe enough that those two forces would not think of giving chase. Besides he was certain that he had removed his scent from the battlefield and no one would be able to follow his movements. Were you satisfied? Naori asked the emperor. No even a little, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. But it does look like the battle will be interesting. I am most looking forward to face the Reikage. The only complaint I can have about him is that he doesn't have the ninjutsu arsenal. He depends too much on his incredible speed and strength to fight. Anoki has interesting ninjutsu. He didn't use his most powerful weapons, but he is slow. Old age, perhaps. It seems like you were most interested in analyzing their fighting styles with experience than encouraging them to move quickly, Naori suggested. You think so? It appears so, Naori said with a nod of his head. But that is not a bad thing at all. I think you are most likely going to engage them in a different fighting style when you face them in war though. Naruto shook his head. I am going to go all out. I did not learn all my ninjutsu to keep them hidden. I learned ninjutsu to use it. But when facing someone like the Reikage, it becomes a bit useless because of his speed. Regardless, it will make things interesting. Kanoha. Kakashi had informed him that overuse of the Mangekyo Sharingan would turn him blind but Sasuke had not listened. And now he regretted that choice. He knew what he needed to do to cure his eyes. But Itachi's eyes were nowhere. Someone had taken his brother's body before he could recover from their battle. It had been something that bothered him and now he knew why it had happened. He was starting to think that perhaps Naruto had something to do with it. Itachi had warned him to be cautious of the blonde. It could no longer be kept a secret. He has been fighting secret battles for Kanoha over the past couple of years and it was now taking its toll with his eyes starting to show him blurriness. If he continued in the same fashion he was, he was going to be completely blind. When he entered into the office, he found the Godame Hokage sitting with Jiraiya. It didn't matter that the San Nin was around. I need to take some time off, he suddenly just said. Tsunade would have been annoyed with Sasuke's attitude if she wasn't already used to it. The more he spent time doing the dirty work and in the darkness, the more silent he became. He was like a ghost in this village. One rarely saw him. The Godame Hokage leaned back to her chair and stared at the Uchiha. Why? Last time I asked you to rest, you said you didn't need it. I need it now, Sasuke said quietly. You are not answering my question and I won't release you unless you work with me, Tsunade said in a stern tone. It wasn't like he was going to keep it hidden from the Hokage. There was a possibility that she could help him, temporarily as it may be. The permanent solution was getting Itachi's eyes. My eyesight is deteriorating. I have been overusing the Sharingan over the past and it has put massive strain on my eyes. Tsunade fell silent. Not a good time to be getting blind, she said. Jiraiya nodded to this. Any time now, 
war could be happening. You are needed to be on your toes in case you are needed. I will be there when I am needed, but I need to take it easy. Tsunade was silent for a couple of moments. She had heard about this problem before. But she had never had the chance to study it herself to see if she can come up with a solution. This represented a chance for her. If it was a sickness, it could be cured. But it was something that turns the eyes old or genetic, she wondered if she could help it. Old age could not be cured. Instant healing was good, but it reduced the life of a person gradually. How long? A couple of months now, Sasuke admitted. And you didn't think it was important to tell me this? I didn't think there was something you could do about it. There has never been any record of anyone being healed from the blindness. The only way to correct it is taking the eyes of someone with close blood relation. In my case, I could take Itachi's eyes or those of my parents. It was not just curing the blindness but he would also awaken the eternal Mangekyo Sharingan. With it, there would be no pain with Susano or Amaterasu. Tsunade frowned. But we still haven't been able to recover Itachi's body, she said. I will give you your time off. Rest for a week, and then come back to me. I will study this problem and see if I can come up with a solution. We cannot afford to have you going blind in this time. It would be frustrating to be staying at home with blind eyes while Naruto was running rampant in the shinobi world. Sasuke could not have that. He would go even if he was blind. It was better to die there than just sitting at home, unable to see anything. I will come, the Uchiha said before walking away silently. Once he was gone, Tsunade sighed. Just when you think everything is going well, this happens, she said with a shake of her head. Do you think Naruto knows? Jiraiya looked thoughtful for a moment before responding. I don't know Haim. I don't know. I don't know anything with Naruto, anymore. I sat with him for then an hour talking about our days together and he didn't even let slip a damn thing or even give me a hint. I still can't tell what he is thinking. But if it isn't Naruto, then who took Itachi's body? The Akatsuki? Jiraiya suggested. He was a member of the organization and they probably took him because they didn't want him to be turned anywhere because of what he had in his mind. Or maybe it was Naruto who did it. But if we are saying that it was Naruto, we have to come to the agreement that Naruto was watching the battle or at least had someone observe things for him. Tsunade adopted a thoughtful look for a moment, well, given everything, it would not be far-fetched, she admitted. But why would Naruto even go that far? I know he was never good with Sasuke, but he isn't a petty person. You're forgetting the best trait about him, Jiraiya reminded the Godame Hokage. Naruto is a calculating person. If it was him, then we can speculate that he was waiting for this moment. The Godame frowned. I hope that is not the case, she said in thought. I read a message from the Mizukage. She wants to meet to discuss Yuzushio. She has had connections with the Emperor and I know he was recently there. She probably knows what they are after. You should meet her, maybe you can get something out of her, Jiraiya said. Naruto isn't going to say anything to us. But the reason he has bothered with Kiri is because they are a major trading partner for Yuzu and Nadashiko. He also would not want to have them as enemies. I will try to arrange something, but I don't want to move things now. I can send Shikamura there. I can't leave Kanoha now with what is happening out there. Iwagakure and Kumo are mobilizing. We don't know what they'll do when they learn of our movements. The war room, it was indeed time for war. The battle lines were already drawn, and now they had to position themselves to defend and attack their enemies. Nagato looked around the dimly lit room. He was in his holographic image, alongside Conan. Yoshino, Naoki and Naruto were also in the room. He had been impatiently waiting for the day to come. It was finally here. They could finally realize their dreams, but they needed to navigate through the chaos first. What is happening? Nagato asked. Iwagakure and Kumo are mobilizing. We calculate that the first wave of attack will probably be at Amagekure. They will probably be trying to test you when they do so or just clearing the path for their main force. Naruto said. It is likely that IWA will do this. They are far closer. Kumo will most likely move in the sea and land. 
then we are free to crush them. Without mercy, Naruto said with a nod. I will come to join you afterwards. For now, we remind ourselves of this dream and our responsibilities to make it happen. How are you planning to handle Konoha once this is all over? Conan asked. They are not going to agree to anything that happens to both Kumogakure and IWA. If they don't agree, we will have problems in trying to maintain the balance and peace. It would be a disaster if we end up needing another war to manage things. The other three cannot be allowed to turn on us, Nagato said firmly. Naruto had not thought of the possibility that such a thing could happen. Would Gara and the Mizukage actually sit together and decide to go against the tyranny of the Emperor? An insane part of him thought the very was ridiculous. But he could not deny that Nagato and Conan do raise rational questions. Konoha will resist, but I doubt the Mizukage or Gara will enter into an agreement that sees them waging war on us. Yoshino responded while Naruto was still thinking. Their personalities would not allow them. That aside, as long as we are reasonable in what we do, there should not be any threat of war. This means that we must be diplomatic in our means and must strive to engage the others in our actions. Kyumo and IWA must be given that independence to give them a sense of freedom. If we are too strict and reject them a chance to breathe, they will stab us the moment we show weakness. This is why we will do things in a manner that they can understand a manner that leaves the villagers and shinobi without reasons to worry. Suspicions will always be there, but we must not give them ammo to attack us. The challenge will be to ensure that there is no civil arrest. Of course, the same measure you took in aim must be taken, Naruto explained after had gathered his thoughts. Would it not raise questions and rebellious attitudes amongst the villages if it becomes clear that we are purging those who disagree with us? Conan asked. I'm sure His Majesty will use a more subtle method that does not make things very clear. People can be eliminated without bloodshed. Politics will be given power for such situations. Aside from that, we are done with preparations in the island. Once things are set, we will allow the Kages to be the judges and we carry out those judgments. We just have to ensure that we give the Kages the authority but yet remain politically powerful enough to make them listen to us. Yoshino explained. If things are done this way, we rule discreetly. It can perhaps be a secret that only the Kages know but we will of course employ an agency, with the specific purpose of guarding secrets and dealing with anyone who tries to release them, Naori said. If things go according to plan, we create a manageable world. Zetsu's threat. It does not diminish. He has warned me that Madara will return to this world. We will be cautious of this. If we had moved quickly, we would have taken his body but Zetsu moved faster. Regardless, if we be on guard, we can manage things. Naruto said. For now, it is war. We will be on the lookout for Iwa's movements. If we see them, they will be destroyed. Nagato said before disappearing. Naruto was silent for a couple of moments before standing up. The other people with him followed him out of the war room. It was silence until he stepped out of the leader's tower. He looked up for a moment before starting to take the direction of his compound. Suna should not be a problem. But the daimyo might be problems. All of them must be silenced. Their political power will offer a wall that we don't need. We are working on that, Naori said. The only issue that remains is that of the water country. We have yet to hear anything from Haku regarding his mission. Summon him, Naruto ordered. Go now. Hi, Naori was gone within a second of the word leaving his lips. Should we be concerned? Naruto shook his head. Haku is trying to work out diplomatic means. He probably went to Kiri and had a pleasant chat with the Mizukich. I don't disagree with that. I am also interested in seeing how his method works. However, there is a time limit we must work within. Yoshino could understand this. He knew that Naruto understood Haku's position quite well but he still needed to be ruthless in his decisions. Perhaps Naruto brought him in because there was no one like the ice user. They were all willing to do anything but Haku could consider his emotions. Perhaps it was the destruction that ruined the nation. Well, the shinobi anyway, civilians lived the normal life. Will my position change? Naruto shook his head. 
when have I flipped flopped on you, Yoshino? I don't usually say this, but all this would not have been possible without your efforts. I will honor my promises to you. His eyes narrowed towards the man. If I turn on you, you can always organize a revolt. Yoshino smiled. You'd eliminate us all, he said. You know that is not true. I love the Uzumaki. My younger days were filled with an obsession for this clan. I swore to restore the glory of this clan and make it even greater destroying it is not in blood. Naruto stated calmly. Let not one hear I just said that or else I will have serious problems in the near future. I can imagine that, Yoshino said with a laugh. I will manage the elders. You don't have to concern yourselves with them. It is indeed true that you are not a full-blooded Uzumaki, but it does not make you any less of an Uzumaki. They know that, but I think they are more or less concerned about your recklessness. Regardless, when I met you, I did have plans to have this village restored. I lacked the will to do anything. Because of you, I developed that will and this village was born. As long as it is my duty to protect it, and lead it, there will be nothing more I want, not your throne. Once more, Naruto's sharp eyes turned towards the man beside him. He closed them for a long minute before glancing at the way ahead. I have never doubted your commitment, Yoshino. He said. Our task will be large in reshaping this shinobi world once we take over. We must author a system that will last. I expect you to continue to play your role. Of course, I will not bother you as much as I did before I assumed my responsibility. It will be a challenge worth tackling, Yoshino said. I have met someone. I would like for you to meet her not as the emperor but as my cousin. We are family, and I don't have anyone else, it would mean much if we could do this with her majesty. Naruto looked thoughtful for a moment. Tell me the date and I will call Karen to come back. I will have to get the best drink first. But I will let you know, Yoshino said before bowing slightly and then he was gone. Family, huh? Just thinking of this, Naruto decided to turn towards the memorial wall. Within the ruins left untouched, there was a large wall with the names of the Uzumakis lost in the invasion. The name of Kushina Uzumaki was not there, but his grandparents were there. Naruto would have a family of his own, but he had never belonged anywhere. Had this not happened, he would have belonged somewhere. Maybe his relatives would have come to Kanoha to fetch him. No, the Sandame would have sent him to them in knowing that things would be difficult in Kanoha. But the invasion destroyed everything. By the time he was born, he had nothing. It was cruel that even his father had no living relatives. But he belonged here. He belonged with the Uzumaki. This was his beloved home. Kanoha could be destroyed by the Kyubi once more, and he wouldn't blink. But for this village, he would bite into his life force to protect it. This was his obsession, his greatest love. What? He asked and Naoki materialized on his right side and whispered. Iwagakure is moving towards the rain. It is a force of about a 1,000 shinobi. They are not the main army. I think these ones are just to clear the way for the main force to pass through the rain without any troubles. A 100. That is more by an excessive amount than I had thought, Naruto thought. How long till they reach the rain? With their pace, tomorrow morning. Is Nagato already aware? Yes, Naori said. Both he and Conan have already prepared. They will not allow them to get closer to Amage Cure. It is their desire that they not suffer any losses in this war. They want their village to remain in peace even in this war. Naruto tilted his head to the side. Nagato is going to go all out to face the dangers then, he said. His shinobi will only move in when there is danger. It is rather careful measures from him. Well, no matter, as long as he holds on, I won't complain. On our side. Kyumo is likely to move round 2000 through the sea and the rest through the land. But they are not moving quickly. I assume they are still waiting for Iwagakure. Naruto said before falling silent. Can we watch the paths of pain cause havoc and still come back here without anyone reaching both the wave and Yuzu? Yes, Naori said. Then we will depart for the rain. I want to watch the paths in action. I'm sure Nagato isn't going to go the battlefield despite regaining most of his mobility. 
All thanks to the power of the Kyubi in Karen, Naori said. Should I inform Yoshino? Yes Naruto said with a nod. He will make all necessary arrangements with his men. The following day. Rain country. Kitsuchi looked ahead with mixed feelings. He had enough men to cause Amigekyur to reconsider things. The village has never been considered that powerful. But there was a word that the leader of the Akatsuki resided in the village. Regardless, he still had to clear the path for the main force. They could not move through this country if it was not subjugated. Anoki didn't want a situation of the last where shinobi were lost because Hanzo would attack them. His movements came to a halt when he sensed something. Halt. He shouted as he looked up into the sky. There was a large bird coming towards them with speed. He held his hands together, ready for anything. He was not expecting to encounter anything before seeing Amage Cure. Something jumped from the bird and crashed into the ground just in front of him and his men in a resounding boom that caused large amounts of debris and dust to pick up. It took a couple of moments for the dust to clear, and when it did, the Deva path was on one knee, inside a crater. Conan slowly descended with her wings flapped. She hovered above the ground and stared at the army from the stone. It was just the two of them for this battle. Nagato had decided so. He didn't want to reveal any of his abilities when it was unnecessary. There was still a long way to go and many more battles to fight. There are a number of them, she said. The Sandame Rakage is said to have stopped about 10000 Shinobi, do you think we cannot stop 100? The Deva Path asked while still on one knee. Conan shook her head. She was quite aware of just how destructive Nagato's power was. She turned her focus towards the enemy. Shinobi from Iwagakure, what is your purpose? She already knew that. Maybe it was pointless even asking but she felt she had to go through this first. We are here to request a way for Iwagakure to safely pass through this country and secure a line of supplies, Kitsuchi said to the two. If a battle could be avoided, he would take that option. Denied, Nagato said through the Deva path. I suppose if we asked you to leave now, you would not do it. Kitsuchi shook his head. The others are already planning to march. We cannot go back without a good response, he said in a firm tone. Anoki had trusted him to do this. If he had to go through these two to get things done, then he would do so. Still, these two did make him cautious. It was just the two of them, and did they think they alone were enough for them? Conan, talking is pointless, the Deva path stood up. Let us finish this quickly, he said. Conan nodded and then started to dissolve into paper sheets. The path jumped into the air before blasting towards the enemy forces in great speed. He crashed landed at the heart of them both hands stretched out. Shinra Tensei. Boom. Kitsuchi could only watch, wide-eyed as an explosion from within went off, blasting his men into the air along with chunks of earth. He could see many of them being blasted into the air, screaming and shouting. The debris forced him to jump back and close his eyes slightly. When everything cleared, he saw that where hundreds of his men once stood only one person stood in a large crater. He gritted his teeth so many men gone in just one attack. What was that attack even? Who were these people even? He didn't know anything about them. But they were obviously powerful and what was with that Dejitsu? It was unlike anything he had ever seen before. He twisted his head to the side when he heard the sound of a shrill from a bird. The large bird that had carried their two opponents was speeding just above the ground in massive speed, heading straight towards him. Dotan, Chidakaku. He raised the ground below him, causing a large rock pillar to sprout out and stretch along with him. The berth just crashed into the rock, and blasted through it. His men scrambled to get out of its path as it sped towards the orange-haired Neem. Pain jumped onto the back of the bird before it took to the air. It dropped something, and then they all realized it had dropped those flashing things as it moved past them. A couple of explosions once more rocked through the battleground, some of his men getting caught while some used Dotan to create rock formations around themselves. The explosions had some flames about them and took about a minute to clear. When they did, it was devastation to his men. He held out his right hand seeing a butterfly fly slowly past him. 
It did not land on his hand, but seemingly stretched its wings and a dreadful feeling swept through his spine. When he looked around, he could see thousands of those butterflies flying around his remaining men. X explosive tags, he wanted to warn his men, but a chain reaction just started to occur before he could finish. The butterflies started to explode one by one. The entire explosion of thousands of explosive tags caused even the ground to shake as the IWA men were covered by a large column of flames. You think that was enough? Conan asked. There are bound to be a handful that hid themselves beneath the ground, the Deva Path said calmly. They won't be worth even finishing. We could even let them go. Could, Conan thought. But they were not going to do that. Nagato did not have mercy. The walls around Kitsuchi crumbled down. His upper body had some burns, his breathing slightly labored. He looked around, he could see hundreds of bodies lying around, being burnt by flames. What were these kinds of tactics? This was not war. This was not a battle. This was just a massacre. These people were just intent on killing them all without wasting their efforts fighting them. He needed to survive this and send a message to Iwavikur about these abilities. He held his breath and dissolved into dust. I was expecting to see the paths dance around this place, Naruto suddenly said as he appeared behind both Nagato and Conan. Neither looked at him as the Deva path responded, it was the most efficient way to deal with them. I don't disagree with that, Naruto said. I was just looking for a battle. But admittedly, the fireworks were quite lovely to see. Your unique ability continues to impress me, Conan, he said with a smile. Conan did not respond to Naruto. There are still survivors, Nagato. Naruto sighed. She continues to be cold towards me, he said in a sad tone. They need not die. I wish to test the facilities I have made in the island. They will become fine specimen to see if the bars can hold and the seals are as efficient as I was told. We shall call them, war criminals. He said. Then our job is done here, the Deva path said. IWA will likely bring more shinobi or choose another path. We might even have Kumo shinobi coming here. We must prepare the grounds around Amigekure. The path said, walking past Naruto. The blonde remained in one place but only his eyes moved as he watched the path leave we will contact you in case that happens, he said calmly. Later. Yuzushio. Haku cautiously walked into Naruto's office within the compound. The blonde was standing by the back exit, with a small bird on his right shoulder. He was just standing there motionlessly but Haku could feel his presence. He stopped for a moment at the desk and saw that the work was already done. Well, he didn't like ignoring his work. He stopped beside the blonde before asking. I was not expecting you to sum. He was not able to finish as he was suddenly grabbed by the throat with an iron grip and then picked up into the air. His eyes widened in shock, seeing that it was Naruto who was doing this to him. He couldn't get the words out of his mouth but the cold look in Naruto's eyes made his heart beat quickly. Haku grabbed Naruto's hand and started to freeze them, causing the blonde to drop him. Haku fell on his knees and coughed a couple of times while holding his throat. He paused, he hadn't sensed a killing intent. When he looked up towards Naruto, the blonde wasn't smiling but he wasn't looking at him coldly either it was just his indifferent mask. You just tried to freeze the blood within my veins, he said. You were strangling me, Haku said as he got up. I say you deserved it. I should have just frozen your entire hand. That would have been unpleasant, Naruto said. You are very comfortable around me that you would let your guard down completely. Your shock was earnest. Was this a test? You trust me this much, and I have trusted you by giving you much responsibility. You are very kind and I like that about you. You offer something that I cannot offer. You will be the voice that offers reason. Once this war is over, if you ever feel that I am going overboard, don't hesitate to use your abilities to stop me. I sometimes take things too far. Today becomes the last day you ever see me do something like that to you, Naruto explained with some emotion. But that isn't the reason, I called you here. I want progress on your job and I won't accept lack of it. I have already spoken to the wind daimyo but I need some more time. I have already shared my discussion with him to the Mizukich. 
I am going to talk to him again soon, and we will try to finalize things. If he listens to the advice of his people, and facts, we will have an agreement with him. Chapter 20 Anoki did not want like this disappointing outcome. Not when he had already made preparations and had been certain that things would work in order. Yet, all that planning just failed. He had to throw everything out in the window because Kitsuchi had returned defeated. He was honestly incensed about this. If the bigger picture wasn't Yuzushio, he would be making plans to destroy AIM. He could not afford to take this route. Not when it was this dangerous. He would have to think this through and come up with a new strategy. Perhaps he could also involve Kumogakure on this. Amigekure cannot be a priority now, Anoki said. He had already listened to Kitsuchi. And he had come to a decision. But they are dangerous, Kuratsuchi said. She had a sour look on her face and her tongue clicked as if she had eaten something bitter. There was no winning with the seal sealing her chakra. She could not use chakra. She was useless in this time of need and that angered her. She could only hate that idiot Naruto. It was his doing. Had he never appeared in her life that day in Tanzaki, she would have never even attempted to meet him in person. This thing of being captured would not have happened. It didn't matter that she was now free. She couldn't do anything and that was perhaps the purpose of releasing her. This was an even cruel fate than being left in a cold cell with a woman who hardly spoke a damn word. One thousand dead is a lot, Anoki said. Yes they are dangerous but we are not after them. We can't risk another confrontation now before we meet Yuzushio. We need to deal with Yuzushio first before moving to them. We will lose more men if he go after them, Kitsuchi could agree with this. But I think I saw the Emperor. I am not too if it was him but I think I saw him when I was trying to escape. Anoki's frown deepened. There has always been a rumor that AIM is connected with Yuzushio. Regardless, we now know that they are the Akatsuki and are very dangerous. We will make a plan for them. But if they are connected to Yuzushio, they might make a move against us, Kuratsuchi said. Possible but it is better they come to us than we going them. Anoki said in a hardened tone. Should we try to search for Deidara? He is a member of the Akatsuki, maybe he can tell us something useful. We will probably meet them in battle, so there is no need to look for him, Anoki said with a slight shake of his head. We also can't afford to multitask like that. The ones who destroyed us are powerful and I just saw Naruto firsthand. He stood before me and the rakage as if we were his peers. He didn't even seem bothered by AI's speed. He is going to be another dangerous opponent and he's still a Jinchuriki. Is Han going with us? Anoki nodded his head. It would be a mistake to take both Jinchurikis to the war. We will take one and leave one behind. But they will only move when it is safe. I have already made two mistakes because I didn't know. The next one will be massively costly. I want to avoid that. In this situation, what was Kuratsuchi supposed to do? Maybe that idiot was laughing thinking about her inner turmoil. She shook her head. Naruto was a cold and indifferent person. He wasn't even thinking about her. But he would pay for this. He would pay for this humiliation. What about my situation? I will be stuck with just Taijutsu and Kenjutsu with how things are. I have already sent a message to Kumo requesting their help. I also sent one to Kanoha. I doubt they will help but we don't have any choice. Anoki said. What was he thinking anyway? The Uzumaki were most comfortable playing with Fuinjutsu. Just even looking at the seal you could see it was the work of masters. There was probably no one else who was not Uzumaki who could remove the seal. It was ridiculous though. It was just a simple chakra suppression seal, and yet none of the seal masters in this village could break it apart. They were willing to admit the seal itself was simple, but the locks that kept chakra from leaving was a complex web of formula they simply could not understand. It was like the handwriting of a child. Unless she said the words, you were not going to figure out what she wrote. I don't doubt your taijutsu skills, but you can't be in the front lines. You'll only be a burden if you get involved. During the fight, we will capture one Uzumaki and have him release the seal, Anoki said in a hardened tone. Kuratsuchi did not kike those words but she could not deny them. 
the truth was often unpleasant to hear. You should get treated before we move. She said to her father before turning back to face her grandfather. Which route are we going to use? We will move in four groups and move through the land of canyons and mushrooms. We will avoid stepping into the land of fire along the way. We will camp in the land of hot water and group with Kumo forces before deciding how we move into the wave then we will be forced to enter the land of fire. Kanoha will not take kindly to a war happening in their own backyard. Although they may not enter to help Yuzushio, they may do so because we are matching in their country. Anoki nodded. In the last war, Sunagekyo remained neutral but Kazakage would stand at the borders and threaten all those who try to enter his country. I hope Kanoha does not follow the same path. But they might, out of self-preservation. They cannot remain still while we are moving in their country and so close to them. No reasonable person would just sit still while people were fighting in the back of their house. Even if Kanoha might not enter, they will likely march out just to be on the safe side, a warning to everyone fighting that they are not to think about going to another direction. With long histories between the nations, a confrontation was likely if the camps got close enough. And then Kanoha would be fighting them. Kumo included. It certainly would not be fighting Yuzushio. They were the aggressors. We will have to talk to the Godame the moment she does something. Anoki said in a stern tone. But our men must be reminded that they ought not to provoke Kanoha. Indeed the last war ended because of the Yandame Hokage, but it does not mean we can win this time. We don't even have a reason to fight them. Kuratsuchi agreed to this. Yet, she remained useless. Had she been 100%, she would have been leading the charge. She would have been happy to fight in the front lines. But now she had nothing. She could not do much. Should we send a few skilled people to try to infiltrate Yuzushio? At this stage, they will surely be stretched thinking about war. Anoki nodded. That could work in our favor, he said. Remind everyone that they must absolutely avoid those two Akatsuki members. Everyone will just be slaughtered if they encounter them. It was finally happening. The war was really happening. Gara had entertained the idea that with things moving slowly, perhaps it might not happen after all. It had been naive thinking from him. Of course, they were going to fight. And it had started. It really did start in the worst case possible for Iwagakure at least. The news was already sending shockwaves around the elemental nations. No one had thought that Amigekure had such capable shinobi. But the rain had displayed it and IWA was surely not going to try to fight the village after those massive losses. This was war all right. It was nothing but death. People just died needlessly. The war field was a shinobi's grave and yet, this has never stopped people from starting wars. Shinobi never learned. They always repeated the same mistakes over and over again. But at least Gara now knew why Naruto was confident he could win against both Kumo and IWA. If two people working with him could cause that much damage within a couple of moments, what more could he, the Emperor do? Obviously, there were going to be deaths. Massive deaths. Yuzu could not match the numbers of their enemies. They will be employing some tactics to reduce those numbers. It was not going to be pleasant. What is Kanoha saying about this? Surely they will also move into the Fire Nation. If they had intended to move a portion of their forces through the rain, then they were going to cross the fire borders, Tamari said to her brother. Gara looked towards his sister for a moment before staring at the papers on the desk. He remained silent for a minute before finally speaking. I have not heard anything from them. But we cannot move because Kanoha has moved. We must also fortify our borders, just to be safe. Tamari nodded. You think Kanoha will do the same? Most likely, Gara said. We are closer to the Earth country. It would not be out of the picture for IWA to send forces towards this side just to keep us guessing and from doing anything. We will also have to set out. Obviously, they will do the same. But we will try by all means to avoid fighting, just as father did. What about Yuzushio? Tamari asked with concern. IWA is sending a bigger army than I had anticipated. That alone would make anyone afraid. I have seen Yuzushio it is not a shinobi village. I want to send you there, Gara said calmly. 
this time at least things could be different. If Naruto is serious about his sister, then this time he will speak to her. I have written a message, I want you to deliver it to him. Isn't it dangerous to be moving around now? It is, Gara admitted. But I still need you to go. You don't have to worry about your safety. I will send Baki and some others with you. They will return home once you have reached the wave you can ask the Emperor to help you return home. I am sure by then, IWA and Kumo will be all over, making movements dangerous. Are you sure he will be gracious enough to send me back? Tamari asked cautiously. She still didn't know what to expect from Naruto. He was an unreadable person after all. You want to sort out your feelings with him. If he refuses, he doesn't care for you. Since it will be dangerous to return, request to stay there until we make plans to retrieve you safely, Gara explained in a hardened tone. He once said that I was a better person than he was. I didn't get it then, I'd always thought he was a pleasant person. You know him better than I do. Temari shook her head. I thought I knew him, she said. I don't think there have been any changes with him. Gara said. There were just a lot we didn't know about him, but I think personality-wise, there was much we missed. Of course, I could be wrong. Temari hoped not. Honestly, she was expecting the same person who came to her about a week ago. She was expecting to see that same smile that had greeted her. It would give her hope. She was still bitter, of course, but she could work around that if Naruto proved to be a person worth the effort. When do I leave? As soon as you are ready. It was war all right. It was still unfortunate that Iwagakure had to suffer the same fate it did in the last war. But last time they had learned. Tsunade doubted this time around they were going to stop. They might choose another path, but it was unlikely that they would end their efforts. There were still many shinobi in the fighting stage. Yet, the heavy loss they suffered in the last round was certainly going to damage morale of their forces. Tsunade was not much worried about the hidden stone she was simply concerned about the outcome of the war itself and the direction of things. There was no stopping it now. But they could still try to manage things. Yuzushio didn't want them to get involved but Tsunade was not going to sit still and do nothing about the situation at hand. Naruto could do all he wanted to do and if he turned on the leaf, there would a battle. Tsunade would give him one. No one was going to threaten this village and get away with it. No one. Not Naruto and certainly not Anoki and AI. The Godame Hokage looked around the chamber for a moment before speaking. Within the war room, it was Jiraiya, Sasuke, Shikaku and Kakashi. The war has already started and IWA has taken the first damage. She announced. About a 1000 shinobi from Iwagakure were all eliminated by two people from Amagekure. It is Konan and Nagato, no doubt. Naruto is said to have been seen at the end, Jiraiya added in a firm tone. Shikaku did not find this surprising. They should have known that there was overwhelming power that Naruto was banking on in this war. He was not stupid nor filled with arrogance. He had calculated things. If just two could do that much damage, then it was going to be a long battle. It was going to be destruction all over. Jiraiya had already said Nagato was a wielder of the Rinnegan. There was still much they didn't know about the Dejitsu. He shook his head, they didn't know anything. Anoki is stubborn but not stupid. He won't try to pass through Amagekure again. He will use another route to move his forces to avoid them, Shikaku said. But high chances are that even if they try to avoid them, they will most likely end up being followed. Amagekure will not just watch them go to Yuzushio. The numbers are high and they will obviously be spread into different groups. Kakashi said. Will Yuzushio really survive this? The numbers from IWA are already high. Turning to Kumo is another matter. That airship they showed, Shikaku said in thought. It was probably made for this purpose. It affords greater mobility and gives them the opportunity to bombard the enemy with aerial attacks. Most likely another force that was going to cause massive casualties. Yes, Yuzushio was definitely prepared for this war. The small village was prepared for genocide. If they were going to use the methods used in the rain, it was not going to be a war, but a one-sided slaughter. 
It just looked like Yuzushio wanted to weaken both Kyumo and IWA. Even if they win this war, it would not be without massive causalities. They both will be weakened and probably won't have the strength to fight each other. Yuzushio didn't even have to worry about the powers of Bijus. The emperor hosted the strongest Biju and the Uzumaki had methods to nullify all that power. Both Kyumo and IWA are obviously going to move into the Fire Nation to get into the wave no doubt there will be some ships moving through the ocean, but the land movements will move into our country, Sasuke stated. I would be willing to stand guard at the borders to stop any advancement. That would leave them with no choice but to use boats and ships to get to Yuzushio, Kakashi said. We would effectively be stopping their invasion and I don't think they will be pleased with that. This has nothing to do with Yuzushio, it is about protecting our borders, Sasuke said in a hardened tone. I could care less about what happens to Yuzushio but we cannot give them the idea that is alright to march into our country. Regardless of how it might look, Sasuke is indeed right, Tsunade said. She did not doubt that Sasuke didn't care for Yuzushio. But you cannot go out. Not now. Not in your condition. It's not like it is that bad, Sasuke said with indifference. Tsunade shook her head. I know that but you don't need to do anything. Kakashi will lead our forces towards the border. Are we going to stop them? No, Tsunade said. Stopping them means a confrontation. We will be dragged into the war. But we still cannot just overlook the issue. I don't want this village to fight a war it has no business in. We won't engage them, but we will give them a passage and a time frame. Once passes, we close the gates. Shikaku smiled. It will be like we are assisting them. It is unlikely that Yuzushio is going to allow them to reach the wave anyway. Remember, they have built much infrastructure there, if battles occur there, civilians get caught in the crossfire, it will be destruction. So it is likely that they will be attacked along the way, Jiraiya said. Knowing Naruto, the attacks would occur just around the Fire Nation. It was going to be chaos all over. He just hoped that no one ended up attacking them. If someone attacks us, we will respond. We are not going to be pushed over. Even if it is Yuzushio. Like is said, no village is going to push us around, the Godain Hokage said in a hardened tone. We don't want to fight but those who attack us will face us. Sasuke had no complaints about this. It was a sound decision. He just didn't like that he would be kept in the shadows of things. But he knew that if things heated up, he would be called into action and perhaps he could come across Naruto. It was almost inevitable that he would attack the blonde. Naruto was a threat to the shinobi world, and to Konoha. Once this is over, we must call a Kage meeting. I will discuss this with both Suna and Kirigakure. But certainly, Yuzushio possess enough power to make it look dangerous. That is under the assumption that they survive this war, Shikaku said. Tsunade smiled. Whether Naruto wants to or not, but we are not going to allow Yuzushio to destroy it again. We let it happen before, we won't let it happen again. Although we will do nothing now, we will be keeping a close eye on things. The moment it becomes dangerous, we will step in. No doubt Kyumo and IWA will make measures to guard against that, Shikaku said. He could almost see IWA forces stationed just away from theirs to keep them from moving. Unless you have another method of getting our forces close to Yuzushio without going through both Kyumo and IWA first. There is a method, Jiraiya said. But it involves getting Kirigakure on board. I think because Kiri and Yuzushio are trade partners, it will be most effective. I see, Shikaku said in thought. Kirigakure. Perhaps it was because Mei hadn't been on a date in quite some time. When was the last time she had been to one anyway? No one asked her out. Marriage was not coming. Ah, the horror never ends. But when Haku had come, she had asked to delay their talks a little bit so they could talk it over at dinner. He had seemed surprised by it but she hadn't minded it. She just smiled and told him someone would get him later. Haku was a handsome man. So much more than the emperor and he was such a kind-hearted soul, nothing like the emperor. Was she comparing them? She shook her head. She had no interest over the emperor in that fashion but she was curious. She smiled warmly at Haku and spoke. 
I hope this doesn't make things awkward. I haven't been out in a long time. I just wanted to remember the feeling, she said. Haku shook his head. Had he ever been out with a woman? Never. Not when he was with Sabuza, not when he was in Yuzu. Naruto has been pushing him to make a personal life. He has just never found the time. No, that was not it. He has just never been interested in forming those kinds of relationships. It is fine, he said calmly. But I am certain Naruto won't be pleased about it. He added smiling. The emperor had expressed interest in the Mizukich. It was a surprise that he hadn't hit on her already. Mei raised an eyebrow at this. What makes you say that? Well, the first time we came here, he asked personal questions and seemed rather interested in you. Though knowing him, it could be just for the canal pleasure. Is he a pervert? Haku laughed before shaking his head. No, he said. He is just particular about what he likes and rarely does he not act on his likes. Interesting, May said in thought. So tell me about him. What kind of person is he? I know he is cold and rational but that can't be all that is to him. One hardly knows what is in his mind. I don't think anyone knows what he is thinking, Haku said with a shake of his head. Cold, yes, he can be most of the time. But it's not that he can't speak honestly and share warm moments. He has those moments, just not a lot of them. He seems cold because he ignores feelings and rationalizes. I think I am there to make him see those emotions he ignores. So, he is not completely a cold-hearted emperor, May said. And what about you? How did you get to serve him when you are so kind? You don't refer him as the emperor but just his name which suggests you are close to him. In a way, yes, Haku said with a nod. I speak for him, I represent him. He said to me, what you say is what I say. Anyone disrespects you, they disrespect me. As how I got to work for him, well, he chose me for my kindness. And if I flirt with you, am I flirting with the emperor? I don't think that applies, Haku said calmly, he put on a smile though. Shall we talk business? I have to return to Yuzu by tomorrow morning. You'll brace the sea at night. It can be quite dangerous. I'll use a different type of method, Haku said. I spoke with the feudal lord again, but he appears unmoved. If he continues to make dangerous moves against the wave, Yuzushio will respond and I am afraid it will not be pleasant. No doubt they'll remove him from the picture, May said with a frown. What do you want me to do? Show him the benefits of working with the wave you have a good relationship with the country and it has worked well. It is not a threat but a willing partner. You should be able to convince him to see the light. And if I can't? Haku just smiled. I have tried everything I could and I was only summoned back to Yuzu to make things quick as they don't want troubles in these times, he said. If reason cannot work, you know force will be used and that will ultimately affect the relationship between Kiri and the Empire. Mei was thoughtful for a moment. If it was Naruto, she'd think there was another hidden motive. But this was Haku and she already knew about the Water Lord's movements. It was a troubling situation and she knew who was in the wrong. I will talk to him. But I must first see Yuzushio and speak to the Emperor at his home. Haku smiled. I was just telling him that if we worked out things well, I could invite you. If you are willing, I can delay my return and we could take a ship early morning, he offered. That is sudden. May said. There is war. Kumo ships will be sailing soon and the waters will become dangerous, Haku said in a firm tone. What do you say? Island. Why are you doing this? It was a question that was asked Naruto as he threw an IWA shinobi inside a cell. There were infamous prisons within the shinobi world. There were some in which once you got in, there was no out. But prisoners were often given some freedom of moving around to play. But in this prison, there are no guards. There were was no warden. The seals were the guards and the warden. The prisoners would cook for themselves. If they played with their allocated food, they would starve. There was no mercy in here. No, war criminals did not deserve it. This was a place to punish criminals. Some would see the sun once more but some would never see it again. They would die in here. The prison itself was dug underground. 
a thick mist covered the island. You could not see anything. The mist also confused one's senses. It was a good place to lock up people who misbehaved in the shinobi world. Naruto's eyes faced the man asking him questions. You are a spoil of war. I thought I should test how things work here. The seal I branded you with keeps you within this cell on lockdown times. When it is not, you will be allowed to move around the entire facility. However, no movements at night. If you leave your cell, you will regret it. Even if you hear someone screaming and calling for help, ignore it. He then threw a key towards the man. This is the key to your cage. Lock it when you asleep and when you get out. Naruto then turned away from the man. The shinobi unlocked the cell and tried to get out, but he hit an invisible wall. What the hell? Naruto spoke without turning to face the man. There is a barrier that activates on certain hours. It is still experimental things. So we don't know if it will work without someone setting it off. Regardless, the barrier only works for you. So if someone tries to come in, they'll be able to enter but you won't be able to leave that key is to keep things out of your cell and other people out of your cell, should there be a malfunction in the seals. If you lose it, make sure you retrieve it. You don't eliminate someone. If you do, you will be terminated as well. As Naruto began to walk out through the dimly lit passages, a thick mist started to creep in. Naruto closed his eyes and walked slowly with both hands inside his pockets. The passages were like a maze but after walking for about 30 minutes within the eerily silent place, he was finally able to get out. The thick mist still covered the place. He jumped up into the air with his eyes still closed. While floating, he turned his eyes south and then let out an explosion of wind that propelled him south in great speed. He landed in the middle of a large forest. He continued walking with his eyes closed before coming to a halt in front of a large rock with a steel door. He pushed open the door and walked down the stairs that went deeper in the underground. Naruto stopped at the third door on his right and walked in. It was library. Karen was sitting behind a large table with a number of papers in front of her. Husband, Karen started without looking up at Naruto. You arrived earlier than expected. I'm not early, Naruto said calmly. I was very clear in the letter I sent you. Karen glanced towards him for a moment before staring at her papers. What day is it? Naruto shook his head as he walked towards Karen. He stopped behind her and placed his hands on her shoulders, massaging them for a moment before leaned on and kissed her on her cheek. I have missed you, you know. Karen snorted. Yeah right, she said. Why must you always doubt your husband's love for you, dear? Have I not been loving and supportive to your dreams? He asked in a whisper while continuing to massage Karen. Karen closed her eyes for a moment, enjoying the comfort. You have been supportive but I don't know about loving. I think you have been happy to see my back so you can fool around in our bed. Naruto just smiled. And I was thinking you enjoy being around here more than being around me. Karen shrugged carelessly. Who knows? Maybe that is true, she said while turning her face upwards. Naruto lifted up his head a bit and stared straight into Karen's eyes. He smiled. It's good to see that you are still in perfect health, dear. Am I allowed to touch you? Since when do you ask for permission? Since you nearly bit my hands off, Naruto said. That was because I'd said no and you kept insisting. Karen said. You are allowed to touch me. I can see you have been keeping your hands to yourself these days. Hitting a rough patch. Naruto's hands slid down slowly before resting on Karen's bust. He fondled them for a couple of seconds before leaning in to kiss her. He captured her lips slowly, and moved slowly as he enjoyed her. After a minute, he stopped. Nothing like that. I have just been saving myself for you. Don't flatter me with cheap lies. I know you have another wife. Karen said. Naruto just smiled. Don't say it like that. He said. If it wasn't because there was a snake wearing glasses somewhere in here, I would tell you that I'm a little turned on. Even if there was no snake, I would tell you to turn it off. Naruto straightened up. You are as cold as ever, he said before glancing towards the entrance. He saw Kabuto but said nothing to him. 
Yoshino has found someone to love and he wants us to meet her. That is why I have come here. Just for that? Karen asked with a frown. I thought there was something important. This is important for Yoshino and he is important to me. Naruto said in a firm tone. Besides, it is time you think about returning home. War has started. I have no interest in it, Karen said in a flat tone. I will come back when the war ends. Naruto sighed. But I am still not leaving here without you. How serious are you? I'm willing to drag you while you kick and scream, Naruto said with a straight face. I'm sure Kabuto will appreciate being able to breathe freely without you around. Are you saying I am overbearing? Karen demanded. I didn't say that, Naruto said. Please go prepare yourself. I will be talking to Kabuto while you do so and then we can leave you will return to finish your things. Karen stared at him and he returned the stare. Fine, she grunted before walking past Kabuto, who then took the seat she vacated. I didn't know Karen was your wife. I know Princess Koyuki is as it was perhaps how you were able to get the technology from her, Kabuto stated in a measured tone. I really have no interest in playing spy games with you, Kabuto. My personal life has nothing to do with you. I just want to know about your results. Naruto responded in a flat tone. Kabuto had not expected Naruto to start sharing but he had not expected this kind of talk to get underway this way. Well, it was not like he wanted to become friends with the Emperor. He was fine here. As long as he got the resources he needed to prove many of the hypotheses he had come up with Orochimaru. I saw you have plenty of Sharingans locked up. I asked Karen for a pair but she wouldn't give me any. I really want to work on them. For what purpose? Orochimaru and I came to conclude that the Rinnegan is the natural evolution that comes after the Mangekyo Sharingan but you need to have both Senju and Uchiha genes to be able to achieve this feat, Kabuto said. Oh, you are not surprised by this. It makes perfect sense. Both Senju and Uchiha are descendants of the Sage of Six Path Sons. He bad too, one became Senju and the other became Uchiha. But that isn't the thing that one immediately comes to conclude. Especially when few people actually believe that the sage even once lived. My clan knows a lot about history and so do the bijus. Who first came up with the art of sealing? It was the sage. We are also relatives of the senju. I would like to have access to that knowledge. Don't be greedy, Naruto was quick to say. So you are saying that it would be possible to artificially recreate Hagoromo and he able to achieve his power? Yes, Kabuto said. Are you interested? A little, Naruto said. But I am more interested in Hashirama's cells for their healing power. I am afraid that I can be a little reckless in battle when I get excited and I need a power that can cover that flaw. You must know that there are dangers of using those cells. They are so powerful that they can consume your entire body or they might just eliminate you. Who do you think you are talking to? Naruto asked before releasing a wave of his chakra. It was a sudden burst that shattered the table and the chairs they sat on. Kabuto fell backwards at the sudden burst of frightening chakra. Naruto was already on his feet as he asked. Don't compare me to Danzo or the weak experiment subjects you used with Orochimaru. Kabuto felt his heart beating so fast he felt like it was going to burst. It was not because of fear. No, it was because of excitement. Naruto's chakra was so powerful that it could literally keep you rooted to your position. He also knew that this place was warded with seals meant to control chakra. The fact that he was still able to release that much chakra even with the seals active just meant that he was looking at someone who was ridiculously powerful. The estimates he had were shattered completely. I will need a sample of you DNA to conduct some research to see how your body will react to the cells, Kabuto said. Of course, if you had the time, I would be willing to strap you on a bed and conduct experiments. You'd surely love that, won't you, Naruto said. What do you want? Do you want me to chop off my hand? Just a bit of your flesh. I know it will regrow. The QB heals your wounds. It should be able to close a bit of flesh wound. But I sense you avoid getting that far because while it heals you, it is slowly killing your muscle tissues. Naruto stared at Kabuto for a moment before glancing at the entrance. I don't like him, 
Karen. He knows too much. It annoys me. A pity, I like him, Karen said as she walked into the library. Why did you have to create this mess? Naruto shrugged. I was showboating, he said. About an hour later. Karen stared at the water around with a frown. She was not looking forward to spending a couple of hours in a ship when Naruto could teleport straight to Yuzushio. She turned to face the emperor who was sitting on a chair on the deck, relaxed as he was. Why are we using a ship? I wanted an excuse to spend time with you. With you being gone, I sometimes forget that I have you Naruto explained in a light tone, a smile on his lips. If only that were true, Karen shook her head. You think that I don't miss you? Maybe a part of you does but I mean the reason we are using a ship. It has nothing to do with feelings. You have never really taken decisions to satisfy your feelings, Karen said. At least I have them, Naruto said in thought. Admittedly, a part of me has been thinking that I have lost my ability to feel. I think I have become a little too cold. If you lost all your feelings, I would seek divorce. I am not going to spend my days living with a man who cannot smile or feel a damn thing. Karen said firmly. You just prefer to use the part of your brain that thinks logically and ignore what your heart tells you. I guess you have been doing it for so long that you don't even realize it anymore. Naruto smiled. I guess they were right to say that the wife indeed knows the husband better. In some cases, even mistresses will know the husband better than the wife. It all depends on whom the husband reveals his true colors to, Karen explained with a wave of her right hand. You're also not a very honest person. I can accuse you of that much. I'm honest. No, you are not. You are a liar. You may not necessarily go on telling people lies but it is what you don't say that makes you a liar. You hide things and say something else. You let people believe things that are not true and allow people to have perceptions of you that are based on false conclusions, Karen said with a stare. I pity Tamari. You said you didn't know anything about her. Naoki keeps me informed, Karen said. Then, why are you questioning yourself? Naruto Uzumaki has always been confident and never doubted himself. That has not changed, Naruto said with a shake of his head. At some point in your life, you just look at your heart and see where you stand. I have done many things in my life but now I am getting into a crucial stage. Yoshino was also talking about family. It has just gotten me thinking about certain things. Karen turned towards her right and stared far away. She frowned. Why are we using a ship, Naruto? Your senses are still as sharp as ever. I can't believe you could sense enemies that I can't even see, Naruto said with a smile. We are bait. I had this ship travel yesterday with some people to draw the attention of a couple of nuisances in these parts of the ocean. Karen stared at him for a long minute before shaking her head. They'll be upon us in an hour or less, she said. You thinking about your family now? What have you been thinking about with Koyuki? She wants children and I thought you had been trying to knock her up. She isn't getting younger and needs an heir for her country. You have always known you were going to give her that heir. That was part of the marriage agreement. Um, it appears that I can't have children of my own, Naruto said. I'd believe that if we didn't already examine you, Karen said. It's different you know. Koyuki's child will be her child. The child will not be Uzumaki. But your children will be our children. I thought of things that way. You are a flawed piece of human, Naruto, Karen said. She then smiled. Well, I decided to marry you even when I knew you could be as cold as Haku's ice. That doesn't make me feel better. When have you needed someone to tell you words to make you feel better? Karen asked. You've always been independent about your emotions. You don't like inviting people in. Well, we will have to heal those emotional scars the brats in Kanoha gave you she smiled sadly. You are not bad. To those close to you, you have always shown love. Even Koyuki cannot complain. You're mentioning her a lot. Am I? Something bothering you? No, Karen said in a flat tone. I just don't particularly like her. Naruto sighed tiredly. I'm not getting involved. Just wake me up when our prey arrives. You are gonna nap now. 
I couldn't sleep last night. The ghost of my mother was haunting me. Karen laughed. If you are sleeping, I am going inside to sleep as well. I'll keep the doors locked just in case. Ever since Kabuto arrived, I have been very busy. Hardly get enough sleep. And I am not going to let you sleep tonight. Karen groaned. Why is it that whenever I am home you are always thinking of getting on top of me? I just love you that much. I bet you say that to all the women you sleep with. Have some faith in me, will you? Karen did not respond. She just walked away without saying another word to Naruto. The emperor just shook his head and then closed his eyes. It was only about an hour later when his eyes snapped open and he found himself surrounded by four men. They were just mere bandits who robbed ships delivering goods. Fake intel had been sent out to catch these people. They were being annoyance to his trade with the water country and he really could not be hiring shinobi to guard ships that were traveling on waters he controlled. Sorry to disturb your nap time, your majesty, someone said with a wicked grin. Naruto's eyes narrowed down towards his throat. There was a blade pressed against him. He must have really been out of it. I wasn't enjoying my sleep anyway, he said carelessly. Don't move. We just want the goods you have and we will be on our way. But if you move, you will lose your head. Unfortunately there are no goods here, Naruto said before whispering a couple of words. Wind just flashed in front of him with small wind blades that just cut through the sword touching his throat and the hand holding it. Arg! The bandit cried in pain as his arm fell to the floor, with blood gushing out. Naruto stood up silently and looked around. It was just one ship. Yes, they only brought one because they knew their ships were not protected by shinobi. It was just merchants who traveled by their ships. He sighed, looking thoughtful for a moment before his right hand shot towards the man he'd cut. He grabbed the man by his face and then hurled him out of the ship. He hit the waters and started shouting help as he began to sink. Jump, Naruto said to the other three. You are not worth the effort of me wasting my energy throwing you out. So, jump, now. He said in a deadly tone. The three looked in fear before jumping out of the ship. Naruto followed, but towards the bandit ship. There were still some within their ship. But he did not care for them. He just landed atop of water and clapped both hands, holding them together before holding a single hand sign. Futon, falling havoc. Powerful gusts of wind started to pick up above the sky. Naruto jumped into his ship as the water started to become violent, hitting the ships. A tornado formed just above the bandit ship. It was twisting violently and in the blink of an eye, it flashed down like lightning. It crashed through the ship and then went through it, breaking it in half. The powerful rotation caused the ship's halves to be sucked in and as the waters began to form a small whirlpool. Are you trying to eliminate us as well? Karen asked, seeing that their ship was being pulled towards the whirlpool. You are awake, Naruto said. I should have just stayed still and told those fools that their money inside there he said before waving his right hand. The whirlpool then started to slow down before finally stopping. That would have been fun, wouldn't? No, Karen responded in a flat tone. How long till we get home? I'm getting sick of the ocean. Naruto looked up for a moment before turning to face the clone steering the ship. He created another clone. There should be more pirates along the way. If not, I'll have to hunt them down. I know their location anyway. Why didn't you just do that from the start? I wanted to show off how powerful I am to my wife, Naruto responded with a smile while walking towards Karen. He held out his right hand. Shall we? Yes, Karen nodded before taking Naruto's hand. But he suddenly pulled her and held her bridal style. Someone is feeling very happy today, she said. I am but I am forced to run through the sea with you. The barrier around Yuzushio has been erected because of war time. I cannot teleport straight to the compound and I have not marked any other place aside from the wave. Then let us go to the wave. I don't want to Naruto said. This should be fun I want to test my speed, chakra control and see if my stamina levels are still at optimum levels. I have been lazy recently. Why can't you just create a clone and take me to the wave? I don't the reason I need to d. 
Naruto stopped her from talking by placing a kiss on her lips. Consider this a bonding moment. You're being uncool. I'll just decide to spend the night drinking at a bar. Naruto shrugged. You know when we get home, you are going straight to sleep and I am going to work. Besides, I am fine with you getting drunk but just know that I will come to pick you up and then abuse you. I'll file a complaint to the council. As emperor, I'll threaten to disband it. No, you have no authority to do so. The council represents the Uzumaki clan. You are not the guardian of the clan. Well, I'll be damned, Naruto said before jumping into the water. I'll be quick. You can just enjoy the fresh breath of the ocean. Yes, your majesty. You mock me, Karen. Naruto stopped in front of Yujito's cell. He stared at her for a moment before opening the cell. He entered and held out his right hand. Yujito stared at it for a moment before grasping it gently. She was helped to stand up and the blonde walked her out of the cell. Once they were out, they disappeared in a blur and appeared atop of the tallest building in the village. Yujito could tell even though this was her first time actually seeing the village. So this was Yuzushio. She could not feel the outside. Everything in here felt so disconnected from the rest of the world. Perhaps it was the barriers they put around the village for protection. The village itself was not that big. Even when you were comparing it to other small nations. The wave was much bigger. Perhaps the Uzumaki didn't want to mix with other people and preferred to stay secluded like this. They had done everything to ensure that the wave grew. It may be not be a shinobi country, but the wave had a lot of people. It was becoming powerful and its gold was not shinobi but its trade and economy. Any village allied to it would certainly have big benefits. Yujito closed her eyes and breathed in the fresh air of the outside. God, she had missed the sun. She had missed the light. She missed everything about being outside. Being a prisoner was not fun. But who could she blame for this? She was a kunoichi who failed her mission and this was the result. When will it end though? Things were certainly heating outside. She was not going to see anything. She was not going to protect Kumogakure. She was a prisoner after all. Your chakra is still sealed, Naruto suddenly said. Yujito glanced at the emperor for a moment before looking down at the peaceful streets of Yuzushio. Everyone was going about their lives. There were no problems. I didn't think you'd risk anything like that, she said. Although I would probably not escape, I'd cause some damage in my attempt. Naruto raised an eyebrow. You are a confident kunoichi but you don't strike me as being cold enough to get innocent people involved in your battles. You'd simply transform within these threats and threaten those lives. Yujito did not express any emotion. She didn't want those piercing eyes trying to read her mind. Still, though, getting innocent people involved. It was something else, but she was not going to give Naruto the answer he was looking for. When one is backed against a corner, anything happens. True, but there should be limits, Naruto said. You simply cannot act in the same manner as to the woman I released. She is a cold-hearted woman who'd not hesitate to eliminate innocent people for her freedom. I don't find that hard to believe, Yujito said. There was something seriously wrong with Kuratsuchi. Her hatred for Naruto was also something unhealthy. Why am I out here? Naruto settled down and motioned for Yujito to do the same. I just thought of giving you some time to get a breather. That aside, I have a proposal for you. You'll probably reject it but I am still going to propose it. Yujito frowned. She didn't like this kind of talk. Regardless of the hardships she experienced in Kumogakure, the village was her beloved home and she would die rather than betray it. I am not betraying my village. Naruto smiled. Shinobi and their loyalty towards their villages, he said shaking his head. I am not going to ask you to betray your village. I said I want you to be comfortable. I don't want you to be miserable. If you are willing, I can get you a room at a hotel and you can live there until the war ends. Just think about it. You don't have to give a response now. Temptations do indeed come in various forms. This was just a method to get her to like this village. But perhaps there was some idea of making things easy for her it did not hide the hidden agenda though. Naruto was not a simple person. 
That is very generous of you, she said eyeing the blonde at the corner of her eyes. Sarcasm, Naruto said. I'll address it anyway, I am not always generous. I don't always do things for the benefit of someone else. I am offering you a choice. You take it or leave it. Any other hidden reasons? Well, if they are hidden, I am not going to tell you, Naruto said with a smile. We have already made an encounter with IWA and of course, we annihilated them. Bigger forces will be moving within the next days. Preparations have already been made both Anoki and AI have made a truce to their troubles. So it begins, Yujito said. You want to go out and fight for your village. This might be treacherous but if Kumo and IWA arrive at this village, they will plunder it. They will destroy everything and eliminate even innocent people. I think it is better for me to be away from such a thing, Yujito explained in a bitter tone. You have a conscience, that is good, Naruto said. They are not going to get into this village. No enemy forces will get into this village. If anyone is going to do that, I will be dead and this village will be empty. Are you sure you should be telling me about the last part? You are not going to tell, are you? I am telling you in confidence. I would rather not know, Yujido said. Karen looked around for a moment before staring at the tall redhead standing beside the creepy and unnerving Yoshino. Miracles do happen. She'd never thought that the man would actually love someone. People might think that Naruto was bad, but Yoshino was worse. He was much nastier and more of a schemer than Naruto was. Yoshino was in many regards, a genius. Naruto filled his head with so many things, which made him knowledgeable but also had the wisdom to apply his knowledge. Of course in battle, Yoshino was a mere toddler compared to the monster smiling beside her. I think you are having unpleasant thoughts about me, Karen, Yoshino said with a smile. He had decided to stop all formalities for the night. He was sure Naruto wouldn't mind. Karen though was another matter. It can't be helped, Karen said with a shrug of her shoulders. Are you going to introduce us? Be nice dear, Naruto said to Karen in a measured tone but yet still smiling. I would like both of you to meet Miyuki, Yoshino said with a smile, a warm tone, both his hands on Miyuki's shoulders. She was slender woman with clear crystal blue eyes, she had a large cleavage that made Karen envious, atop of all, she could win any beauty contest with just that innocent smile of hers, and the pure look on her eyes. Naruto Uzumaki, but otherwise known as the Emperor. This Karen, my wife, Naruto said introducing himself. A pleasure, your majesty, Miyuki said with a small bow, her voice was almost melodious, a hypnotic sound that caught the emperor in a mental trance as he studied her. Naruto shook his head. The pleasure is all mine, he said smiling. I was not expecting such a beautiful woman to be in Yoshino's hands. Yoshino put on a flat smile on his lips. I was positive that you already knew her, he said. Naruto shook his head. You know my half-blood is not wanted by those cold-blooded vampires. He said. I don't play around this side of things, he said. I hope we are not just going to be talking, Yoshino. Of course not, I know you get bored easily, Yoshino said with a smile. Well, Yoshino certainly got a woman who is somewhat like him, Naruto said as he entered the bedroom with Karen following behind him. What gave you that impression? She seemed like a pleasant person. Yet you didn't seem to be too bothered to speak to her, Naruto said with narrowed eyes. He walked towards the back door and slid it open slightly for some fresh air to get in before going back to stand by the bed. You had that covered, Karen said with a shrug before helping Naruto take off his cloak. She didn't bother folding it but just dropped it to the floor. She helped him remove his shirt as well before he helped her remove all her upper clothing. Naruto shook his head and then settled on the edge of the bed. I couldn't ignore her. She has such alluring eyes. But I have met her before. Yes, I have. In a bar obviously, Karen said as she climbed on the bed. She sat behind Naruto and wrapped her hands around him. I won't deny that but I just had a conversation with her. She acted as if she hadn't met me before. I am sure Yoshino already knows given that flat smile he gave me when he asked, Naruto said with a shake of his head. And you said you hadn't met her before. I was denying seeing her naked. 
It's not like there are a thousands members of the clan. I have met everyone who is Uzumaki in this village, Naruto said. Karen bit Naruto on his right shoulder. You talking about seeing another woman while in bed with your wife, that is such a turn off, she said. I'm not a masochist, you know, Naruto said before taking Karen's hands. He pulled them forward, causing her exposed chest to press against his back. Well, at least there won't be any harm done. However, I feel very uncomfortable having two Yoshinos. Yet you seem to enjoy conversing with her, Karen said. I was interested in studying her. But I failed. I couldn't see what she had on her mind. I am afraid we might have a problem in the near future or maybe no. Naruto let go of Karen's hands. You're lazy. Your hand work can't excite me. This is what happens when you stay away from your husband, he said while twisting around. He pushed Karen backwards, and had her lie on her back before going atop of her. I am the emperor, what do you think will happen when I show weakness? People why Karen trailed off, biting her lip after Naruto had bit her right and I asterisk asterisk glow. People will think you are human, she finished. Naruto's tongue was too busy with Karen br asterisk asterisk sts to form any words. Both his hands held her firmly around her waist before he moved up, while kissing her chest, her neck, and cheeks. Being human is overrated. Humans are horrible creatures anyway, he said. But then again, you are still Huma Karen was stopped from continuing as Naruto gently captured her lips. His tongue slid into her mouth. She was ready for it. Their tongues choreographed for a couple of moments before Naruto broke it off, after feeling Karen's hands trying to get into his pants. He smiled, someone is a little happy today, he said. Just shut up and help me out here. Naruto just laughed and grabbed Karen's pants. He helped her take them off. She was pushing for it to be done quickly. Naruto threw the pants away and removed his own pants. Once done, he grabbed Karen by her thighs and helped stretch her legs to help expose her middle. He moved in and his tongue slid out before poking around the entrance a bit. You were saying? Naruto asked, his head held up, looking Karen. Must I help myself? She asked before responding to the emperor. You are also a human. Besides I think being human helps make you accessible to those Bella. Naruto had inserted two fingers inside of her. He made his hand motions for a bit before Karen tried to close her legs. I haven't even applied chakra yet, he said. Just do it. Naruto did as told. Ah. Hmm. Karen moaned as she felt the pleasure. Her whole body trembled with excitement. Naruto stopped after a couple of minutes and moved up. He started kissing her again. He nearly jolted when Karen grabbed him by the balls. She massaged them for a moment, causing him to stop kissing her. Wow, Karen mouthed as both her hands gently touched the stiff stick. I'm ready, she said. Naruto helped guide it in. His movements were slow. He felt Karen stiffen as the head entered. Slowly, he inserted it in with his closed as he felt the walls around tightening in. After four rounds, Karen was fully satisfied. She had a content smile with Naruto's hands holding her gently as they lay in the bed. I'm still not returning before the war ends, she suddenly said. Naruto sighed. I did not expect you to change your mind. He said. It shouldn't take long though. So, hopefully, within a month, you'll be back here, with me. Hopefully, Karen said. Are they going to make you marry another woman? Naruto shook his head. Not as things stand. We'll see once things settle down. But I doubt it. It's not my duty to increase the numbers anyway and you don't want a lot of children. I'm the one who has to carry them for nine months. If you can carry one for me, then we can talk. Ah, uh, I got married to a difficult woman, Naruto said. Are we going to take a shower? Let us I can't sleep like this. Karen said. But let us stay like this for a little while longer. Don't fall asleep then. Naruto was sitting on the sofa inside his office while reading a scroll. There were a couple of them lined up on the small table in front of him. Karen was sitting behind his desk, looking through papers with a focused look on her face. They were sitting like that when Karen suddenly spoke. 
You can come in, Naoki, she said before the man could even knock at the door. Naoki entered the office. Your Majesty, he greeted Karen. Your abilities don't seem to have cooled off a bit despite staying in a place surrounded by a mist that makes it impossible for a sensor to function. You get used to it, Karen said. Today, I am your boss. Naruto has given authority to me. So whatever report you want to make, you can make it to me. Wait till I am dead, Naruto said without looking up from the scroll he held. Come to me, Naoki. The Uzumaki smiled. Disappointing, it would have been interesting to take different orders. It would not have been bad serving under you, Karen-sama. You flatter me, Karen said with an expressionless look on her face. Naoki walked towards Naruto and then whispered into his ear. Haku is back but he brought a guest with him. He said he wasn't sure if he should bring her here with Karen around. He is currently showing her around the village to stall. Will she be leaving soon? Speak up so I can hear you, Karen said with a stare. She knew they were talking about her. It is men's business dear. Do you want to hear that although Naoki had a woman for the whole night, he could not get it up, Naruto said in a flat tone. If he has such problems, I can take him back to the island with me. I am sure Kabuto can work something out, Karen said with a smile. But nothing is happening we can as well use him as a test subject because he will be useless as a man. I don't have such problems Naoki said before looking at Naruto. Haku is afraid she might have a problem, Naruto said in thought. Unless Haku was planning something personal, there should not be a problem. But then again, this was Karen. She could still have a problem. Well, it did not matter anyway. Yes, Naoki said with a nod of his head. Tell him it's fine. Once he is done, he can bring her here. Hi, Naoki saluted before leaving the office. Karen stared at Naruto for a moment. So you are hiding things from me now? Yes, Naruto nodded. We didn't have to sneak around or whisper when you were not around. But since you are here, we have to do things this way, he said. I will be leaving soon, Karen said. I need more money or at least certain things I need. Can't give you any. Work with what you have, Naruto said in a hardened tone. We are not negotiating that, Karen. We have a war we must prepare for and I can't be wasting funds we don't even have at this stage, we are just leeching off the wave country. It is your war. And it is my empire. Not ours, Naruto said. You can speak to Yoshino. But imperial coffers are not going to give you anything. You're being stingy. If you saw how bad the situation is, you wouldn't say that, Naruto said with a slight shake of his head. What do you want to work on anyway? Shouldn't you be thinking about wrapping up your things in preparation of your return home? There was something I wanted to make before that, Karen said. I'll have to leave Kabuto in charge of the island she paused for a moment. Can I really trust him? I believe so, Naruto said. We don't have to worry about him. Though, being careful isn't a sin, that is why we gave him a special seal, the emperor said. You can also tell him that if he wants to move in and of the island, he can speak to Yoshino and make arrangements. In the meantime, we have a guest to entertain. A woman no doubt. Yes, the Mizukage, Naruto said. What does she want? She came with Haku we will hear from her when she arrives. He is currently giving her a tour around the village. You have been very accommodating to her. If it was someone else, you would have forced things already. But you have been diplomatic with her, Karen said. Sometimes I wonder about your intentions and if you really don't hold grudges as you say you don't. Kiri was in a bad state and fighting them would have made things difficult for us. I made a rational decision, Naruto said with a shrug. But admittedly, Anoki, I dislike and so does the rakage. Both of them really don't fit into my ideal world, thus they must die. May fits in perfectly. My other reasons are just a bonus. Anoki had divided his men into five groups, four with two thousand shinobi and the other with just a thousand. They were all going to march towards the wave country before heading to Yuzushio. Naruto had even made things simpler but creating a bridge they could use to reach the island without having to struggle with the whirlpools that surrounded it. 
The problem now was the intel he had received Kanoha was moving out and it appears that Suna was also moving as well. It didn't surprise him that they were both making moves at the same time. They were allies after all. But Kanoha moving was the bigger problem. He didn't expect them to move so early. A confrontation was bound to happen and the leaf was likely to stop them from crushing Yuzushio. It would be a big problem. Yet, if he managed to work out things with the rakage, they could turn on the leaf. Should that happen, it was going to be a shinobi world war alright. Anoki wanted to avoid this. Kitsuchi, Anoki called the man. Your unit will move second. Akatsuchi will take the lead through the land of canyons. Two units will force through the land of mushrooms and then into canyons to avoid entering Fire Nation. Always keep contact with other units. And don't move too quickly. Keep a safe distance with others. Hi. Now get ready to move out. Akatsuchi will be moving out within an hour. Anoki then turned to Kuratsuchi. Because of these events that have occurred, you have an important mission that you must handle. And don't fail this one, Kuratsuchi. If you succeed, we hold Suna hostage possibly Kanoha to some extent. We could even have them turn against each other. It doesn't have to anyone specific but get someone important. I will get it done, old man. Kuratsuchi said in a firm tone. I failed the last time, I won't fail this one. Besides, this time, there will be no return if I fail. I will be buried in the desert if things go wrong, she added in a bitter tone. I hope it doesn't come to that, Anoki said seriously. We will be looking for someone to help you out. Once we find this person, I will call for you. Make sure you work fast.